right now on America This Morning. Flood alerts and delays for the morning commute as we kick off the busy holiday travel week. What to expect today and the storm damage across parts of the south. Nearly a foot of rain in some areas. Motorcade scare. President Biden is rushed into an SUV after a crash in Delaware. What we're learning about the investigation. New action to address the surge of migrants crossing the U.S. border. What authorities are doing today at two border crossings. This is former President Trump's immigration rhetoric. Why critics are comparing his rhetoric to Nazi Germany. A new warning about rising flu, COVID, and RSV cases. ER visits among children have doubled in one week, what the CDC is now predicting. Plus, a two-year-old is honored for bravery after what happened to her on the playground. And later, what's so different with office holiday parties this year? From ABC News in New York, this is America This Morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm Andrew Dimberg. Good morning to you. I'm Rhiannon and Allie. We want to begin with the weather and travel delays this morning at the beginning of this busy week before Christmas. Looking at the radar right now, some of the busiest airports in the country are on alert as a storm system moves into the northeast following a weekend of heavy flooding for millions of Americans. This morning, a damaging storm barreling up the east coast is expanding, kicking off this week before Christmas with treacherous travel for millions of Americans. A widespread two to four inches of rain are expected from Delaware to the Canadian border. More than six inches could fall in parts of New England, with wind gusts up to 60 miles per hour possible along the coast. Fear, worry, anxiousness, just figuring out how we got to set up for the next storm and what time the high tides are coming. The storm already drenched Florida with tropical storm-like conditions. This video showing severe flooding in Miami. Parts of South Carolina got nearly a foot of rain, swamping Charleston. AccuWeather captured first responders rescuing drivers in historic Georgetown, South Carolina. Hundreds of flights have been delayed at airports in Atlanta, Miami, and Fort Lauderdale. Beginning this week, until January 2nd, 39 million Americans are expected to fly, with peak travel expected this Thursday and Friday. This storm already putting a damper on holiday travel plans. I'm excited, and yeah, but we're going to have to wait in long lines, but it's fun. Much colder temperatures will return after the storm. We'll check your forecast in just a few minutes. The government is fining Southwest Airlines a record $140 million for the flight cancellation meltdown over the holidays last year. That's when operational delays stranded 2 million passengers. The airline already paid out $600 million in refunds. The fine is 30 times larger than any previous fine. Southwest will also be required to issue credits for significant delays that are the airline's fault. A scare for President Biden and the First Lady. A car slammed into a vehicle in their motorcade last night. ABC's Derek Dennis reports on the investigation. Mr. President, why are you losing to Trump in the poll? President Biden was answering a reporter's question in Delaware last night when out of nowhere. Biden seemingly startled at the sound of a crash as he left a visit to his campaign headquarters and was immediately rushed into his waiting SUV. Secret Service agents surrounded the car with weapons drawn, the driver getting out with hands up. Turns out a car had hit a parked Secret Service vehicle in the rain and was left with a damaged bumper. Neither the president nor the first lady were hurt. The Secret Service says a vehicle securing the president's motorcade was struck by another vehicle. There was no protective interest associated with this event. Police say investigators are working to determine if driver impairment was a factor. Sources say it appears there was no ideological motivation behind the crash. From the video, it appears the driver cooperated with Secret Service agents, keeping his hands up. Andrew, Rhiannon. Derek, thank you. Breaking overnight, North Korea has launched its first long-range missile in about five months, and a Japanese official says the missile is likely capable of reaching anywhere in the U.S. The test missile reportedly landed in the water off Japan. North Korea also fired a shorter-range missile over the weekend. The launches are believed to be a response to increased nuclear cooperation between the U.S. and South Korea. U.S. border officials are announcing more changes today to address the migrant crisis at the southern border. The new action comes as President Trump faces scrutiny for his immigration rhetoric, which critics are comparing to the rhetoric used by Nazis in World War II. ABC's Liz Landers is here now with details. Liz, good morning. Good morning, Rhiannon. Authorities at the southern border are taking new action today because of the surge of migrants crossing into the U.S.
This morning, officials at the U.S.-Mexico border are temporarily suspending freight train crossings in El Paso and Eagle Pass, Texas, in order to redeploy resources elsewhere. It comes after authorities reportedly apprehended more than 4,000 migrants in the area yesterday alone. Temporary closures were also recently imposed at a port of entry in Arizona and at a pedestrian entrance in San Diego. Over the weekend, Senate negotiators failed to reach a deal on a framework for border security improvements, which Republicans are demanding as a condition to pass more funding for the wars in Israel and Ukraine. Republicans point to national security concerns at the southern border and the smuggling of drugs. A truck driver at a cargo facility in California just across the Mexican border was recently arrested, accused of carrying 3,000 pounds of meth and more than 500 pounds of cocaine inside packages of jalapeno paste. But Democrats say if the problem of illegal immigration was solved today, the illegal drug supply in the U.S. would be unaffected because they say the drugs mostly come through legal ports of entry. They're poisoning the blood of our country. That's what they've done. Former President Trump is facing criticism for his immigration rhetoric, speaking about, quote, blood purity, echoing Nazi slogans of World War II. Trump doubled down at a campaign event last night, saying the U.S. needs a cleanup. We will begin, and we have no choice, the largest deportation operation in American history. One of Trump's rivals in the Republican race, Chris Christie, blasted the former president. He's disgusting. And what he's doing is dog whistling to Americans who feel absolutely under stress and strain from the economy and from the conflicts around the world. As for those bipartisan talks in Washington on new border security measures, lawmakers did report progress yesterday while also downplaying any hope for a deal before the holidays. Andrew. Liz, thank you. Now to the war in the Middle East and the discovery of a massive tunnel not far from Israel's border with Gaza. It's raising even more questions about intelligence failures before the October attack by Hamas. Here's ABC's Allison Kosick. This morning, Israel's military is revealing what it describes as Hamas's largest tunnel under Gaza. Nearly two and a half miles long, large enough to drive a car through. Inside, IDF soldiers say they found weapons, even a rail system. You can see how deep this tunnel goes. This is something that would have taken years to build. The IDF saying this probably took millions of dollars. <laughs> Families of some of the Israeli hostages still held by Hamas are now camping outside Israeli military headquarters, demanding a new deal to release their loved ones. Their protests coming after Israeli forces accidentally killed three hostages Friday. A preliminary investigation found the three hostages left a building in in an area of very intense fighting, carrying a stick with a white cloth. A soldier reportedly saw them as a threat and opened fire. Troops were ordered to stop firing, but another soldier shot and killed the third hostage. Investigators say the men had written these signs outside the building pleading for help, saying SOS and help three hostages written on fabric using leftover food. Meanwhile, back in the U.S., amid a surge of anti-Semitism, synagogues and Jewish facilities in at least 19 states and Washington, D.C., received bomb threats yesterday. And hundreds of so-called swatting incidents have been reported in recent days. That's when someone reports a non-existing serious crime. In Washington, D.C., a man was also arrested for spraying an unknown substance at people outside a synagogue. He's being charged with assault. Andrew Rhiannon. Allison, thank you for that. New video of a driver being rescued from a ravine in Northern California. Look at this. Officers in Sonoma County spotted the vehicle upside down about 60 miles north of San Francisco. Rescue crews in that chopper used a 100-foot line to reach the car and then airlift the driver, who is now recovering. Time now for a look at your Monday weather. An active Monday setting up. If you are going to be doing some traveling, we will be talking about wet weather along with some locally heavy rain and some gusty winds. Speaking of the winds, some of the winds can chop 50, 60, even close to 65 miles per hour right along the coast. And that could lead to some difficult travel and some power outages. Then comes the snow, especially off the Great Lakes into the higher terrain of western Maryland and eastern West Virginia. I'm AccuWeather's meteorologist Justin Pavic.
Coming up, the train collision caught on camera in Texas. Also ahead, a top Republican Party official faces punishment after being accused of sexual assault. And a two-year-old girl is honored for her bravery after finding a gun at a playground. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yeah with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions, their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. We're back now with an 18-wheeler demolished by a freight train near Fort Worth, Texas. Investigators say the truck got stuck at that crossing. The crash caused 17 of the train cars and two of its engines to derail. The conductor suffered minor injuries. The chairman of the Republican Party of Florida has been censured and stripped of his authority and salary as he faces a rape allegation. Party leaders say Christian Ziegler is unfit for office. He's accused of sexually assaulting a woman after their alleged threesome with his wife was canceled. Governor Ron DeSantis is among those calling for Ziegler to resign. A pro basketball player is facing murder charges in Las Vegas. Chance Comanche and his girlfriend are accused of kidnapping and killing Marina Rogers. She was reported missing two weeks ago. Her body was found in a desert area, and Comanche most recently played for the Stockton Kings and the G League, and previously played for the Portland Trailblazers in the NBA. No word on a motive in the case. A new warning about a surge in respiratory illnesses ahead of the holidays. The CDC says 17 states and New York City are seeing high or very high levels of COVID, flu, and RSV. The agency says hospitalizations are up, which could force hospitals to ration care by the end of the month. RSV appears to be peaking in some parts of the country, but we are still seeing a lot of cases. Influenza, like it usually does, is running wild, and COVID-19 hospitalizations have been up for the past five weeks. CDC figures show ER visits for children doubled last week. Health officials urge anyone who's sick to stay home. Police in Las Vegas are celebrating the recovery of a toddler six weeks after she accidentally shot herself. The two-year-old was presented with an award for her bravery. A suspect had ditched a loaded gun in the playground of her daycare, and the gun went off after she picked it up, leaving her in critical condition. To be uh, that resilient and, and really running around after that incident happened, it just shows you uh, how tough these kids can be. And she just has that survivor spirit and, and thoughts and prayers to her and her family. She is incredible. Police say the fire department and other agencies have joined them in symbolically adopting the girl. Coming up, get your VCR ready. The new craze surrounding VHS tapes. But first, not one, not two, three rare pregnancies, all at the same hospital. The bond now shared by these three moms. Whenever, wherever.
wherever news breaks. It's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. National forests are good places to get away. But sometimes bad things happen in good places. It's the stuff of nightmares. All I could see was their feet sticking up. My knees went weak. This is a human skull. We were definitely against the clock. How many more victims are out there? Wild Crime, Blood Mountain. Now streaming only on Hulu. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. We're back with questions surrounding who is driving this Ferrari registered to actor Michael B. Jordan. Video captured the car sideswiping a parked vehicle recently in Hollywood. Neither police nor Jordan's representatives have said who was driving, but that person right now is not facing any charges. We turn now to North Carolina and three women who now share an incredible close bond. They went through rare pregnancies, all of them at the same hospital. It's one of the rarest pregnancy conditions a mother can have. Monoamniotic twins, identical twins sharing the same amniotic sac. The pregnancy is risky and it requires hospitalization at 26 weeks with around the clock monitoring. It was really hard to kind of swallow the fact that, you know, this is not going to be anything what I imagined it to be. Monoamniotic twins occur in only one in 8,000 pregnancies. But just a few weeks after Summer Morrison was admitted to a hospital outside of Charlotte, North Carolina, another woman, Kiara Davis, was admitted with the same rare pregnancy. I tried to give her, you know, some of the things I wish I knew when I got there. That was really helpful because I was like, whew, uh, it's finally somebody that's going through the same thing that I'm going through. Two moms being treated on the same floor for a condition that occurs in less than 0.1% of all pregnancies. I think we just learned like how nice it is to have that, you know, little village. And just knowing like we weren't doing this alone. Summer gave birth to two healthy twin girls. And remarkably, just a few days later, a third woman, Vakoya Miller was admitted with the same type of pregnancy. They told me that there were actually two other moms that were having the same twins that I were. All three women treated at the same hospital, all three giving birth to daughters, six little girls who are now thriving. It's just like a bond you can't make up. It's just, just awesome. Just awesome. Six adorable babies. And later on Good Morning America, the women discuss their new bond and what they've learned from each other. In sports, the Baltimore Ravens clinched a playoff spot last night thanks to MVP-style plays like this one from Lamar Jackson. The Ravens ran for more than 250 yards to beat the Jaguars 23-7. The Ravens currently have the best record in the AFC. In Cleveland, the Bears needed a Hail Mary pass to beat the Browns and the ball fell right into a receiver's lap, but he dropped it. It was instead intercepted. And the Browns won 20 to 17. In the NBA, Steph Curry snapped a record 268 game streak last night. It was the first game since 2018 where he failed to make a three point shot, but the Warriors still managed to beat the Blazers. Coming up, what's different with office Christmas parties this year? Plus what we've learned about this vase bought cheap at a thrift store. 
much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions, their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. All across the globe, the world will be celebrating the new year and you can see it as it happens live. The global celebrations. See the new year as it comes in live. Streaming all day and night on ABC News Live. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for best news program in all of television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis, weeknights on ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, Start Here. Reporting from Seoul, South Korea, I'm Brick Planet. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Time to check the pulse. We begin with the holiday parties at the office this year. They are not what they used to be. Yeah, headline in the New York Times poses the question, did the Grinch come for the office holiday party? Corporate party planners say, yes, there's been a big shift since the pandemic. They say workers want daytime celebrations with reduced or even no alcohol. More people want to be home at night. Who would have thought? Instead of spending time with work colleagues in, quote, off hours. And younger workers are putting down the booze. The Times reports less than 40% of young Americans say they drink on a regular basis. Next, the growing number of people rewinding to a time before streaming. The last major movie released on VHS was nearly 20 years ago. But a group of people who call themselves tape heads are fueling a resurgence for the industry. More video stores are now opening and Yes, collectors are taking notice at auctions. For example, a mint, a mint condition VHS of Back to the Future recently sold for $75,000. Next, a sweet success at the box office. For Wonka, starring Timothy Chalamet as a young Willy Wonka, dominating the competition this weekend. You're the funny little man who's been following me. Funny little man. How dare you? I will have you know that I am a perfectly respectable size for an Oompa Loompa. Yes, that is Hugh Grant as an Oompa Loompa. Wonka brought in $39 million, and analysts say it's a great sign for musicals, which have really struggled recently at the box office. In fact, the studio downplayed Wonka's song and dance elements in promotions. Now to California and a substitute teacher who knows his history. That's because he's lived it. This is 95-year-old veteran Gene Arnold. When he talks about the Depression and World War II with his junior high school students, he's telling them from memory as well as textbooks. Mr. Arnold plans to keep teaching as long as he's able. I know what will happen, and that's the sad part. If I retire, I'm going to go home and sit down. I know that. I'm tired. I really am. The kids keep me going. He's tired, but he's not out yet. Mr. Arnold's principal says the kids love him. And finally, the vase that turned out to be the discovery of a lifetime. It was bought at a Goodwill thrift store. The price just four bucks. But the woman who bought it did some research and learned it was designed by a renowned Italian architect, and she just sold it at auction for $107,000. Top headlines next. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. You 
health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love that. Me. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. We have really good news. Congratulations, you're breaking. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. A nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions. Their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. Checking more top stories now. The government is fining Southwest Airlines $140 million for its operational meltdown last year, which stranded 2 million passengers over the holidays. That fine is 30 times larger than any previous fine against an airline. Authorities in Texas are searching for an escaped inmate who was serving a life sentence for abusing a child. They say Robert Yancey escaped from a prison near Houston yesterday. They haven't said how. He was last seen in a white Nissan, possibly driven by a woman. Quaker Oats has recalled some of its granola bars and its cereal because of salmonella concerns. The recall affects more than three dozen products sold across the U.S. Now, Quaker says it has not received any reports of any infections. We do have a complete list of the affected products on our website, abcnews.com. Today's weather, heavy rain and flooding along the northeast coast. More than six inches could fall in New England. Snow around the Great Lakes, rain and mountain snow for the west coast. Finally, the sisters gaining internet fame for the confession video to their late mother. They spoke to Danny New. These are some of the things that we'd like to confess to her that have happened since she died. When we remember someone who's passed on... Our mom would really find what we did funny. Sometimes we are allowed to laugh. <laughs> I didn't know that I needed to get my own insurance policy. <laughs> This past month, nearly 25 million TikTok users learned this lesson from sisters Sarah and Katie. Car insurance. As they laughed and sometimes wheezed through the updates that they wish they could give their mom care, who passed away in the summer of 2022. I feel like you need an EMT nearby. <laughs> Someone commented that and said it's going to be only one sister doing these if she doesn't get her wheeze checked out. <laughs> You're so nervy. They've since shared a few of these confessions, now also featuring the oldest sister, Megan. Grief is a process. And all three will tell you that one of the reasons they can laugh about this is because as soon as their mom was told that her treatments for pancreatic cancer were not working. She looked right at me and she's like, Katie, it's going to be fine. We're going to laugh through it. And that's how the three of you will get through it. I got the stomach virus so bad I miss Megan's baby shower. <laughs> And this principle is something that their mom instilled in them when their father passed away in 1999. She taught us how to deal with the grief, acknowledge it, and keep going and still be able to find the happiness and the laughter and the joy. Especially when you all share a ridiculously contagious laugh together. <laughs> And they're raising money right now for the fight against pancreatic cancer. If you want to check out CARES Crew with K's on pancan.org, guys. That laugh is contagious. I think that's why it got over 20 million views, or thanks to Danny New. That's what's making news in America this morning. Have a great day, everyone.
right now on America This Morning. Flood alerts and delays for the morning commute as we kick off the busy holiday travel week. What to expect today and the storm damage across parts of the south. Nearly a foot of rain in some areas. Motorcade scare. President Biden is rushed into an SUV after a crash in Delaware. What we're learning about the investigation. New action to address the surge of migrants crossing the U.S. border. What authorities are doing today at two border crossings. This is former President Trump's immigration rhetoric. Why critics are comparing his rhetoric to Nazi Germany. A new warning about rising flu, COVID, and RSV cases. ER visits among children have doubled in one week, what the CDC is now predicting. Plus, a two-year-old is honored for bravery after what happened to her on the playground. And later, what's so different with office holiday parties this year? From ABC News in New York, this is America This Morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm Andrew Dimber. Good morning to you. I'm Rhiannon and Allie. We want to begin with the weather and travel delays this morning at the beginning of this busy week before Christmas. Looking at the radar right now, some of the busiest airports in the country are on alert as a storm system moves into the northeast following a weekend of heavy flooding for millions of Americans. This morning, a damaging storm barreling up the east coast is expanding, kicking off this week before Christmas with treacherous travel for millions of Americans. A widespread two to four inches of rain are expected from Delaware to the Canadian border. More than six inches could fall in parts of New England, with wind gusts up to 60 miles per hour possible along the coast. Fear, worry, anxiousness. Just figuring out how we got to set up for the next storm and what time the high tides are coming. The storm already drenched Florida with tropical storm-like conditions. This video showing severe flooding in Miami. Parts of South Carolina got nearly a foot of rain, swamping Charleston. AccuWeather captured first responders rescuing drivers in historic Georgetown, South Carolina. Hundreds of flights have been delayed at airports in Atlanta, Miami, and Fort Lauderdale. Beginning this week, until January 2nd, 39 million Americans are expected to fly, with peak travel expected this Thursday and Friday. This storm already putting a damper on holiday travel plans. I'm excited, and yeah, but we're going to have to wait in long lines, but it's fun. Much colder temperatures will return after the storm. We'll check your forecast in just a few minutes. The government is fining Southwest Airlines a record $140 million for the flight cancellation meltdown over the holidays last year. That's when operational delays stranded 2 million passengers. The airline already paid out $600 million in refunds. The fine is 30 times larger than any previous fine. Southwest will also be required to issue credits for significant delays that are the airline's fault. A scare for President Biden and the First Lady. A car slammed into a vehicle in their motorcade last night. ABC's Derek Dennis reports on the investigation. Mr. President, why are you losing to Trump in the polls? President Biden was answering a reporter's question in Delaware last night when out of nowhere. Biden seemingly startled at the sound of a crash as he left a visit to his campaign headquarters and was immediately rushed into his waiting SUV. Secret Service agents surrounded the car with weapons drawn, the driver getting out with hands up. Turns out a car had hit a parked Secret Service vehicle in the rain and was left with a damaged bumper. Neither the president nor the first lady were hurt. The Secret Service says a vehicle securing the president's motorcade was struck by another vehicle. There was no protective interest associated with this event. Police say investigators are working to determine if driver impairment was a factor. Sources say it appears there was no ideological motivation behind the crash. From the video, it appears the driver cooperated with Secret Service agents, keeping his hands up. Andrew, Rhiannon. Derek, thank you. Breaking overnight, North Korea has launched its first long-range missile in about five months, and a Japanese official says the missile is likely capable of reaching anywhere in the U.S. The test missile reportedly landed in the water off Japan. North Korea also fired a shorter-range missile over the weekend. The launches are believed to be a response to increased nuclear cooperation between the U.S. and South Korea. U.S. border officials are announcing more changes today to address the migrant crisis at the southern border. The new action comes as President Trump faces scrutiny for his immigration rhetoric, which critics are comparing to the rhetoric used by Nazis in World War II. ABC's Liz Landers is here now with details. Liz, good morning. Good morning, Rhiannon. Authorities at the southern border are taking new action today because of the surge of migrants crossing into the U.S.
This morning, officials at the U.S.-Mexico border are temporarily suspending freight train crossings in El Paso and Eagle Pass, Texas, in order to redeploy resources elsewhere. It comes after authorities reportedly apprehended more than 4,000 migrants in the area yesterday alone. Temporary closures were also recently imposed at a port of entry in Arizona and at a pedestrian entrance in San Diego. Over the weekend, Senate negotiators failed to reach a deal on a framework for border security improvements, which Republicans are demanding as a condition to pass more funding for the wars in Israel and Ukraine. Republicans point to national security concerns at the southern border and the smuggling of drugs. A truck driver at a cargo facility in California just across the Mexican border was recently arrested, accused of carrying 3,000 pounds of meth and more than 500 pounds of cocaine inside packages of jalapeno paste. But Democrats say if the problem of illegal immigration was solved today, the illegal drug supply in the U.S. would be unaffected because they say the drugs mostly come through legal ports of entry. They're poisoning the blood of our country. That's what they've done. Former President Trump is facing criticism for his immigration rhetoric, speaking about, quote, blood purity, echoing Nazi slogans of World War II. Trump doubled down at a campaign event last night, saying the U.S. needs a cleanup. We will begin, and we have no choice, the largest deportation operation in American history. One of Trump's rivals in the Republican race, Chris Christie, blasted the former president. He's disgusting. And what he's doing is dog whistling to Americans who feel absolutely under stress and strain from the economy and from the conflicts around the world. As for those bipartisan talks in Washington on new border security measures, lawmakers did report progress yesterday while also downplaying any hope for a deal before the holidays. Andrew. Liz, thank you. Now to the war in the Middle East and the discovery of a massive tunnel not far from Israel's border with Gaza. It's raising even more questions about intelligence failures before the October attack by Hamas. Here's ABC's Allison Kosick. This morning, Israel's military is revealing what it describes as Hamas's largest tunnel under Gaza. Nearly two and a half miles long, large enough to drive a car through. Inside, IDF soldiers say they found weapons, even a rail system. You can see how deep this tunnel goes. This is something that would have taken years to build. The IDF saying this probably took millions of dollars. <laughs> Families of some of the Israeli hostages still held by Hamas are now camping outside Israeli military headquarters, demanding a new deal to release their loved ones. Their protests coming after Israeli forces accidentally killed three hostages Friday. A preliminary investigation found the three hostages left a building in in an area of very intense fighting, carrying a stick with a white cloth. A soldier reportedly saw them as a threat and opened fire. Troops were ordered to stop firing, but another soldier shot and killed the third hostage. Investigators say the men had written these signs outside the building pleading for help, saying SOS and help three hostages written on fabric using leftover food. Meanwhile, back in the U.S., amid a surge of anti-Semitism, synagogues and Jewish facilities in at least 19 states and Washington, D.C., received bomb threats yesterday. And hundreds of so-called swatting incidents have been reported in recent days. That's when someone reports a non-existing serious crime. In Washington, D.C., a man was also arrested for spraying an unknown substance at people outside a synagogue. He's being charged with assault. Andrew Rhiannon. Allison, thank you for that. New video of a driver being rescued from a ravine in Northern California. Look at this. Officers in Sonoma County spotted the vehicle upside down about 60 miles north of San Francisco. Rescue crews in that chopper used a 100-foot line to reach the car and then airlift the driver, who is now recovering. Time now for a look at your Monday weather. An active Monday setting up. If you are going to be doing some traveling, we will be talking about wet weather along with some locally heavy rain and some gusty winds. Speaking of the winds, some of the winds can chop 50, 60, even close to 65 miles per hour right along the coast. And that could lead to some difficult travel and some power outages. Then comes the snow, especially off the Great Lakes into the higher terrain of western Maryland and eastern West Virginia. I'm AccuWeather's meteorologist Justin Pavic.
Coming up, the train collision caught on camera in Texas. Also ahead, a top Republican Party official faces punishment after being accused of sexual assault. And a two-year-old girl is honored for her bravery after finding a gun at a playground. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wiener Mobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. news breaks it's so important to always remember that lives are changed here in london in buffalo uvalde texas edinburgh scotland reporting from rolling fork mississippi the ukrainian refugees here in warsaw we're heading to a small community outside of mexico city getting you behind the stories as they happen abc news live prime we'll take you there stream abc news live weeknights wherever you stream your news only on abc news live why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Traveling with the president in Dublin, Ireland, I'm Mary Bruce. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. We're back now with an 18-wheeler demolished by a freight train near Fort Worth, Texas. Investigators say the truck got stuck at that crossing. The crash caused 17 of the train cars and two of its engines to derail. The conductor suffered minor injuries. The chairman of the Republican Party of Florida has been censured and stripped of his authority and salary as he faces a rape allegation. Party leaders say Christian Ziegler is unfit for office. He's accused of sexually assaulting a woman after their alleged threesome with his wife was canceled. Governor Ron DeSantis is among those calling for Ziegler to resign. A pro basketball player is facing murder charges in Las Vegas. Chance Comanche and his girlfriend are accused of kidnapping and killing Marina Rogers. She was reported missing two weeks ago. Her body was found in a desert area, and Comanche most recently played for the Stockton Kings and the G League, and previously played for the Portland Trailblazers in the NBA. No word on a motive in the case. A new warning about a surge in respiratory illnesses ahead of the holidays. The CDC says 17 states and New York City are seeing high or very high levels of COVID, flu, and RSV. The agency says hospitalizations are up, which could force hospitals to ration care by the end of the month. RSV appears to be peaking in some parts of the country, but we are still seeing a lot of cases. Influenza, like it usually does, is running wild, and COVID-19 hospitalizations have been up for the past five weeks. CDC figures show ER visits for children doubled last week. Health officials urge anyone who's sick to stay home. Police in Las Vegas are celebrating the recovery of a toddler six weeks after she accidentally shot herself. The two-year-old was presented with an award for her bravery. A suspect had ditched a loaded gun in the playground of her daycare, and the gun went off after she picked it up, leaving her in critical condition. To be uh, that resilient and, and really running around after that incident happened, it just shows you uh, how tough these kids can be. And she just has that survivor spirit and, and thoughts and prayers to her and her family. She is incredible. Police say the fire department and other agencies have joined them in symbolically adopting the girl. Coming up, get your VCR ready. The new craze surrounding VHS tapes. But first, not one, not two, three rare pregnancies, all at the same hospital. The bond now shared by these three moms. 
We have really good news. <laughs> your I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions, their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. All across the globe, the world will be celebrating the new year, and you can see it as it happens live. The global celebrations. See the new year as it comes in live. Streaming all day and night on ABC News Live. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis, weeknights on ABC News Live. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime, we'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, wherever you stream your news, only on ABC News Live. We're back with questions surrounding who is driving this Ferrari registered to actor Michael B. Jordan. Video captured the car sideswiping a parked vehicle recently in Hollywood. Neither police nor Jordan's representatives have said who was driving, but that person right now is not facing any charges. We turn now to North Carolina and three women who now share an incredible close bond. They went through rare pregnancies, all of them at the same hospital. It's one of the rarest pregnancy conditions a mother can have, monoamniotic twins, identical twins sharing the same amniotic sac. The pregnancy is risky, and it requires hospitalization at 26 weeks with around-the-clock monitoring. It was really hard to kind of swallow the fact that, you know, this is not going to be anything what I imagined it to be. Monoamniotic twins occur in only one in 8,000 pregnancies. But just a few weeks after Summer Morrison was admitted to a hospital outside of Charlotte, North Carolina, another woman, Kiara Davis, was admitted with the same rare pregnancy. I tried to give her, you know, some of the things I wish I knew when I got there. That was really helpful because I was like, whew, uh, it's finally somebody that's going through the same thing that I'm going through. Two moms being treated on the same floor for a condition that occurs in less than 0.1% of all pregnancies. I think we just learned like how nice it is to have that, you know, little village. And just knowing like we weren't doing this alone. Summer gave birth to two healthy twin girls. And remarkably, just a few days later, a third woman, Vakoya Miller was admitted with the same type of pregnancy. They told me that there were actually two other moms that were having the same twins that I were. All three women treated at the same hospital, all three giving birth to daughters, six little girls who are now thriving. It's just like a bond you can't make up. It's just, just awesome. Just awesome. Six adorable babies. And later on Good Morning America, the women discuss their new bond and what they've learned from each other. In sports, the Baltimore Ravens clinched a playoff spot last night thanks to MVP-style plays like this one from Lamar Jackson. The Ravens ran for more than 250 yards to beat the Jaguars 23-7. The Ravens currently have the best record in the AFC. In Cleveland, the Bears needed a Hail Mary pass to beat the Browns and the ball fell right into a receiver's lap, but he dropped it. It was instead intercepted. And the Browns won 20 to 17. In the NBA, Steph Curry snapped a record 268 game streak last night. It was the first game since 2018 where he failed to make a three-point shot, but the Warriors still managed to beat the Blazers. Coming up, 
What's different with office Christmas parties this year? Plus, what we've learned about this vase bought cheap at a thrift store. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Reporting from the scene of the Monterey Park mass shooting, I'm Juju Chang. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Time to check the pulse. We begin with the holiday parties at the office this year. They are not what they used to be. Yeah, headline in the New York Times poses the question, did the Grinch come for the office holiday party? Corporate party planners say, yes, there's been a big shift since the pandemic. They say workers want daytime celebrations with reduced or even no alcohol. More people want to be home at night. Who would have thought? Instead of spending time with work colleagues in, quote, off hours. And younger workers are putting down the booze. The Times reports less than 40% of young Americans say they drink on a regular basis. Next, the growing number of people rewinding to a time before streaming. The last major movie released on VHS was nearly 20 years ago. But a group of people who call themselves tape heads are fueling a resurgence for the industry. More video stores are now opening and Yes, collectors are taking notice at auctions. For example, a mint, a mint condition VHS of Back to the Future recently sold for $75,000. Next, a sweet success at the box office. For Wonka, starring Timothy Chalamet as a young Willy Wonka, dominating the competition this weekend. You're the funny little man who's been following me. Funny little man. How dare you? I will have you know that I am a perfectly respectable size for an Oompa Loompa. Yes, that is Hugh Grant as an Oompa Loompa. Wonka brought in $39 million, and analysts say it's a great sign for musicals, which have really struggled recently at the box office. In fact, the studio downplayed Wonka's song and dance elements in promotions. Now to California and a substitute teacher who knows his history. That's because he's lived it. This is 95-year-old veteran Gene Arnold. When he talks about the Depression and World War II with his junior high school students, he's telling them from memory as well as textbooks. Mr. Arnold plans to keep teaching as long as he's able. I know what will happen, and that's the sad part. If I retire, I'm going to go home and sit down. I know that. I'm tired. I really am. The kids keep me going. He's tired, but he's not out yet. Mr. Arnold's principal says the kids love him. And finally, the vase that turned out to be the discovery of a lifetime. It was bought at a Goodwill thrift store. The price just four bucks. But the woman who bought it did some research and learned it was designed by a renowned Italian architect, and she just sold it at auction for $107,000. Top headlines next. 
first thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wiener Mobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Checking more top stories now. The government is fining Southwest Airlines $140 million for its operational meltdown last year, which stranded 2 million passengers over the holidays. That fine is 30 times larger than any previous fine against an airline. Authorities in Texas are searching for an escaped inmate who was serving a life sentence for abusing a child. They say Robert Yancey escaped from a prison near Houston yesterday. They haven't said how. He was last seen in a white Nissan, possibly driven by a woman. Quaker Oats has recalled some of its granola bars and its cereal because of salmonella concerns. The recall affects more than three dozen products sold across the U.S. Now, Quaker says it has not received any reports of any infections. We do have a complete list of the affected products on our website, abcnews.com. Today's weather, heavy rain and flooding along the northeast coast. More than six inches could fall in New England. Snow around the Great Lakes, rain and mountain snow for the west coast. Finally, the sisters gaining internet fame for the confession video to their late mother. They spoke to Danny New. These are some of the things that we'd like to confess to her that have happened since she died. When we remember someone who's passed on, our mom would really find what we did funny. Sometimes we are allowed to laugh. <laughs> I didn't know that I needed to get my own insurance. <laughs> This past month, nearly 25 million TikTok users learned this lesson from sisters Sarah and Katie. Car insurance. As they laughed and sometimes wheezed through the updates that they wish they could give their mom care, who passed away in the summer of 2022. I feel like you need an EMT nearby. Yeah. <laughs> Someone commented that and said it's going to be only one sister doing these if she doesn't get her wheeze checked out. <laughs> You're so nervy. They've since shared a few of these confessions, now also featuring the oldest sister, Megan. Grief is a process. And all three will tell you that one of the reasons they can laugh about this is because as soon as their mom was told that her treatments for pancreatic cancer were not working. She looked right at me and she's like, Katie, it's going to be fine. We're going to laugh through it. And that's how the three of you will get through it. I got the stomach virus so bad I miss Megan's baby shower. <laughs> And this principle is something that their mom instilled in them when their father passed away in 1999. She taught us how to deal with the grief, acknowledge it, and keep going and still be able to find the happiness and the laughter and the joy. Especially when you all share a ridiculously contagious laugh together. <laughs> And they're raising money right now for the fight against pancreatic cancer. If you want to check out CARES Crew with K's on pancan.org, guys. That laugh is contagious. I think that's why it got over 20 million views, or thanks to Danny New. That's what's making news in America this morning. Have a great day, everyone.
Right now on America This Morning, flood alerts and delays for the morning commute as we kick off the busy holiday travel week. What to expect today and the storm damage across parts of the south. Nearly a foot of rain in some areas. Motorcade scare. President Biden is rushed into an SUV after a crash in Delaware. What we're learning about the investigation. New action to address the surge of migrants crossing the U.S. border. What authorities are doing today at two border crossings. This is former President Trump's immigration rhetoric. Why critics are comparing his rhetoric to Nazi Germany. A new warning about rising flu, COVID, and RSV cases. ER visits among children have doubled in one week, what the CDC is now predicting. Plus, a two-year-old is honored for bravery after what happened to her on the playground. And later, what's so different with office holiday parties this year? From ABC News in New York, this is America This Morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm Andrew Dimberg. Good morning to you. I'm Rhiannon and Allie. We want to begin with the weather and travel delays this morning at the beginning of this busy week before Christmas. We can get the radar right now. Some of the busiest airports in the country are on alert as a storm system moves into the northeast following a weekend of heavy flooding for millions of Americans. This morning, a damaging storm barreling up the east coast is expanding, kicking off this week before Christmas with treacherous travel for millions of Americans. A widespread two to four inches of rain are expected from Delaware to the Canadian border. More than six inches could fall in parts of New England, with wind gusts up to 60 miles per hour possible along the coast. Fear, worry, anxiousness, just figuring out how we got to set up for the next storm and what time the high tides are coming. The storm already drenched Florida with tropical storm-like conditions. This video showing severe flooding in Miami. Parts of South Carolina got nearly a foot of rain, swamping Charleston. AccuWeather captured first responders rescuing drivers in historic Georgetown, South Carolina. Hundreds of flights have been delayed at airports in Atlanta, Miami, and Fort Lauderdale. Beginning this week, until January 2nd, 39 million Americans are expected to fly, with peak travel expected this Thursday and Friday. This storm already putting a damper on holiday travel plans. I'm excited, and yeah, but we're going to have to wait in long lines, but it's fine. Much colder temperatures will return after the storm. We'll check your forecast in just a few minutes. The government is fining Southwest Airlines a record $140 million for the flight cancellation meltdown over the holidays last year. That's when operational delays stranded 2 million passengers. The airline already paid out $600 million in refunds. The fine is 30 times larger than any previous fine. Southwest will also be required to issue credits for significant delays that are the airline's fault. A scare for President Biden and the First Lady. A car slammed into a vehicle in their motorcade last night. ABC's Derek Dennis reports on the investigation. Mr. President, why are you losing to Trump in the poll? President Biden was answering a reporter's question in Delaware last night when out of nowhere. Biden seemingly startled at the sound of a crash as he left a visit to his campaign headquarters and was immediately rushed into his waiting SUV. Secret Service agents surrounded the car with weapons drawn, the driver getting out with hands up. Turns out a car had hit a parked Secret Service vehicle in the rain and was left with a damaged bumper. Neither the president nor the first lady were hurt. The Secret Service says a vehicle securing the president's motorcade was struck by another vehicle. There was no protective interest associated with this event. Police say investigators are working to determine if driver impairment was a factor. Sources say it appears there was no ideological motivation behind the crash. From the video, it appears the driver cooperated with Secret Service agents, keeping his hands up. Andrew, Rhiannon. Derek, thank you. Breaking overnight, North Korea has launched its first long-range missile in about five months, and a Japanese official says the missile is likely capable of reaching anywhere in the U.S. The test missile reportedly landed in the water off Japan. North Korea also fired a shorter-range missile over the weekend. The launches are believed to be a response to increased nuclear cooperation between the U.S. and South Korea. U.S. border officials are announcing more changes today to address the migrant crisis at the southern border. The new action comes as President Trump faces scrutiny for his immigration rhetoric, which critics are comparing to the rhetoric used by Nazis in World War II. ABC's Liz Landers is here now with details. Liz, good morning. Good morning, Rhiannon. Authorities at the southern border are taking new action today because of the surge of migrants crossing into the U.S.
This morning, officials at the U.S.-Mexico border are temporarily suspending freight train crossings in El Paso and Eagle Pass, Texas, in order to redeploy resources elsewhere. It comes after authorities reportedly apprehended more than 4,000 migrants in the area yesterday alone. Temporary closures were also recently imposed at a port of entry in Arizona and at a pedestrian entrance in San Diego. Over the weekend, Senate negotiators failed to reach a deal on a framework for border security improvements, which Republicans are demanding as a condition to pass more funding for the wars in Israel and Ukraine. Republicans point to national security concerns at the southern border and the smuggling of drugs. A truck driver at a cargo facility in California just across the Mexican border was recently arrested, accused of carrying 3,000 pounds of meth and more than 500 pounds of cocaine inside packages of jalapeno paste. But Democrats say if the problem of illegal immigration was solved today, the illegal drug supply in the U.S. would be unaffected because they say the drugs mostly come through legal ports of entry. They're poisoning the blood of our country. That's what they've done. Former President Trump is facing criticism for his immigration rhetoric, speaking about, quote, blood purity, echoing Nazi slogans of World War II. Trump doubled down at a campaign event last night, saying the U.S. needs a cleanup. We will begin, and we have no choice, the largest deportation operation in American history. One of Trump's rivals in the Republican race, Chris Christie, blasted the former president. He's disgusting. And what he's doing is dog whistling to Americans who feel absolutely under stress and strain from the economy and from the conflicts around the world. As for those bipartisan talks in Washington on new border security measures, lawmakers did report progress yesterday while also downplaying any hope for a deal before the holidays. Andrew. Liz, thank you. Now to the war in the Middle East and the discovery of a massive tunnel not far from Israel's border with Gaza. It's raising even more questions about intelligence failures before the October attack by Hamas. Here's ABC's Allison Kosick. This morning, Israel's military is revealing what it describes as Hamas's largest tunnel under Gaza. Nearly two and a half miles long, large enough to drive a car through. Inside, IDF soldiers say they found weapons, even a rail system. You can see how deep this tunnel goes. This is something that would have taken years to build. The IDF saying this probably took millions of dollars. <laughs> Families of some of the Israeli hostages still held by Hamas are now camping outside Israeli military headquarters, demanding a new deal to release their loved ones. Their protests coming after Israeli forces accidentally killed three hostages Friday. A preliminary investigation found the three hostages left a building in an area of very intense fighting, carrying a stick with a white cloth. A soldier reportedly saw them as a threat and opened fire. Troops were ordered to stop firing, but another soldier shot and killed the third hostage. Investigators say the men had written these signs outside the building pleading for help, saying SOS and help three hostages written on fabric using leftover food. Meanwhile, back in the U.S., amid a surge of anti-Semitism, synagogues and Jewish facilities in at least 19 states and Washington, D.C., received bomb threats yesterday. And hundreds of so-called swatting incidents have been reported in recent days. That's when someone reports a non-existing serious crime. In Washington, D.C., a man was also arrested for spraying an unknown substance at people outside a synagogue. He's being charged with assault. Andrew Rhiannon. Allison, thank you for that. New video of a driver being rescued from a ravine in Northern California. Look at this. Officers in Sonoma County spotted the vehicle upside down about 60 miles north of San Francisco. Rescue crews in that chopper used a 100-foot line to reach the car and then airlift the driver, who is now recovering. Time now for a look at your Monday weather. An active Monday setting up. If you are going to be doing some traveling, we will be talking about wet weather along with some locally heavy rain and some gusty winds. Speaking of the winds, some of the winds can chop 50, 60, even close to 65 miles per hour right along the coast. And that could lead to some difficult travel and some power outages. Then comes the snow, especially off the Great Lakes into the higher terrain of western Maryland and eastern West Virginia. I'm AccuWeather's meteorologist Justin Povick.
Coming up, the train collision caught on camera in Texas. Also ahead, a top Republican Party official faces punishment after being accused of sexual assault. And a two-year-old girl is honored for her bravery after finding a gun at a playground. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Yeah! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions, their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. We are back now with an 18-wheeler demolished by a freight train near Fort Worth, Texas. Investigators say the truck got stuck at that crossing. The crash caused 17 of the train cars and two of its engines to derail. The conductor suffered minor injuries. The chairman of the Republican Party of Florida has been censured and stripped of his authority and salary as he faces a rape allegation. Party leaders say Christian Ziegler is unfit for office. He's accused of sexually assaulting a woman after their alleged threesome with his wife was canceled. Governor Ron DeSantis is among those calling for Ziegler to resign. A pro basketball player is facing murder charges in Las Vegas. Chance Comanche and his girlfriend are accused of kidnapping and killing Marina Rogers. She was reported missing two weeks ago. Her body was found in a desert area, and Comanche most recently played for the Stockton Kings and the G League, and previously played for the Portland Trailblazers in the NBA. No word on a motive in the case. A new warning about a surge in respiratory illnesses ahead of the holidays. The CDC says 17 states and New York City are seeing high or very high levels of COVID, flu, and RSV. The agency says hospitalizations are up, which could force hospitals to ration care by the end of the month. RSV appears to be peaking in some parts of the country, but we are still seeing a lot of cases. Influenza, like it usually does, is running wild, and COVID-19 hospitalizations have been up for the past five weeks. CDC figures show ER visits for children doubled last week. Health officials urge anyone who's sick to stay home. Police in Las Vegas are celebrating the recovery of a toddler six weeks after she accidentally shot herself. The two-year-old was presented with an award for her bravery. A suspect had ditched a loaded gun in the playground of her daycare, and the gun went off after she picked it up, leaving her in critical condition. To be uh, that resilient and, and really running around after that incident happened, it just shows you uh, how tough these kids can be. And she just has that survivor spirit and, and thoughts and prayers to her and her family. She is incredible. Police say the fire department and other agencies have joined them in symbolically adopting the girl. Coming up, get your VCR ready. The new craze surrounding VHS tapes. But first, not one, not two, three rare pregnancies, all at the same hospital. The bond now shared by these three moms. 
whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yeah. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. We're back with questions surrounding who is driving this Ferrari registered to actor Michael B. Jordan. Video captured the car sideswiping a parked vehicle recently in Hollywood. Neither police nor Jordan's representatives have said who was driving, but that person right now is not facing any charges. We turn now to North Carolina and three women who now share an incredible close bond. They went through rare pregnancies, all of them at the same hospital. It's one of the rarest pregnancy conditions a mother can have, monoamniotic twins, identical twins sharing the same amniotic sac. The pregnancy is risky, and it requires hospitalization at 26 weeks with around-the-clock monitoring. It was really hard to kind of swallow the fact that, you know, this is not going to be anything what I imagined it to be. Monoamniotic twins occur in only 1 in 8,000 pregnancies. But just a few weeks after Summer Morrison was admitted to a hospital outside of Charlotte, North Carolina, another woman, Kiara Davis, was admitted with the same rare pregnancy. I tried to give her, you know, some of the things I wish I knew when I got there. That was really helpful because I was like, Ooh, I, it's finally somebody that's going through the same thing that I'm going through. Two moms being treated on the same floor for a condition that occurs in less than 0.1% of all pregnancies. I think we just learned like how nice it is to have that, you know, little village. And just knowing, like, we weren't doing this alone. Summer gave birth to two healthy twin girls. And remarkably, just a few days later, a third woman, Vakoya Miller, was admitted with the same type of pregnancy. They told me that there were actually two other moms that were having the same twins that I were. All three women treated at the same hospital, all three giving birth to daughters, six little girls who are now thriving. It's just like a bond you can't make up. It's just... Just awesome. Just awesome. Six adorable babies. And later on Good Morning America, the women discuss their new bond and what they've learned from each other. In sports, the Baltimore Ravens clinched a playoff spot last night thanks to MVP-style plays like this one from Lamar Jackson. The Ravens ran for more than 250 yards to beat the Jaguars 23-7. The Ravens currently have the best record in the AFC. In Cleveland, the Bears needed a Hail Mary pass to beat the Browns, and the ball fell right into a receiver's lap, but he dropped it. It was instead intercepted. And the Browns won 20-17. to 17. In the NBA, Steph Curry snapped a record 268-game streak last night. It was the first game since 2018 where he failed to make a three-point shot, but the Warriors still managed to beat the Blazers. Coming up, 
What's different with office Christmas parties this year? Plus, what we've learned about this vase bought cheap at a thrift store. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Hi. 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 Yes. Hi. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Welcome to Crufts, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. <laughs> dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner. Oh, Crufts 2023. The secret life of dancing dogs. Now streaming on Hulu. <laughs> Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. Reporting from Boston, I'm Whit Johnson. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Time to check the pulse. We begin with the holiday parties at the office this year. They are not what they used to be. Yeah, headline in the New York Times poses the question, did the Grinch come for the office holiday party? Corporate party planners say, yes, there's been a big shift since the pandemic. They say workers want daytime celebrations with reduced or even no alcohol. More people want to be home at night. Who would have thought? Instead of spending time with work colleagues and quote, off hours. And younger workers are putting down the booze. The Times reports less than 40% of young Americans say they drink on a regular basis. Next, the growing number of people rewinding to a time before streaming. The last major movie released on VHS was nearly 20 years ago. But a group of people who call themselves tape heads are fueling a resurgence for the industry. More video stores are now opening and Yes, collectors are taking notice at auctions. For example, a mint, a mint condition VHS of Back to the Future recently sold for $75,000. Next, a sweet success at the box office. For Wonka, starring Timothy Chalamet as a young Willy Wonka, dominating the competition this weekend. You're the funny little man who's been following me. Funny little man. How dare you? I will have you know that I am a perfectly respectable size for an Oompa Loompa. Yes, that is Hugh Grant as an Oompa Loompa. Wonka brought in $39 million, and the analysts say it's a great sign for musicals, which have really struggled recently at the box office. In fact, the studio downplayed Wonka's song and dance elements in promotions. Now to California and a substitute teacher who knows his history. That's because he's lived it. This is 95-year-old veteran Gene Arnold. When he talks about the Depression and World War II with his junior high school students, he's telling them from memory as well as textbooks. Mr. Arnold plans to keep teaching as long as he's able. I know what will happen, and that's the sad part. If I retire, I'm going to go home and sit down. I know that. I'm tired. I really am. The kids keep me going. He's tired, but he's not out yet. Mr. Arnold's principal says the kids love him. And finally, the vase that turned out to be the discovery of a lifetime. It was bought at a Goodwill thrift store. The price, just four bucks. But the woman who bought it did some research and learned it was designed by a renowned Italian architect, and she just sold it at auction for $107,000. Top headlines next.
This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. We have really good news. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions, their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Checking more top stories now. The government is fining Southwest Airlines $140 million for its operational meltdown last year, which stranded 2 million passengers over the holidays. That fine is 30 times larger than any previous fine against an airline. Authorities in Texas are searching for an escaped inmate who was serving a life sentence for abusing a child. They say Robert Yancey escaped from a prison near Houston yesterday. They haven't said how. He was last seen in a white Nissan, possibly driven by a woman. Quaker Oats has recalled some of its granola bars and its cereal because of salmonella concerns. The recall affects more than three dozen products sold across the U.S. Now, Quaker says it has not received any reports of any infections. We do have a complete list of the affected products on our website, abcnews.com. Today's weather, heavy rain and flooding along the northeast coast. More than six inches could fall in New England. Snow around the Great Lakes, rain and mountain snow for the west coast. Finally, the sisters gaining internet fame for the confession video to their late mother. They spoke to Danny New. These are some of the things that we'd like to confess to her that have happened since she died. When we remember someone who's passed on, our mom would really find what we did funny. Sometimes we are allowed to laugh. <laughs> I didn't know that I needed to get my own insurance. <laughs> this past month, nearly 25 million TikTok <laughs> users learned this lesson from sisters Sarah and Katie. Car insurance. <laughs> as they laughed and sometimes wheezed through the updates that they wish they could give their mom care, who passed away in the summer of 2022. I feel like you need an EMT nearby. <laughs> <laughs> Someone commented that and said it's going to be only one sister doing these if she doesn't get her wheeze checked out. <laughs> You're so nervy. <laughs> They've since shared a few of these confessions, now also featuring the oldest sister, Megan. Grief is a process. And all three will tell you that one of the reasons they can laugh about this is because as soon as their mom was told that her treatments for pancreatic cancer were not working. She looked right at me and she's like, Katie, it's going to be fine. We're going to laugh through it. And that's how the three of you will get through it. I got the stomach virus so bad I miss Megan's baby shower. <laughs> And this principle is something that their mom instilled in them when their father passed away in 1999. She taught us how to deal with the grief, acknowledge it, and keep going and still be able to find the happiness and the laughter and the joy. Especially when you all share a ridiculously contagious laugh together. <laughs> And they're raising money right now for the fight against pancreatic cancer. If you want to check out CARES Crew with K's on pancam.org, guys. That laugh is contagious. I think that's why it got over 20 million views, or thanks to Danny New. That's what's making news in America this morning. Have a great day, everyone.
It's Monday, December 18th. Part of their mission was to rescue hostages, so why did they gun some of them down in the street? We start here. Israel admits it opened fire on Israeli hostages who were waving a white flag. He reportedly shouted help in Hebrew. As outrage spreads, Palestinians say welcome to what really happens in these raids. Rudy Giuliani loses his case and every dollar to his name. The absurdity of the number merely underscores the absurdity of the entire proceeding. But what does this mean for his former top client? And the autopsy for Matthew Perry shows he had drugs in his system as he died. We do see recreational use of ketamine. That is an unfortunate effect of ketamine's existence. But this was the same type of drug that was being used to treat him. From ABC News, this is Start Here. I'm Brad Milkey. About three quarters of the way up the Gaza Strip, in the northern half of the territory, is Gaza City. Usually, this is the most populous city in the region. But, of course, Israel's airstrikes have decimated it so much that many civilians have moved south. Israel started moving into this area with ground troops. They encircled Gaza City to hunt down Hamas and hopefully rescue hostages that had been kidnapped on October 7th. We saw that until we started the ground action, there was no pressure on them to release hostages. In fact, the thinking in Israel was, this could allow us to be more precise with military action. Up close, our soldiers can differentiate between members of terror groups and civilians. Mistakes will happen. Once they happened, we came out. Not a lot of militaries do that. Well, on Friday, we got word Israeli troops had opened up fire in Gaza City. It appeared that troops had shot directly at people carrying a white flag and those people turned out to be some of the very hostages they were trying to save. Over the last 48 hours, the outrage has only grown inside and outside Israel. So let's take you there right now. ABC's foreign correspondent, Britt Klenet, is in Tel Aviv. Britt, what, what happened here? Well, I think it's safe to say that it really is as shocking as it sounds. You know, these details coming in from the IDF. They say three hostages came out of a building at less than 100 yards from the troops. Uh, they weren't wearing T-shirts. Uh, they were waving a white cloth attached to a stick. Uh, two were killed, a third injured. Now, the third who was injured, he ran into a building and he reportedly shouted help in Hebrew, but he was also somehow shot and killed. <laughs> Those details have really hit hard with the Israeli public. They are angry, they are upset, they are marching through the very middle of the city in the middle of the night. But especially the hostage families. 71 days, they need to come home now, Aksha. I was there the day that they got that news. I spoke to a hostage a family member. Tell me how you feel. Terrible, terrible. It's the worst news we got since October 7th. The hostage families from the very beginning of this war, Brad, from October 7th, they have been saying, do not go into Gaza until our family members, our loved ones, are released. And now look what's happened. Uh, we demand the government to stand behind its words that it values life on top of all um, and, and go forward with the negotiation, even if it's not in the perfect terms, because as we see, we're losing hostages. This is their worst fears combined. Yeah, and that question that he asked, how does this happen? I mean, is there an answer to that? I mean, what, what are the procedures, the protocols in place? So I spoke to an IDF official very quickly after they made the announcement of these three hostages um, mm -hmm. being accidentally killed by the IDF. At the end of the day, it is something that sadly can be expected of such a chaotic battlefield where the enemy constantly and systematically uses civilian clothing while they are fighting. It's a dynamic environment, he said. Um, so it's very hard to rule out things like this happening. They were in combat minutes before, then they saw a group of men approaching, which they perceived mistakenly to be a threat. I said, does this give you pause for thought? And he said, no, no matter what happens, we are pushing on. That maybe it's time to switch gears. Maybe it's time to rein it in. We are going to continue with the mission here. And uh, for us, there is no such luxury as to 
stop and think and pause and ponder after each event on the ground. He said it's no time to pause and ponder. We just don't have the time. We have a task at hand. Well, and it makes me wonder, Britt, because, like, let's be honest, is it more likely that this has only happened once and it just happened to be with a bunch of Israeli hostages? Or is it more likely that this happens all the time, it just happens with Palestinian civilians that, that are just as innocent, just as desperate to not get killed, and yet troops are perhaps so trigger-happy that people do get gunned down? I mean, is, does this shed light, I guess, on how Israeli troops are reacting with their rules of engagement? I think that's the worry, right? We are perhaps seeing some kind of breakdown in discipline in the ranks of the IDF. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not entitled by any means to shoot unarmed human beings waving a white flag, even if they are scared. And I think that's what it really comes down to. If they are doing that, uh, you know, we also know that they could be violating other rules. You know, we just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> We're seeing all these videos, not all of them verified, of IDF videotaping sing-alongs with their friends, looting bicycles, going into stores, you know, spray painting people's houses. It's just not a good look. And I think what it does is underscore why Palestinians, as you say, are so utterly terrified, Brad. Right, and the IDF says they're still investigating the shooting in Gaza, but they do say they've already disciplined other soldiers for violating their code of conduct, including some soldiers that went into a mosque and sang Hanukkah songs last week as if to antagonize the worshippers there. All right, Britt Clement, there in Israel. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brad. Next time on Start Here, he accused them of fraud. Now he'll spend the rest of his life paying for his. We're back after the break. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. National forests are good places to get away. But sometimes bad things happen in good places. It's the stuff of nightmares. All I could see was their feet sticking up. My knees went weak. This is a human skull. We were definitely against the clock. How many more victims are out there? Wild Crime, Blood Mountain. Now streaming only on Hulu. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me.
For the last three years, former President Donald Trump has falsely claimed that the 2020 election was stolen. They cheated and they rigged our presidential election. His key allies have given interviews proclaiming voting machines as rigged. Not only was that wrong, it resulted in a settlement that could devastate the bottom line at Fox News. They are engaged in surreptitious illegal activity. Trump's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, gave press conferences calling Georgia election officials corrupt by name. Well, now he's on the hook, too, for an eye-popping amount of money. The verdict we had been waiting for came in on Friday, and ABC senior national correspondent Terry Moran was covering this civil trial in D.C. Terry, what did the jury find here? Well, they walloped him, I think is the, the legal term. Uh, it, it, I've never seen a verdict of that size, and I've seen some $100 million verdicts. And the moment in the courtroom I was there, Giuliani was staring right at the jury when the verdict came down, didn't flinch, but then quickly looked down. The plaintiff's table, the plaintiff's Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss, the two Georgia election workers, they looked around smiling and shocked. It was a shocking moment. The absurdity of the number merely underscores the absurdity of the entire proceeding where I've not been allowed to offer one single piece of evidence in defense. A jury stood witness to what Rudy Giuliani did to me and my daughter and held him accountable, and for that I'm thankful. Because what the jury did was on the compensatory damages to compensate the women for what had happened to them. They awarded a total of about $33 million, roughly split between the two women. The flame that Giuliani lit with those lies and passed to so many others to keep that flame blazing changed every aspect of our lives. And then for the intentional infliction of emotional distress, each woman was awarded $20 million. And then for punitive damages, the jury gets to say, you know, this is outrageous and this is what we think we need to send a message about. And here's the message. $75 million for a grand total of $148 million. Just a, a really staggering verdict, not just in terms of the money, but in terms of the emotion behind it, the emotion in that courtroom and clearly the emotion of, of the jury uh, that they wanted to send a message that this can't stand. That's clearly what they were saying. Well, just because it, this, these were clearly lies and clearly egregious ones? Yes. In fact, that was stipulated to by Rudy Giuliani that he had made false statements about Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss, but his argument on appeal will be they were constitutionally protected speech because they were made in the context of presidential election. Good luck with that. When this case gets before a fair tribunal, it'll be reversed so quickly it'll make your head spin. What was really staggering was that the plaintiff's lawyer had asked for $43 million uh, in the opening statements. Oh, wow. And the, D Giuliani's lawyer in opening statements had said, oh, if you, if you do that, if you award $43 million, that is the civil equivalent of the death penalty for Rudy Giuliani. And they ordered $148 million. So, Terry, is that the dollar amount he's going to have to pay? That, like, Is all of Rudy Giuliani's wealth essentially transferred over to these election workers? What happens here? As of now, he has a legal obligation. That's what that verdict is, to pay $148 million to Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss. Now, he's, he's basically broke. The IRS is after him for half a million dollars. He had to set, put his condo on the market. He said he doesn't have any money. But he wouldn't share the financial details where his accounts are, where his money is. And that's one of the reasons that he lost the case. But now comes the hard part, collecting from Rudy Giuliani. I think what we're going to see from Rudy Giuliani is he's going to file for bankruptcy and try to see if that Chapter 13 bankruptcy can protect his assets. Like he's a lot of plaintiffs who get an award against a defendant who can't pay it all, they'll need a lawyer or a collection agency, and they do have options. Because this is a legal obligation of Rudy Giuliani's, any wages, any income he gets, can a portion of it be taken from him, They're, you know, be uh, garnished? They can garnish his wages. They can levy his bank accounts. A portion of any funds in his bank accounts can be taken to pay this legal obligation. Uh, they can put liens on his property. I don't know if that property is sold, but anything he does sell, a portion of it can go to them. So they won't see $148 million, and that verdict may be reduced on appeal. Some lawyers think it's likely that it will be, but he will always have to pay them money for the rest of his life. And lastly, Terry, I mean, does this give a hint about how juries will see other cases involving Donald Trump or his associates, like either in Georgia where this was happening or in D.C. or elsewhere, I guess? 
You know, so, so that's a great question, because what the jury heard that Giuliani did was not only outrageous, but kind of reckless. There's a recklessness in the air in America right now. Do you regret no. what you did to Sh Ruby Of course Sanders? I don't regret I told the truth. They, they were engaged in changing votes. There's no proof of that. Oh, you're damn right there is. And that is really part and parcel of what of what Giuliani and Trump and in some ways the whole MAGA movement is about. It doesn't matter what the facts are. If you say it with enough contempt and, and enough gumption and enough spit-in-your-face defiance, you can make it true in the electorate. You can make it true in, in the media that you like. Mm. In court, it's a different matter. There are rules of evidence developed over centuries to get at the facts of things. And that helps juries come to these results. You know, Giuliani was complaining about the jury and all that stuff. The facts that were laid out before the jury, the facts that were admitted to by Rudy Giuliani, would be agreed to by juries around the country. It's the legal process where Trump, in many of his, his ways of approaching things, runs into a brick wall. Yeah, I was going to say, even in New York, in Trump's civil trial, there's no jury hearing the case, but despite Trump coming out of court every day and saying this is bogus, a judge has already declared that in this case, Trump did lie. The question is just, what will the lies cost him? Uh, Terry Moran, thanks very much. Thanks, Brad. Matthew Perry died in late October. The actor known for his role on Friends was found unresponsive in his hot tub. And while the cause of his death was unknown, his past experiences with drug abuse made lots of fans wonder if this might have been addiction related. Well, now the autopsy results are out. And while the report did not find traces of cocaine or heroin or fentanyl in his system, it did find ketamine. In fact, it reveals that Perry was undergoing ketamine therapy in the weeks ahead of his death. So with that, let's go to ABC's medical correspondent, Dr. Darian Sutton. Dr. Sutton, I mean, first of all, what is ketamine? Could you just give us like the rundown on, on what it is? And secondly, what role did it play in his death? Well, it's difficult to say the exact role, but the report has some important information in it, specifically regarding the level of ketamine found within his body. Uh, ketamine is a dissociative anesthetic, historically has been used for pain, medication, and even anesthesia within the operating room. And in the emergency room, I've used it clinically for patients in the treatment for procedures. Well, in this case, what, we, what we're seeing in this report is that the levels of ketamine within Matthew Perry's body were so high, they were at the levels that are considered anesthesia levels which would be levels required to be monitored under a clinical environment because of the effects of ketamine. There were also other contributing factors that were listed. Uh, for one, he had a history of coronary artery disease, very common within adults at that age. Also, he was using another medication called buprenorphine, which is a medication used for opiate use disorder. Although these uh, other contributing factors can increase someone's risk of harm if they're not controlled tightly, um, the association of this with his death is not what is assumed at this time. I see, which makes it sound then like you could have an overdose of ketamine or be affected by ketamine and then drown in your pool or drown in your hot tub, which is kind of what, what they're making it sound like happened here. Is that how we should think of this all as sort of going down? Well, ketamine has a variable effect on the body depending on the dose. At lower doses, you can see treatment for pain. At moderate doses, you can see sedation or disassociation, which is kind of when patients have an absence-like effect. They appear awake, but they're not fully conscious. And then at higher doses, that's when you step into the world of danger. Uh, at higher doses, ketamine can cause sedation and decrease your respiratory rate so low that it can cause your body not to get enough oxygen and increase your risk of death. Uh, the risk is that if you use this medication or substance, since it causes you to be sedated in a way where you're not paying attention, you can drown. And so that's where that risk lies. So where did it come from? That Did it come from his therapeutic use or from elsewhere? The half-life of ketamine is relatively short. It's about two to four hours. So if you see doses that are that high, the use of ketamine must have been in a close proximity in terms of time to when the effect happened or the death happened. We also know in the report that Matthew Perry was getting treatment for treatment-resistant depression with ketamine, and the last use was around more than 10 days prior to his death. The effects of ketamine and the half-life of ketamine are so short, it would be unlikely that that event or those two events are connected. Oh, that seems important to know, because th 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 this wouldn't necessarily be from the ketamine therapies. Because I can imagine someone who's considering psychiatric treatment, a doctor mentions it, and you go, oh, I don't want, like, I don't want that. I heard about Matthew Perry, but these aren't necessarily the same thing. 
These are not necessarily the same thing. It is relatively uncommon to see a fatality or a death associated with ketamine. Often, the deaths of ketamine are either A, if it's used at extremely high doses, or B, more commonly, when ketamine is used with other substances. Well, ketamine historically has been used for the treatment of pain and anesthesia, and ketamine has been a part of incredible advancements in the world of psychiatry and psychology in terms of treatment-resistant depression. We've seen many success stories of patients who have uh, gotten ketamine treatments under close observation uh, from their providers and had wonderful outcomes. And so, yes, we do see recreational use of ketamine. That is an unfortunate effect of ketamine's existence. But overall, we've seen incredible benefits of ketamine in terms of clinical management of depression. Yeah, of course, for, for the people in these research projects that have said, this basically saved my life. Now you've got this beloved actor who was apparently using it at the time of his death. We'll see what happens here. Dr. Darian Sutton, ABC Medical Correspondent. Thank you so much. Of course. Okay, one more quick break. When we come back, you don't even need a chimney to make these Christmas wishes come true. One last thing is next. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Welcome to Crufts, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. <laughs> dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner of Crufts 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. <laughs> All across the globe, the world will be celebrating the new year. And you can see it as it happens live. The global celebrations. See the new year as it comes in live. Streaming all day and night on ABC News Live. Reporting from the aftermath of the Maui fires, I'm Melissa Adan. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. And one last thing. If you know someone with an advent calendar, they can tell you, as of today, we are T-minus one week to Christmas morning. But if you want to be Santa's official helper, <laughs> you got until the end of the day. So for the last hundred years, the U.S. Postal Service has been running a program to help with Santa's letter load. He gets lots of mail directed to him at his official address at the North Pole. The zip code there, by the way, is 88888, like five snowmen in a row, if you're wondering. But pretty much anything marked Santa will find its way there. I'm an elf working at the North Pole. I'm processing letters that kids write into Santa. A few years ago, this documentary called Dear Santa tracked some of these letters on their way up north. 
This program called Operation Santa used to be limited to local postmasters who were given the authority to answer some letters on Santa's behalf. More recently, it's been open to the public and the start of the pandemic moved the entire operation online. So now on the postal office website, letters are posted, their identifying information redacted so that they can be adopted by anyone who wants to lend a hand. And while some people just respond to the letters, that deadline passed last week, you can also adopt a wish list. Have you asked Santa for presents this year? I'm asking for a makeup and nail kit, a hover ball. This is Jocelyn yeah. Tchaikovsky. She's seven years old. She's from Pennsylvania. A hover what? Ball. What is that? It's where you can like throw a ball and it will float up in the air and come back to you. Now, she did not mail her list to Santa. She did it the old-fashioned way and just wished it out loud. But this just reminds you how specific kids' wish lists are. Here's one from Isaac in Utah. He writes, quote, Dear Santa, my Christmas list is an Xbox Series S, the game Horizon 2, and a super tall water slide. Emmanuel in Missouri said I would like an Xbox and my own bedroom. The idea is that people from around the country can click on these letters, get the exclusive rights to them, and then send these families whatever they don't think Santa will be able to swing. The deadline to take on these requests, though, is today. Now, what's weird is as you click through all these letters, Almost all of them seem to ask for iPhones, computers, gaming consoles. Some kids want these things, of course, but could some of these just be coming from adults who want free stuff? A few years ago, some postal workers were busted for submitting their own letters to the program, but the Postal Service says no one should feel pressure to send expensive gifts. A response from Santa, they say, or the donation of a special skill is a win. Plus, if you ask two-year-old James Dow Cortivo from New Jersey... Santa, when are you cars? Toy cars will always do the trick. Keep it simple, Santa. Merry Christmas. The letters I really believe are the ones like this. Noah in Wisconsin says he wants a Nintendo Switch. You're like, oh, that's pretty expensive. But also, quote, Nike gold shoes, a gold safe, and shorts. Just shorts. Like, they're all treated equally here. Plus, if you have a middle schooler, you are aware of how monstrous some of their requests can be. I was just looking at a 13-year-old girl's list. Some of the beauty products are ones that I bought for my wife. Like, that's her big present for the year, so I hope you appreciate what you're asking for your Tiffany. More on all these stories at abcnews.com or the ABC News app. I'm Brad Milkey. See you tomorrow. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Welcome to Crufts, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. <laughs> dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner. Oh, Crufts 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs. Now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. Live, America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7 straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. 
Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting in Moscow, Idaho, I'm Kana Whitworth. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Right now on America This Morning, flood alerts and delays for the morning commute as we kick off the busy holiday travel week. What to expect today and the storm damage across parts of the south. Nearly a foot of rain in some areas. Motorcade scare. President Biden is rushed into an SUV after a crash in Delaware. What we're learning about the investigation. New action to address the surge of migrants crossing the U.S. border. What authorities are doing today at two border crossings. This is former President Trump's immigration rhetoric. Why critics are comparing his rhetoric to Nazi Germany. A new warning about rising flu, COVID, and RSV cases. ER visits among children have doubled in one week, what the CDC is now predicting. Plus, a two-year-old is honored for bravery after what happened to her on the playground. And later, what's so different with office holiday parties this year? From ABC News in New York, this is America This Morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm Andrew Dimberg. Good morning to you. I'm Rhiannon and Allie. We want to begin with the weather and travel delays this morning at the beginning of this busy week before Christmas. Looking at the radar right now, some of the busiest airports in the country are on alert as a storm system moves into the northeast following a weekend of heavy flooding for millions of Americans. This morning, a damaging storm barreling up the east coast is expanding, kicking off this week before Christmas with treacherous travel for millions of Americans. A widespread two to four inches of rain are expected from Delaware to the Canadian border. More than six inches could fall in parts of New England, with wind gusts up to 60 miles per hour possible along the coast. Fear, worry, anxiousness, just figuring out how we got to set up for the next storm and what time the high tides are coming. The storm already drenched Florida with tropical storm-like conditions. This video showing severe flooding in Miami. Parts of South Carolina got nearly a foot of rain, swamping Charleston. AccuWeather captured first responders rescuing drivers in historic Georgetown, South Carolina. Hundreds of flights have been delayed at airports in Atlanta, Miami, and Fort Lauderdale. Beginning this week, until January 2nd, 39 million Americans are expected to fly, with peak travel expected this Thursday and Friday. This storm already putting a damper on holiday travel plans. I'm excited, and yeah, but we're going to have to wait in long lines, but it's fine. Much colder temperatures will return after the storm. We'll check your forecast in just a few minutes. The government is fining Southwest Airlines a record $140 million for the flight cancellation meltdown over the holidays last year. That's when operational delays stranded 2 million passengers. The airline already paid out $600 million in refunds. The fine is 30 times larger than any previous fine. Southwest will also be required to issue credits for significant delays that are the airline's fault. A scare for President Biden and the First Lady. A car slammed into a vehicle in their motorcade last night. ABC's Derek Dennis reports on the investigation. Mr. President, why are you losing to Trump in the poll? President Biden was answering a reporter's question in Delaware last night when out of nowhere. Biden seemingly startled at the sound of a crash as he left to visit to his campaign headquarters and was immediately rushed into his waiting SUV. 
Secret Service agents surrounded the car with weapons drawn, the driver getting out with hands up. Turns out a car had hit a parked Secret Service vehicle in the rain and was left with a damaged bumper. Neither the president nor the first lady were hurt. The Secret Service says a vehicle securing the president's motorcade was struck by another vehicle. There was no protective interest associated with this event. Police say investigators are working to determine if driver impairment was a factor. Sources say it appears there was no ideological motivation behind the crash. From the video, it appears the driver cooperated with Secret Service agents, keeping his hands up. Andrew, Rhiannon. Derek, thank you. Breaking overnight, North Korea has launched its first long-range missile in about five months, and a Japanese official says the missile is likely capable of reaching anywhere in the U.S. The test missile reportedly landed in the water off Japan. North Korea also fired a shorter-range missile over the weekend. The launches are believed to be a response to increased nuclear cooperation between the U.S. and South Korea. U.S. border officials are announcing more changes today to address the migrant crisis at the southern border. The new action comes as President Trump faces scrutiny for his immigration rhetoric, which critics are comparing to the rhetoric used by Nazis in World War II. ABC's Liz Landers is here now with details. Liz, good morning. Good morning, Rhiannon. Authorities at the southern border are taking new action today because of the surge of migrants crossing into the U.S. This morning, officials at the U.S.-Mexico border are temporarily suspending freight train crossings in El Paso and Eagle Pass, Texas, in order to redeploy resources elsewhere. It comes after authorities reportedly apprehended more than 4,000 migrants in the area yesterday alone. Temporary closures were also recently imposed at a port of entry in Arizona and at a pedestrian entrance in San Diego. Over the weekend, Senate negotiators failed to reach a deal on a framework for border security improvements, which Republicans are demanding as a condition to pass more funding for the wars in Israel and Ukraine. Republicans point to national security concerns at the southern border and the smuggling of drugs. A truck driver at a cargo facility in California just across the Mexican border was recently arrested, accused of carrying 3,000 pounds of meth and more than 500 pounds of cocaine inside packages of jalapeno paste. But Democrats say if the problem of illegal immigration was solved today, the illegal drug supply in the U.S. would be unaffected because they say the drugs mostly come through legal ports of entry. They're poisoning the blood of our country. That's what they've done. Former President Trump is facing criticism for his immigration rhetoric, speaking about, quote, blood purity, echoing Nazi slogans of World War II. Trump doubled down at a campaign event last night, saying the U.S. needs a cleanup. We will begin, and we have no choice, the largest deportation operation in American history. One of Trump's rivals in the Republican race, Chris Christie, blasted the former president. He's disgusting. And what he's doing is dog whistling to Americans who feel absolutely under stress and strain from the economy and from the conflicts around the world. As for those bipartisan talks in Washington on new border security measures, lawmakers did report progress yesterday while also downplaying any hope for a deal before the holidays. Andrew. Liz, thank you. Now to the war in the Middle East and the discovery of a massive tunnel not far from Israel's border with Gaza. It's raising even more questions about intelligence failures before the October attack by Hamas. Here's ABC's Allison Kosick. This morning, Israel's military is revealing what it describes as Hamas's largest tunnel under Gaza. Nearly two and a half miles long, large enough to drive a car through. Inside, IDF soldiers say they found weapons, even a rail system. You can see how deep this tunnel goes. This is something that would have taken years to build. The IDF saying this probably took millions of dollars. <laughs> Families of some of the Israeli hostages still held by Hamas are now camping outside Israeli military headquarters, demanding a new deal to release their loved ones. Their protests coming after Israeli forces accidentally killed three hostages Friday. A preliminary investigation found the three hostages left a building in in an area of very intense fighting, carrying a stick with a white cloth. A soldier reportedly saw them as a threat and opened fire. Troops were ordered to stop firing, but another soldier shot and killed the third hostage. 
Investigators say the men had written these signs outside the building pleading for help, saying SOS and help three hostages written on fabric using leftover food. Meanwhile, back in the U.S., amid a surge of anti-Semitism, synagogues and Jewish facilities in at least 19 states and Washington, D.C., received bomb threats yesterday. And hundreds of so-called swatting incidents have been reported in recent days. That's when someone reports a non-existing serious crime. In Washington, D.C., a man was also arrested for spraying an unknown substance at people outside a synagogue. He's being charged with assault. Andrew, Rhiannon. Allison, thank you for that. New video of a driver being rescued from a ravine in Northern California. Look at this. Officers in Sonoma County spotted the vehicle upside down about 60 miles north of San Francisco. Rescue crews in that chopper used a 100-foot line to reach the car and then airlift the driver, who is now recovering. Time now for a look at your Monday weather. An active Monday setting up. If you are going to be doing some traveling, we will be talking about wet weather along with some locally heavy rain and some gusty winds. Speaking of the winds, some of the winds can chop 50, 60, even close to 65 miles per hour right along the coast. And that could lead to some difficult travel and some power outages. Then comes the snow, especially off the Great Lakes into the higher terrain of western Maryland and eastern West Virginia. I'm AccuWeather's meteorologist Justin Pavic. Coming up, the train collision caught on camera in Texas. Also ahead, a top Republican Party official faces punishment after being accused of sexual assault. And a two-year-old girl is honored for her bravery after finding a gun at a playground. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions. Their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. We're back now with an 18-wheeler demolished by a freight train near Fort Worth, Texas. Investigators say the truck got stuck at that crossing. The crash caused 17 of the train cars and two of its engines to derail. The conductor suffered minor injuries. The chairman of the Republican Party of Florida has been censured and stripped of his authority and salary as he faces a rape allegation. Party leaders say Christian Ziegler is unfit for office. He's accused of sexually assaulting a woman after their alleged threesome with his wife was canceled. Governor Ron DeSantis is among those calling for Ziegler to resign. 
A pro basketball player is facing murder charges in Las Vegas. Chance Comanche and his girlfriend are accused of kidnapping and killing Marina Rogers. She was reported missing two weeks ago. Her body was found in a desert area, and Comanche most recently played for the Stockton Kings and the G League, and previously played for the Portland Trailblazers in the NBA. No word on a motive in the case. A new warning about a surge in respiratory illnesses ahead of the holidays. The CDC says 17 states and New York City are seeing high or very high levels of COVID, flu, and RSV. The agency says hospitalizations are up, which could force hospitals to ration care by the end of the month. RSV appears to be peaking in some parts of the country, but we are still seeing a lot of cases. Influenza, like it usually does, is running wild. And COVID-19 hospitalizations have been up for the past five weeks. CDC figures show ER visits for children doubled last week. Health officials urge anyone who's sick to stay home. Police in Las Vegas are celebrating the recovery of a toddler six weeks after she accidentally shot herself. The two-year-old was presented with an award for her bravery. A suspect had ditched a loaded gun in the playground of her daycare, and the gun went off after she picked it up, leaving her in critical condition. To be uh, that resilient and, and really running around after that incident happened, it just shows you uh, how tough these kids can be. And she just has that survivor spirit and, and thoughts and prayers to her and her family. She is incredible. Police say the fire department and other agencies have joined them in symbolically adopting the girl. Coming up, get your VCR ready. The new craze surrounding VHS tapes. But first, not one, not two, three rare pregnancies, all at the same hospital. The bond now shared by these three moms. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Yeah with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live, streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. What You Need to Know, a third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love that. Me. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. We're back with questions surrounding who is driving this Ferrari registered to actor Michael B. Jordan. Video captured the car sideswiping a parked vehicle recently in Hollywood. Neither police nor Jordan's representatives have said who was driving, but that person right now is not facing any charges. We turn now to North Carolina and three women who now share an incredible close bond. They went through rare pregnancies, all of them at the same hospital. It's one of the rarest pregnancy conditions a mother can have. Monoamniotic twins, identical twins sharing the same amniotic sac. The pregnancy is risky and it requires hospitalization at 26 weeks with around the clock monitoring. It was really hard to kind of swallow the fact that, you know, 
This is not going to be anything what I imagined it to be. Monoamniotic twins occur in only one in 8,000 pregnancies. But just a few weeks after Summer Morrison was admitted to a hospital outside of Charlotte, North Carolina, another woman, Kiara Davis, was admitted with the same rare pregnancy. I tried to give her, you know, some of the things I wish I knew when I got there. That was really helpful because I was like, whew, uh, it's finally somebody that's going through the same thing that I'm going through. Two moms being treated on the same floor for a condition that occurs in less than 0.1% of all pregnancies. I think we just learned like how nice it is to have that you know, little village. And just knowing like we weren't doing this alone. Summer gave birth to two healthy twin girls. And remarkably, just a few days later, a third woman, Vakoya Miller, was admitted with the same type of pregnancy. They told me that there were actually two other moms that were having the same twins that I were. All three women treated at the same hospital, all three giving birth to daughters, six little girls who are now thriving. It's just like a bond you can't make up. It's just, just awesome. Just awesome. Six adorable babies. And later on Good Morning America, the women discuss their new bond and what they've learned from each other. In sports, the Baltimore Ravens clinched a playoff spot last night thanks to MVP-style plays like this one from Lamar Jackson. The Ravens ran for more than 250 yards to beat the Jaguars 23-7. to The Ravens currently have the best record in the AFC. In Cleveland, the Bears needed a Hail Mary pass to beat the Browns, and the ball fell right into a receiver's lap, but he dropped it. It was instead intercepted. And the Browns won 20 to 17. In the NBA, Steph Curry snapped a record 268 game streak last night. It was the first game since 2018 where he failed to make a three point shot, but the Warriors still managed to beat the Blazers. Coming up, what's different with office Christmas parties this year? Plus what we've learned about this vase bought cheap at a thrift store. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome to Crufts, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. <laughs> dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner. Oh, Crufts 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. <laughs> With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. Reporting from San Francisco, I'm Selena Way. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Time to check the pulse. We begin with the holiday parties at the office this year. They are not what they used to be. Yeah, headline in the New York Times poses the question, did the Grinch come for the office holiday party? Corporate party planners say, yes, there's been a big shift since the pandemic. They say workers want daytime celebrations with reduced or even no alcohol. More people want to be home at night. Who would have thought? Instead of spending time with work colleagues and quote, off hours. And younger workers are putting down the booze. The Times reports less than 40% of young Americans say 
they drink on a regular basis. Next, the growing number of people rewinding to a time before streaming. The last major movie released on VHS was nearly 20 years ago, but a group of people who call themselves tape heads are fueling a resurgence for the industry. More video stores are now opening and Yes, collectors are taking notice at auctions. For example, a mint, a mint condition VHS of Back to the Future recently sold for $75,000. Next, a sweet success at the box office. For Wonka, starring Timothy Chalamet as a young Willy Wonka, dominating the competition this weekend. You're the funny little man who's been following me. Funny little man. How dare you? I will have you know that I am a perfectly respectable size for an Oompa Loompa. Yes, that is Hugh Grant as an Oompa Loompa. Wonka brought in $39 million, and analysts say it's a great sign for musicals, which have really struggled recently at the box office. In fact, the studio downplayed Wonka's song and dance elements in promotions. Now to California and a substitute teacher who knows his history. That's because he's lived it. This is 95-year-old veteran Gene Arnold. When he talks about the Depression and World War II with his junior high school students, he's telling them from memory as well as textbooks. Mr. Arnold plans to keep teaching as long as he's able. I know what will happen, and that's the sad part. If I retire, I'm going to go home and sit down. I know that. I'm tired. I really am. The kids keep me going. He's tired, but he's not out yet. Mr. Arnold's principal says the kids love him. And finally, the vase that turned out to be the discovery of a lifetime. It was bought at a Goodwill thrift store. The price just four bucks. But the woman who bought it did some research and learned it was designed by a renowned Italian architect, and she just sold it at auction for $107,000. Top headlines next. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. We have really good news. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand. These were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions. Their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Checking more top stories now. The government is fining Southwest Airlines $140 million for its operational meltdown last year, which stranded 2 million passengers over the holidays. That fine is 30 times larger than any previous fine against an airline. Authorities in Texas are searching for an escaped inmate who was serving a life sentence for abusing a child. They say Robert Yancey escaped from a prison near Houston yesterday. They haven't said how. He was last seen in a white Nissan, possibly driven by a woman. Quaker Oats has recalled some of its granola bars and its cereal because of salmonella concerns. The recall affects more than three dozen products sold across the U.S. Now, Quaker says it has not received any reports of any infections. We do have a complete list of the affected products on our website, abcnews.com. Today's weather, heavy rain and flooding along the northeast coast. More than six inches could fall in New England. Snow around the Great Lakes, rain and mountain snow for the west coast. Finally, the sisters gaining internet fame for the confession video to their late 
mother. They spoke to Danny New. These are some of the things that we'd like to confess to her that have happened since she died. When we remember someone who's passed on, our mom would really find what we did funny. Sometimes we are allowed to laugh. <laughs> I didn't know that I needed to get my own insurance. <laughs> This past month, nearly 25 million TikTok users learned this lesson from sisters Sarah and Katie. Car insurance. As they laughed and sometimes wheezed through the updates that they wished they could give their mom care, who passed away in the summer of 2022. I feel like you need an EMT nearby. Yeah. <laughs> Someone commented that and said it's going to be only one sister doing these if she doesn't get her wheeze checked out. <laughs> You're so nervy. They've since shared a few of these confessions, now also featuring the oldest sister, Megan. Grief is a process. And all three will tell you that one of the reasons they can laugh about this is because as soon as their mom was told that her treatments for pancreatic cancer were not working. She looked right at me and she's like, Katie, it's going to be fine. We're going to laugh through it. And that's how the three of you will get through it. I got the stomach virus so bad I miss Megan's baby shower. <laughs> And this principle is something that their mom instilled in them when their father passed away in 1999. She taught us how to deal with the grief, acknowledge it, and keep going and still be able to find the happiness and the laughter and the joy. Especially when you all share a ridiculously contagious laugh together. <laughs> And they're raising money right now for the fight against pancreatic cancer. If you want to check out CARES Crew with K's on pancan.org, guys. That laugh is contagious. I think that's why it got over 20 million views, or thanks to Danny New. That's what's making news in America this morning. Have a great day, everyone. It's Monday, December 18th. Part of their mission was to rescue hostages, so why did they gun some of them down in the street? We start here. Israel admits it opened fire on Israeli hostages who were waving a white flag. He reportedly shouted help in Hebrew. As outrage spreads, Palestinians say welcome to what really happens in these raids. Rudy Giuliani loses his case and every dollar to his name. The absurdity of the number merely underscores the absurdity of the entire proceeding. But what does this mean for his former top client? And the autopsy for Matthew Perry shows he had drugs in his system as he died. We do see recreational use of ketamine. That is an unfortunate effect of ketamine's existence. But this was the same type of drug that was being used to treat him. From ABC News, this is Start Here. I'm Brad Milkey. About three quarters of the way up the Gaza Strip, in the northern half of the territory, is Gaza City. Usually, this is the most populous city in the region. But, of course, Israel's airstrikes have decimated it so much that many civilians have moved south. Israel started moving into this area with ground troops. They encircled Gaza City to hunt down Hamas and hopefully rescue hostages that have been kidnapped on October 7th. We saw that until we started the ground action, there was no pressure on them to release hostages. In fact, the thinking in Israel was, this could allow us to be more precise with military action. Up close, our soldiers can differentiate between members of terror groups and civilians. Mistakes will happen. Once they happened, we came out. Not a lot of militaries do that. Well, on Friday, we got word Israeli troops had opened up fire in Gaza City. It appeared that troops had shot directly at people carrying a white flag and those people turned out to be some of the very hostages they were trying to save. Over the last 48 hours, the outrage has only grown inside and outside Israel. So let's take you there right now. ABC's foreign correspondent, Britt Klenet, is in Tel Aviv. Britt, what, what happened here? Well, I think it's safe to say that it really is as shocking as it sounds. You know, these details coming in from the IDF. They say three hostages came out of a building at less than 100 yards from the troops. Uh, they weren't wearing T-shirts. Uh, they were waving a white cloth attached to a stick. Uh, two were killed, a third injured. Now, the third who was injured, he ran into a building and he reportedly shouted help in Hebrew. 
but he was also somehow shot and killed. Those details have really hit hard with the Israeli public. They are angry, they are upset, they are marching through the very middle of the city, in the middle of the night. But especially the hostage families. 71 days, they need to come home now, Akshav. I was there the day that they got that news. I spoke to a hostage a family member. Tell me how you feel. Terrible, terrible. It's the worst news we got since October 7th. The hostage families from the very beginning of this war, Brad, from October 7th, they have been saying, do not go into Gaza until our family members, our loved ones, are released. And now look what's happened. Uh, we demand the government to stand behind its words that it values life on top of all um, and, and go forward with the negotiation, even if it's not in the perfect terms, because as we see, we're losing hostages. This is their worst fears combined. Yeah, and that question that he asked, how does this happen? I mean, is there an answer to that? I mean, what, what are the procedures, the protocols in place? So I spoke to an IDF official very quickly after they made the announcement of these three hostages um, mm -hmm. being accidentally killed by the IDF. At the end of the day, it is something that sadly can be expected of such a chaotic battlefield where the enemy constantly and systematically uses civilian clothing while they are fighting. It's a dynamic environment, he said. Um, so it's very hard to rule out things like this happening. They were in combat minutes before, then they saw a group of men approaching, which they perceived mistakenly to be a threat. I said, does this give you pause for thought? And he said, no, no matter what happens, we are pushing on. That maybe it's time to switch gears. Maybe it's time to rein it in. We are going to continue with the mission here. And uh, for us, there is no such luxury as to stop and think and pause and ponder after each event on the ground. He said it's no time to pause and ponder. We just don't have the time. We have a task at hand. Well, and it makes me wonder, Britt, because, like, let's be honest, is it more likely that this has only happened once and it just happened to be with a bunch of Israeli hostages? Or is it more likely that this happens all the time, it just happens with Palestinian civilians that, that are just as innocent, just as desperate to not get killed, and yet troops are perhaps so trigger-happy that people do get gunned down? I mean, is, does this shed light, I guess, on how Israeli troops are reacting with their rules of engagement? I think that's the worry, right? We are perhaps seeing some kind of breakdown in discipline in the ranks of the IDF. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not entitled by any means to shoot unarmed human beings waving a white flag, even if they are scared. And I think that's what it really comes down to. If they are doing that, uh, you know, we also know that they could be violating other rules. You know, we just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> We're seeing all these videos, not all of them verified, of IDF videotaping sing-alongs with their friends, looting bicycles, going into stores, you know, spray-painting people's houses. It's just not a good look. And I think what it does is underscore why Palestinians, as you say, are so utterly terrified, Brad. Right, and the IDF says they're still investigating the shooting in Gaza, but they do say they've already disciplined other soldiers for violating their code of conduct, including some soldiers that went into a mosque and sang Hanukkah songs last week as if to antagonize the worshippers there. All right, Britt Clement, there in Israel. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brad. Next time on Start Here, he accused them of fraud. Now he'll spend the rest of his life paying for his. We're back after the break. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. 
From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. National forests are good places to get away. But sometimes bad things happen in good places. It's the stuff of nightmares. All I could see was their feet sticking up. My knees went weak. This is a human skull. We were definitely against the clock. How many more victims are out there? Wild crime at Blood Mountain. Now streaming only on Hulu. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. Welcome to Crufts, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. <laughs> dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner of oh, Crufts 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs. Now streaming on Hulu. <laughs> For the last three years, former President Donald Trump has falsely claimed that the 2020 election was stolen. They cheated and they rigged our presidential election. His key allies have given interviews for claiming voting machines as rigged. Not only was that wrong, it resulted in a settlement that could devastate the bottom line at Fox News. They are engaged in surreptitious illegal activity. Trump's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, gave press conferences calling Georgia election officials corrupt by name. Well, now he's on the hook, too, for an eye-popping amount of money. The verdict we had been waiting for came in on Friday, and ABC senior national correspondent Terry Moran was covering this civil trial in D.C. Terry, what did the jury find here? Well, they walloped him, I think is the, the legal term. I, it, I've never seen a verdict of that size, and I've seen some $100 million verdicts. And the moment in the courtroom I was there, Giuliani was staring right at the jury when the verdict came down, didn't flinch, but then quickly looked down. The plaintiff's table, the plaintiff's Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss, the two Georgia election workers, they looked around smiling and shocked. It was a shocking moment. The absurdity of the number merely underscores the absurdity of the entire proceeding, where I've not been allowed to offer one single piece of evidence in defense. A jury stood witness to what Rudy Giuliani did to me and my daughter and held him accountable, and for that I'm thankful. Because what the jury did was on the compensatory damages to compensate the women for what had happened to them. They awarded a total of about $33 million, roughly split between the two women. The flame that Giuliani lit with those lies and passed to so many others to keep that flame blazing changed every aspect of our lives. And then for the intentional infliction of emotional distress, each woman was awarded $20 million. And then for punitive damages, the jury gets to say, you know, this is outrageous and this is what we think we need to send a message about. And here's the message. $75 million for a grand total of $148 million. Just a, a really staggering verdict, not just in terms of the money, but in terms of the emotion behind it, the emotion in that courtroom and clearly the emotion of, of the jury uh, that they wanted to send a message that this can't stand. That's clearly what they were saying. Well, just because it, this, these were clearly lies and clearly egregious ones? Yes. In fact, that was stipulated to by Rudy Giuliani that he had made false statements about Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss, but his argument on appeal will be they were constitutionally protected speech because they were made in the context of presidential election. Good luck with that. When this case gets before a fair tribunal, it'll be reversed so quickly it'll make your head spin. What was really staggering was that the plaintiff's lawyer had asked for $43 million uh, in the opening statements. Oh, wow. And that Giuliani's lawyer in opening statements had said, oh, if you, if you do that, 
If you award $43 million, that is the civil equivalent of the death penalty for Rudy Giuliani. And they ordered $148 million. So, Terry, is that the dollar amount he's going to have to pay? That like Is all of Rudy Giuliani's wealth essentially transferred over to these election workers? What happens here? As of now, he has a legal obligation, that's what that verdict is, to pay $148 million to Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss. Now, he's, he's basically broke. The IRS is after him for half a million dollars. He had to set, put his condo on the market. He said he doesn't have any money. But he wouldn't share the financial details where his accounts are, where his money is. And that's one of the reasons that he lost the case. But now comes the hard part, collecting from Rudy Giuliani. I think what we're going to see from Rudy Giuliani is he's going to file for bankruptcy and try to see if that Chapter 13 bankruptcy can protect his assets. Like a lot of plaintiffs who get an award against a defendant who can't pay it all, they'll need a lawyer or a collection agency, and they do have options. Because this is a legal obligation of Rudy Giuliani's, any wages, any income he gets, can a portion of it be taken from him, They're, you know, be uh, garnished? They can garnish his wages. They can levy his bank accounts. A portion of any funds in his bank accounts can be taken to pay this legal obligation. Uh, they can put liens on his property. I don't know if that property is sold, but anything he does sell, a par portion of it can go to them. So they won't see $148 million, and that verdict may be reduced on appeal. Some lawyers think it's likely that it will be, but he will always have to pay them money for the rest of his life. And lastly, Terry, I mean, does this give a hint about how juries will see other cases involving Donald Trump or his associates, like either in Georgia where this was happening or in D.C. or elsewhere, I guess? You know, so, so that's a great question, because what the jury heard that Giuliani did was not only outrageous, but kind of reckless. There's a recklessness in the air in America right now. Do you regret what you did to Ruby Freeman? Of course Freeman? I don't regret it. I told the truth. They they were engaged in changing votes. There's no proof of that. Oh, you're damn right there is. And that is really part and parcel of what, of what Giuliani and Trump and in some ways the whole MAGA movement is about. It doesn't matter what the facts are. If you say it with enough contempt and, and enough gumption and enough spit-in-your-face defiance... You can make it true in the electorate. You can make it true in, in the media that you like. Mm. In court, it's a different matter. There are rules of evidence developed over centuries to get at the facts of things. And that helps juries come to these results. You know, the, Giuliani was complaining about the jury and all that stuff. The facts that were laid out before the jury, the facts that were admitted to by Rudy Giuliani, would be agreed to by juries around the country. It's the legal process where Trump, in many of his his ways of approaching things, runs into a brick wall. Yeah, I was going to say, even in New York, in Trump's civil trial, there's no jury hearing the case. But despite Trump coming out of court every day and saying this is bogus, a judge has already declared that in this case, Trump did lie. The question is just, what will the lies cost him? Uh, Terry Moran, thanks very much. Thanks, Brad. Matthew Perry died in late October. The actor known for his role on Friends was found unresponsive in his hot tub. And while the cause of his death was unknown, his past experiences with drug abuse made lots of fans wonder if this might have been addiction related. Well now, the autopsy results are out and while the report did not find traces of cocaine or heroin or fentanyl in his system, it did find ketamine. In fact, it reveals that Perry was undergoing ketamine therapy in the weeks ahead of his death. So with that, let's go to ABC's medical correspondent, Dr. Darian Sutton. Dr. Sutton, I mean, first of all, what is ketamine? Could you just give us like the rundown on, on what it is? And secondly, what role did it play in his death? Well, it's difficult to say the exact role, but the report has some important information in it, specifically regarding the level of ketamine found within his body. Uh, ketamine is a dissociative anesthetic, historically has been used for pain, medication, and even anesthesia within the operating room. And in the emergency room, I've used it clinically for patients in the treatment for procedures. Well, in this case, what, we, what we're seeing in this report is that the levels of ketamine within Matthew Perry's body were so high, they were at the levels that are considered anesthesia levels 
levels, which would be levels required to be monitored under a clinical environment because of the effects of ketamine. There were also other contributing factors that were listed. Uh, for one, he had a history of coronary artery disease, very common within adults at that age. Also, he was using another medication called buprenorphine, which is a medication used for opiate use disorder. Although these uh, other contributing factors can increase someone's risk of harm if they're not controlled tightly, um, the association of this with his death is not what is assumed at this time. I see, which makes it sound then like you could have an overdose of ketamine or be affected by ketamine and then drown in your pool or drown in your hot tub, which is kind of what, what they're making it sound like happened here. Is that how we should think of this all as sort of going down? Well, ketamine has a variable effect on the body depending on the dose. At lower doses, you can see treatment for pain. At moderate doses, you can see sedation or disassociation, which is kind of when patients have an absence-like effect. They appear awake, but they are not fully conscious. And then at higher doses, that's when you step into the world of danger. Uh, at higher doses, ketamine can cause sedation and decrease your respiratory rate so low that it can cause your body not to get enough oxygen and increase your risk of death. Uh, the risk is that if you use this medication or substance, it causes you to be sedated in a way where you're not paying attention, you can drown. And so that's where that risk lies. So where did it come from? That it, Did it come from his therapeutic use or from elsewhere? The half-life of ketamine is relatively short. It's about two to four hours. So if you see doses that are that high, the use of ketamine must have been in a close proximity in terms of time to when the effect happened or the death happened. We also know in the report that Matthew Perry was getting treatment for treatment-resistant depression with ketamine, and the last use was around more than 10 days prior to his death. The effects of ketamine and the half-life of ketamine are so short, it would be unlikely that that event or those two events are connected. Oh, that seems important to know, because th 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 this wouldn't necessarily be from the ketamine therapy. Because I can imagine someone who's considering psychiatric treatment, a doctor mentions it, and you go, oh, I don't want, like, I don't want that. I heard about Matthew Perry, but these aren't necessarily the same thing. These are not necessarily the same thing. It is relatively uncommon to see a fatality or a death associated with ketamine. Often, the deaths of ketamine are either A, if it's used at extremely high doses, or B, more commonly, when ketamine is used with other substances. Ketamine historically has been used for the treatment of pain and anesthesia. And ketamine has been a part of incredible advancements in the world of psychiatry and psychology in terms of treatment-resistant depression. We've seen many success stories of patients who have uh, gotten ketamine treatments under close observation uh, from their providers and had wonderful outcomes. And so, yes, we do see recreational use of ketamine. That is an unfortunate effect of ketamine's existence. But overall, we've seen incredible benefits of ketamine in terms of clinical management of depression. Yeah, of course, for, for the people in these research projects that have said, like, this basically saved my life. Now you've got this beloved actor who was apparently using it at the time of his death. Uh, we'll see what happens here. Dr. Darian Sutton, ABC Medical Correspondent. Thank you so much. Of course. Okay, one more quick break. When we come back, you don't even need a chimney to make these Christmas wishes come true. One last thing is next. This is ABC News Live. The crushing the families truck. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. 
With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Welcome to Crufts, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. <laughs> dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner of oh, Crufts 2023, The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. <laughs> All across the globe, the world will be celebrating the new year. And you can see it as it happens live. The global celebrations. See the new year as it comes in live. Streaming all day and night on ABC News Live. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. And one last thing. If you know someone with an advent calendar, they can tell you, as of today, we are T-minus one week to Christmas morning. But if you want to be Santa's official helper, <laughs> you got until the end of the day. So for the last hundred years, the U.S. Postal Service has been running a program to help with Santa's letter load. He gets lots of mail directed to him at his official address at the North Pole. The zip code there, by the way, is 88888, like five snowmen in a row, if you're wondering. But pretty much anything marked Santa will find its way there. I'm an elf working at the North Pole. I'm processing letters that kids write into Santa. A few years ago, this documentary called Dear Santa tracked some of these letters on their way up north. This program called Operation Santa used to be limited to local postmasters who were given the authority to answer some letters on Santa's behalf. More recently, it's been open to the public and the start of the pandemic moved the entire operation online. So now on the postal office website, letters are posted, their identifying information redacted so that they can be adopted by anyone who wants to lend a hand. And while some people just respond to the letters, that deadline passed last week, you can also adopt a wish list. Have you asked Santa for presents this year? I'm asking for a makeup and nail kit, a hover ball. This is Jocelyn yeah. Tchaikovsky. She's seven years old. She's from Pennsylvania. A hover what? Ball. What is that? It's where you can like throw a ball and it will float up in the air and come back to you. Now, she did not mail her list to Santa. She did it the old-fashioned way and just wished it out loud. But this just reminds you how specific kids' wish lists are. Here's one from Isaac in Utah. He writes, quote, Dear Santa, my Christmas list is an Xbox Series S, the game Horizon 2, and a super tall water slide. Emmanuel in Missouri said, I would like an Xbox and my own bedroom. The idea is that people from around the country can click on these letters, get the exclusive rights to them, and then send these families whatever they don't think Santa will be able to swing. The deadline to take on these requests, though, is today. Now, what's weird is as you click through all these letters, Almost all of them seem to ask for iPhones, computers, gaming consoles. Some kids want these things, of course, but could some of these just be coming from adults who want free stuff? A few years ago, some postal workers were busted for submitting their own letters to the program, but the Postal Service says no one should feel pressure to send expensive gifts. A response from Santa, they say, or the donation of a special skill is a win. Plus, if you ask two-year-old James Dow Cortivo from New Jersey... Santa, when are you cars? Toy cars will always do the trick. Keep it simple, Santa. Merry Christmas. The letters I really believe are the ones like this. Noah in Wisconsin says he wants a Nintendo Switch. You're like, oh, that's pretty expensive. But also, quote, Nike gold shoes, a gold safe, and shorts. Just shorts. Like, they're all treated equally here. Plus, if you have a middle schooler, you are aware of how monstrous some of their requests can be. I was just looking at a 13-year-old girl's list. Some of the beauty products are ones that I bought for my wife. Like, that's her big present for the year, so I hope you appreciate what you're asking for here, Tiffany. More on all these stories at abcnews.com or the ABC News app. I'm Brad Milkey. See you tomorrow.
This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Bedminster, New Jersey, I'm Mary Bruce. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. I'm Diane Macedo. Today on ABC News Live First, dangerous weather coast to coast. A powerful East Coast storm is on the move, bringing a flash flood emergency. How it's impacting holiday travel and when the West Coast could see heavy rain and snow. The high stakes discussions to get more hostages released from Gaza. What we know about the status of the talks and what the IDF is saying about the biggest Hamas tunnel uncovered so far. Trump under fire again, what the former president said on the campaign trail that echoes white supremacists and Nazi Germany. Honoring the life and legacy of Sandra Day O'Connor will take you inside the private ceremony where Supreme Court justices will pay their respects to the first woman who served on the high court, plus how the public can say their goodbyes too. We begin with severe storms slamming the East Coast. 11 states are under flood watches right now from Maryland to Maine. Wind gusts are reaching up to 60 and 70 miles per hour in areas of New England. That same system has been bringing heavy rain and a reported tornado in the southeast. Parts of Florida saw up to five inches of rain. South Carolina measured its highest non-tropical tide on record with more than 16 inches of rain falling in some areas between Charleston and Georgetown. And at least 200,000 customers are without power this morning in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. ABC News senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it all. That massive storm making its way into the Northeast. In New Jersey, drivers had to be rescued after cars stalled out in floodwaters. Cars hydroplaning through deep water along New York City's FDR Drive. The Carolina coastline getting hammered. An ocean overwash pushing ashore in Buxton, North Carolina, part of the Outer Banks. Winds wreaking havoc across South Carolina. This shopping center suffering severe damage after a reported tornado touched down. Pieces of the building ending up in the parking lot. Windows smashed after winds picked up debris and launched into this van. Winds toppling trailers and knocking down trees into houses in Horry County. When we were running, that's when we heard the glass breaking and we came out and then the tree was there. Areas near Charleston getting more than 16 inches of rain. AccuWeather captured first responders rescuing drivers in historic Georgetown. The same storm slamming Florida too. Conditions so bad there, this driver couldn't see the road ahead, going right over a seawall and into the intercoastal. His van floating. First responders, though, were able to rescue him. Oh, my God. And this power line igniting during the storm in St. Petersburg. And meteorologist Rob Marciano joins me now from Norwalk, Connecticut. Rob, what's it like there right now? 
It's a lot more calm now than it was even 30 minutes ago, Diane. It's almost like we hit, hit the eye of a, of a tropical storm or, or a hurricane with the little backside. You can almost see the skies brightening behind me. But uh, overnight last night, when we had high tide here, uh, we had a pretty good storm surge. You see some of this water still puddled up here, and you can see the outer line of the highest uh, tide back there. So a rough night here uh, in Connecticut, the northeast, and as you know, the mid-Atlantic, and it just kept coming right during the morning rush hour between what happened in New York City and all the trees that were coming down here in Connecticut. We had uh, uh, water rescues in Danbury and a number of trees coming down. You reported on the power outages. That will probably continue, but the, the highest winds now, I think the core of those have moved east of here and slowly marching their way uh, through the eastern half of New England, Diane. So, Rob, uh, we talked about 200,000 customers without power right now. That's includes thousands in Connecticut. So how long is that expected to last? And what's in the forecast now for that region? Well, I think as far as getting crews out to, to start working on this stuff, they'll, they'll be able to do that relatively quickly. There's no ice they have to worry about. The winds uh, will be strong, but uh, not to, to the point where they can't get out and start repairing. So I think we'll start to see a ramping up of crews from west to east go out and start to get people back online. But this, these winds, the core of these winds now moving into Boston, the Cape, and then Maine, I think, is going to see a, a huge number of power outages. And they just had a bad storm a couple of weeks ago. So I think these numbers will continue to roll as the storm rolls to the east and everyone will start to clear. But the cold air coming behind this is no joke. Remember, we're in December. Even though this felt like a tropical storm and acted like it in some ways, uh, once the front comes through, we're going to feel a, a big chill down for everybody. And, uh, you know, Ginger's going to talk more about that, some lake effect snow coming in. So uh, not, the, not the greatest way to start off the week before before Christmas, Diane. No, it sure isn't. Rob Marciano in Connecticut. Stay dry, Rob. Thank you. And ABC News Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z is tracking where that storm system is headed and what's coming behind it. Rough commute, to say the least. And I actually took video out of my commute because we were all backed up on the west side highway. This is so early. And that tree down in the middle of the highway there, we had gusts easily over 60 miles per hour, taking down trees, taking out power. You know, for now, it looks like more than 100,000 customers, at least in the northeast. And that will keep going through the day because we've got really gusty winds. Those flood watches, there have been flash flood warnings, meaning you do not want to drive from Montclair all the way up toward Albany. And you can see where those uh, alerts go from southern Appalachia right there into western North Carolina up to Maine. Those are for high wind and they'll stick with us today. We even have some winter storm warnings on the map but let's focus on that wet and windy part because for New York City, Philadelphia, you're clear after about the noon 1 p.m. hour. Then it's still windy though and then it's blustery and really rainy from Boston up through Portland through the early evening and even you know far northern Maine through about midnight. Then we'll clear it all out and then we'll start to bring in the cooler air and the considerable snow, especially in the lee of the lakes. So that's why you saw some of those winter weather advisories in West Michigan and Western New York. Diane? All right, Ginger Z, thank you. And the storm is hitting just ahead of what's expected to be a record week of holiday travel. AAA says more than 115 million people will travel for the holidays, and extreme weather is already canceling and delaying flights. We're also tracking some major news about Southwest Airlines. ABC News' Trevor Alt has more from Newark Liberty International Airport. As the record holiday rush gets underway, severe weather causing travel trouble. More than 5,000 flights delayed and over 100 canceled Sunday alone. And as millions get ready to fly, this morning the Department of Transportation unveiling a record $140 million penalty against Southwest Airlines over last year's meltdown where 16,900 flights were canceled, stranding more than 2 million passengers. What we're doing here is sending a message to the entire airline industry. You need to take care of your passengers, and if you don't, there will be consequences. The DOT found Southwest failed to provide adequate customer service assistance, flight status notifications, or prompt refunds. Since then, Southwest paid out more than $600 million in refunds and reimbursements to travelers. But now the DOT is requiring they establish a $90 million compensation system for future passengers affected by significant delays and cancellations, including a $75 flight credit to pay any passenger whose flight gets delayed more than three hours when it's the airline's fault. Southwest saying in a statement, we are pleased that we reached an agreement with the DOT that prioritizes our customers. This record penalty is holding Southwest accountable for their failures, and it is sending a message to the entire industry with a new standard, a new level of accountability. 
And Diane, Southwest Airlines says they're going to be implementing this strategy, compensating passengers who experience significant delays by the end of April. Secretary Buttigieg says that the purpose of this massive fine is to set a new precedent. He says with a failure of this size, there has to be consequences. Diane. All right, Trevor Alt at Newark Airport in New Jersey. Thanks, Trevor. And Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor is being honored today in Washington, D.C. The late Justice O'Connor will lie in repose in the Great Hall of the Supreme Court this morning, where the public will be able to pay respects after a private ceremony. Justice O'Connor died earlier this month at the age of 93. She became the Supreme Court's first female justice in 1981, opening the door for others in the decades to come. Justice O'Connor's funeral will be held tomorrow at the Washington National Cathedral. President Biden and Supreme Court Chief Justice jo uh, John Roberts will be there to deliver eulogies. We'll bring you this morning's ceremony live as soon as it starts. Meanwhile, police in Delaware are investigating a car crash involving the presidential motorcade last night. Neither President Biden nor the First Lady were hurt, but now police say they're looking into whether the driver was impaired. Senior White House correspondent Selena Wang has the latest. Overnight, a security scare for President Biden, a car slamming into an SUV that was part of the president's motorcade, just as Biden was leaving his campaign headquarters in raining Wilmington, Delaware. Mr. President! You can see in the video, the president just finished answering a question from a reporter, then a loud crash. Biden stopping in his tracks, clearly startled as the sedan crashes into the vehicle, protecting the rest of the motorcade. Secret Service agents rushing the president into his SUV, where the First Lady was already waiting. Neither were injured. Officers surround the sedan that rammed into the motorcade, the driver putting his hands up. Police say investigators are working to determine if driver impairment was a factor. Sources say it appears there was no ideological motivation behind the crash. Secret Service says the president's motorcade left without any problems and that there is no further threat related to the crash. The White House says both the president and the first lady are fine. Diane? All right, senior White House correspondent Selena Wang, thank you. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin is in Israel, set to meet with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu today. His visit comes amid reports the administration is pressuring Israel to scale back its offensive in Gaza. Meanwhile, a U.S. official tells ABC News the director of the CIA is joining new hostage negotiations in Europe with leaders from Israel and Qatar. Foreign correspondent Britt Clinton has the latest from Tel Aviv. Ongoing hostage negotiations, as more than 100 are still being held in Gaza, a U.S. official telling ABC News the director of the CIA, Bill Burns, is meeting leaders from Israel and Qatar in Europe to join those high-stakes discussions. And Defence Secretary Lloyd Austin arriving in Israel this morning to discuss transitioning into a more focused phase of the war. Austin also hoping to quiet concerns over a wider regional conflict. We saw firsthand Israel's growing tension with Lebanon's Iran-backed militant group Hezbollah. Israel and Hezbollah exchanging cross-border fire here. Incoming artillery sending our team into a bunker. This is a daily experience yes. for you. Yes, except this time we had the privilege of being right next to this bunker and this base. Combat soldiers have to operate far beyond these walls. Combat soldiers also on the ground throughout Gaza. The IDF saying they found the biggest Hamas tunnel uncovered so far. ABC's Ines de la Quatera goes inside. The IDF saying this probably took millions of dollars and they say they will be destroying this tunnel. The Israeli military's aerial assault of the Strip remains relentless too. <laughs> the Hamas-run Gaza Health Ministry saying more than 18,700 Palestinians have been killed in this war. 64 journalists also killed, according to the Committee to Protect Journalists. Al Jazeera cameraman Sama Abu Dhaka laid to rest over the weekend. Back in Israel, a funeral held for the first of the three hostages accidentally killed by Israeli troops. Their preliminary investigation says Alon Shamriz, Yotam Haim and Sama Talalka had left a building in a very intense area in Gaza without shirts, carrying a makeshift white flag.
Now, that investigation, it also said the soldiers initially fired because they thought they saw a threat. Uh, Israel is still saying it is determined to destroy Hamas, though, although uh, U.S. officials say Austin is expected to push Israel away from the heavy bombardment we're seeing in Gaza right now. Diane? All right, Britt Clinton in Tel Aviv, thank you. And U.S. officials are condemning North Korea after it launched two missile tests in 24 hours. Japan's prime minister says the flight trajectory of the second test indicates it was a long-range ballistic missile capable of striking anywhere in the continental United States. South Korean officials call the launch a major provocation that disrupts the peace and stability of the Korean peninsula. U.S. officials call the test a flagrant violation of multiple U.N. Security Council resolutions, but say it does not pose a threat to American personnel territory or allies. Coming up, Trump under fire again. What the former president said on the campaign trail that some say echoes white supremacists and Nazi Germany. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Former President Trump is facing backlash for comments he made about immigrants while on the campaign trail. Critics say his words echo those of Hitler, as he also praised authoritarian leaders, even quoting Russian President Vladimir Putin. ABC News senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott has the latest, with less than a month until the first votes are cast in the 2024 Republican primary. On the campaign trail, former President Donald Trump is drawing big crowds in a swing through early voting states, but coming under fire for these anti-immigrant comments he made in New Hampshire this weekend. They're poisoning the blood of our country. That's what they've done. That language echoes white supremacists and was used by Adolf Hitler in his autobiographical manifesto, Mein Kampf, where Hitler criticized mixing races, calling it, quote, blood poisoning. Trump has repeatedly used the phrase. He's disgusting. And what he's doing is dog whistling to Americans who feel absolutely under stress and strain from the economy and from the conflicts around the world. And he's dog whistling it to blame it on people from areas that don't look like us. If elected, Trump promised to carry out mass deportations, deputizing the National Guard to arrest undocumented immigrants. I will terminate every open borders policy of the Biden administration, stop the invasion of our southern border and begin the largest domestic deportation operation in American history. On the campaign trail, the former president also praising dictators, at one point invoking Russian President Vladimir Putin, using quotes from a top U.S. adversary to attack President Biden. Vladimir Putin. Has anybody ever heard of Vladimir Putin? 
of Russia says that Biden's, and this is a quote, politically motivated persecution of his political rival is very good for Russia because it shows the rottenness of the American political system. The Biden campaign responding with a blistering statement, writing Trump parroted Adolf Hitler, praised Kim Jong-un, and quoted Vladimir Putin while running for president on a promise to rule as a dictator and threaten American democracy. And Trump's own words turning off some Republican voters. He takes things to the extremes, and this is part of the drama we're trying to get away from. There's no reason for it. But the former president is still the far and away front runner, ahead of his Republican rivals by 50 points. He's not afraid to hurt people's feelings, and there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> people really need to toughen up a little bit. Diane, of course, former President Donald Trump has pleaded not guilty to 91 criminal charges. He will certainly have a lot to juggle between his legal calendar and the court calendar. Our friends over at 538 took a look at the historical data, and they found that no presidential candidate has ever been this far ahead in the national polls and gone on to lose the nomination. Diane. Senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott, thank you. And Iowa's caucuses are now less than a month away, and the New Hampshire primary is just a week after that. So our team of ABC News 2024 campaign embeds are fanning out across Iowa and New Hampshire to ask voters there what's driving them. Here's Jay O'Brien with ABC's Trail Mix series. As crucial presidential primaries in Iowa and New Hampshire near, Republican voters there reacting to the ongoing impeachment inquiry into President Biden. I think there's certainly enough um, there to, to warrant at least looking into it. If there was some validity to it, and then yes, I would say that, that they should look into that. Thus far, there hasn't been. The first in the nation Iowa caucuses now less than a month away. Voters there are concerned about the economy. The money I make today is basically the same money as I made 20 years ago, and I'm no further ahead in life. The same worries more than a thousand miles away in New Hampshire. Entering adulthood post-college, um, I feel like the job market is slim, and the housing prices keep going up. Abortion rights polarizing as candidates grapple with the historic lawsuit from Kate Cox challenging Texas's abortion ban and its effect on women's health care. I don't think that anybody should have a right to discuss medical options about someone else's body. I'm hoping that they have the judgment on that. Former President Trump still dominating most primary polls. Other GOP hopefuls looking to grow their support in these crucial remaining weeks. I like Vivek. I would probably say Ron DeSantis. I'd have to say uh, Trump, really. When people walk into the voting booth, that's when they're going to decide who they really want. ABC's Jay O'Brien, thanks for that. Coming up, honoring the life and legacy of Sandra Day O'Connor. We'll take you inside the private ceremony where the Supreme Court justices will pay their respects to the first woman who ever served on the high court. Plus, how the public can say their goodbyes as well. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. 
wherever news breaks. It's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. Welcome to Crufts, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. <laughs> dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner of oh, Crufts 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war for non-stop live coverage. Stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. From Fulton County Court in Atlanta, I'm Aaron Katursky. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. We have breaking news from Washington, D.C. The casket carrying late Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor is set to arrive at the Supreme Court shortly. Justice O'Connor was the first woman to ever serve on the Supreme Court. She died earlier this month at 93. Justice O'Connor set to lie in repose in the High Court's Great Hall after a private ceremony in the Upper Great Hall. Her casket will be carried up the steps in front of the court, passing under the iconic words engraved on the pediment, equal justice under the law. Supreme Court police officers will be serving as the casket team, while Justice O'Connor's grandchildren are serving as the honorary pallbearers. We're also going to see all the justices there, as well as her family and her former law clerks. For more, let's bring in ABC's Jay O'Brien and ABC News political contributor Mary Jordan for more. Jay, what's the latest there as the late Justice Sandra Day O'Connor is set to be memorialized? As you said, the motorcade with her casket is expected here any moment from now. They will process right up the main stairs there. You can see over my shoulder. You can even see, it's hard to make out at this distance, but some of her law clerks starting to gather on those steps. They will be lining the steps as the casket processes up into what the Supreme Court calls, as you said, the upper Great Hall. She will lie in repose in the Great Hall. It is meant as a recognition of what she has meant to the history of this country, the history of law in this country, obviously the first female justice of the high court, kicking the door open, as many have said, for women, not just in the law, but in American political history writ large. And so that casket arriving just moments from now as we can expect a somber ceremony that honors her legacy, Diane. Jay, how are lawmakers there paying tribute to her? Well, we've heard from President Biden, who again will give that eulogy tomorrow. We've also heard from lawmakers here on Capitol Hill who discuss, as I mentioned earlier, Justice O'Connor's legacy as it may, uh, over the entire arc of American history. Let's not forget, she's appointed by President Reagan in 1981. Before that, she has a career in the Arizona Senate. She's the majority leader in the Arizona Senate. She's a lawmaker in Arizona prior to that. But if you look all the way back to when she graduates from Stanford Law School, we've heard lawmakers repeat this story of once she graduates third in her class from Stanford, she goes out shopping to big law firms and one law firm offers her a job as a secretary. Some law firms don't get back to her at all and so she takes a job in a local district attorney's office. And we've heard lawmakers really on both sides of the aisle recount that story as a means of demonstrating what Sandra Day O'Connor has meant to American history. It's the exact same story by the by Diane that President Obama recounted when he gave her the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Now Mary, Justice O'Connor expressed regret that a woman had not been chosen to replace her on the court, but she lived to see a record four women now serving on the Supreme Court at the same time. How significant is that and how much does her legacy play into that? You know, she 
was a Republican, and her, the second woman on the court, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, was was appointed by uh, a Democrat. And it was very interesting that when it came to women's rights issues, they almost always were in sync. Um, and she is probably best known for being a listener, a consensus builder, um, and bipartisan. Her whole the reason that they called her the most powerful woman in the world for years when she was on the high court was because she was in the middle. She listened to the country. She said, my job is not to make laws. It's to kind of interpret the cases in front of me. And she did that by taking the pulse of the country. She said, for instance, that she personally uh, didn't support abortions. But she upheld Roe versus Wade because she said there was women had the right to make their own choice. I think that in this current era, when there's such ugly, bitter bipartisanship, the reason that there's such interest in her incredible life is that she was a conservative, a moderate, who often listened and couldn't be pegged either way, a, a true bipartisan who believed in civil discussion. And we're seeing her law clerks now lining the steps of the Supreme Court. Witnesses to all of this history that you're talking about, Mary. We're going to have a lot more on this coming up. Jay O'Brien, Mary Jordan, Mary Jordan, thank you both. And we will have continuing coverage of today's private ceremony for Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor right after the break. Stay with us. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions. Their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. We have breaking news from Washington, D.C. The casket carrying late Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor is arriving at the Supreme Court where a ceremony is set to begin shortly. 
Justice O'Connor was the first woman to ever serve on the Supreme Court. She died earlier this month at age 93. Justice O'Connor is set to lie in repose in the High Court's Great Hall after a private ceremony in the Upper Great Hall. You can see her casket now making its way to the steps of the Supreme Court. Uh, it will be carried up those steps in front of the court, passing under the iconic words engraved on the pediment, equal justice under the law. For more, I want to bring back ABC's Jay O'Brien, who's there right in front of the court, and ABC News political contributor Mary Jordan. Uh, Jay, walk us through what we're seeing now and what we will see throughout the morning today. Yeah, and just let me kind of narrate exactly what you're looking at there. So that is uh, behind them. Uh, carrying the casket is a contingent of a Supreme Court honor guard, in a sense. Behind the casket are uh, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor's grandchildren. On the steps, as that casket ascends toward the Supreme Court, are lined, as you mentioned, Diane, the justice's former law clerks. When you're a law clerk to a Supreme Court justice, it's like being a member of their family, particularly with certain justices, and Sandra Day O'Connor was one of them. Uh, and so you can imagine that this is an emotional day for those standing on those steps. As the casket processes into the Supreme Court, there will be a ceremony in which we'll hear from one former law clerk of Justice O'Connor, and then we will hear from Justice, um, or rather, we'll hear from her former law clerk, who is Reverend Dr. Jane Fahey, and then we will hear from Justice Sonia Sotomayor as well. That will be in this ceremony. There is a larger funeral plan for tomorrow at the National Cathedral. Before that ceremony takes place, this casket is going to be placed on something called the Lincoln Catafalk. The Lincoln Catafalk is where caskets are placed when they lie in repose, either at the Supreme Court or under the Capitol Rotunda or other places here in Washington. It was actually created for Lincoln after Lincoln was assassinated when he lied in repose under the Capitol Dome. It was the first time anyone had ever done that. And it's a sign for those who lie atop it of the contributions that they have made to American history. So a significance of Sandra Day O'Connor's legacy demonstrated simply by the fact that she's going to lie atop the exact same thing that Abraham Lincoln lied atop, that other presidents and other notable Americans have as well. Mary, watching these clerks, watching her casket, I just, I keep thinking about what it must have been like for them to clerk for the first woman to ever serve on the high court, the levels of history that they witnessed firsthand. You know, on a personal note, she was well known to love to have dinner parties. Um, and, you know, she was, grew up on a ranch. She was down to earth. She was funny. Um, the famous O'Connor dinners would include both Republicans and Democrats, women and men, younger people. Um, she was also loved, she said, you know, it's interesting because she ultimately died from Alzheimer's disease. She used to play bridge and she with Kay Graham, who was then the publisher of the Washington Post and a bunch of other trailblazing women. Um, Catherine Graham was the first woman to run a Fortune 500 company. Sandra Day O'Connor was the first woman on the high court. And they would gather these women and say, we have to keep sharp, and they would play bridge. Um, I think that everyone there on the steps today has a story of some dinner, some lunch, some card game. Um, she even sh she was a sharp shot. She grew up on a ranch, and she knew how to shoot a gun, ride a horse. Uh, she was really, really one of a kind. And Jay, the first there will be a private ceremony today with the Supreme Court justices there paying tribute uh, before she then lies in the repose for the public to say goodbye. What does this day mean for the court and the justices who followed in her footsteps? Well, we've seen statements from every single Supreme Court justice, past and, and, and current rather and former, uh, and they all demonstrate and they all acknowledge uh, the immense legacy that Justice Sandra Day O'Connor has left behind. Particularly, we saw statements from uh, Justice Elena Kagan, for instance, Justice Sotomayor as well, um, who recount what she meant um, for women 
in the law and women in American history writ large. Justice Elena Kagan's statement, if I recall correctly, even recounted um, her remembering where she was that day that Reagan made that announcement that he was plucking her from an appellate court in Arizona, a state appellate court, not a federal bench, uh, and elevating her to be nominated to the Supreme Court to be the first women justice. And, and Elena Kagan remarking how emotional it was for her, who I believe, again, if I recall correctly, was in law school at the time. We've also heard stories from other women who clerk for Justice Andrea O'Connor who say, uh, I remember one story of, of one former clerk saying she was driving and she had to pull over because she was in tears when she heard, I believe on the radio, that uh, Reagan was nominating Sandra Day O'Connor. And when you talk about how unique she was, that she was a woman of the Southwest, that she knew how to grow up on a ranch, it was that that really drew, in addition to her legal policy, Ronald Reagan to Sandra Day O'Connor. They had this meeting in the Oval Office where they talked about ranch life, and Reagan talked about his experience in the West as well. And after that meeting, Reagan said he didn't want to meet with anyone else. He was so taken by Sandra Day O'Connor that that was his choice for nominee. Um, and it goes to show you just the immense impact that she's had on American history and the American history that she's been able to reach out and touch firsthand. And Mary, there's so many interesting facts that we're learning throughout the course of all this. And one of them is that when Justice O'Connor first arrived at the court, there wasn't even a women's restroom near the courtroom because they had never needed one before that. How did she approach her role as the first female Supreme Court justice? And how do you think that role has changed in the four decades since then? She talked about it. And you know that was really important. Um, we just heard how she wasn't from the federal appeals court. Why? There weren't that many women even at that level. So she was, when she put on that black robe, the image of this woman who it's who is now you know in the most powerful court in the country was so powerful that 60,000 people many many of them women and young girls wrote to her um, and she responded she used to talk out about it and, and say that women couldn't could there was nothing that women couldn't do i mean she was only 16 when she got into Stanford undergraduate, Stanford University. She was at the top of her class, magna cum laude. And people, I think her, her legacy and impact is that she not only opened the door, as some people used to say, she kicked that door open, she kept it open. And whether you were a Republican or a Democrat, nominated by a Republican or a Democrat, as Elena Kagan was, she wrote to you, she stayed in touch with you, she invited you to lunch. And I think that these days, when things are so bitterly isolated, you're in, people are in silos according to their party, it's important, important legacy. To remember the ways her life here uh, as they start their remarks. You're going to see the justices on one side of the casket and Justice O'Connor's family on the other. Let's listen. We also gather to surround her family with our love and support in their time of grief. She was a beloved mother, grandmother, sister. She was also a trusted court colleague, a cherished mentor, a friend, and a trailblazing inspiration to many. Most of us gathered here were part of her court family. And this space, this building, was a kind of holy space for us, the place where we had our most sustained interactions with her. In our shared sorrow, we gather to draw strength from one another and from the Holy One upon whom the justice called throughout her life. Let us pray. Eternal God, Lord of life and death, we thank you for your servant, Sandra, and for the love and mercy she received from you and gave to us. In these moments of grateful remembrance, gather our pain 
into the peace of your presence. And assure us that not even death can separate us from your infinite mercy. Amen. Justice O'Connor sometimes compared being appointed to this court in 1981 to being struck by lightning. Many of us, including me, felt the same way about the honor of being appointed her clerk. But more fundamentally, she left an indelible mark on our lives. We're grateful, of course, for the privilege of our public service and our heady debates about the constitutional questions of the day. But even more, we are grateful for the way she shaped us as young lawyers and as human beings by her cowgirl grit, energy, and no-nonsense sense of duty, by her ironclad rule that she would never respond in kind to any unkind words in an opinion, by her grace under intense public scrutiny, and by her generosity of spirit sense of humor, and zest for life. Noticing our long hours, she insisted we get away from our desks to exercise in her aerobics class and to enjoy Washington's museums and springtime cherry blossoms. During my term, a fierce rainstorm erupted on the day of a planned picnic. Undeterred, indeed thrilled by rain, and shaped, no doubt, by her father's instruction that in ranching life, one must be prepared for anything. She simply brought along large umbrellas and oilcloth blankets for our rain-soaked picnic around the tidal basin. With self-deprecating humor, she indulged a clerk's request to photocopy her hand to make that now famous sign captioned, for a pat on the back, lean here. But we never doubted, never doubted her appreciation for our efforts to deliver the excellence she inspired from us. To naturally competitive young lawyers, she modeled collegiality whether it was wandering down the hall, draft in hand, to persuade another justice to join her opinion, or requiring us to take opposing positions in Saturday's chamber's debates of upcoming arguments. She believed completely in the value of thoughtful, respectful debate from differing perspectives to arrive at a good answer. She and her husband, John, enjoyed a visibly loving, joyful partnership. She hoped each of us would find that kind of joy. So she was known to dabble in some mischievous matchmaking on behalf of an unattached clerk. And for those of us blessed with families, her nurture included giving t-shirts naming our children her grand clerks. She also embodied the conviction inspired by her Stanford mentor that one committed person can make a constructive difference. That was certainly true of her votes on this court where she sought common ground. It is true of her pioneering efforts to improve civics education. 
She believed that realizing the dream of our nation depends on hard work to educate each generation in the design of our extraordinary system of American democracy. But the difference one person can make is especially true of her influence on her clerks. She shaped us by her lessons in meaningful work, loving relationship, and zest for life. Hers was a lifetime appointment, but ours was the gift of her lifelong investment in us, not just as lawyers, but as full human beings. We loved her dearly, and for the gift of her life, we give thanks. Let us pray. Now into your hands, O oh merciful Savior, we commend your servant, Sandra. Acknowledge, we humbly pray, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive her into the arms of your mercy into the blessed rest of everlasting peace and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. Looking at a portrait there of the late Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, the first woman to ever serve on the Supreme Court in a private ceremony as the justices and family say their goodbye. We just heard from Reverend Jane Fahey, one of Justice O'Connor's former clerks, and now we're hearing from Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor. Let's listen. I thank the Chief Justice and the O'Connor family for this privilege of speaking today in honor of my life role model, Sandra Day O'Connor. I start where I believe she would have started, by introducing her beloved family, Scott O'Connor and his wife, Joni, with their children, Courtney, Adam, and Keeley, Brian O'Connor and his wife, Sean, and their children, Weston and Sawyer, and Jay O'Connor and his wife, Heather Corcoran, and their sons, Dylan and Luke. Over the years, I have had the pleasure of spending time with some of the O'Connor family and of serving alongside Jay on the iCivics Board, where we work to continue Sandra's path-breaking initiative in civics education. We are here today to mark the passing of a truly remarkable person, to honor and remember Sandra not only for her work as a judge, but for her humanity, leadership, determination, and vision. And we cannot do that without giving thanks to each of you in the O'Connor family for sharing Sandra with us, especially to your dad, John, whom Sandra adored and who made the greatest of sacrifices to follow her to Washington, D.C. The world, the country, and our court owe all of you a debt of gratitude I know how precious you were to her, to her. Each of you had your own unique relationship with her, and she cherished that relationship. She was especially grateful for her wonderful daughters-in-law, and it is, hard, it is not hard to imagine why. For a long time, the only woman among men, Sandra appreciated you, her daughters-in-law, for breaking up some of the homogeneity in her life. To her grandchildren, you only got to know her at the second part of her life. But I hope you know that she lived her life to leave her legacy particularly to you. She was devoted 
to making a better world. And that's what she did. Some years ago, my colleagues and I were at lunch discussing the bygone era of the court when justices were openly hostile to each other and rarely interacted personally. It was a sad chapter in our court's history. One colleague suggested, or one colleague asked, when did that change? Someone suggested a particular chief justice. Another named a different chief justice. Ruth, in her characteristically quiet yet commanding voice said, it all changed when a woman came to the court. Those at the table who had served with Sandra shook their heads vigorously in agreement. My friend Clarence once described Sandra as the glue of this court. I agree. She brought us all together, even after she retired. The first day I came to work in this building, Sandra was at my office door to welcome me to the court. Of the many topics she covered, the one she seemed most intent to get across was the importance of regularly attending the justices' lunch after arguments and conferences. The collegiality of the court, Sandra explained, was vital to getting our work done in a manner the country would respect. She was, as with so many things, prescient in that regard. Later that first day, when I met with the Chief Justice, he told me that Sandra had made him promise that he would lead attendances at our lunches, impressing upon him the importance of building our relationships with one another. The Chief today still honors his promise to Sandra and rarely misses a lunch. Sandra was also known for dragging colleagues out of their offices by linking her arms through theirs and walking them to the lunchroom whenever she noticed that their attendance was lagging. Many of the justices who served with her, including some here today, experienced this firsthand. Sandra shared herself, her family, her home, and even her friends fully with her colleagues. And she expected the same from all of us. However, the lunches and the many other get-togethers Sandra initiated, including dinners, movies, barbecues, and visits to the theater and museums, were almost never about the food, the show, or the occasional scotch and water. They were about bringing us closer to one another and ensuring that we got to know each other as full people. She knew the value of this. She practiced it firsthand when she was the first female majority leader of the Arizona Senate, famously bringing together her colleagues on both sides of the aisle for routine barbecues. So she understood that personal relationships were critical to working together, even and especially in the face of adversity or strenuous disagreement. This may seem obvious now to many of us, but, un but it wasn't until she made it so. She changed our court and everything she touched so fundamentally and so much for the better. So, of course, that is not the only way that Sandra changed the court. Scholars have paid more attention to Sandra's close to 700 opinions than she ever expected or sought. For many years, the way Sandra went, the court followed. And that was for a simple reason. Sandra approached each case with incredible thoughtfulness and sought to arrive at a practical, a practical conclusion. She never disregarded the realities of our country. As my colleague Elena has said, she had an extraordinary understanding of the American people, just as she had an extraordinary understanding of this court's role and its limits. The nation was well served by the steady hand and intellect of a justice who never lost sight of how the law affected ordinary people. Ruth once said that she could scarcely follow Sandra. Few ever could, although I know Ruth came very close. Pressuring years of female law clerks into attending her very early morning gym class by the way, something I know Ruth and this, her sister Ruth never did. Sandra exercised every day, 
socialized every night and weekend, and traveled across the country and the world. Even during her chemotherapy sessions, she never missed a day of work. She did the court's work, wrote books, and spoke at seemingly every college, law school, and bar association in the United States and abroad. To quote Stephen Breyer, Sandra, quote, worked tirelessly, traveling during court vacations to American Indian courts, tribal courts. As an aside, she and Stephen were the first justices to ever do that, meeting with Asian, African, and European judges, and planning with bar association representatives about how to advance the rule of law, democracy, and independent judicial systems in the nations for the former Soviet bloc. Close quote. Sronder was a leader in the ABA Sealy program, promoting the rule of law in emerging nations. She also traveled across the country and the world to promote merit-based judicial selection instead of elected judgeships, always advocating for judicial independence. If all of this were not enough, Sandra was instrumental in founding the Arizona Women's Lawyers Association and the National Association of Women Judges, and frequently spoke at events of the International Association of Women Judges. She sat on countless board of directors for nonprofit and charitable organizations, each one meaningful to her. And after her retirement from this court, she founded the Arizona-based Sandra Day O'Connor Institute, which aimed to advance American democracy through civics education, civic engagement, and civil discourse. Which brings us to what I view as Sandra's signature accomplishment and most lasting legacy, iCivics. She saw our nation's civil discourse breaking down and believed strongly that we would lose our democracy if we, did, if we did not teach civics to our younger generations. Sandra famously said, the practice of democracy is not passed down in the gene pool. It must be taught and learned by each generation. And she insightfully decided that the way to reach our youngest generation was through interactive online games that would make learning fun. Her goal was to have iCivics reach every state in the country. It has, and the iCivics games are played by over 9 million students nationwide, now in both English and Spanish. iCivics has expanded its reach to high school and college students and is working on primary education projects. It is also leading coalitions of civically engaged organizations. Her memory will live on through this incredible organization, which meant so much to her and means so much to me. I am grateful not, to, not just to Jay, but to the entire O'Connor family for their continuing support of iCivics work. I thank Sandra for her vision and her drive, not merely to see and understand the problem, but to do something about it. Just do it was a mantra for her. And with it, she accomplished so much. Perhaps Sandra would want me to stop here with her contributions to society. But I want to say a little more about how wonderful she was as a person. The very first time I met Sandra was around 1998, when I was invited to the court as a new circuit court judge. Sandra was unfailingly gracious gracious towards all of the newbie judges, a generosity of spirit that I would learn extended to the never-ending line of people who clamored to say hello whenever she was out in public. That day, one new judge asked whether she had spacious chambers. She said she thought so and promptly took us all for ourselves to see her office. The Southwest motif was warm and and welcoming, and captured some of the Arizona sun she so loved. The cowgirl from out west was on full display. And I remember that a cushion in her office read, maybe in error, but never in doubt. This combination of humility and fearlessness was her to a T. 
She never let self-doubt or hang-wringing stop her from making a decision, decision or taking charge and doing something. And our country was better for it. Like countless other women, I will always remember the day Sandra was nominated to become the first female Supreme Court Justice. Sitting in my district attorney's office in New York, I felt the gravity of her nomination. At a time when most states had no female justices on their high courts, and large firms of 300 to 500 lawyers touted having just one female partner, I knew that Sandra would open the door for women in the law and serve as an inspiration to girls across the country. Later on, she would often say that it was good to be the first, but don't want to be the last. Today, I know she is smiling, knowing that four sisters serve on her court. For the four of us, and for so many others of every background and aspiration, Sandra was a living example that women could take on any challenge, could more than hold their own in spaces dominated by men, and could do so with grace. An interviewer once asked Sandra how she wanted to be remembered on her tombstone. She replied, here lies a good judge. Yes, Sandra, you will be remembered that way. But a full epithet would read, here lies a good judge, wife, mother, grandmother, sister, friend, and above all else, a human being, extraordinary. Let us have a moment of silence for reflection now. Sandra, may you rest in peace. That was Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor paying tribute to the late Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, the first woman to ever serve on the nation's highest court. Justice Sotomayor talked about O'Connor's accomplishments as a state lawmaker as well as a Supreme Court justice and her work after retirement to teach school children about democracy. She also talked about her personal mantra, just do it, saying her Western cowgirl personality shined through. We also heard a lot about Justice O'Connor uh, and her family saying that she worked to leave a legacy to her grandchildren and that she was clearly devoted to making a better world. And now we're seeing the current Supreme Court justices leaving the upper great hall where that private ceremony was just held. On the other side of the casket is Justice O'Connor's family uh, that she held so important. This is all a private ceremony, again, for the justices and the family. And from here, Justice O'Connor will lie in repose where we can uh, say goodbye as the public, where the public can go and say goodbye. I want to bring in ABC's Jay O'Brien, who's on Capitol Hill outside the Supreme Court, and ABC's political contributor Mary Jordan for more. Jay, what's, what struck you, not only to see her former clerk, Reverend Jan Fahey, uh, giving some words today to start off the ceremony, but now to hear Justice Sonia Sotomayor talk about how this was her role model. This was the person who, who paved the way for her to now be a Supreme Court justice and talking about so many different facets of Justice O'Connor's life. Yeah, and she referenced a, a couple different aspects of Justice O'Connor's legacy. And, and one of them is obviously 
her place in history as the first female justice on the high court. Justice Sotomayor, as you said, saying that she was there to memorialize her role model. She said that right there at the beginning of her remarks. But then she said something that really struck me, and it jives with what I've talked to, or what I've, uh, conversations I've had with people over the course of the last few days, which is Justice Sotomayor there said that one of the biggest aspects of Justice Sandra Day O'Connor's legacy is her commitment to civics education. When she retired from the Supreme Court in 2006, she dedicated her post-court professional life to the education of civics across the country. And she, cre she created this program called iCivics, which teaches civics to young people through computer games. You heard Justice Sotomayor reference it there. A and one of the things, uh, one of the pieces of conversation that I've had with people over the last few days, asking them about how they believe Justice O'Connor should be best remembered, is they said if, if people want to memorialize Justice O'Connor, a couple lawmakers I talked to said, get into government. Go volunteer for your local government. Go run for school board. Justice O'Connor said when she was stepping down from public life in 2018 after her diagnosis with dementia, she said, and I'll quote directly from the letter she wrote, she said, quote, we need people to find, we need to find ways to get people young and old more involved in their communities and in their government. That was her life's work after she left the court. And that's one of the other imprints that she leaves on American history. Her commitment to reminding Americans that democracy is an active process and you've got to study it and you've got to get involved in it. Mary, we often don't get um, a look behind the scenes at the Supreme Court. It, it's a generally very private branch of the government. But it was interesting to hear that the, the, the tenor of the court changed, that the justices, I'm paraphrasing here, used to view each other as adversaries and sort of criticize each other a lot. And after the, ju you know, after the ruling was over, they would go their separate ways. And that it's credited now to Justice O'Connor that that changed and that justices started to come together and, and be friendly with each other and get to know each other behind the scenes. How significant is that? Well, it's huge. And uh, frankly, there have been problems more recently on the court. Um, and people talk about missing the Sandra collegiality, that she would make a point of saying, let's all have lunch together. Let's not just be fighting all the time. Um, and she was saying, I just want to hear your argument. Um, and I can look in, it's just like her civics education. You know, she's, she's saying that we are better together no matter if we have divergent views and this is one country uh there are republicans and democrats there are people that are for certain things like abortion rights uh campaign finance reform voting rights she had to vote and decide and issued opinions on all of those but she would sit down at lunch she thought it was really important uh, with those who had different views again she said we can have different views, but we have one country and we owe it to ourselves to be civil and collegial and we're better, stronger when we're talking to each other. I mean, wow, what a legacy. And I think that's why tomorrow at her funeral at the National Cathedral, you're gonna see President Biden address this because it, she was nominated by a Republican president, Ronald Reagan, and here, in her very, very uh, key moment when the country is so divided, you're going to ha hear from President Biden talking about civil discussion and the importance of that and the importance for our democracy. I mean, what a thing, what a visionary thing to say. Um, almost 20 years ago, she said, democracy, and you know, it's not something that's just handed down. You got to work for it. You got to get involved. And that's why her iCivics organization also, one of the things they do is train young leaders and encourage them to get into county government, city government, state government, as she did when she was young. And I want to bring in our senior national correspondent, Terry Moran, into this conversation as well. Because, Terry, we, we heard about 
Justice O'Connor and her love of the law, her love of civics, her love of her family, and in many ways her focus of her legacy being on her grandkids and her grand, grand clerks, uh, as they were so called. Um, but one of the quotes from Justice Sotomayor seemed to encapsulate all of that when she said she was a justice who never lost sight of how the law affected mm -hmm. everyday people. It's so true, Diane. It, it's the end of an era because of who she was. As, as you've been talking about, this is a person who changed the court. There's a saying on the Supreme Court that each new justice changes the whole court because it's such a small group, the group dynamics change, and she changed them. Uh, she was tough, she was practical-minded, and she was so much fun. One of the things that I think you got from Justice Sotomayor's eulogy there is that she was a, a, a bright and fun and highly sociable personality. She and her husband, John, were fixtures on the social circuit in Washington for decades. And she brought a, a, a reality to the law in a way that I think the court misses right now. She was the last justice uh, who had ever served in any branch of government aside from the judiciary. She was an elected politician. She was, as Justice Sotomayor noted, the first woman Senate majority leader of the Arizona state legislature. She had a practical down-to-earth understanding of how government really works and who who actually benefits and who doesn't. One of the things that became clear after she left is that the Supreme Court decision uh, in the Citizens United case that legalized corporate giving to campaigns would have turned out differently if she'd been on the court. She was clear about it. She said, you know, she ran for office. She had to raise money. She knows that money in politics means something. And I think that ended up being the heart of her judging. Uh, a very deep pragmatism. She took cases one at a time. She wasn't a justice like most are today, with some grand theory of everything in the law. She looked at the case, she looked at the people, she looked at the law, and she judged as best she could, given uh, the hard work that she put into it and her own conscience. She was a justice of a very different kind than we have today. And frankly, that pragmatism, that humanity, and that sociability, that humor, that kindness, it's missed on the, on the court right now. You see this court riven with leaks. Another big one out of the, uh, the New York Times last week shows that this court is a very different place than it was when Sandra Day O'Connor was on it. Yeah, uh, one of the things, you know, we, we've, we've all learned a lot about all of the justices over the course of the past few weeks and months and years in this career, but to hear that she socialized every night Every night, I think we're all feeling a little bit like slackers now. Jay O'Brien, Terry Moran, Mary Jordan, thank you all. We'll be right back. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. We have really good news. Congratulations, <laughs> I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted 
babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions, their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Severe storms are slamming the East Coast. 11 states are under flood watches right now from Maryland to Maine. Wind gusts, excuse me, wind gusts are reaching up to 60 and 70 miles per hour in areas of New England. The same system has been bringing heavy rain and a reported tornado in the southeast. Parts of Florida saw up to five inches of rain. South Carolina measured its highest non-tropical tide on record with more than 16 inches of rain in some parts of the state. And at least 250,000 customers are without power this morning in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire. ABC News senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it all. That massive storm making its way into the Northeast. In New Jersey, drivers had to be rescued after cars stalled out in floodwaters. Cars hydroplaning through deep water along New York City's FDR Drive. The Carolina coastline getting hammered. An ocean overwash pushing ashore in Buxton, North Carolina, part of the Outer Banks. Winds wreaking havoc across South Carolina. This shopping center suffering severe damage after a reported tornado touched down. Pieces of the building ending up in the parking lot. Windows smashed after winds picked up debris and launched into this van. Winds toppling trailers and knocking down trees into houses in Horry County. When we were running, that's when we heard the glass breaking and we came out and then the tree was there. Areas near Charleston getting more than 16 inches of rain. AccuWeather captured first responders rescuing drivers in historic Georgetown. The same storm slamming Florida too. Conditions so bad there, this driver couldn't see the road ahead, going right over a seawall and into the intercoastal. His van floating. First responders, though, were able to rescue him. Oh, my God. And this power line igniting during the storm in St. Petersburg. Well, Diane, the main pulse of rain has moved east of us, as has the main core of the wind. It's pretty much still right now, so we'll take this after the rough night we had here along the Connecticut shoreline. But everybody had it, New York City, New Jersey, and obviously the... Uh, all that went down in, in South Carolina and North Carolina with the flooding there. So another epic storm on a Monday. This one, though, much worse than last week's. And uh, certainly Eastern Connecticut, Eastern Connecticut, Eastern New England will continue to get uh, uh, more in the way of wind before this thing begins to die down here finally and move its way out of here. But uh, still a lot of people without power, more power outages likely in eastern and northern parts of New England as this storm really, uh, I'd say it's a historic storm for this, certainly this time of year eventually moves out later on tonight. Diane? All right, Rob Marciano, thank you. And the storm is hitting just ahead of what's expected to be a record week of holiday travel. AAA says more than 115 million people will travel for the holidays, and extreme weather is already canceling and delaying flights. We're also tracking some major news about Southwest Airlines. ABC News' Trevor Alt has more from Newark Airport. As the record holiday rush gets underway, severe weather causing travel trouble. More than 5,000 flights delayed and over 100 canceled Sunday alone. And as millions get ready to fly, this morning the Department of Transportation unveiling a record $140 million penalty against Southwest Airlines over last year's meltdown where 16,900 flights were canceled, stranding more than 2 million passengers. What we're doing here is sending a message to the entire airline industry. You need to take care of your passengers, and if you don't, there will be consequences. The DOT found Southwest failed to provide adequate customer service assistance, flight status notifications, or prompt refunds. Since then, Southwest paid out more than $600 million in refunds and reimbursements to travelers. But now the DOT is requiring they establish a $90 million compensation system for future passengers affected by significant delays and cancellations, including a $75 flight credit to pay any passenger whose flight gets delayed more than three hours when it's the airline's fault. Southwest saying in a statement, we are pleased that we reached an agreement with the DOT that prioritizes our customers. This record penalty is holding Southwest accountable for their failures, and it is sending a message to the entire industry with a new standard, a new level of accountability. 
And Diane, Southwest Airlines says they're going to be implementing this strategy, compensating passengers who experience significant delays by the end of April. Secretary Buttigieg says that the purpose of this massive fine is to set a new precedent. He says with a failure of this size, there has to be consequences. Diane. All right, Trevor Alt at Newark Airport. Thank you. Coming up, from high speed to high tea, Jason Momoa and Patrick Wilson join our Maggie Ruley on an action-packed London adventure right after the break. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Give it to me. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the auto workers picket lines in Michigan, I'm Faith Abube. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. First, Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom splashes into theaters Friday. But before stars Jason Momoa and Patrick Wilson grace the big screen in the superhero sequel, they delighted our Maggie Rooley with everything from high speed to high tea on an action-packed London adventure. Take a look. Yeah! Jason Momoa and his aquatic alter ego Aquaman have a lot more in common than you think. They both know how to wield a trident. And they're both quite comfortable on the water. Okay, ready? Go. Okay, yeah. Go. <laughs> Ripping through the River Thames, we caught up with Jason in London. Look at that. That's ridiculous. Atlantis is way cooler. <laughs> That's true. That's I'm like, true. Ooh, cool killer bridge. I don't know if you've seen my movie, but ours is way bigger. Or what would you want people to know about Aquaman? that they might not know. I think he really, really wants to um, have a brother and connect with his brother. That's heartwarming. He's not going to tell no one. Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you. <laughs> this is don't tell anyone else. You know the deal here. No spoilers. But speaking of that brother. Good job, little brother. High five. Do not call me brother. We met up with Patrick Wilson for quite the high tea. Jason, you actually volunteered to be mother. I'll be mother. I'll be mother. Will I'll you, mother. Will you Great mother. please please for us? I will, ladies first. Oh, why, thank you so here. much. Look at the stance. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Okay, my, this yeah, is really... <laughs> See this? You're getting you this lunch? Have you seen mother do oh this? My God. And after we sip... Oh, that's a tasty treat. <laughs> Some good tea. <laughs> It's time to spill. There you go. Well, you know, I have to say something I love about the two of you is that you're brothers on the screen, but I feel like there's a little romance, uh, bromance going on. You here. said romance. I did. I slipped. Chemistry is a funny thing. Mm -hmm. First of all, we're both very, very, very busy people in our own lives, for sure. And so I think the relationship on screen has to come from two people that want 
to be there and want to have a good time, and, 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 and we do. Well, I think what's fun about the new movie is that you guys don't have to hate each other the whole time. Yeah. It seems like you're, you're teaming up a bit. Yeah. You choose to. <laughs> <laughs> so what was it like to sort of be on the same side in this movie? When you come from these two different worlds, where I, where I suck at something, he's great at it, and where he yep. sucks at something, I'm great at it. And so when we come together to do something positive. And True King builds bridges, right? <laughs> True King builds bridges. And it's what these stars have brought from their personal lives that really help these characters shine. We always talk about uh, whether you're playing somebody super serious or super mm. funny. It's like, how much do you, do you go to the character? How much does the character come to you? And I think what this film has done even more than the first film is this character has come to him. I'm a husband and a father, and I wouldn't have it any other way. You've played this character for so long. You're like, I would love to see him this way. I wanted to walk that line where you're like, being a king, dealing with all that, mm -hmm. in a world that's getting completely polluted, being a father for the first time, he's obviously the reluctant king who's now king, and then also being a husband, and just like, balancing all that, and he's exhausted. And I am. Being a great father. That's that part. Maggie Ruley, ABC News, London. Maggie, thank you. And thank you for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. We'll be right back. We have really good news. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions, their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. Thanks for streaming with us. You were looking at a foggy New York City on this Monday, and we have a lot of news to get to. Here's the rundown right now. Severe storms are slamming the East Coast. 11 states are under flood watches right now from Maryland to Maine. Wind gusts are reaching up to 60 and 70 miles per hour in areas of New England. That same system has also been bringing heavy rain and a reported tornado in the southeast. At least 200,000 customers are without power this morning in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. Rhode Island. The storm's hitting just ahead of what's expected to be a record week of holiday travel. AAA says more than 115 million people will travel for the holidays, and extreme weather is already canceling and delaying flights. Officials are investigating after a freight train demolished an 18-wheeler near Fort Worth, Texas. Investigators say the truck got stuck while crossing the tracks and was hit by a Union Pacific train. 17 of the train cars and two of its engines derailed. Union Pacific says the conductor was the only person injured in the crash, suffering minor injuries. 
The NFL playoffs are taking shape after a big weekend of football. The Baltimore Ravens clinched a spot and are sitting alone atop of the AFC after beating the Jaguars 32-7. The Dallas Cowboys punched their ticket despite losing to the Bills in Buffalo. And the New York Jets have been eliminated for the 13th straight year, just as Aaron Rodgers could reportedly be medically cleared to play next week. Members of the public are now paying tribute to late Justice Sandra Day O'Connor as she lies in repose in the Supreme Court's Grand Hall. Justice O'Connor was the first woman to ever serve as a Supreme Court justice, paving the way for generations to come after her. She died earlier this month at age 93. Earlier, Justice Sonia Sotomayor talked about her historic impact. I will always remember the day Sandra was nominated to become the first female Supreme Court justice. Sitting in my district attorney's office in New York, I felt the gravity of her nomination. At a time when most states had no female justices on their high courts, and large firms of 300 to 500 lawyers touted having just one female partner, I knew that Sandra would open the door for women in the law and serve as an inspiration to girls across the country. Later on, she would often say, that it was good to be the first, but don't want to be the last. And senior national correspondent Terry Moran and ABC News Supreme Court contributor Kate Shaw join me now for more. Kate, what did Sandra Day O'Connor being named to the court mean, not only for the future justices who followed in her footsteps, including Sotomayor, but women in the legal field in general? Well, it was a watershed moment. I don't think there's any question about that. And it's pretty interesting because Ronald Reagan actually said he wanted to put the first woman on the Supreme Court. If you think back to more recent history, uh, President Biden actually took a lot of criticism for saying that he wanted to put the first black woman on the Supreme Court. And then, of course, he did nominate and see confirmed Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson. But there's actually a long history of presidents specifically seeking out demographic features in their nominees. He wanted to put a woman on the court and he found her. She didn't come from, you know, a federal appeals court uh, perch. She wasn't even a lawyer practicing in the federal courts. She spent most of her career in the rough and tumble world of Arizona politics in the state Senate, rising to be the majority leader in the state Senate, and then on a state intermediate appeals court. So it was in many ways an unlikely path to the highest court in the land, um, but she more than rose to the occasion once she arrived, became a formidable presence on the court, but one who always took a fairly modest view of the role of the court in a democracy. She thought, you know, the justices should be minimalist, they should think about the consequences of their rulings, and they should not act as though they were the most important player in our constitutional scheme. Mostly the political branches should run the show and the court should just make sure that the system of democracy was functioning properly. Terry, there are so many facets of her legacy now being unpacked. What stuck out to you most from what we heard in that ceremony today? Well, it was great to hear from Justice Sotomayor about Sandra Day O'Connor, the justice off the court, not just on the court. And the way that she brought the court together, there's a saying that every new justice changes the whole court because it's such a small group of people that the social dynamic has changed. And Sandra Day O'Connor changed it, as Justice Sotomayor pointed out. The court in the past uh, you know, had been a place of coldness, sometimes fierce enmity with justices kind of backstabbing uh, each other. In fact, it may, it may be drifting in that way now again. But she came on with a kind of politician's touch. As, as Kate just mentioned, she was a practiced politician. She brought them together. She insisted that they lunch together all the time. Sometimes she'd kind of buttonhole them. She was tough, tough-minded but also fun. She was known as really one of the <clears throat> main socialites in Washington, she and her husband John, for a long time. And I think that, <clears throat> excuse me, that contribution to the court is substantive because she was able to occupy the center, which she did so long, in a way that could bring along some of her colleagues. And I think at base, the, the most important contribution she brought to the court was a pragmatism, a deeply humane pragmatism incremental change. They, she didn't have a grand theory of everything to change the world with one stroke of her pen. What she wanted to do was judge the case before her properly, truly respecting the participants in the case and the law that she was sworn to apply. So I want to go back to Kate on that, because Kate, Justice O'Connor served on the Supreme Court for 24 years. So how do you think she helped shape the court and its decisions in that time? 
Well, I think Terry's absolutely right. She had an outsized impact on the court, kind of interpersonally and socially. I mean, little things like, for example, they need. It looks like we lost uh, Kate's audio there. So let's go back to Terry. Terry, the funeral is taking place tomorrow at the National Cathedral. What can we expect to see and particularly to hear from both the president and the chief justice tomorrow? Well, the, the chief justice will speak in his formal capacity and his personal capacity. You could see on the justice's face uh, at that ceremony at the Capitol the deep pain. Uh, that they have in losing such a, a treasured colleague. And he will speak for her role as, as patriot, as a patriotic justice of the United States and what she did for the country. Uh, President Biden, I think, wants to take off on, on who she was in the court, that, that vital center that she occupied, that sense that she had that sides could come together in cases and reach pragmatic uh, decisions that would not, as I say, revolutionize and overturn existing arrangements, but would give the democratic branches and the people of the country more of an opportunity to consider the issue, those burning issues that come before the court, and continue to work on them. Uh, I, I think President Biden will pick up on that in this divided time and also pick up on her commitment to civic education. She believed passionately that if we know about our country, its history, its institutions, its flaws, its nobility, all of it together, the country will work better. And I think President Biden will talk about that as well. Kate, how do you think Justice O'Connor's impact on the court is still being felt today? Well, I think there's a lot of reflecting right now on her and her legacy. And one thing that's really come to mind for me is her open-mindedness during her nearly 25 years on the bench. You actually saw her views evolve on questions like abortion, affirmative action, uh, gay rights. These are issues that she actually took a pretty conservative position on in the 1980s when she was first on the court. But her views changed as she heard arguments and worked through questions with colleagues. And she wrote you know, the opinion upholding the core uh, right to abortion first announced in Roe. That was the Casey opinion. Um, she sided with affirmative action in 2003 in the Grutter case. Again, really, her views evolved, but open-mindedness, I think, was really central to her. She didn't come in with fully baked views on every issue. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of people think the court could use a dose of, open-mindedness and humility. Um, it's not clear you see a ton of that on display with this court in which people are pretty fixed in their ideological and partisan corners, um, and there's not a lot of kind of moderation or wiggle room. I think the Chief Justice probably wishes there was more of that on the court because he really is kind of the center and the most moderate justice on the court in many ways right now. So I wonder if that's something that will be alluded to or at least in the air uh, tomorrow and just as the reflections continue on her life and legacy. All right, we will be watching and listening. Terry Moran, Kate Shaw, thank you both. Thank you. Meanwhile, YouTube parenting influencer Ruby Frankie is expected to plead guilty today after being charged with felony child abuse. Frankie was known for so-called tough love parenting. Now the Utah mom is admitting to abusing her own children while also blaming someone else. Eva Pilgrim has the latest. A dramatic new turn in the case against former YouTube mom influencer Ruby Frankie. I'm not even going to let you eat breakfast until you get your chores done. The Utah mother of six now expected to take a plea deal after being charged with six counts of felony child abuse. Her lawyers in a statement saying, Ruby Frankie is a devoted mother and is also a woman committed to constant improvement. And she is taking responsibility for the part she played in the events leading up to her incarceration. I think that her defense by itself would have been a really difficult sell to a jury. She's the mom, she's responsible for these kids, and they were subjected to horrific abuse. Today we are starting off our day the way we do every day. Known for her no-nonsense parenting approach on her since-deleted YouTube channel. Keeping them home from school and wiping the floorboards would like really bring pain. Frankie amassed more than two million followers documenting the lives of her six children. But her social media empire collapsed when her 12-year-old son escaped from her former business partner Jody Hildebrandt's home, prompting this chilling 911 call from a neighbor. I just had a 12-year-old boy show up here at my front door asking for help. He's emaciated, he's got tape around his legs, he's hungry and he's thirsty. 
Frankie now seemingly pointing the finger at Hildebrandt. Frankie's team claiming Hildebrandt isolated her from her family and that Frankie was subjected to a distorted sense of morality shaped by Ms. Hildebrandt's influence. The two often seen together in videos. Those of you who are angry about principles, come and be taught. We'd love to have you. Hildebrandt now facing six counts of aggravated child abuse. Her niece speaking with our Juju Chang after her arrest. All of these these theories and these modalities and these these parenting ideas that all comes from Jody. This is very significant for Jody's defense team because this essentially signals that she's going to testify against her. We did reach out to Hildebrandt's attorneys. They have not responded to our requests for comment. Diane. All right, Eva Pilgrim, thank you. Coming up, actor Matthew Perry's death blamed in part on ketamine, the latest on his autopsy, the potential dangers of the drug, and what exactly it's prescribed for. Also ahead, Shonda Rhimes has a new passion project, how she's memorializing the life of Emmett Till, and why. So much at stake, so much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Give it to me. number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. We have really good <laughs> I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions. Their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. We have breaking news. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin is speaking after meeting with Israeli officials on their war with Hamas. Let's listen. Security. We stand here 72 days into a war that we didn't want. On October 7th, Hamas conduct a brutal attack. They murdered, raped, and kidnapped children, women, soldiers, Holocaust survivors. On October 7th, we fought back and immediately set the goals of this war, the destruction of Hamas and the return of the hostages home with no exception. Our common enemies around the world are watching and they know that Israel victory is the victory of the free world led by the United States of America. In our, in our war against Hamas, the Hamas terrorist organization is a war, not, it's not a war against the people of Gaza. We are fighting a brutal enemy that hides behind civilians. Billions of dollars have been invested in Gaza, money that should have gone to civilian infrastructure and instead was used to build a network of tunnels, 
hundreds of kilometers long, equipped by military facilities. Today, IDF troops are operating in Hamas hotspots across Gaza. In northern Gaza, our troops have eliminated thousands of terrorists, destroyed military infrastructure, and dis dismantled most of the battalions operating in the area. In South Gaza, in Khan Yunis, we are precise and focused on eliminate Hamas leadership and military infrastructure. Detecting and engaging Hamas leadership and the chain of command span over the phases of this war and will continue until we fully achieve our goals. Secretary Austin, we both know the, comp the complexities of war. We both fought brutal terrorist organization. We know that it takes time. Unlike our enemies, we are defending our values and we operate according to international law. The IDF is operating to minimize the harm to civilian population. We are also working with international partners to facilitate the delivery of humanitarian aid. Yet, any time we discuss humanitarian issues, we must remember the 129 hostages we held in Gaza. This is the most humanitarian issue. On October 8th, a day after Hamas attack, Hezbollah opened fire unprovoked. The threats of rockets, missiles, and drones is unacceptable. Over 80,000 80, citizens have been in, displaced, living as refugees in their own country. We are determined to create a new reality, restoring security in the area, based on UN resolution 1701, pushing back Hezbollah. We will bring back the residents of the North to their homes on the border after full security will be restored. We prefer to do so via understanding, ensuring that the border region is clear of terrorists and does not allow direct threats of our citizens. If such a process will not be implemented diplomatically, we will not hesitate to act. Today, we also discuss the growing global threat posed by the Houthis terrorist organization. Their action threaten international freedom of navigation and their reckless behavior, firing ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, and drones against Israel can drag the region into war. The State of Israel values U.S. leadership, and we will support international efforts. At the same time, we maintain the right to take all the actions necessary to defend our sovereignty and our citizens. Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Houthis are funded, supported, and trained by one source of evil, Iran. And unfortunately, this is only their secondary effort. Iran's major effort is acquiring military nuclear capabilities, and this continue even now. We are aware of their actions, and we, we, we are ready to defend ourselves. We must take a stand. The world is watching us now. This includes our enemies, Hamas, Hezbollah, and Iran. The image they see today is powerful, as we stand here united. We are resilient and determined, and we will win on every front. Thank you once again, Mr. Secretary. Thank you for coming.
and thank you for your support and your friendship. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, everybody. You have, we've been talking almost daily by phone. So it's good to see you once again in person. And it's good to be back in Israel, even in these difficult days, especially in these difficult days. This is my fourth visit to Israel as Secretary of Defense and my second time since October 7th. And I know that Israel has been profoundly changed from where you were on October 6th. So I'm here with a clear message. America's support for Israel's security is unshakable. And Israel is not alone. At a time of mourning, a real friend shows up. And I know how terrible these days have been for the Israeli people. And I know that October 7th touched everyone in this small democracy. So let me again extend my deepest condolences to Minister Gadi Eisenkot, who has been sitting shiva for his 25-year-old son and mourning his nephew after they both fell in Gaza. On October 7th, Hamas committed one of the worst atrocities in the history of modern terrorism. As President Biden said, it was an act of sheer evil. Innocent young people at a concert were massacred. Parents were shot in front of their children. Women were sexually assaulted. Toddlers and Holocaust survivors were taken hostage. And for Hamas, that was just the beginning. Hamas has clearly and loudly spelled out its vision of the future. And it is to repeat October 7th over and over and over again. No country should tolerate such a danger. And Israel has every right to defend itself against a fanatical terrorist group whose stated purpose is to murder Jews and eradicate the Jewish state. Hamas is still holding hostages, including American citizens. Hamas embeds itself and hides itself behind innocent Palestinian civilians. Hamas does not speak for the Palestinian people. And Hamas is determined to doom both Israelis and Palestinians to an unending cycle of suffering and strife. So make no mistake, Hamas should never again be able to project terror from Gaza into the sovereign state of Israel. And we will continue to work together for a safer, more secure future for Israel and a brighter future for the Palestinians. The United States will keep pushing relentlessly for the safe return of hostages in Gaza. And we will continue to help Israel in its efforts to bring them all home. Thanks to the personal leadership of President Biden, we helped to broker a deal that got out more than 100 hostages. But this remains a top priority for the United States from President Biden on down. And we will continue to do everything that we can to bring home every man, every woman, and every child seized by Hamas. Now, the United States has been clear and consistent since Hamas started this war on October 7th. Democracies are stronger and more secure when we uphold the law of war. And I've, as I've said, Protecting Palestinian civilians in Gaza is both a moral duty and a strategic imperative. So we will continue to stand up for Israel's bedrock right to defend itself. And we will also continue to urge the protection of civilians during conflict and to increase the flow of humanitarian aid into Gaza. That's important as Israel fights to dismantle the Hamas ter uh, terrorist infrastructure in Gaza. And it will also be crucial for our work with our allies and partners 
after the fighting stops. Now, we're working to ensure that this conflict does not escalate beyond Gaza. But as we are driving to stabilize the region, Iran is raising tensions by continuing to support terrorist groups and militias. Attacks by these Iranian proxies threaten the region's citizens and risk a broader conflict. Of course, the United States does not seek war, and we urgently call on Iran to take steps to de-escalate. Now, in my meetings today, I also discussed the need to take urgent action to stabilize the West Bank. Attacks by extremist settlers against the Palestinians in the West Bank must stop. And those committing the violence must be held accountable. Now, we know that the past 72 days have been some of the most painful days in Israel's history. But it would compound this tragedy if all that was waiting for the Israeli people and your Palestinian neighbors at the end of this awful war was more insecurity, fury, and despair. As I've said, Israelis and Palestinians have both paid too bitter a price to just go back to October 6th. So I discuss pathways today toward a future for Gaza after Hamas, based upon the clear principles laid down last month by my friend, Secretary Blinken. Israelis and Palestinians both deserve a horizon of hope. So the United States continues to believe, as we have under administrations of both parties, that it is in the interest of both Israelis and Palestinians to move forward toward two states, living side by side in mutual security. Now, we know how hard that is, especially after October 7th. But ongoing instability and insecurity only play into the hands of Hamas. So we must think together about what lies beyond this terrible season of terror and war. And as we do, the United States will remain deeply committed to the security and self-defense of the state of Israel. As John F. Kennedy said in 1960, America's friendship with Israel is a national commitment. That was true then, and it's even truer now. The United States will remain Israel's closest friend in the world. And as I've said repeatedly, our support for Israel's security remains unshakable, and it always will. Thank you very much, and we'll be happy to take your questions. Um, all right, we'll start now with Karen Betzalel. Um, thank you. Secretary Austin, welcome to Israel. Um, it's not a secret that there is a gap between Israel and the U.S., so have you set any sort of either timetable or deadline to the current phase of Israel ground war in Gaza, and have you heard any firm assessment from the IDF where the current phase stand? And if I may, with regard to the North, um, Israel says, and, and the Minister Gallant has just repeated, that it will attack Lebanon if there won't be an acceptable solution that will include the uh, Hezbollah withdrawal north to the Litani River. Jake Sullivan was here last week, and he was quite confident that uh, such a solution can be achieved. Uh, what is the US, the U.S. position if Israel attack, and will you order the U.S. Army to strike and even destroy Hezbollah and Iranian target if required? And uh, Minister Gallant, um, it took the IDF 70 days to reach the tunnel that was uh, revealed yesterday. How long do you think it, it takes to totally dismantle the threat of the tunnel in Gaza? And if I may ask you, uh, Secretary, uh, Secretary Austin was speaking about uh, the day after. The American keeps asking Israel how it sees the day after. So what do you tell them? Who will rule, will rule Gaza? And will uh, the IDF be in Gaza throughout uh, the entire next year? Thank you very much. Which one of those 12 questions do you want me to ask? <laughs> I have more. <laughs> Regarding the timeline, this is Israel's operation. And I'm not here to dictate timelines 
or terms. Our support uh, to Israel's right to defend itself is ironclad, as you've heard me say a number of times, and that's not going to change. It's critical, as I said earlier, that Hamas uh, not be able to threaten Israel uh, from Gaza or even threaten Gaza uh, anymore. You know, that's an interest that we all share. That's a common interest with all of us. And so today we had great discussions about the status of the campaign, about goals and objectives, and about uh, how to reduce uh, harm to civilians uh, in the battle space uh, and, to, and the need to ensure uh, a sustained flow of humanitarian assistance uh, into Gaza. You know, we can offer some insight based upon our own experience in fighting terrorist groups, and certainly uh, that enabled us to have great, uh, great discussions. And we also have some great thoughts about um, how to transition from high-intensity operations to a lower intensity and more surgical operations. So we had uh, great discussions on all of those, uh, those issues. On Lebanon, uh, we've been clear that uh, we don't want to see this conflict widen into a, a, a uh, larger war or a regional war. And, uh, and we call upon uh, Hezbollah uh, to make sure that uh, they don't do things that would provoke a wider conflict. And that was Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin alongside the Israeli Defense Minister giving remarks on Israel's war with Hamas. We heard the Secretary of Defense reiterating U.S. support for Israel, but also reiterating the need to protect civilians in this conflict. I want to bring in foreign correspondent Britt Clinton in Tel Aviv, Israel, along with senior White House correspondent Selena Wang for more. Selena, this is the second time that the Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin is visiting Israel since October 7th. And he says that U.S. support for Israel's security is unshakable, but he also emphasized the need to protect civilians, calling it a moral duty and a strategic imperative. How significant is this trip, and what does it mean for the trajectory of the war? Yeah, look, it's a delicate balancing act, not just for the Secretary of Defense, but for the entire Biden administration. As you say, they're both trying to project that unshakable support for Israel while also becoming more vocal about the need to protect civilians amid the de devastation in Gaza. Some strong words from the Secretary of Defense there about how it is a moral imperative to protect civilians. This comes as the president himself just days before had some of his strongest criticisms of Israel, blaming, quote, indiscriminate bombing for Israel losing global support. He also had some other critical messages there. He mentioned condemning the Iranian proxies, calling out their attacks for destabilizing the region, calling on Iran to de-escalate. He also brought up the issue of hostages. This is a top priority from the president down all the way down and we know that the u.s believes there are still eight americans missing and that they're doing everything they can to try and negotiate another deal to get those hostages out now critically austin also said he spoke to the israelis about what happens when this fighting ends now the u.s has made clear they want to see a two-state solution a revitalized palestinian authority eventually ruling over gaza and that is something that the prime minister of israel has flat out rejected so the question is how do they get their clear Clearly, still daylight between these two countries on a whole host of issues. Britta, I want to go to you on this point uh, about Iran and hearing the Secretary of Defense speak directly to Iran, calling on them to de escalate these provocations by its proxies. You've seen firsthand this growing tension between Israel and Lebanon's Iran backed militant group Hezbollah. So, what's the latest on these concerns that this war could escalate beyond Gaza? Well, as Selena said, you know, this is a very delicate balancing act. You know, he said that they're working to make sure the war doesn't widen, uh, telling Iran to de-escalate, you know, uh, telling Israelis uh, and Palestinians uh, ha have both paid a bitter price uh, to go back to October 7th. So, you know, it's very clear that he's here on a mission 
to make sure this does not break out into a wider war. We've seen those tensions in the Red Sea. I was up in the northern Israeli border over the weekend. We saw the daily attacks fired from the Lebanese side, fired from the Israeli side. Uh, it is certainly uh, maintaining a level of intensity, and that is a concern that if they decide to go north and push into southern Lebanon to operate in that space, then it will bring in other players in the region. We also heard the Israeli defense minister talking about the humanitarian issues at bay uh, in Gaza, but also saying the biggest one of those is the hostages that still remain. We know that the director of the CIA is joining new hostage negotiations in Europe, so we'll be watching that very closely. Brick Clinton in Tel Aviv, senior White House correspondent Selena Wang, thank you both. Meanwhile, severe storms are slamming the East Coast. 11 states are under flood watches right now from Maryland to Maine. Wind gusts are reaching up to 60, 70 miles per hour in some areas of New England. That same system has been bringing heavy rain and a reported tornado in the southeast. Parts of Florida saw up to five inches of rain. South Carolina got more than 16 inches of rain falling in some parts. And at least 250,000 customers are without power this morning in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire. ABC News senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it all. That massive storm making its way into the Northeast. In New Jersey, drivers had to be rescued after cars stalled out in floodwaters. Cars hydroplaning through deep water along New York City's FDR Drive. The Carolina coastline getting hammered. An ocean overwash pushing ashore in Buxton, North Carolina, part of the Outer Banks. Winds wreaking havoc across South Carolina. This shopping center suffering severe damage after a reported tornado touched down. Pieces of the building ending up in the parking lot. Windows smashed after winds picked up debris and launched into this van. Winds toppling trailers and knocking down trees into houses in Horry County. When we were running, that's when we heard the glass breaking and we came out and then the tree was there. Areas near Charleston getting more than 16 inches of rain. AccuWeather captured first responders rescuing drivers in historic Georgetown. The same storm slamming Florida too. Conditions so bad there, this driver couldn't see the road ahead, going right over a seawall and into the intercoastal. His van floating. First responders, though, were able to rescue him. Oh, my God. And this power line igniting during the storm in St. Petersburg. Well, Diane, the main pulse of rain has moved east of us, as has the main core of the wind. It's pretty much still right now, so we'll take this after the rough night we had here along the Connecticut shoreline. But everybody had it, New York City, New Jersey, and obviously the, uh, all that went down in, in South Carolina and North Carolina with the flooding there. So another epic storm on a Monday. This one, though, much worse than last week's. And uh, certainly eastern Connecticut, eastern Connecticut, eastern New England will continue to get uh, uh, more in the way of wind before this thing begins to die down here finally and move its way out of here. But uh, still a lot of people without power, more power outages likely in eastern and northern parts of New England as this storm really, uh, I'd say it's a historic storm for this, certainly this time of year, eventually moves out later on tonight. Diane? All right, Rob Marciano, thank you. And ABC News Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z is tracking where that storm system is headed and what's coming behind it. Rough commute, to say the least. And I actually took video out of my commute because we were all backed up on the west side highway. This is so early. And that tree down in the middle of the highway there, we had gusts easily over 60 miles per hour, taking down trees, taking out power. You know, for now, it looks like more than 100,000 customers, at least in the northeast. And that will keep going through the day because we've got really gusty winds, those flood watches. There have been flash flood warnings, meaning you do not want to drive from Montclair all the way up toward Albany. And you can see where those uh, alerts go from southern Appalachia right there into western North Carolina up to Maine. Those are for high wind and they'll stick with us today. We even have some winter storm warnings on the map but let's focus on that wet and windy part because for New York City, Philadelphia, you're clear after about the noon 1 p.m. hour. Then it's still windy though and then it's blustery and really rainy from Boston up through Portland through the early evening and even you know far northern Maine through about midnight. Then we'll clear it all out and then we'll start to bring in the cooler air and the considerable snow, especially in the lee of the lakes. So that's why you saw some of those winter weather advisories in West Michigan and Western New York. Diane? All right, Ginger Z, thank you. And the storm is hitting just ahead of what's expected to be a record week of holiday travel. AAA says more than 115 million people will travel for the holidays, and extreme weather's already canceling and delaying flights. Here's a look at how many flights are in the air right now. 
We're also tracking some major news about Southwest Airlines. ABC News' Trevor Alt has more from Newark Airport. As the record holiday rush gets underway, severe weather causing travel trouble. More than 5,000 flights delayed and over 100 canceled Sunday alone. And as millions get ready to fly this morning, the Department of Transportation unveiling a record $140 million penalty against Southwest Airlines over last year's meltdown where 16,900 flights were canceled, stranding more than 2 million passengers. What we're doing here is sending a message to the entire airline industry. You need to take care of your passengers, and if you don't, there will be consequences. The DOT found Southwest failed to provide adequate customer service assistance, flight status notifications, or prompt refunds. Since then, Southwest paid out more than $600 million in refunds and reimbursements to travelers. But now the DOT is requiring they establish a $90 million compensation system for future passengers affected by significant delays and cancellations, including a $75 flight credit to pay any passenger whose flight gets delayed more than three hours when it's the airline's fault. Southwest saying in a statement, we are pleased that we reached an agreement with the DOT that prioritizes our customers. This record penalty is holding Southwest accountable for their failures, and it is sending a message to the entire industry with a new standard, a new level of accountability. And Diane, Southwest Airlines says they're going to be implementing this strategy, compensating passengers who experience significant delays by the end of April. Secretary Buttigieg says that the purpose of this massive fine is to set a new precedent. He says with a failure of this size, there has to be consequences. Diane. All right, Trevor Alt at Newark Airport, thank you. And stay with ABC News Live all day for the latest on weather and travel. But right now we have breaking news. Pope Francis has formally approved blessings for same-sex couples. In a new document, the Pope gives permission to, for priests to perform those blessings, saying people seeking God's love and mercy should not be subject to an exhaustive moral analysis to receive it. But the radical change doesn't mean the Vatican has changed its stance on same-sex marriage. The document explains that blessings should not be confused with the sacrament of marriage, maintaining that marriage is a lifelong sacrament between a man and a woman. Meanwhile, on Capitol Hill, members of the public are now paying tribute to the late Justice Sandra Day O'Connor as she lies in repose in the Supreme Court's Grand Hall. Justice O'Connor was the first woman to ever serve as a Supreme Court justice, paving the way for generations to come after her. She died earlier this month at age 93. Today, Justice Sonia Sotomayor talked about her historic impact. I will always remember the day Sandra was nominated to become the first female Supreme Court justice. Sitting in my district attorney's office in New York, I felt the gravity of her nomination. At a time when most states had no female justices on their high courts, and large firms of 300 to 500 lawyers touted having just one female partner, I knew that Sandra would open the door for women in the law and serve as an inspiration to girls across the country. Later on, she would often say, that it was good to be the first, but don't want to be the last. Justice O'Connor became the Supreme Court's first female justice in 1981. Her funeral will be held tomorrow at the Washington National Cathedral. President Biden and Supreme Court Chief Justice John Roberts will deliver eulogies. Meanwhile, Senate lawmakers in the White House are scrambling to reach a deal on a last-minute aid package for both Israel and Ukraine before heading home for the holidays. Republicans are insisting that any funding be tied to tighter immigration restrictions along the southern border of the U.S. ABC's Jay O'Brien joins me now on Capitol Hill for more. Jay, the president says there is room for compromise here. So what's the timeline right now, and when do they need to reach an agreement? Well, the reality, Diane, is that time is running out. The White House has said that Ukraine needs additional U.S. aid to replenish its stockpile, replenish its coffers by the end of this year, or there could be serious consequences on the battlefield in its defense against Russia. Now, we know that, that Ukraine aid, as you said here on Capitol Hill, has been inextricably linked through the desires of Republicans to changes to immigration policy, not just money for border security, but changes 
changes to immigration policy. That means that aid for Ukraine, also additional aid for Israel and for Taiwan, is tied up until Republicans and Democrats can come to agreement as to exactly what those policy changes would look like. We know that Republicans and Democrats negotiated throughout the weekend a small group of senators who've been trying to hash this out behind closed doors. We know that those negotiations have continued and lawmakers have said that they've improved, but lawmakers have also come out from behind closed doors and said they're pessimistic that a deal can be reached by the end of this week when the Senate goes out for the holidays. The House is already out, by the way. They said they might come back if there's a deal reached in the Senate, but I can tell you I've talked to lawmakers on both sides of the aisle, keenly familiar with this issue in foreign policy and aid for Ukraine, who tell me they believe that this would all get settled if it, it really, they believe, in the new year, Diane. And Jay, the U.S. Capitol Police is now telling ABC News that they're aware of a video circulating since last week that reportedly shows sexual activity in the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee hearing room. Now, ABC News hasn't verified this video, but can you tell us the latest on what you're hearing about this? Yeah, Diane, U.S. Capitol Police said they are looking into this video that purports to show a sex act between two men inside of that Senate hearing room. The hearing room is the room of, as you said, the storied Senate Judiciary Committee. Inside that hearing room have been the 9-11 Commission hearings, for instance, as well as countless Senate confirmations as well. The video was obtained by the conservative outlet, The Daily Caller. And again, ABC News has not independently verified the video. It has also not verified the identities of the individuals that are purported to be in the video. It appears one Senate staffer has been fired as a result of this video. Diane. All right, ABC's Jay O'Brien on Capitol Hill. Thank you. Coming up, a new warning about some popular children's toys. What to know before holiday shopping for little ones? We have details after the break. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. Welcome to Crooks, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day on the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner, oh, Crooks 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to ABC News Live. First, we have a new warning about some popular children's toys this holiday season. ABC News business reporter Alexis Christophers has more on what you should know before shopping for little ones. Alexis? Well, retailers are already responding to this latest warning, Diane. So Walmart, Target, and Amazon say they will stop selling water beads marketed to kids over growing safety concerns. So these are small, colorful gel balls. They're made of super absorbent polymers 
They look like candy, right? Well, they're often sold as toys, including in craft activity kits and as sensory tools for children with disabilities. But the Consumer Product Safety Commission is now warning that they should not be in homes and schools with kids three years or younger. When they're dry, these water beads can be as small as a cupcake sprinkle. But the agency warns that if the beads are ingested, they can continue to grow inside the body and could lead to life-threatening injuries. They can also end up in ears, causing damage or hearing loss. The agency he says water bead related injuries accounted for nearly 8,000 emergency room visits between 2016 and last year. Now, Walmart says it's already taken steps to remove the products in stores and online. Target promises to do the same, but not until January, which means parents will still see them out there as they holiday shop. Amazon is giving sellers until December 22nd to stop marketing those water beads, Diane, as toys. Well, all right, good to know, Alexis. Water beads also, they're not the only thing that the Safety Commission is warning parents and, and other people shopping for that matter about. So right. what, what else should we be on the lookout for? This is a popular one that my kids wanted when they were little. We never did buy it, I must say. Uh, but if you are in the market for a non-motorized scooter, you may want to consider these new stats from the Consumer Product Safety Commission. The agency says in 2022, these popular scooters were responsible for one in every five toy-related injuries to kids 14 and younger. Overall, the agency says non-motorized scooters sent over 35,000 people of all ages to the emergency room last year. They stress, of course, always have the right gear, including a helmet if you are using a scooter. And it's really not just just about what you buy, it's where you buy it. Experts recommend buying toys from a trusted retailer or manufacturer. And if it's online through a third party seller, you want to look for an independent certification mark, Diane, that you can usually find that right near the manufacturer's label to make sure it was tested by an independent third party and that product has been vetted. It's great advice. Alexis, thank you. Sure. Coming up, it is Motivation Monday. Peloton instructor Adrian Williams joins me live to help us jumpstart our week. Stay with us. So much at stake, so much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Give it to me. number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. We have really good news. <laughs> Congratulations, you're I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions. Their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. Reporting in Las Vegas at the UNLV shootings, I'm Jacqueline Lee. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. First, it is time for Motivation Monday, where we bring guests on that will help us kickstart our week. Today, we're excited to have on Peloton instructor and competitive sprinter, Adrian Williams. Adrian's known for his tough yet lighthearted classes. He leads with a sense of humor and tries to leave his students with a positive message. And Adrian Williams joins me now to tell us more about that. Adrian, thanks so much for coming on. Thank it's you great for to have me. you. 
I want to first start with your story and okay. how you went about establishing healthy habits for yourself. So I think from a young age, I've kind of had great parenting, right? So it was my mom, it was my dad, it was my grandma. They all established um, healthy patterns for me, whether it was eating, being physical, um, checking in on my own personal mental health. Those are like the three things in terms of pillars that were very important to me when I was a kid. And then sleep was probably the last thing that I learned um, that was added into there. Yeah, a lot of us miss that part until sleep. later on in life. Um, I love this phrase, though. You say, never give up because great things take time. Correct. But some of us don't have a lot of patience or willpower, especially after a stress day. So how do you go about, what's your advice for how we can stay consistent and establish routines we can actually stick to? Well, I think when I think about the overarching sustainable wellness, right? Mental health, physical health, nutrition, and sleep. Those are the four most important things. So paying attention to all of them, doing daily check-ins with yourself, seeing how you're feeling mentally, right? Physically, always finding the thing that makes you feel the most empowered that is generally easy when it comes to workouts, I think is what you should start with. Um, once you've built confidence into something where it becomes physical activity, I think it helps you move better. And then the nutrition, which is tough around the holidays, right? It's that time where you're having trouble, you're going to holiday parties, but understanding what you need specifically for your body and then making sure you're getting eight hours. <laughs> I know that's tough, but sleep is probably the most important thing because it plays such a role in cognitive function. And then when you have good cognitive function, you're able to, you know, attack daily tasks throughout the day. I wrote a book about sleep. So we talk about that a lot on this show. Um, you talked about doing things that make you feel empowered and yes. confident. We've all been there where we go to the gym and you're like, I'm here, but now I have no idea what I'm going to do. And you kind of feel a little bit self-conscious. Mm -hmm. So any thoughts on kind of creative ways that people can find ways to move particularly with the new year coming up in a way that does make them feel confident? I think simple is key. So knowing uh, in terms of timing, how much you have to put into something. So a, the buddy system is always, I think, one of the best things. Having a friend that you can do something with and Peloton offers that on a leaderboard, right? We create a sense of community by engaging with someone that you might not see, but you can do something with on a daily routine. Um, I think 10 minutes, 20 minutes is all you need to sort of feel empowered and to start your day. And then from there, once you've built that confidence, it becomes something that your body craves. Sky's the limit from there. Adrian, <laughs> thank you so much for yeah. coming on. It's thank, great to talk to you. Thank you for having you. me. Our pleasure. And thank yeah. you at home for streaming with us. I am Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, analysis, and motivation. We'll be right back. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime, we'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news, only on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. Welcome to Crux, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day on the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner of Crux 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. 
all across the globe, the world will be celebrating the new year. And you can see it as it happens live. The global celebrations. See the new year as it comes in live. Streaming all day and night on ABC News Live. ABC News, America's number one news source. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. Thanks for streaming with us. You were looking at a foggy New York City on this Monday, and we have a lot of news to get to. Here's the rundown right now. Severe storms are slamming the East Coast. 11 states are under flood watches right now from Maryland to Maine. Wind gusts are reaching up to 60 and 70 miles per hour in areas of New England. That same system has also been bringing heavy rain and a reported tornado in the southeast. At least 200,000 customers are without power this morning in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. Rhode Island. The storm's hitting just ahead of what's expected to be a record week of holiday travel. AAA says more than 115 million people will travel for the holidays, and extreme weather's already canceling and delaying flights. Officials are investigating after a freight train demolished an 18-wheeler near Fort Worth, Texas. Investigators say the truck got stuck while crossing the tracks and was hit by a Union Pacific train. 17 of the train cars and two of its engines derailed. Union Pacific says the conductor was the only person injured in the crash, suffering minor injuries. The NFL playoffs are taking shape after a big weekend of football. The Baltimore Ravens clinched a spot and are sitting alone atop of the AFC after beating the Jaguars 32-7. The Dallas Cowboys punched their ticket despite losing to the Bills in Buffalo. And the New York Jets have been eliminated for the 13th straight year, just as Aaron Rodgers could reportedly be medically cleared to play next week. Members of the public are now paying tribute to late Justice Sandra Day O'Connor as she lies in repose in the Supreme Court's Grand Hall. Justice O'Connor was the first woman to ever serve as a Supreme Court justice, paving the way for generations to come after her. She died earlier this month at age 93. Earlier, Justice Sonia Sotomayor talked about her historic impact. I will always remember the day Sandra was nominated to become the first female Supreme Court justice. Sitting in my district attorney's office in New York, I felt the gravity of her nomination. At a time when most states had no female justices on their high courts, and large firms of 300 to 500 lawyers touted having just one female partner, I knew that Sandra would open the door for women in the law and serve as an inspiration to girls across the country. Later on, she would often say, that it was good to be the first, but don't want to be the last. And senior national correspondent Terry Moran and ABC News Supreme Court contributor Kate Shaw join me now for more. Kate, what did Sandra Day O'Connor being named to the court mean, not only for the future justices who followed in her footsteps, including Sotomayor, but women in the legal field in general? Well, it was a watershed moment. I don't think there's any question about that. And it's pretty interesting because Ronald Reagan actually said he wanted to put the first woman on the Supreme Court. If you think back to more recent history, uh, President Biden actually took a lot of criticism for saying that he wanted to put the first black woman on the Supreme Court. And then, of course, he did nominate and see confirmed Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson. But there's actually a long history of presidents specifically seeking out demographic features in their nominees. He wanted to put a woman on the court and he found her. She didn't come from, you know, a federal appeals court uh, perch. She wasn't even a lawyer practicing in the federal courts. She spent most of her career in the rough and tumble world of Arizona politics in the state Senate, rising to be the majority leader in the state Senate, and then on a state intermediate appeals court. So it was in many ways an unlikely path to the highest court in the land, um, but she more than rose to the occasion once she arrived, became a formidable presence on the court, but one who always took a fairly modest view of the role of the court in a democracy. She thought, you know, the justices should be minimalist, they should think about the consequences of their rulings, and they should not act as though they were the most important player in our constitutional scheme. Mostly the political branches should run the show and the court should just make sure that the system of democracy was functioning properly. Terry, there are so many facets of her legacy now being unpacked. What stuck out to you most from what we heard in that ceremony today? Well, it was great to hear from Justice Sotomayor about Sandra Day O'Connor, the justice 
off the court, not just on the court. And the way that she brought the court together, there's a saying that every new justice changes the whole court because it's such a small group of people that the social dynamic has changed. And Sandra Day O'Connor changed it, as Justice Sotomayor pointed out. The court in the past uh, you know, had been a place of coldness, sometimes fierce enmity with justices kind of backstabbing uh, each other. In fact, it may, it may be drifting in that way now again. But she came on with a kind of politician's touch. As, as Kate just mentioned, she was a practiced politician. She brought them together. She insisted that they lunch together all the time. Sometimes she'd kind of buttonhole them. She was tough, tough-minded, but also fun. She was known as really one of the <clears throat> main socialites in Washington, she and her husband John, for a long time. And I think that, <clears throat> excuse me, that contribution to the court is substantive, because she was able to occupy the center, which she did so long, in a way that could bring along some of her colleagues. And I think at base, the, the most important contribution she brought to the court was a pragmatism, a deeply humane pragmatism incremental change. They, she didn't have a grand theory of everything to change the world with one stroke of her pen. What she wanted to do was judge the case before her properly, truly respecting the participants in the case and the law that she was sworn to apply. Terry, the funeral is taking place tomorrow at the National Cathedral. What can we expect to see and particularly to hear from both the president and the chief justice tomorrow? Well, the, the Chief Justice will speak in his formal capacity and his personal capacity. You could see on the Justice's face uh, at that ceremony at the Capitol the deep pain uh, that they have in losing such a, a treasured colleague. And he will speak for her role as, as, patriot, as a patriotic justice of the United States and what she did for the country. Uh, President Biden, I think, wants to take off on... on who she was in the court, that, that vital center that she occupied, that sense that she had that sides could come together in cases and reach pragmatic uh, decisions that would not, as I say, revolutionize and overturn existing arrangements, but would give the democratic branches and the people of the country more of an opportunity to consider the issue, those burning issues that come before the court, and continue to work on them. I, I think President Biden will pick up on that in this divided time and also pick up on her commitment to civic education. She believed passionately that if we know about our country, its history, its institutions, its flaws, its nobility, all of it together, the country will work better. And I think President Biden will talk about that as well. Kate, how do you think Justice O'Connor's impact on the court is still being felt today? Well, I think there's a lot of reflecting right now on her and her legacy. And one thing that's really come to mind for me is her open-mindedness during her nearly 25 years on the bench. You actually saw her views evolve on questions like abortion, affirmative action, uh, gay rights. These are issues that she actually took a pretty conservative position on in the 1980s when she was first on the court. But her views changed as she heard arguments and worked through questions with colleagues. And she wrote you know, the opinion upholding the core uh, right to abortion first announced in Roe. That was the Casey opinion. Um, she sided with affirmative action in 2003 in the Grutter case. Again, really, her views evolved, but open-mindedness, I think, was really central to her. She didn't come in with fully baked views on every issue. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of people think the court could use a dose of, open-mindedness and humility. Um, it's not clear you see a ton of that on display with this court in which people are pretty fixed in their ideological and partisan corners, um, and there's not a lot of kind of moderation or wiggle room. I think the Chief Justice probably wishes there was more of that on the court because he really is kind of the center and the most moderate justice on the court in many ways right now. So I wonder if that's something that will be alluded to or at least in the air uh, tomorrow and just as the reflections continue on her life and legacy. All right, we will be watching and listening. Terry Moran, Kate Shaw, thank you both. Meanwhile, YouTube parenting influencer Ruby Frankie is expected to plead guilty today after being charged with felony child abuse. Frankie was known for so-called tough love parenting. Now the Utah mom is admitting to abusing her own children while also blaming someone else. Eva Pilgrim has the latest. A dramatic new turn in the case against former YouTube momfluencer Ruby Frankie. I'm not even going to let you eat breakfast until you get your chores done. 
The Utah mother of six now expected to take a plea deal after being charged with six counts of felony child abuse. Her lawyers in a statement saying, Ruby Frankie is a devoted mother and is also a woman committed to constant improvement, and she is taking responsibility for the part she played in the events leading up to her incarceration. I think that her defense by itself would have been a really difficult sell to a jury. She's the mom, she's responsible for these kids, and they were subjected to horrific abuse. Today we are starting off our day the way we do every day. Known for her no-nonsense parenting approach on her since-deleted YouTube channel. Keeping them home from school and wiping the floorboards would like really bring pain. Frankie amassed more than 2 million followers documenting the lives of her six children. But her social media empire collapsed when her 12-year-old son escaped from her former business partner Jody Hildebrandt's home, prompting this chilling 911 call from a neighbor. I just had a 12-year-old boy show up here at my front door asking for help. He's emaciated, he's got tape around his legs, he's hungry and he's thirsty. Frankie now seemingly pointing the finger at Hildebrandt. Frankie's team claiming Hildebrandt isolated her from her family and that Frankie was subjected to a distorted sense of morality shaped by Ms. Hildebrandt's influence. The two often seen together in videos. Those of you who are angry about principles, come and be taught. <laughs> We'd love to have you. Hildebrandt now facing six counts of aggravated child abuse. Her niece speaking with our Juju Chang after her arrest. All of these these theories and these modalities and these these parenting ideas that all comes from Jody. This is very significant for Jody's defense team because this essentially signals that she's going to testify against her. We did reach out to Hildebrandt's attorneys. They have not responded to our requests for comment. Diane. All right, Ava Pilgrim, thank you. Coming up, Trump under fire again. What the former president said on the campaign trail that some say echoes white supremacists and Nazi Germany. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel Hamas War. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand. These were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions. Their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live.
Get Ready America every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Former President Trump is facing backlash for comments he made about immigrants while on the campaign trail. Critics say his words echo those of Hitler, as he also praised authoritarian leaders, even quoting Russian President Vladimir Putin. ABC News senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott has the latest, with less than a month until the first votes are cast in the 2024 Republican primary. On the campaign trail, former President Donald Trump is drawing big crowds in a swing through early voting states, but coming under fire for these anti-immigrant comments he made in New Hampshire this weekend. They're poisoning the blood of our country. That's what they've done. That language echoes white supremacists and was used by Adolf Hitler in his autobiographical manifesto, Mein Kampf, where Hitler criticized mixing races, calling it, quote, blood poisoning. Trump has repeatedly used the phrase. He's disgusting. And what he's doing is dog whistling to Americans who feel absolutely under stress and strain from the economy and from the conflicts around the world. And he's dog whistling it to blame it on people from areas that don't look like us. If elected, Trump promised to carry out mass deportations, deputizing the National Guard to arrest undocumented immigrants. I will terminate every open borders policy of the Biden administration, stop the invasion of our southern border and begin the largest domestic deportation operation in American history. On the campaign trail, the former president also praising dictators, at one point invoking Russian President Vladimir Putin, using quotes from a top U.S. adversary to attack President Biden. Vladimir Putin, has anybody ever heard of Vladimir Putin? Of Russia says that Biden's, and this is a quote, politically motivated persecution of his political rival is very good for Russia because it shows the rottenness of the American political system. The Biden campaign responding with a blistering statement, writing Trump parroted Adolf Hitler, praised Kim Jong-un, and quoted Vladimir Putin while running for president on a promise to rule as a dictator and threaten American democracy. And Trump's own words turning off some Republican voters. He takes things to the extremes, and this is part of the drama we're trying to get away from. There's no reason for it. But the former president is still the far and away front runner, ahead of his Republican rivals by 50 points. He's not afraid to hurt people's feelings, and there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> People really need to toughen up a little bit. Diane, of course, former President Donald Trump has pleaded not guilty to 91 criminal charges. He will certainly have a lot to juggle between his legal calendar and the court calendar. Our friends over at 538 took a look at the historical data, and they found that no presidential candidate has ever been this far ahead in the national polls and gone on to lose the nomination. Diane. Senior Congressional Correspondent Rachel Scott, thank you. And Iowa's caucuses are now less than a month away, and the New Hampshire primary is just a week after that. So our team of ABC News 2024 campaign embeds are fanning out across Iowa and New Hampshire to ask voters there what's driving them. Here's Jay O'Brien with ABC's Trail Mix series. As crucial presidential primaries in Iowa and New Hampshire near, Republican voters there reacting to the ongoing impeachment inquiry into President Biden. I think there's certainly enough um, there to, to warrant at least looking into it. If there was some validity to it, and then yes, I would say that, that they should look into that. Thus far, there hasn't been. The first in the nation Iowa caucuses now less than a month away. Voters there are concerned about the economy. The money I make today is basically the same money as I made 20 years ago, and I'm no further ahead in life. The same worries more than a thousand miles away in New Hampshire. Entering adulthood post-college, um, I feel like the job market is slim, and the housing prices keep going up. Abortion rights polarizing as candidates grapple with a historic lawsuit from Kate Cox challenging Texas's abortion ban and its effect on women's health care. I don't think that anybody should have a right to discuss medical options 
about someone else's body. I'm hoping that they have good judgment on that. Former President Trump still dominating most primary polls. Other GOP hopefuls looking to grow their support in these crucial remaining weeks. I like Vivek. I would probably say Ron DeSantis. I'd have to say uh, Trump, really. When people walk into the voting booth, that's when they're going to decide who they really want. ABC's Jay O'Brien, thanks for that. Coming up, from high speed to high tea, Jason Momoa and Patrick Wilson join our Maggie Ruley on an action-packed London adventure right after the break. We have really good I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions, their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. National forests are good places to get away. But sometimes bad things happen in good places. It's the stuff of nightmares. All I could see was their feet sticking up. My knees went weak. This is a human skull. We were definitely against the clock. How many more victims are out there? Wild Crime, Blood Mountain. Now streaming only on Hulu. Thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. All across the globe, the world will be celebrating the new year. And you can see it as it happens live. The global celebrations. See the new year as it comes in live. Streaming all day and night on ABC News Live. Reporting from the Federal Reserve, I'm ABC's Elizabeth Schulze. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom splashes into theaters Friday, but before stars Jason Momoa and Patrick Wilson grace the big screen in the superhero sequel, they delighted our Maggie Rooley with everything from high speed to high tea on an action-packed London adventure. Take a look. Yeah! Jason Momoa and his aquatic alter ego Aquaman have a lot more in common than you think. They both know how to wield a trident. And they're both quite comfortable on the water. Ready, go. Okay, yeah. Go. Cha! Cha! 
<laughs> Ripping through the River Thames, we caught up with Jason in London. Look at that. That's ridiculous. Atlantis is way cooler. <laughs> That's true. That's like, very ooh, true. Cool killer bridge. I don't know if you've seen my movie, but ours is way bigger. Or what would you want people to know about Aquaman that they might not know? I think he really, really wants to um, have a brother and connect with his brother. That's heartwarming. He's not going to tell no one. Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you. <laughs> this is Don't tell secret. anyone else. You know the deal here. No spoilers. But speaking of that brother. Bravo, brother. High five. Do not call me brother. We met up with Patrick Wilson for quite the high tea. Jason, you actually volunteered to be mother. I'll be mother. I'll be mother. Will I'll you, mother. Will you great please support for us? I will. Ladies first. I'm oh, why, thank you so here. much. Look at the stance. Wow. Yeah, no. Okay. My this power, is really. Power stance <laughs> <is> <laughs> See this? You getting you this lunch? Have you seen mother do oh this? My God. And after we sip. Oh, I... that's a tasty treat. <laughs> Some good tea. <laughs> it's time to spill. There you go. Well, you know, I have to say something I love about the two of you is that you're brothers on the screen, but I feel like there's a little romance, uh, bromance going on You here. said romance. I did, I slipped. Chemistry is a funny thing. Mm. First of all, we're both very, very, very busy people in our own lives, for sure, and so I think the relationship on screen has to come from two people that want to be there and want to have a good time, and, 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 and we do. Well, I think what's fun about the new movie is that you guys don't have to hate each other the whole time. Yeah. It seems like you're, you're you teaming up a bit. Yeah. You choose to. <laughs> <laughs> so what was it like to sort of be on the same side in this movie? When you come from these two different worlds, mm -hmm. where, I, where I suck at something, he's great at it, and where he yep. sucks at something, I'm great at it, and so when we come together to do something positive. And True King builds bridges, right? <laughs> True King builds bridges. And it's what these stars have brought from their personal lives that really help these characters shine. We always talk about uh, whether you're playing somebody super serious or super mm. funny. It's like, how much do you, do you go to the character? How much does the character come to you? And I think what this film has done even more than the first film is this character has come to him. I'm a husband and a father. And I wouldn't have it any other way. You play this character for so long. You're like, I would love to see him this way. I wanted to walk that line where you're like, being a king, dealing with all that mm -hmm. in a world that's getting completely polluted. Being a father for the first time, he's obviously the reluctant king who's now king and then also being a husband and just like balancing yeah. all that and he's exhausted. And I am. Being a great father. The that's that part. Like, <laughs> Maggie Ruley, ABC News, <laughs> London. Maggie, thank you, and thank you for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. We'll be right back. ABC News, America's number one news source. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Give it to me. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. You're
Well, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love that. Me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. I'm Matt Cuffin reporting along the front lines of the war with Israel. Wherever the news is, we'll take you there. They're streaming ABC News Live. I'm Diane Macedo. Today on ABC News Live First, the high stakes discussions to get more hostages released from Gaza. What we know about the status of the talks and what the IDF is saying about the biggest Hamas tunnel uncovered so far. Dangerous weather coast to coast. A powerful East Coast storm is on the move, bringing a flash flood emergency. How it's impacting holiday travel and when the West Coast could see heavy rain and snow. And it's Motivation Monday. Peloton instructor Adrian Williams is joining me live to help us jumpstart our week on a positive note. But we begin with Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, who's in Israel, meeting with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu today. Earlier in a press conference with the Israeli Defense Minister, Austin reiterated U.S. support for Israel's security and self-defense. But the Secretary also talked about encouraging a more surgical approach to the fighting in Gaza and the importance of protecting civilian life. ABC's Aika Jachi has the latest. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin in Israel today with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to discuss the Biden administration's push to transition into a more focused phase of the war. So I discussed pathways today toward a future for Gaza after Hamas. Israelis and Palestinians both deserve a horizon of hope. The Department of Defense says Austin will discuss Israel's criteria for deciding when and how to move to a stability operation inside Gaza, focusing on safety and support to civilians, ending its current major military offensive. Protecting Palestinian civilians in Gaza is both a moral duty and a strategic imperative. Austin also hoping to quell concerns of a wider regional conflict. This as Israel and Hezbollah in Lebanon continue to exchange cross-border fire. Meanwhile, tensions continue to rise in the Red Sea. Over the weekend, American and British warships shooting down 15 unmanned drones in the Red Sea from Houthis attacking commercial vessels. This after the group hijacked an Israeli-linked ship in November. Still, hostage negotiations continue following the deaths of three Israeli hostages by Israeli soldiers over the weekend. Israel saying the soldiers initially fired because they thought they saw a threat. More than 100 hostages are still being held in Gaza. A U.S. official telling ABC News the director of the CIA, Bill Burns, is meeting leaders from Israel and Qatar in Europe to join those high-stakes discussions. Aikajachi, thank you. Meanwhile, severe storms are slamming the East Coast. 11 states are under flood watches right now from Maryland to Maine. Wind gusts are reaching up to 60, 70 miles per hour in some areas of New England. That same system has been bringing heavy rain and a reported tornado in the southeast. Parts of Florida saw up to five inches of rain. South Carolina got more than 16 inches of rain falling in some parts. And at least 250,000 customers are without power this morning in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire. ABC News senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it all. That massive storm making its way into the Northeast. In New Jersey, drivers had to be rescued after cars stalled out in floodwaters. Cars hydroplaning through deep water along New York City's FDR Drive. The Carolina coastline getting hammered. 
An ocean overwash pushing ashore in Buxton, North Carolina, part of the Outer Banks. Winds wreaking havoc across South Carolina. This shopping center suffering severe damage after a reported tornado touched down. Pieces of the building ending up in the parking lot. Windows smashed after winds picked up debris and launched into this van. Winds toppling trailers and knocking down trees into houses in Horry County. When we were running, that's when we heard the glass breaking and we came out and then the tree was there. Areas near Charleston getting more than 16 inches of rain. AccuWeather captured first responders rescuing drivers in historic Georgetown. The same storm slamming Florida too. Conditions so bad there, this driver couldn't see the road ahead, going right over a seawall and into the intercoastal. His van floating. First responders, though, were able to rescue him. Oh, my God. And this power line igniting during the storm in St. Petersburg. Well, Diane, the main pulse of rain has moved east of us, as has the main core of the wind. It's pretty much still right now, so we'll take this after the rough night we had here along the Connecticut shoreline. But everybody had it, New York City, New Jersey, and obviously the, uh, all that went down in, in South Carolina and North Carolina with the flooding there. So another epic storm on a Monday. This one, though, much worse than last week's. And uh, certainly eastern Connecticut, eastern Connecticut, eastern New England will continue to get uh, uh, more in the way of wind before this thing begins to die down here finally and move its way out of here but uh, still a lot of people without power more power outages likely in eastern and northern parts of new england as this storm really uh i'd say it's a historic storm for this certainly this time of year eventually moves out later on tonight diane all right, Rob Marciano, thank you. And ABC News Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z is tracking where that storm system is headed and what's coming behind it. Rough commute, to say the least. And I actually took video out of my commute because we were all backed up on the west side highway. This is so early. And that tree down in the middle of the highway there, we had gusts easily over 60 miles per hour, taking down trees, taking out power. You know, for now, it looks like more than 100,000 customers, at least in the northeast. And that will keep going through the day because we've got really gusty winds. Those flood watches, there have been flash flood warnings, meaning you do not want to drive from Montclair all the way up toward Albany. And you can see where those uh, alerts go from southern Appalachia right there into western North Carolina up to Maine. Those are for high wind and they'll stick with us today. We even have some winter storm warnings on the map, but let's focus on that wet and windy part because for New York City, Philadelphia, you're clear after about the noon 1 p.m. hour. Then it's still windy though and then it's blustery and really rainy from Boston up through Portland through the early evening and even you know far northern Maine through about midnight. Then we'll clear it all out and then we'll start to bring in the cooler air and the considerable snow, especially in the lee of the lakes. So that's why you saw some of those winter weather advisories in West Michigan and Western New York. Diane? All right, Ginger Z, thank you. And the storm is hitting just ahead of what's expected to be a record week of holiday travel. AAA says more than 115 million people will travel for the holidays and extreme weather's already canceling and delaying flights. Here's a look at how many flights are in the air right now. We're also tracking some major news about Southwest Airlines. ABC News' Trevor Alt has more from Newark Airport. As the record holiday rush gets underway, severe weather causing travel trouble. More than 5,000 flights delayed and over 100 canceled Sunday alone. And as millions get ready to fly, this morning the Department of Transportation unveiling a record $140 million penalty against Southwest Airlines over last year's meltdown, where 16,900 flights were canceled, stranding more than 2 million passengers. What we're doing here is sending a message to the entire airline industry. You need to take care of your passengers, and if you don't, there will be consequences. The DOT found Southwest failed to provide adequate customer service assistance, flight status notifications, or prompt refunds. Since then, Southwest paid out more than $600 million in refunds and reimbursements to travelers. But now the DOT is requiring they establish a $90 million compensation system for future passengers affected by significant delays and cancellations, including a $75 flight credit to pay any passenger whose flight gets delayed more than three hours when it's the airline's fault. Southwest saying in a statement, we are pleased that we reached an agreement with the DOT that prioritizes our customers. This record penalty is holding Southwest accountable for their failures, and it is sending a message to the entire industry with a new standard, a new level of accountability. 
And Diane, Southwest Airlines says they're going to be implementing this strategy, compensating passengers who experience significant delays by the end of April. Secretary Buttigieg says that the purpose of this massive fine is to set a new precedent. He says with a failure of this size, there has to be consequences. Diane. All right, Trevor Alt at Newark Airport. Thank you. And stay with ABC News Live all day for the latest on weather and travel. But right now we have breaking news. Pope Francis has formally approved blessings for same-sex couples. In a new document, the Pope gives permission to, for priests to perform those blessings, saying people seeking God's love and mercy should not be subject to an exhaustive moral analysis to receive it. But the radical change doesn't mean the Vatican has changed its stance on same-sex marriage. The document explains that blessings should not be confused with the sacrament of marriage, maintaining that marriage is a lifelong sacrament between a man and a woman. Meanwhile, on Capitol Hill, members of the public are now paying tribute to the late Justice Sandra Day O'Connor as she lies in repose in the Supreme Court's Grand Hall. Justice O'Connor was the first woman to ever serve as a Supreme Court justice, paving the way for generations to come after her. She died earlier this month at age 93. Today, Justice Sonia Sotomayor talked about her historic impact. I will always remember the day Sandra was nominated to become the first female Supreme Court justice. Sitting in my district attorney's office in New York, I felt the gravity of her nomination. At a time when most states had no female justices on their high courts, and large firms of 300 to 500 lawyers touted having just one female partner, I knew that Sandra would open the door for women in the law and serve as an inspiration to girls across the country. Later on, she would often say, that it was good to be the first, but don't want to be the last. Justice O'Connor became the Supreme Court's first female justice in 1981. Her funeral will be held tomorrow at the Washington National Cathedral. President Biden and Supreme Court Chief Justice John Roberts will deliver eulogies. Meanwhile, Senate lawmakers in the White House are scrambling to reach a deal on a last-minute aid package for both Israel and Ukraine before heading home for the holidays. Republicans are insisting that any funding be tied to tighter immigration restrictions along the southern border of the U.S. ABC's Jay O'Brien joins me now on Capitol Hill for more. Jay, the president says there is room for compromise here. So what's the timeline right now, and when do they need to reach an agreement? Well, the reality, Diane, is that time is running out. The White House has said that Ukraine needs additional U.S. aid to replenish its stockpile, replenish its coffers by the end of this year, or there could be serious consequences on the battlefield in its defense against Russia. Now, we know that, that Ukraine aid, as you said here on Capitol Hill, has been inextricably linked through the desires of Republicans to changes to immigration policy, not just money for border security, but changes to immigration policy. That means that aid for Ukraine, also additional aid for Israel and for Taiwan, is tied up until Republicans and Democrats can come to agreement as to exactly what those policy changes would look like. We know that Republicans and Democrats negotiated throughout the weekend a small group of senators who've been trying to hash this out behind closed doors. We know that those negotiations have continued and lawmakers have said that they've improved, but lawmakers have also come out from behind closed doors and said they're pessimistic that a deal can be reached by the end of this week when the Senate goes out for the holidays. The House is already out, by the way. They said they might come back if there's a deal reached in the Senate. But I can tell you I've talked to lawmakers on both sides of the aisle, keenly familiar with this issue in foreign policy and aid for Ukraine, who tell me they believe that this would all get settled if it, it really, they believe, in the new year, Diane. And Jay, the U.S. Capitol Police is now telling ABC News that they're aware of a video circulating since last week that reportedly shows sexual activity in the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee hearing room. Now, ABC News hasn't verified this video, but can you tell us the latest on what you're hearing about this? Yeah, Diane, U.S. Capitol Police said they are looking into this video that purports to show a sex act between two men inside of that Senate hearing room. The hearing room is the room of, as you said, the storied Senate Judiciary Committee. Inside that hearing room have been the 9-11 Commission hearings, for instance, as well as countless Senate confirmations as well. The video was obtained by the conservative outlet, The Daily Caller. And again, ABC News has not independently verified the 
video. It has also not verified the identities of the individuals that are purported to be in the video. It appears one Senate staffer has been fired as a result of this video. Diane. All right, ABC's Jay O'Brien on Capitol Hill. Thank you. Coming up, a new warning about some popular children's toys. What to know before holiday shopping for little ones? We have details after the break. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fort, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. Welcome to Crufts, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day on the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner of Crufts 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, from Poland once again tonight. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Do you think you'll ever be able to go back home? We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Splintered houses and splintered lives. And the magnitude of the devastation. You're streaming ABC News Live. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Raleigh, North Carolina. The U.S. Capitol. Mayfield, Kentucky. Minneapolis. Mexico. Tongass National Forest, Alaska. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. Giving you a front row seat to our world as it plays out in real time, live. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, America's most honored streaming news program, only on ABC News Live. Streaming free right now, wherever you stream your news. Welcome back to ABC News Live. First, we have a new warning about some popular children's toys this holiday season. ABC News business reporter Alexis Christophers has more on what you should know before shopping for little ones. Alexis? Well, retailers are already responding to this latest warning, Diane. So Walmart, Target, and Amazon say they will stop selling water beads marketed to kids over growing safety concerns. So these are small, colorful gel balls. They're made of super absorbent polymers. They look like candy, right? Well, they're often sold as toys, including in craft activity kits and as sensory tools for children with disabilities. But the Consumer Product Safety Commission is now warning that they should not be in homes and schools with kids three years or younger. When they're dry, these water beads can be as small as a cupcake sprinkle. But the agency warns that if the beads are ingested, they can continue to grow inside the body and could lead to life-threatening injuries. They can also end up in ears, causing damage or hearing loss. The agency 
Agency says water bead related injuries accounted for nearly 8,000 emergency room visits between 2016 and last year. Now, Walmart says it's already taken steps to remove the products in stores and online. Target promises to do the same, but not until January, which means parents will still see them out there as they holiday shop. Amazon is giving sellers until December 22nd to stop marketing those water beads, Diane, as toys. Well, all right, good to know, Alexis. Water beads also, they're not the only thing that the Safety Commission is warning parents and, and other people shopping, for that matter, about. So right. what, what else should we be on the lookout for? This is a popular one that my kids wanted when they were little. We never did buy it, I must say. Uh, but if you are in the market for a non-motorized scooter, you may want to consider these new stats from the Consumer Product Safety Commission. The agency says in 2022, these popular scooters were responsible for one in every five toy-related injuries to kids 14 and younger. Overall, the agency says non-motorized scooters sent over 35,000 people of all ages to the emergency room last year. They stress, of course, always have the right gear, including a helmet if you are using a scooter. And it's really not just just about what you buy, it's where you buy it. Experts recommend buying toys from a trusted retailer or manufacturer. And if it's online through a third party seller, you want to look for an independent certification mark, Diane. That you can usually find that right near the manufacturer's label to make sure it was tested by an independent third party and that product has been vetted. It's great advice. Alexis, thank you. Sure. Coming up, it is Motivation Monday. Peloton instructor Adrian Williams joins me live to help us jumpstart our week. Stay with us. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Give it to me. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Do you remember the moment you saw that gun? How could I forget? Come to County 911. Please hurry up. Somebody fire your shot. I just kept hearing bullets. Bang, bang. Pow, 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 pow. There's a crazy man out on a shooting spree. This is an Uber driver who's already shot someone. And then he just continues to pick up people. It was cold-blooded. People were panicked. He says, well, if I told you, it would blow your mind. The devil is a lie. The Deadly Ride, the 2020 event special, Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. Right now, there's just so much happening in our world. So much at stake at the start of every morning. Making sense of it all, that's not always so easy. And that's where we come in. Good morning, America. We want you to know, every morning, we're right here. And we got gotcha. you. Stream ABC News Live, counting down every day to the most consequential election of our lifetime. Now just one year away. If it's politics in 2024, ABC News Live will take you there. Streaming free wherever you stream your news. Reporting from the border of Texas and Mexico, I'm Mireya Villargal. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live.
Welcome back to ABC News Live. First, it is time for Motivation Monday, where we bring guests on that will help us kickstart our week. Today, we're excited to have on Peloton instructor and competitive sprinter Adrian Williams. Adrian's known for his tough yet lighthearted classes. He leads with a sense of humor and tries to leave his students with a positive message. And Adrian Williams joins me now to tell us more about that. Adrian, thanks so much for coming on. Thank it's great you for to have me. you. I want to first start with your story and okay. how you went about establishing healthy habits for yourself. So I think from a young age, I've kind of had great parenting, right? So it was my mom, it was my dad, it was my grandma. They all established um, healthy patterns for me, whether it was eating, being physical, um, checking in on my own personal mental health. Those are like the three things in terms of pillars that were very important to me when I was a kid. And then sleep was probably the last thing that I learned um, that was added into there. Yeah, a lot of us miss that part until Sleep. later on in life. Um, I love this phrase, though. You say, never give up because great things take time. Correct. But some of us don't have a lot of patience or willpower, especially after a stressed day. So how do you go about, what's your advice for how we can stay consistent and establish routines we can actually stick to? Well, I think when I think about the overarching sustainable wellness, right? Mental health, physical health, nutrition, and sleep. Those are the four most important things. So paying attention to all of them, doing daily check-ins with yourself, seeing how you're feeling mentally, right? Physically, always finding the thing that makes you feel the most empowered. That is generally easy when it comes to workouts, I think is what you should start with. Um, once you've built confidence into something where it becomes physical activity, I think it helps you move better. And then the nutrition, which is tough around the holidays, right? It's that time where you're having trouble, you're going to holiday parties, but understanding what you need specifically for your body and then making sure you're getting eight hours. <laughs> I know that's tough, but sleep is probably the most important thing because it plays such a role in cognitive function. And then when you have good cognitive function, you're able to you know, attack daily tasks throughout the day. I wrote a book about sleep, so we talk about that a lot <laughs> on this show. Um, you talked about doing things that make you feel empowered and yes. confident. We've all been there where we go to the gym and you're like, I'm here, but now I have no idea what I'm gonna do, and you kind of feel a little bit self-conscious. Mm -hmm. So any thoughts on kind of creative ways that people can find ways to move, particularly with the new year coming up, in a way that does make them feel confident? I think simple is key. So knowing uh, in terms of timing, how much you have to put into something. So a, the buddy system is always, I think, one of the best things. Having a friend that you can do something with and Peloton offers that on a leaderboard, right? We create a sense of community by engaging with someone that you might not see, but you can do something with on a daily routine. Um, I think 10 minutes, 20 minutes is all you need to sort of feel empowered and to start your day. And then from there, once you've built that confidence, it becomes something that your body craves. Sky's the limit from there. Adrian, <laughs> thank you so much for yeah. coming on. It's thank, great to talk to you. Thank you for having you. me. Our pleasure. And thank yeah. you at home for streaming with us. I am Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, analysis, and motivation. We'll be right back. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions. Their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live.
the crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. Thanks for streaming with us. You were looking at a foggy New York City on this Monday, and we have a lot of news to get to. Here's the rundown right now. Severe storms are slamming the East Coast. 11 states are under flood watches right now from Maryland to Maine. Wind gusts are reaching up to 60 and 70 miles per hour in areas of New England. That same system has also been bringing heavy rain and a reported tornado in the southeast. At least 200,000 customers are without power this morning in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. Rhode Island. The storm's hitting just ahead of what's expected to be a record week of holiday travel. AAA says more than 115 million people will travel for the holidays, and extreme weather is already canceling and delaying flights. Officials are investigating after a freight train demolished an 18-wheeler near Fort Worth, Texas. Investigators say the truck got stuck while crossing the tracks and was hit by a Union Pacific train. 17 of the train cars and two of its engines derailed. Union Pacific says the conductor was the only person injured in the crash, suffering minor injuries. The NFL playoffs are taking shape after a big weekend of football. The Baltimore Ravens clinched a spot and are sitting alone atop of the AFC after beating the Jaguars 32-7. The Dallas Cowboys punched their ticket despite losing to the Bills in Buffalo. And the New York Jets have been eliminated for the 13th straight year, just as Aaron Rodgers could reportedly be medically cleared to play next week. Members of the public are now paying tribute to late Justice Sandra Day O'Connor as she lies in repose in the Supreme Court's Grand Hall. Justice O'Connor was the first woman to ever serve as a Supreme Court justice, paving the way for generations to come after her. She died earlier this month at age 93. Earlier, Justice Sonia Sotomayor talked about her historic impact. I will always remember the day Sandra was nominated to become the first female Supreme Court justice. Sitting in my district attorney's office in New York, I felt the gravity of her nomination. At a time when most states had no female justices on their high courts, and large firms of 300 to 500 lawyers touted having just one female partner, I knew that Sandra would open the door for women in the law and serve as an inspiration to girls across the country. Later on, she would often say that it was good to be the first, but don't want to be the last. And senior national correspondent Terry Moran and ABC News Supreme Court contributor Kate Shaw join me now for more. Kate, what did Sandra Day O'Connor being named to the court mean not only for the future justices who followed in her footsteps, including Sotomayor, but women in the legal field in general? 
Well, it was a watershed moment. I don't think there's any question about that. And it's pretty interesting because Ronald Reagan actually said he wanted to put the first woman on the Supreme Court. If you think back to more recent history, uh, President Biden actually took a lot of criticism for saying that he wanted to put the first black woman on the Supreme Court. And then, of course, he did nominate and see confirmed Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson. But there's actually a long history of presidents specifically seeking out demographic features in their nominees. He wanted to put a woman on the court and he found her. She didn't come from, you know, a federal appeals court uh, perch. She wasn't even a lawyer practicing in the federal courts. She spent most of her career in the rough and tumble world of Arizona politics in the state Senate, rising to be the majority leader in the state Senate, and then on a state intermediate appeals court. So it was in many ways an unlikely path to the highest court in the land, um, but she more than rose to the occasion once she arrived, became a formidable presence on the court, but one who always took a fairly modest view of the role of the court in a democracy. She thought, you know, the justices should be minimalist, they should think about the consequences of their rulings, and they should not act as though they are the most important player in our constitutional scheme. Mostly the political branches should run the show and the court should just make sure that the system of democracy was functioning properly. Terry, there are so many facets of her legacy now being unpacked. What stuck out to you most from what we heard in that ceremony today? Well, it was great to hear from Justice Sotomayor about Sandra Day O'Connor, the justice off the court, not just on the court. And the way that she brought the court together, there's a saying that every new justice changes the whole court because it's such a small group of people that the social dynamic has changed. And Sandra Day O'Connor changed it, as Justice Sotomayor pointed out. The court in the past uh, you know, had been a place of coldness, sometimes fierce enmity with justices kind of backstabbing uh, each other. In fact, it may, it may be drifting in that way now again. But she came on with a kind of politician's touch. As, as Kate just mentioned, she was a practiced politician. She brought them together. She insisted that they lunch together all the time. Sometimes she'd kind of buttonhole them. She was tough, tough-minded but also fun. She was known as really one of the <clears throat> main socialites in Washington, she and her husband John, for a long time. And I think that, <clears throat> excuse me, that contribution to the court is substantive because she was able to occupy the center, which she did so long, in a way that could bring along some of her colleagues. And I think at base, the, the most important contribution she brought to the court was a pragmatism, a deeply humane pragmatism incremental change. They, she didn't have a grand theory of everything to change the world with one stroke of her pen. What she wanted to do was judge the case before her properly, truly respecting the participants in the case and the law that she was sworn to apply. Terry, the funeral is taking place tomorrow at the National Cathedral. What can we expect to see and particularly to hear from both the president and the chief justice tomorrow? Well, the, the Chief Justice will speak in his formal capacity and his personal capacity. You could see on the Justice's face uh, at that ceremony at the Capitol the deep pain uh, that they have in losing such a, a treasured colleague. And he will speak for her role as, as, patriot, as a patriotic justice of the United States and what she did for the country. Uh, President Biden, I think, wants to take off on... on who she was in the court, that, that vital center that she occupied, that sense that she had that sides could come together in cases and reach pragmatic uh, decisions that would not, as I say, revolutionize and overturn existing arrangements, but would give the democratic branches and the people of the country more of an opportunity to consider the issue, those burning issues that come before the court, and continue to work on them. Uh, I, I think President Biden will pick up on that in this divided time and also pick up on her commitment to civic education. She believed passionately that if we know about our country, its history, its institutions, its flaws, its nobility, all of it together, the country will work better. And I think President Biden will talk about that as well. Kate, how do you think Justice O'Connor's impact on the court is still being felt today? Well, I think there's a lot of reflecting right now on her and her legacy. And one thing that's really come to mind for me is her open-mindedness during her nearly 25 years on the bench. You actually saw her views evolve on questions like abortion, affirmative action, uh, gay rights. These are issues that she actually took a pretty conservative position on in the 1980s when she was first on the court. But her views changed as she heard arguments and worked through questions with colleagues. And she wrote you know, the opinion upholding the core uh, right to abortion 
uh, first announced in Roe. That was the Casey opinion. Um, she sided with affirmative action in 2003 in the Grutter case. Again, really, her views evolved, but open-mindedness, I think, was really central to her. She didn't come in with fully baked views on every issue. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of people think the court could use a dose of, open-mindedness and humility. Um, it's not clear you see a ton of that on display with this court in which people are pretty fixed in their ideological and partisan corners, um, and there's not a lot of kind of moderation or wiggle room. I think the Chief Justice probably wishes there was more of that on the court because he really is kind of the center and the most moderate justice on the court in many ways right now. So I wonder if that's something that will be alluded to or at least in the air uh, tomorrow and just as the reflections continue on her life and legacy. All right, we will be watching and listening. Terry Moran, Kate Shaw, thank you both. Meanwhile, YouTube parenting influencer Ruby Frankie is expected to plead guilty today after being charged with felony child abuse. Frankie was known for so-called tough love parenting. Now the Utah mom is admitting to abusing her own children while also blaming someone else. Eva Pilgrim has the latest. A dramatic new turn in the case against former YouTube mom influencer Ruby Frankie. I'm not even going to let you eat breakfast until you get your chores done. The Utah mother of six now expected to take a plea deal after being charged with six counts of felony child abuse. Her lawyers in a statement saying, Ruby Frankie is a devoted mother and is also a woman committed to constant improvement. And she is taking responsibility for the part she played in the events leading up to her incarceration. I think that her defense by itself would have been a really difficult sell to a jury. She's the mom, she's responsible for these kids, and they were subjected to horrific abuse. Today, we are starting off our day the way we do every day. Known for her no-nonsense parenting approach on her since-deleted YouTube channel. Keeping them home from school and wiping the floorboards would, like, really bring pain. Frankie amassed more than 2 million followers documenting the lives of her six children. But her social media empire collapsed when her 12-year-old son escaped from her former business partner Jody Hildebrandt's home, prompting this chilling 911 call from a neighbor. I just had a 12-year-old boy show up here at my front door asking for help. He's emaciated, he's got tape around his legs, he's hungry and he's thirsty. Frankie now seemingly pointing the finger at Hildebrandt. Frankie's team claiming Hildebrandt isolated her from her family and that Frankie was subjected to a distorted sense of morality shaped by Ms. Hildebrandt's influence. The two often seen together in videos. Those of you who are angry about principles, come and be taught. <laughs> We'd love to have you. Hildebrandt now facing six counts of aggravated child abuse. Her niece speaking with our Juju Chang after her arrest. All of these these theories and these modalities and these these parenting ideas that all comes from Jody. This is very significant for Jody's defense team because this essentially signals that she's going to testify against her. We did reach out to Hildebrandt's attorneys. They have not responded to our requests for comment. Diane. All right, Eva Pilgrim, thank you. Coming up, Trump under fire again. What the former president said on the campaign trail that some say echoes white supremacists and Nazi Germany. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Give it to me. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the 
biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. Welcome to Crufts, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day on the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner, oh, Crufts 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions. Their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. Stream ABC News Live, counting down every day to the most consequential election of our lifetime. Now just one year away. If it's politics in 2024, ABC News Live will take you there. Streaming free wherever you stream your news. President Trump is facing backlash for comments he made about immigrants while on the campaign trail. Critics say his words echo those of Hitler, as he also praised authoritarian leaders, even quoting Russian President Vladimir Putin. ABC News senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott has the latest, with less than a month until the first votes are cast in the 2024 Republican primary. On the campaign trail, former President Donald Trump is drawing big crowds in a swing through early voting states, but coming under fire for these anti-immigrant comments he made in New Hampshire this weekend. They're poisoning the blood of our country. That's what they've done. That language echoes white supremacists and was used by Adolf Hitler in his autobiographical manifesto, Mein Kampf, where Hitler criticized mixing races, calling it, quote, blood poisoning. Trump has repeatedly used the phrase. He's disgusting. And what he's doing is dog whistling to Americans who feel absolutely under stress and strain from the economy and from the conflicts around the world. And he's dog whistling it to blame it on people from areas that don't look like us. If elected, Trump promised to carry out mass deportations, deputizing the National Guard to arrest undocumented immigrants. I will terminate every open borders policy of the Biden administration, stop the invasion of our southern border and begin the largest domestic deportation operation in American history. On the campaign trail, the former president also praising dictators, at one point invoking Russian President Vladimir Putin, using quotes from a top U.S. adversary to attack President Biden. Vladimir Putin, has anybody ever heard of Vladimir Putin? Of Russia says that Biden's, and this is a quote, politically motivated persecution of his political rival, is very good for Russia because it shows the rottenness of the American political system. The Biden campaign responding with a blistering statement, writing Trump parroted Adolf Hitler, praised Kim Jong-un, and quoted Vladimir Putin while running for president on a promise to rule as a dictator and threaten American democracy. And Trump's own words turning off some Republican voters. He takes things to the extremes, and this is part of the drama we're trying to get away from. There's no reason for it. But the former president is still the far and away front runner, ahead of his Republican rivals by 50 points. He's not afraid to hurt people's feelings, and there's nothing wrong with that. People really need to toughen up a little bit. 
Diane, of course, former President Donald Trump has pleaded not guilty to 91 criminal charges. He will certainly have a lot to juggle between his legal calendar and the court calendar. Our friends over at 538 took a look at the historical data and they found that no presidential candidate has ever been this far ahead in the national polls and gone on to lose the nomination. Diane. Senior Congressional Correspondent Rachel Scott, thank you. And Iowa's caucuses are now less than a month away, and the New Hampshire primary is just a week after that. So our team of ABC News 2024 campaign embeds are fanning out across Iowa and New Hampshire to ask voters there what's driving them. Here's Jay O'Brien with ABC's Trail Mix series. As crucial presidential primaries in Iowa and New Hampshire near, Republican voters there reacting to the ongoing impeachment inquiry into President Biden. I think there's certainly enough um, there to, to warrant at least looking into it. If there was some validity to it, and then yes, I would say that, that they should look into that. Thus far, there hasn't been. The first in the nation Iowa caucuses now less than a month away. Voters there are concerned about the economy. The money I make today is basically the same money as I made 20 years ago, and I'm no further ahead in life. The same worries more than a thousand miles away in New Hampshire. Entering adulthood post college, um, I feel like the job market is slim and the housing prices keep going up. Abortion rights polarizing as candidates grapple with a historic lawsuit from Kate Cox challenging Texas's abortion ban and its effect on women's health care. I don't think that anybody should have a right to discuss medical options about someone else's body. I'm hoping that they have the judgment on that. Former President Trump still dominating most primary polls. Other GOP hopefuls looking to grow their support in these crucial remaining weeks. I like Vivek. I would probably say Ron DeSantis. I'd have to say uh, Trump, really. When people walk into the voting booth, that's when they're going to decide who they really want. ABC's Jay O'Brien, thanks for that. Coming up, from high speed to high tea, Jason Momoa and Patrick Wilson join our Maggie Ruley on an action-packed London adventure right after the break. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. Welcome to Crufts, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day. On the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is a place to sing to magic. Our winner of Crufts 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. We have really good news. <laughs> <laughs> 
I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions, their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. All across the globe, the world will be celebrating the new year. And you can see it as it happens live. The global celebrations. See the new year as it comes in live. Streaming all day and night on ABC News Live. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. First, Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom splashes into theaters Friday, but before stars Jason Momoa and Patrick Wilson grace the big screen in the superhero sequel, they delighted our Maggie Rooley with everything from high speed to high tea on an action-packed London adventure. Take a look. Yeah! Jason Momoa and his aquatic alter ego Aquaman have a lot more in common than you think. They both know how to wield a trident. And they're both quite comfortable on the water. Okay, ready, go. Okay, yeah. Go. <laughs> Ripping through the River Thames, we caught up with Jason in London. Look at that. That's ridiculous. Atlantis is way cooler. <laughs> That's true. That's I'm like, true. Ooh, cool killer bridge. I don't know if you've seen my movie, but ours is way bigger. Or what would you want people to know about Aquaman? that they might not know. I think he really, really wants to um, have a brother and connect with his brother. That's heartwarming. He's not going to tell no one. Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you. <laughs> this is Don't tell anyone else. You know the deal here. No spoilers. But speaking of that brother. Travel brother high five. Do not call me brother. We met up with Patrick Wilson for quite the high tea. Jason, you actually volunteered to be mother. I'll be mother. I'll be mother. Will I'll you? Mother. Will you? Great mother. Please. Please. For us? I will. Ladies first. Oh, why thank you so here. much. Look at the stance. Wow. Yeah, no. Okay. My, this my, is my really. <laughs> <stance> <laughs> 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 see this? You're getting you can't this lunch. Teach Have you seen mother do this? And after we sip. Oh, that's a tasty treat. Some good tea. Okay. It's time to spill. <laughs> you well, you know, I have to say something I love about the two of you is that you're brothers on the screen, but I feel like there's a little uh, bromance going on You here. said romance. I did. I slipped. Chemistry is a funny thing. Mm -hmm. First of all, we're both very, very, very busy people in our own lives, for sure. And so I think the relationship on screen has to come from two people that want to be there and want to have a good time, and, 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 and we do. Well, I think what's fun about the new movie is that you guys don't have to hate each other the whole time. Yeah. It seems like you're, you're teaming up a bit. Yeah. You choose to. <laughs> <laughs> so what was it like to sort of be on the same side in this movie? When you come from these two different worlds, mm -hmm. where, I, where I suck at something, he's great at it, and where he yep. sucks at something, I'm great at it. And so when we come together to do something positive. And True King builds bridges, right? <laughs> True King builds bridges. And it's what these stars have brought from their personal lives that really help these characters shine. We always talk about uh, whether you're playing somebody super serious or super mm. funny. It's like, how much do you, do you go to the character? How much does the character come to you? And I think what this film has done even more than the first film is this character has come to him. I'm a husband and a father, and I wouldn't have it any other way. You've played this character for so long, you're like, I would love to see him this way. I wanted to walk that line where you're like, being a king, dealing with all that mm. in a world that's getting completely polluted. Being a father for the first time, he's obviously the reluctant king who's now king and then also being a husband and just like balancing all that and he's exhausted. Mm. And I am. Being a great father. That's that part. <laughs> Maggie Rooley, ABC News, London. Maggie, thank you, and thank you for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. We'll be right back.
This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families front. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Give it to me. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from East Palestine, Ohio, I'm Alex Brashey. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Today on ABC News Live, wicked weather slamming the Northeast, powerful winds and heavy rain leaving thousands of you without power. We've got your forecast ahead. Southwest Airlines slapped with a record-setting fine, what it means for travelers and why the transportation secretary says he's putting all airlines on notice. And anger over the accidental killing of three Israeli hostages. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin in the Middle East for talks as officials confirm a fresh round of hostage negotiations with Hamas. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Our top story this hour, 11 states under flood watches right now from Maryland to Maine. Wind gusts already reaching up to 70 miles per hour in parts of New England. That same system bringing heavy rain to the southeast as well. Parts of South Carolina measuring its highest non-tropical tide on record with more than 16 inches of rain falling in parts of the state. And more than a half a million people are now without power in New England. Our senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it all for us right now. That massive storm making its way into the Northeast. In New Jersey, drivers had to be rescued after cars stalled out in floodwaters. Cars hydroplaning through deep water along New York City's FDR Drive. The Carolina coastline getting hammered. An ocean overwash pushing ashore in Buxton, North Carolina, part of the Outer Banks. Winds wreaking havoc across South Carolina. This shopping center suffering severe damage after a reported tornado touched down. Pieces of the building ending up in the parking lot. Windows smashed after winds picked up debris and launched into this van. Winds toppling trailers and knocking down trees into houses in Horry County. When we were running, that's when we heard the glass breaking and we came out and then the tree was there. Areas near Charleston getting more than 16 inches of rain. AccuWeather captured first responders rescuing drivers in historic Georgetown. The same storm slamming Florida too. Conditions so bad there, this driver couldn't see the road ahead, going right over a seawall and into the intercoastal. His van floating. First responders, though, were able to rescue him. Oh, my God. And this power line igniting during the storm in St. Petersburg. All right, Rob, thanks so much. Well, let's get some more on this forecast amid the storms and bring in our meteorologist, Kenton Jewicki. So, Kenton, where's the storm headed next, and what do you think people should expect? Yeah, Kira, it's definitely not done yet. The storm is still bringing heavy rain to the new uh, to New England, all of New England, and also upstate New York, getting through New York City right now as well. And the winds, they're still going as well. We have wind gusts just in the past couple hours. Nantucket there, around 60-mile-per-hour wind gusts still going on. That's a damaging wind gust, certainly. And 
and also up near Portland, getting up to 50 miles per hour there. Here are some of those alerts. Again, winter storm warning there for Erie. Otherwise, we have all these flash flood warnings. But we also have flood warnings everywhere in red that you see. That's either a flash flood warning or just a regular flood warning where there's been so much rain. A lot of these areas seeing two to four inches of rain, and there's just not a lot for that to go. So there are there's water over roadways. Streams are higher. Certainly a big impact there. And as we track this through, by about 6 p.m., that's going to be north of Boston. It's going to be near Portland for that heaviest rain. More snow, though, coming over from the west. That's going to be lake effect snow and even some wraparound snow on the back of this system. So by 7 a.m. tomorrow, we're looking at Appalachia, still seeing uh, a bit of snow there and some lake effect as well. But chilly air, this feels like a spring storm for a lot of the Northeast. It's very warm. But tomorrow, that all changes. We're going to look at wind chills tomorrow morning uh, in the teens and 20s for a lot of the Northeast. All right, and the West Coast also expecting some storms, right? They are. Uh, two storms, actually. The first one is already starting to move in. We have a lot of alerts already coming through here with this. Wind alerts especially, and some winter storm alerts. That's going to be for those higher elevations where they could see uh, about a foot of snow there. But it's really the second storm. That's the big one, Kira. We're looking at about Tuesday here. That's when this starts to come in. It's for the entire state of California, but especially Southern California, which doesn't see this type of storm that often. We're looking at any from two to three inches for a lot of this California coast here through the end of this week. But look at Los Angeles down there. They're going to see possibly three inches, maybe even more, depending on how this storm tracks. So something else that we're certainly keeping an eye on this week, Kira. All right, Kenton, thanks so much. Well, the Department of Transportation is handing down a record-setting fine for Southwest Airlines after last year's travel meltdown during the holiday season. The $140 million fine is 30 times larger than any previous fine against an airline. The government is also making uh, South Southwest rather issue a $75 flight credit to any traveler whose arrival is delayed more than three hours if it's the airline's fault. Transportation reporter Sam Sweeney joins me now. So, Sam, let's just talk about the message the Department of Transportation is sending here with this this historic fine. They are calling for accountability, not just from Southwest, but the entire industry. And this has really been one of Secretary Buttigieg's uh, projects. He wants to hold these airlines accountable, reduce delays, reduce cancellations. And when there are those cancellations uh, and delays that are significant, the airline should be responsible if it's their fault. I spoke with him this morning. Let's listen. This record penalty is holding Southwest accountable for their failures, and it is sending a message to the entire industry with a new standard, a new level of accountability. It is a multiple of anything that our department has done in the past, and our expectation is that that will lead to better decisions and better passenger service. And there you heard it from the secretary. They have worked methodically over the last year to go through all of the paperwork, all of the complaints from passengers. They've traveled to Dallas to meet with Southwest officials multiple times to see everything that happened here, why this failure took place, and what Southwest is doing to improve it so it doesn't happen again. And the big takeaway here is that $75 credit. If you fly Southwest and your flight, as you said, Kira, is delayed more than three hours and it is Southwest's fault, you are now entitled to $75. That is a first for airlines here in the U.S. And a lot of friends impacted last year uh, by Southwest and what went down. Do you think there'll be broader implications here and that I other airlines will have to comply as well? It sounds like there will be. They're working through that uh, uh, federal regulatory framework there uh, to get this into place. I asked the secretary that this morning, and he said they're going to watch this. They're going to see how it looks, but they want, again, hold these airlines accountable, and this is just one way of doing it. But there is another side to this story. Some uh, critics of this policy say, look, is this going to encourage airlines to cut corners to get these planes into the air when it may not be safe. Of course, the airlines themselves, uh, you know, say that they would never do that and they put safety first. But that's what some critics of these programs do say. So let's just talk about 2022 and, and why that travel meltdown even went down the way that it did, because clearly it's warranting a, a pretty big penalty here for Southwest in particular. 
This was the worst meltdown in aviation history. It couldn't have happened at a worse time. It was Christmas week. You had millions of people traveling, and they canceled nearly 17,000 flights. Now, other airlines also had problems earlier in the week when this ice storm moved across the country, but they were able to recover, and Southwest, Southwest was not able to. They had a different operating system. Instead of a hub system, they go from point to point. That was one of their problems, but also their computer system melted down. It was antiquated. It needed to be update their crews were out of place and they needed to stop the airline and they did a full restart and if you recall it started earlier on the week and it didn't get really recovered until friday all right let's see how the week goes only seven days out till christmas sam sweeney thank you thank you Let's talk about the war in the Middle East now. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin is in Israel amid growing pressure on the country to scale back its offensive in Gaza as the humanitarian crisis just deepens. Secretary Austin and Israel's Minister of Defense held a presser focusing on the future of Gaza after this war. Take a listen. Israelis and Palestinians both deserve a horizon of hope. It is in the interest of both Israelis and Palestinians to move forward toward two states living side by side in mutual security. Our Inez de la Quatera is in Tel Aviv. You know, Inez, we talked about the growing pressure on Israel, but you really didn't see it in that presser with the Secretary of Defense. Yeah, so uh, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin there really trying to walk a fine line. On the one hand, reaffirming the U.S.'s support for Israel, but this comes as there are growing disagreements with Israel when it comes to Gaza. So uh, one issue, of course, is everything going on with the uh, mounting uh, civilian casualties there. The uh, U.S. calling on Israel to do more to minimize civilian casualties. The Israelis insisting they are doing everything they can uh, to, to, to do that. Uh, when it comes to the future of Gaza, that's another big uh, sticking point, and we know that that Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin discussed that with the Israeli Defense Minister. Uh, the, the Austin afterwards did uh, publicly talk about um, how, how, you know, parts of what they had discussed. So uh, he says that there should be a two-state solution. We know that's what the U.S. is in favor of under clear principles that Secretary of State uh, Antony Blinken laid out last month. And part of those principles include things like Israel should not reoccupy Gaza or, uh, you know, re reuniting uh, Gaza or, or uni uniting Gaza with the West Bank under a revitalized Palestinian authority. But both of those things are things that the Israelis uh, are, are opposed to. So we've heard the Israelis suggest that they should maintain a a presence in Gaza after the war ends. And we also know that the Israeli prime minister is not too hot on the idea of having the Palestinian Authority take over Gaza. So those are, are, are I think, two, the main two sticking points. That's part of the reason you're seeing Austin uh, here in Israel to kind of smooth that out. Um, and it's part of the reason you saw other U.S. officials as well, uh, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan just last week and uh, Blinken last month. So let's talk about the hostages. An IDF commander says that the accidental shooting last week of those three Israeli hostages in Gaza was against the rules of engagement. How did this mistake happen? And what changes is the IDF making in the wake of those deaths? Yeah, so they're, they're very much still looking into it. There is an investigation that's ongoing. According to a preliminary investigation, we understand that those three hostages uh, were came out of a building that was in an area of very intense fighting. They were shirtless. They had a makeshift uh, white flag, but a soldier perceived them uh, to be a threat and opened fire, killing two instantly. We understand that afterwards, someone cried out help in Hebrew, and so a battalion commander uh, ordered for the troops to stop firing, but another soldier uh, opened fire again minutes later, and and, uh, killed the third hostage. So that, so that, you know, of course, set off all sorts of protests, uh, especially here in Tel Aviv over the weekend. The, the families of the hostages taking to the streets uh, to, to, to protest that and, and call for some kind of deal here to be put on the table to release the hostages. But the IDF, you know, saying they're looking into the incidents, um, insisting that they're doing everything they can as they go about, you know, going after Hamas and going after Hamas's uh, infrastructure, destroying the tunnels, for instance. The IDF insists that they are taking steps to try and keep the hostages is safe, um, but, but they still are going to have lots of questions to answer there, Kira. Well, CIA Director Burns also uh, joining the head of Israel's intelligence service for more hostage negotiation talks. What would it take for another deal to happen, you think? 
Yeah, and we understand that, that those negotiations are back on, uh, so that is certainly some, some you know, good news, I think. The Israeli officials uh, uh, confirming that uh, the head of the Israeli intelligence service is in Europe meeting with the Qatari prime minister. We also understand, according to U.S. officials, that CIA director Bill Burns uh, is joining those talks. We know the first round of talks were held in Doha, the, those talks that led to that first temporary truce. Bill Burns was part of those talks, and so now it appears another round of talks is being held in Europe. I will say a top Hamas official, though, uh, reiterating that there would be no additional hostage releases uh, until the fighting stops here. So, you know, that may throw a wrench here uh, in these talks. Um, but but we are hearing from the families of the hostages, again, the, those, you know, the, those that took to the streets over the weekend, thousands taken to the streets in Tel Aviv, some of them even camping out overnight outside of the IDF's headquarters, demanding that a deal be put on the table, saying that the current approach of going after the hostages by force, which the IDF has been taking, clearly isn't working. We're learning almost every every day of additional hostages who have been killed. And so the families of these hostages want some kind of deal to be put on the table. Uh, they were telling us that, you know, they feel it's the only way to bring back the hostages alive. All right. Inez de la Cotera there in Tel Aviv. Thanks, Inez. Back here at home, police in Delaware are investigating a car crash involving the president's motorcade. The SUV was struck by another vehicle as President Biden was walking out of a staff dinner at his campaign headquarters. The crash reportedly startled the president before getting into another SUV. Secret Service says that Biden's motorcade then left without any problems. The White House did report that both the president and the first lady are fine, and the police say they're looking into whether the driver was actually impaired. Former President Trump is facing backlash now for comments that he made about immigrants while on the campaign trail. Critics say his words echo those of Adolf Hitler, as he also praised authoritarian leaders, even quoting Russian President Vladimir Putin. Our senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott has the latest with less than a month until the first votes are cast in the 2024 Republican primary. On the campaign trail, former President Donald Trump is drawing big crowds in a swing through early voting states, but coming under fire for these anti-immigrant comments he made in New Hampshire this weekend. They're poisoning the blood of our country. That's what they've done. That language echoes white supremacists and was used by Adolf Hitler in his autobiographical manifesto, Mein Kampf, where Hitler criticized mixing races, calling it, quote, blood poisoning. Trump has repeatedly used the phrase. He's disgusting. And what he's doing is dog whistling to Americans who feel absolutely under stress and strain from the economy and from the conflicts around the world. And he's dog whistling it to blame it on people from areas that don't look like us. If elected, Trump promised to carry out mass deportations, deputizing the National Guard to arrest undocumented immigrants. I will terminate every open borders policy of the Biden administration, stop the invasion of our southern border and begin the largest domestic deportation operation in American history. On the campaign trail, the former president also praising dictators, at one point invoking Russian President Vladimir Putin, using quotes from a top U.S. adversary to attack President Biden. Vladimir Putin. Has anybody ever heard of Vladimir Putin? Of Russia says that Biden's, and this is a quote, politically motivated persecution of his political rival, is very good for Russia because it shows the rottenness of the American political system. The Biden campaign responding with a blistering statement, writing Trump parroted Adolf Hitler, praised Kim Jong-un, and quoted Vladimir Putin while running for president on a promise to rule as a dictator and threaten American democracy. And Trump's own words turning off some Republican voters. He takes things to the extremes, and this is part of the drama we're trying to get away from. There's no reason for it. But the former president is still the far and away front runner, ahead of his Republican rivals by 50 points. He's not afraid to hurt people's feelings, and there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> people really need to toughen up a little bit. And thanks to our senior congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott, there. And we should note that Trump has pleaded not guilty to 91 criminal charges now. And on the political front, our friends over at 538 have taken a look at the historical data and found that no presidential candidate has been this far ahead in the national polls and gone on to lose the nomination. Coming up, honoree Sandra Day O'Connor with a look inside the private ceremony where Supreme Court justices are paying their final respects. Whenever news breaks, 
We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Glad you're streaming with us. Members of the public are paying their respects to the late Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who's lying in repose at the Supreme Court. Justice O'Connor was the first woman to ever serve on the nation's highest court and passed away earlier this month at the age of 93. Well, this morning, justices, family members, and spouses spoke at a private ceremony in the high court's Great Hall, and among them, Supreme Court, Supreme court Justice Sonia Sotomayor, who praised her role model. I will always remember the day Sandra was nominated to become the first female Supreme Court Justice. Sitting in my district attorney's office in New York, I felt the gravity of her nomination. At a time when most states had no female justices on their high courts, and large firms of 300 to 500 lawyers touted having just one female partner, I knew that Sandra would open the door for women in the law and serve as an inspiration to girls across the country. Later on, she would often say that it was good to be the first, but don't want to be the last. Well, the public is invited to pay their respects through 8 p.m. tonight, and tomorrow her funeral will be held at Washington National Cathedral. Our Jay O'Brien is just outside the Supreme Court there, 24 years on the court, and, you know, she not only shaped the court's decisions in that time, Jay, but those decisions are still being felt in this moment. That's exactly right. Uh, she fashioned herself, remember, Kira, as a moderate on the court, a swing vote. She was appointed by President Ronald Reagan. She was obviously a conservative, but the longer she spent on that court, the more that she was unpredictable. And she cast votes that would, uh, for instance, uphold precedent that protected uh, Roe v. Wade. And then she, of course, also upheld, uh, for instance, the University of Michigan's decisions or uh, admissions decisions on affirmative action. But then she was the vote in Bush v. Gore, that rare instance in which the Supreme Court decided who would win the presidency, and that's how George W. Bush becomes president. Um, and so her legacy is long in the decisions that she made, but also the court is so different now than when Sandra Day O'Connor was on the bench. Roe was overturned. Affirmative action changed forever in a recent decision. And so the, the arc of her impact on American legal history is still being felt to this day. And also just the example she set in her ideological change and bend while she sat on the bench. 
You know, when she first arrived at the Supreme Court, I mean, there wasn't even a woman's restroom near the courtroom because there was never a need for one, you know, but she approached her role as the first female Supreme Court justice with such grace and humility and clearly paved the way for other women justices, as we heard Sotomayor, you know, mentioned in her life. Yeah, Justice Sotomayor said that when she was memorializing Justice Sandra Day O'Connor today, she was memorializing a role model. There's this story so often told about Sandra Day O'Connor where she goes to Stanford, she graduates third in her class, and then she goes to a big law firm, and instead of offering her a job as a lawyer, she had gone there to seek, they offered her a job as a secretary. So instead, she went to a district attorney's office, and that's where she began her long legal career. Both Justice Sotomayor also so Justice Elena Kagan have uh, authored remembrances in which they said they remember where they were when President Reagan announced that he was plucking a judge from a state court in Arizona and elevating her to be his nominee to the Supreme Court, the first female ever to hold that job. And the phrase is so often used when it comes to Sandra Day O'Connor that she didn't just open the door for women in law and in American politics, she kicked it open. She sure did, and twice joined the majority in decisions that upheld and reaffirmed Roe versus Wade. Let's just talk about how significant it was to have a woman in the room, you know, during these landmark rulings, Jay. Well, one of the things that Sandra Day O'Connor's clerks frankly remarked on today, but also been remarking on since she passed a few weeks back, is that she always looked at judicial opinions as to how they would impact people, how the law impacts average Americans. And she would have those conversations in deliberations with the various justices, on that case and on others. But also, again, as we noted earlier, Kira, the landscape of the American legal system, particularly as it relates to Roe, has completely been upended since Sandra Day O'Connor sat on the court. She was a key vote in Planned Parenthood v. Casey, which was a decision that really bolstered Roe and the right to an abortion. But that same Supreme Court now completely changed in its conservative majority and completely changed with the justices that sat on it has now struck down Roe, a sign that Sandra Day O'Connor sat on a court that is much different than the one we look at today. It sure is. But her influence, I'll tell you, that'll live on forever, that's for sure. Jay, thanks so much. Coming up, a massive shift for Pope Francis and the Catholic Church. We've got the details right after a break. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. We have really good news. <laughs> 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 I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions, their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. Reporting from Vaden, Mississippi, I'm Phil Lipoff. Wherever the story is, We'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live.
Glad you're streaming with us other headlines that we're tracking for you this hour. In a major shift, Pope Francis says the Catholic Church will now allow blessings of same-sex couples. However, the church adding that the blessing must avoid any elements that remotely resemble a marriage rite. It's the first major update to Catholic doctrine in decades and will have a major impact across the globe for a church still divided over same-sex couples. The European Union formally opening an investigation into Elon Musk and X, the social network formerly known as Twitter. The EU is looking into claims the company failed to do enough to stop disinformation and hate speech from spreading online. This is the first investigation under a new European law attempting to hold social media companies accountable for posts on its platforms. And bye bye Berlin, hello China. The giant pandas, Pitt and Polly, originally were supposed to go to China a couple years ago, but the pandemic delayed those plans until now. They are only about 1,800 giant pandas still living in the wild in China. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips from Breaking News to all the stories that matter to you. You can always find us on various streaming services, the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com. News never stops, neither do we. We'll be right back. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Hi, <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. ABC News, America's number one news source. Today on ABC News Live, wicked weather slamming the Northeast, powerful winds and heavy rain leaving thousands of you without power. We've got your forecast ahead. Southwest Airlines slapped with a record-setting fine, what it means for travelers and why the transportation secretary says he's putting all airlines on notice. And anger over the accidental killing of three Israeli hostages. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin in the Middle East for talks as officials confirm a fresh round of hostage negotiations with Hamas. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Our top story this hour, 11 states under flood watches right now from Maryland to Maine. Wind gusts already reaching up to 70 miles per hour in parts of New England. That same system bringing heavy rain to the southeast as well. Parts of South Carolina measuring its highest non-tropical tide on record with more than 16 inches of rain falling in parts of the state. And more than a half a million people are now without power in New England. Our senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it all for us right now. That massive storm making its way into the Northeast. In New Jersey, drivers had to be rescued after cars stalled out in floodwaters. Cars hydroplaning through deep water along New York City's FDR Drive. The Carolina coastline getting hammered. 
An ocean overwash pushing ashore in Buxton, North Carolina, part of the Outer Banks. Winds wreaking havoc across South Carolina. This shopping center suffering severe damage after a reported tornado touched down. Pieces of the building ending up in the parking lot. Windows smashed after winds picked up debris and launched into this van. Winds toppling trailers and knocking down trees into houses in Horry County. When we were running, that's when we heard the glass breaking and we came out and then the tree was there. Areas near Charleston getting more than 16 inches of rain. AccuWeather captured first responders rescuing drivers in historic Georgetown. The same storm slamming Florida too. Conditions so bad there, this driver couldn't see the road ahead, going right over a seawall and into the intercoastal. His van floating. First responders, though, were able to rescue him. Oh, my God. And this power line igniting during the storm in St. Petersburg. All right, Rob, thanks so much. Well, let's get some more on this forecast amid the storms and bring in our meteorologist, Kenton Jewicki. So, Kenton, where's the storm headed next and what do you think people should expect? Yeah, Kira, it's definitely not done yet. The storm is still bringing heavy rain to the new uh, to New England, all of New England, and also upstate New York, getting through New York City right now as well. And the winds, they're still going as well. We have wind gusts just in the past couple hours. Nantucket there, around 60 mile per hour wind gusts still going on. That's a damaging wind gust, certainly. And also up near Portland, getting up to 50 miles per hour there. Here are some of those alerts. Again, winter storm warning there for Erie. Otherwise, we have all these flash flood warnings. But we also have flood warnings everywhere in red that you see. That's either a flash flood warning or just a regular flood warning where there's been so much rain. A lot of these areas seen two to four inches of rain, and there's just not a lot for that to go. So there are there's water over roadways. Streams are higher. Certainly a big impact there. And as we track this through, by about 6 p.m., that's going to be north of Boston. It's going to be near Portland for that heaviest rain. More snow, though, coming over from the west. That's going to be lake effect snow and even some wraparound snow on the back of this system. So by 7 a.m. tomorrow, we're looking at Appalachia, still seeing uh, a bit of snow there and some lake effect as well. But chilly air, this feels like a spring storm for a lot of the Northeast. It's very warm. But tomorrow, that all changes. We're going to look at wind chills tomorrow morning uh, in the teens and 20s for a lot of the Northeast. All right, and the West Coast also expecting some storms, right? They are. Uh, two storms, actually. The first one is already starting to move in. We have a lot of alerts already coming through here with this. Wind alerts especially, and some winter storm alerts. That's going to be for those higher elevations where they could see uh, about a foot of snow there. But it's really the second storm. That's the big one, Kira. We're looking at about Tuesday here. That's when this starts to come in. It's for the entire state of California, but especially Southern California, which doesn't see this type of storm that often. We're looking at any anywhere from two to three inches for a lot of this California coast here through the end of this week. But look at Los Angeles down there. They're going to see possibly three inches, maybe even more, depending on how this storm tracks. So something else that we're certainly keeping an eye on this week, Kira. All right, Kenton, thanks so much. Well, the Department of Transportation is handing down a record-setting fine for Southwest Airlines after last year's travel meltdown during the holiday season. The $140 million fine is 30 times larger than any previous fine against an airline. The government is also making uh, South Southwest rather issue a $75 flight credit to any traveler whose arrival is delayed more than three hours if it's the airline's fault. Transportation reporter Sam Sweeney joins me now. So, Sam, let's just talk about the message the Department of Transportation is sending here with this historic fine. They are calling for accountability, not just from Southwest, but the entire industry. And this has really been one of Secretary Buttigieg's uh, projects. He wants to hold these airlines accountable, reduce delays, reduce cancellations. And when there are those cancellations uh, and delays that are significant, the airline should be responsible if it's their fault. I spoke with him this morning. Let's listen. This record penalty is holding Southwest accountable for their failures, and it is sending a message to the entire industry with a new standard, a new level of accountability. It is a multiple of anything that our department has done in the past, and our expectation is that that will lead to better decisions and better passenger service. 
And there you heard it from the secretary. They have worked methodically over the last year to go through all of the paperwork, all of the complaints from passengers. They've traveled to Dallas to meet with Southwest officials multiple times to see everything that happened here, why this failure took place, and what Southwest is doing to improve it so it doesn't happen again. And the big takeaway here is that $75 credit. If you fly Southwest and your flight, as you said, Kira, is delayed more than three hours and it is Southwest's fault, you are now entitled to $75. That is a first for airlines here in the U.S. And a lot of friends impacted last year uh, by Southwest and what went down. Do you think there'll be broader implications here and that I other airlines will have to comply as well? It sounds like there will be. They're working through that uh, uh, federal regulatory framework there uh, to get this into place. I asked the secretary that this morning, and he said they're going to watch this. They're going to see how it looks, but they want, again, hold these airlines accountable, and this is just one way of doing it. But there is another side to this story. Some uh, critics of this policy say, look, is this going to encourage airlines to cut corners to get these planes into the air when it may not be safe. Of course, the airlines themselves, uh, you know, say that they would never do that and they put safety first, but that's what some critics of these programs do say. So let's just talk about 2022 and, and why that travel meltdown even went down the way that it did, because clearly it's warranting a, a pretty big penalty here for Southwest in particular. This was the worst meltdown in aviation history. It couldn't have happened at a worse time. It was Christmas week. You had millions of people traveling, and they canceled nearly 17,000 flights. Now, other airlines also had problems earlier in the week when this ice storm moved across the country, but they were able to recover, and Southwest, Southwest was not able to. They had a different operating system. Instead of a hub system, they go from point to point. That was one of their problems, but also their computer system melted down. It was antiquated. It needed to be update their crews were out of place and they needed to stop the airline and they did a full restart and if you recall it started earlier on the week and it didn't get really recovered until friday all right let's see how the week goes only seven days out till christmas sam sweeney thank you thank you talk about the war in the Middle East now. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin is in Israel amid growing pressure on the country to scale back its offensive in Gaza as the humanitarian crisis just deepens. Secretary Austin and Israel's Minister of Defense held a presser focusing on the future of Gaza after this war. Take a listen. Israelis and Palestinians both deserve a horizon of hope. It is in the interest of both Israelis and Palestinians to move forward toward two states living side by side in mutual security. Our Inez de la Quatera is in Tel Aviv. You know, Inez, we talked about the growing pressure on Israel, but you really didn't see it in that presser with the Secretary of Defense. Yeah, so uh, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin there really trying to walk a fine line. On the one hand, reaffirming the U.S.'s support for Israel, but this comes as there are growing disagreements with Israel when it comes to Gaza. So uh, one issue, of course, is everything going on with the uh, mounting uh, civilian casualties there. The uh, U.S. calling on Israel to do more to minimize civilian casualties. The Israelis insisting they are doing everything they can uh, to, to, to do that. Uh, when it comes to the future of Gaza, that's another big uh, sticking point, and we know that Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin discussed that with the Israeli Defense Minister. Uh, the, the Austin afterwards did uh, publicly talk about um, how, how, you know, parts of what they had discussed. So uh, he says that there should be a two-state solution. We know that's what the U.S. is in favor of under clear principles that Secretary of State uh, Antony Blinken laid out last month. And part of those principles include things like Israel should not reoccupy Gaza or, uh, you know, re reuniting uh, Gaza or, or uni uniting Gaza with the West Bank under a revitalized Palestinian authority. But both of those things are things that the Israelis uh, are, are opposed to. So we've heard the Israelis suggest that they should maintain a presence in Gaza after the war ends. And we also know that the Israeli prime minister is not too hot on the idea of having the Palestinian authority take over Gaza. So those are, are, are I think, two, the, the main two sticking points. That's part of the reason you're seeing Austin uh, here in Israel to kind of smooth that out. Um, and it's part of the reason you saw other U.S. officials as well. Uh, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan just last week and uh, Blinken last month. 
So let's talk about the hostages. An IDF commander says that the accidental shooting last week of those three Israeli hostages in Gaza was against the rules of engagement. How did this mistake happen? And what changes is the IDF making in the wake of those deaths? Yeah, so they're, they're very much still looking into it. There is an investigation that's ongoing. According to a preliminary investigation, we understand that those three hostages uh, were came out of a building that was in an area of very intense fighting. They were shirtless. They had a makeshift uh, white flag, but a soldier perceived them uh, to be a threat and opened fire, killing two instantly. We understand that afterwards, someone cried out help in Hebrew, and so a battalion commander uh, ordered for the troops to stop firing, but another soldier uh, opened fire again minutes later and and uh, killed the third hostage. So that, so that, you know, of course, set off all sorts of protests, uh, especially here in Tel Aviv over the weekend. The, the families of the hostages taking to the streets uh, to, to, to protest that and, and call for some kind of deal here to be put on the table to release the hostages. But the IDF, you know, saying they're looking into the incidents, um, insisting that they're doing everything they can as they go about, you know, going after Hamas and going after Hamas's uh, infrastructure, destroying the tunnels, for instance. The IDF insists that they are taking steps to try and keep the hostages is safe, um, but, but they still are going to have lots of questions to answer there, Kira. Well, CIA Director Burns also uh, joining the head of Israel's intelligence service for more hostage negotiation talks. What would it take for another deal to happen, you think? Yeah, and we understand that, that those negotiations are back on, uh, so that is certainly some, some you know, good news, I think. The Israeli officials uh, uh, confirming that uh, the head of the Israeli intelligence service is in Europe meeting with the Qatari prime minister. We also understand, according to U.S. officials, that CIA Director Bill Burns uh, is joining those talks. We know the first round of talks were held in Doha, the, those talks that led to that first temporary truce. Bill Burns was part of those talks, and so now it appears another round of talks is being held in Europe. I will say a top Hamas official, though, uh, reiterating that there would be no additional hostage releases uh, until the fighting stops here. So, you know, that may throw a wrench here uh, in these talks. Um, but but we are hearing from the families of the hostages, again, the, those, you know, the, those that took to the streets over the weekend, thousands taking to the streets in Tel Aviv, some of them even camping out overnight outside of the IDF's headquarters, demanding that a deal be put on the table, saying that the current approach of going after the hostages by force, which the IDF has been taking, clearly isn't working. We're learning almost every every day of additional hostages who have been killed. And so the families of these hostages want some kind of deal to be put on the table. Uh, they were telling us that, you know, they feel it's the only way to bring back the hostages alive. All right. Inez de la Cotera there in Tel Aviv. Thanks, Inez. Former President Trump is facing backlash now for comments that he made about immigrants while on the campaign trail. Critics say his words echo those of Adolf Hitler as he also praised authoritarian leaders, even quoting Russian President Vladimir Putin. Our senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott has the latest with less than a month until the first votes are cast in the 2024 Republican primary. On the campaign trail, former President Donald Trump is drawing big crowds in a swing through early voting states. But coming under fire for these anti-immigrant comments he made in New Hampshire this weekend. They're poisoning the blood of our country. That's what they've done. That language echoes white supremacists and was used by Adolf Hitler in his autobiographical manifesto, Mein Kampf, where Hitler criticized mixing races, calling it, quote, blood poisoning. Trump has repeatedly used the phrase. He's disgusting. And what he's doing is dog whistling to Americans who feel absolutely under stress and strain from the economy and from the conflicts around the world. And he's dog whistling it to blame it on people from areas that don't look like us. If elected, Trump promised to carry out mass deportations, deputizing the National Guard to arrest undocumented immigrants. I will terminate every open borders policy of the Biden administration, stop the invasion of our southern border and begin the largest domestic deportation operation in American history. On the campaign trail, the former president also praising dictators, at one point invoking Russian President Vladimir Putin, using quotes from a top U.S. adversary to attack President Biden. Vladimir Putin, has anybody ever heard of Vladimir Putin? Of Russia says that Biden's, and this is a quote, politically motivated persecution of his political rival, is very good for Russia because it shows the rottenness of the American political system. The Biden campaign responding with a blistering statement, writing Trump parroted Adolf Hitler, praised Kim Jong-un, 
and quoted Vladimir Putin while running for president on a promise to rule as a dictator and threaten American democracy. And Trump's own words turning off some Republican voters. He takes things to the extremes, and this is part of the drama we're trying to get away from. There's no reason for it. But the former president is still the far and away front runner, ahead of his Republican rivals by 50 points. He's not afraid to hurt people's feelings, and there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> People really need to toughen up a little bit. And thanks to our senior congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott, there. And we should note that Trump has pleaded not guilty to 91 criminal charges now. And on the political front, our friends over at 538 have taken a look at the historical data and found that no presidential candidate has been this far ahead in the national polls and gone on to lose the nomination. Coming up, honoree Sandra Day O'Connor with a look inside the private ceremony where Supreme Court justices are paying their final respects. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Do you remember the moment you saw that gun? How could I forget? One night, the Uber driver and the terror that still haunts a city. The 2020 event special, Friday on ABC. Glad you're streaming with us. Members of the public are paying their respects to the late Supreme Court Judge Sandra Day O'Connor, who's lying in repose at the Supreme Court. Justice O'Connor was the first woman to ever serve on the nation's highest court and passed away earlier this month at the age of 93. Well, this morning, justices, family members, and spouses spoke at a private ceremony in the high court's Great Hall. And among them, Supreme Court, Supreme court Justice Sonia Sotomayor, who praised her role model. I will always remember the day Sandra was nominated to become the first female Supreme Court Justice. Sitting in my district attorney's office in New York, I felt the gravity of her nomination at a time when most states had no female justices on their high courts and large firms of 300 to 500 lawyers touted having just one female partner. I knew that Sandra would open the door for women in the law and serve as an inspiration to girls across the country. Later on, she would often say that it was good to be the first, but don't want to be the last. Well, the public is invited to pay their respects through 8 p.m. tonight and tomorrow her funeral will be held at Washington National Cathedral. Our Jay O'Brien is just outside the Supreme Court there, 24 years on the court. And, you know, she not only shaped the court's decisions in that time, Jay, but those decisions are still being felt in this moment. That's exactly right. Uh, she fashioned herself, remember, Kira, as a moderate on the court, a swing vote. She was appointed by President Ronald Reagan. She was obviously a conservative, but the longer she spent on that court, the more that she was unpredictable. And she cast votes that would, uh, for instance, uphold precedent that protected uh, Roe v. Wade. And then she, of course, also upheld, uh, for instance, the University of Michigan's decisions or uh, admissions decisions on affirmative action. But then she was the 
deciding vote in Bush v. Gore, that rare instance in which the Supreme Court decided who would win the presidency, and that's how George W. Bush becomes president. Um, and so her legacy is long in the decisions that she made, but also the court is so different now than when Sandra Day O'Connor was on the bench. Roe was overturned. Affirmative action changed forever in a recent decision. And so the, the arc of her impact on American legal history is still being felt to this day. And also just the example she set in her ideological change and bend while she sat on the bench. You know, when she first arrived at the Supreme Court, I mean, there wasn't even a woman's restroom near the courtroom because there was never a need for one, you know? But she approached her role as the first female Supreme Court justice with such grace and humility and clearly paved the way for other women justices, as we heard Sotomayor, you know, mentioned in her life. Yeah, Justice Sotomayor said that when she was memorializing Justice Sandra Day O'Connor today, she was memorializing a role model. There's this story so often told about Sandra Day O'Connor where she goes to Stanford, she graduates third in her class, and then she goes to a big law firm, and instead of offering her a job as a lawyer, she had gone there to seek, they offered her a job as a secretary. So instead, she went to a district attorney's office, and that's where she began her long legal career. Both Justice Sotomayor also Justice Elena Kagan have uh, authored remembrances in which they said they remember where they were when President Reagan announced that he was plucking a judge from a state court in Arizona and elevating her to be his nominee to the Supreme Court, the first female ever to hold that job. And the phrase is so often used when it comes to Sandra Day O'Connor that she didn't just open the door for women in law and in American politics, she kicked it open. She sure did, and twice joined the majority in decisions that upheld and reaffirmed Roe versus Wade. Let's just talk about how significant it was to have a woman in the room, you know, during these landmark rulings, Jay. Well, one of the things that Sandra Day O'Connor's clerks, frankly, remarked on today, but also been remarking on since she passed a few weeks back, is that she always looked at judicial opinions as to how they would impact people, how the law impacts average Americans. And she would have those conversations in deliberations with the various justices, on that case and on others. But also, again, as we noted earlier, Kira, the landscape of the American legal system, particularly as it relates to Roe, has completely been upended since Sandra Day O'Connor sat on the court. She was a key vote in Planned Parenthood v. Casey, which was a decision that really bolstered Roe and the right to an abortion. But that same Supreme Court now completely changed in its conservative majority and completely changed with the justices that sat on it has now struck down Roe, a sign that Sandra Day O'Connor sat on a court that is much different than the one we look at today. It sure is. But her influence, I'll tell you, that'll live on forever, that's for sure. Jay, thanks so much. Coming up, a massive shift for Pope Francis and the Catholic Church. We've got the details right after a break. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions, their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. 
Reporting from Cole, Oklahoma, I'm Mola Lange. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Glad you're streaming with us with our headlines that we're tracking for you this hour. In a major shift, Pope Francis says the Catholic Church will now allow blessings of same-sex couples. However, the church adding that the blessing must avoid any elements that remotely resemble a marriage right. It's the first major update to Catholic doctrine in decades and will have a major impact across the globe for a church still divided over same-sex couples. The European Union formally opening an investigation into Elon Musk and X, the social network formerly known as Twitter. The EU is looking into claims that the company failed to do enough to stop disinformation and hate speech from spreading online. This is the first investigation under a new European law attempting to hold social media companies accountable for posts on its platforms. And bye bye Berlin, hello China. The giant pandas, Pitt and Polly, originally were supposed to go to China a couple years ago, but the pandemic delayed those plans until now. They are only about 1,800 giant pandas still living in the wild in China. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips from Breaking News to all the stories that matter to you. You can always find us on various streaming services, the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com. News never stops, neither do we. We'll be right back. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Give it to me. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. A nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions. Their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the scene of the deadly medical center shooting here in Atlanta, I'm Steve Osinzami. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You are streaming ABC News Live. Today on ABC News Live, anger over the accidental killing of three Israeli hostages. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin is in the Middle East for talks as officials confirm a fresh round of hostage negotiations with Hamas. Congress facing an uphill battle ahead of holidays. Negotiators scrambling to find common ground on government spending, the odds of a deal before the new year. Southwest Airlines slapped with a record-setting fine, what it means for travelers and why the Transportation Secretary says he's putting all airlines on notice. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Our top story this hour, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin visiting Israel amid growing pressure on that country to scale back its offensive in Gaza as the humanitarian crisis deepens. The secretary and Israel's minister of defense holding a presser focusing on the future of Gaza after the war. Take a listen. Israelis and Palestinians both deserve a horizon of hope. It is in the interest of both Israelis and Palestinians to move forward toward two states, living side by side in mutual security. 
Let's bring in Inez de la Cotera in Tel Aviv. So Inez, let's talk about how significant Austin's comments are and this visit. And do you think it adds any pressure on Israeli military operations right now? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the hope here, that this visit will pressure Israel into kind of coming to an agreement here with the U.S., specifically in terms of what happens next in Gaza, but also in terms of what's ongoing at the moment. So we know the U.S. is pushing Israel to, you know, minimize the uh, number of civilian casualties there uh, and to also move into a next next kind of more targeted, smaller phase of the war. Uh, the Israelis have given no timeline for when they plan to do that, but we understand the, the U.S. would like to see that happening in the next uh, few weeks. When it comes to what's next, uh, lots of disagreements there between the U.S. and Israel. So uh, the U.S. would like to see ultimately a two-state solution. They don't want Israel to reoccupy Gaza, and they do want to see a revitalized Palestinian Authority take over. The Israelis have indicated the opposite. So they are not in favor of having the Palestinian Authority take over. They have suggested that they may want to uh, maintain a presence in Gaza after the war ends. And so that's part of the ongoing discussions that are going to be had here. We know the, that Austin uh, met with the defense minister, the Israeli defense minister, today. They discussed the future of Gaza behind closed doors. Um, but Austin really trying to, to walk a fine line and, you know, on the one hand, reaffirming the, the U.S.'s support for Israel and then at the same time pushing for these goals. Both sides have acknowledged that there are disagreements here. The Israelis uh, just in the last few days saying they're hopeful that some kind of agreement can be reached with the U.S. So an IDF spokesperson says that Israel is closer to war with Hezbollah now after a series of attacks along Israel's northern border. What's the situation there? Yeah, the situation there very much ongoing, so it hasn't exactly turned into any kind of fully fledged uh, war, obviously. No new front opening up uh, for now, but that is the concern here. We've seen daily skirmish skirmishes happening uh, along Israel's northern border with Lebanon. Uh, residents there have had to leave their homes. We know that tens of thousands of people have been displaced, and uh, just anecdotally in the hotel we're staying at, there are residents from northern Israel who've had to uh, move. The, the government is paying for their hotel. They don't know when they're going to be able to go home, so it's something that the Israeli government, of course, is, is mindful of, but the U.S. as well. Uh, we've seen uh, the U.S. repeatedly warning other actors not to get involved here, not to take advantage of the situation uh, to, to try and open up a new front in the war. It's part of the reason you're seeing Austin here as well is, is you know, his, his very presence acts as a deterrent to those actors who may be hostile to, to Israel. So the IDF is also saying it's discovered one of the biggest Hamas tunnels uh, ever uh, under Gaza. Do you know anything more than what they've just said? Yeah, so we were actually taken uh, into Gaza to see that tunnel. So they say this is the biggest Hamas tunnel they've ever uncovered in Gaza. They, they say this is something that would have taken years to build and millions of dollars to build. They say they, they when they discovered it, there were militants inside, there were lots of weapons, that it was also booby-trapped. Uh, they do say they plan to destroy it in the coming days, that this is just part of, uh, you know, what they've been doing here. Just one of their goals, uh, one of their clearly stated goals is to not only destroy Hamas, but also to destroy uh, Hamas. Hamas's uh, terror infrastructure, and they told us you cannot fully destroy Hamas without also destroying those tunnels. So they're going to be destroying those tunnels. They wouldn't get into specifics as to how they're going to destroy it. Uh, they say that the only way to permanently destroy a tunnel is with explosives. Uh, they wouldn't confirm that uh, the IDF has also been using uh, seawater, pumping seawater into some tunnels to, to try and destroy them. U.S. officials did confirm that that was happening in a limited capacity, uh, but the IDF still not commenting on that specific technique. All right, Inez de la Quatera, thank you so much. And moving on to the race for the White House, former President Donald Trump holding a demanding lead in the Republican primary, but is also facing criticism for comments that he made on the campaign trail when he stopped in New Hampshire. He attacked immigrants and praised dictators. Here's a little bit of what he said. They're poisoning the blood of our country. That's what they've done. They poison mental institutions and prisons all over the world, not just in South America, not just the three or four countries that we think about, but all over the world. They're coming into our country from Africa, from Asia, all over the world. They're pouring into our country. Deputy Political Director Avery Harper was also listening to his comments, poisoning the blood. You know, Trump has used that phrase throughout the campaign cycle, Avery. White supremacist uh, Adolf Hitler even used that kind of language. But is it going to make any difference to voters? 
Right, well, we'll definitely have to see. Yes, this harkens back to white supremacist rhetoric. This is uh, something that harkens back to Hitler's obsession with so-called blood purity. Uh, and uh, you have to remember, this is not necessarily a new playbook for former President Trump. In 2016, you have to remember his comments about immigrants then. Uh, he said they're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime. This is not a new playbook for them. When we think about this Republican primary. I don't necessarily think it's going to impact how he does with voters there. We know that he is dominating in this race when you look at uh, him in comparison to the rest of the GOP field. Uh, but when it comes to uh, the potential of a general election, uh, this could hurt him there. This could mobilize uh, voters to come out and vote against him in the general election should he be the nominee. So the former president also quoted Putin, and he praised Chinese President Xi Jinping for ruling ruthlessly. Um, are other candidates on the campaign trail calling Trump out for any of this? Right. Uh, we know that there's a real reluctance on the part of many within this Republican field uh, to talk about former President Trump at all. And so uh, the only candidate that we've talked to or that we've heard from in terms of uh, how they feel about these comments, his coziness with authoritarian leaders like, uh, you know, the leaders in, in Russia and the leader of, of China, is former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. He is someone who has spoken out about this. He has been vocal. He says that uh, Trump is getting, quote, crazier uh, in reference to these comments comments about the other candidates so far we haven't heard very much from them on this uh, because again they are walking a fine line they are trying to appeal to uh, Trump voters while not alienating them and so uh, we know that it is not popular in this current Republican Party uh, to speak negatively about former President Trump so we'll see what happens there and um, doesn't seem to uh, be hurting him thus far he's uh, way ahead in the poll numbers all right well I have you let's talk about this race to reach a deal a border deal uh, and it's happening up on Capitol Hill do you think there's a risk politically politically rather for the president as in Biden to make a deal with Republicans on the border in order to get the funding he wants for Ukraine and Israel right now I, I definitely do when you look at the fact that we're entering a uh, an election year if Biden is perceived to be siding with Republicans Republicans uh, on uh, and folks who are proponents of Trump era immigration policies that could be detrimental to him and damaging to his credibility with parts of the Democratic Party that helped elect him back in 2020. Uh, we're talking about young voters, voters of color, voters who uh, might know and love uh, immigrants who are in this country, right? And so it remains to be seen what is actually going to happen there. I know that uh, the White House has been open and signal openness to making a deal on this, uh, trying to address the issues at the southern border, but. Uh, the fact is that this could be damaging for the president come 2024. All right, one more question. Trump's recent attacks on, on immigrants, do you think it'll have any impact on Republicans negotiating with the White House? Well, we know that Trump has a significant influence within this current Republican Party. Uh, in terms of his hand playing uh, in these negotiations specifically, uh, I'm not so sure about that. But of course, there are Republican, Republican lawmakers, particularly in the House, who are taking their cues from him on this. Avery Harper, thank you. Thank you. So the Department of Transportation is handing down a record-setting fine now for Southwest Airlines after last year's travel meltdown during the holiday season. The $140 million fine is 30 times larger than any previous fine against an airline. And the government is also making Southwest issue a $75 flight credit to any traveler whose arrival is delayed more than three hours if it's the airline's fault. The transportation reporter Sam Sweeney's tracking all this. So... Um, the Department of Transportation definitely trying to send a message here with this historic fine. Yep, sending a message to Southwest and all of the other airlines to get it together and take care of your customers or else you will be held accountable. Secretary Buttigieg has made this a point of his tenure uh, as the Secretary of Transportation. I spoke with him this morning. Let's listen. This record penalty is holding Southwest accountable for their failures and it is sending a message to the entire industry with a new standard, a new level of accountability. It is a multiple of anything that our department has done in the past, and our expectation is that that will lead to better decisions and better passenger service. 
And the Department of Transportation has spent nearly a year investigating Southwest before they made this announcement this morning. They went to Texas. They went methodically through the paperwork. They went through the complaints, and that's how they came up with this historical fine cure, as you said, 30 times uh, what they've ever done in the past. And Southwest is out with a statement saying that they don't agree that they broke the law, as the Department of Transportation says, but they are glad that they have reached this settlement uh, and that they will be able to provide this industry first, as you said, a $75 flight credit to anyone whose flight is delayed by more than three hours when it is Southwest's fault. Now, that won't go in, uh, into effect until later next year, but still a first for a U.S. airline. All right, and Southwest, uh, who is it paying this fine to, and will the consumer actually see any of that? They are going to pay $35 million to the U.S. government. It will go into the Treasury, as any other fine uh, typically does. And then $90 million of it will be used for that, that, that new fund to compensate passengers going forward. And they were also given credit because of the amount of rapid rewards or frequent flyer points that they gave out as part of the compensation to the people who, more than 2 million people who were affected by those delays and cancellations last year. You remember, nearly 17,000 flights were canceled in about a week's period. Well, will other airlines have to comply, you think? Will we see a domino effect? I asked Secretary Buttigieg that if that's his goal to make this industry-wide, and he said that they are looking at it. Uh, it will have to go through a lengthy federal regulatory process, but it is certainly something that they are very interested in seeing across the board. Do you think airlines have revamped their systems at all since the Southwest meltdown? A lot of lessons were learned from this, uh, not just for Southwest, but across the board, United, American, Delta, all making sure that their systems are in tip-top shape, the most, uh, the newest technology, so they're able to handle these incidents. Southwest was dealing with an antiquated system, particularly its crew system. They weren't able to get their flight attendants and pilots in position to restart the airline. Eventually, they said, we're just going to cancel nearly every flight. It'll be a full stop, and we will restart the operation the next day after we move crews around. But some flight attendants and pilots were reporting they were on hold with the company for more than 16 hours trying to figure out where they should be. Sam Sweeney, appreciate it. Hopefully this week will be smooth. Fingers <laughs> crossed. Yes. Well, coming up, Guilty, the former YouTube momfluencer charged with child abuse, what she said to the judge right before her plea. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. Welcome to Crufts, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day on the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is a place to sing to magic. Our winner of oh, Crufts 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show.
Glad you're streaming with us. Well, YouTube parenting influencer Ruby Frankie has pled guilty to four of the six charges of felony child abuse. Take a listen. With my deepest regret and sorrow for my family and my children, guilty. Frankie was known for her so-called tough love parenting, and now the Utah mom is admitting to abusing her own children while also blaming someone else. Our legal contributor, Brian Buckmeyer, joins me now. He's been following this case as well. So, Brian, let's just start with how significant Ruby's plea is today, and what does it mean for her case now? Well, Kira, it's very significant for her case because what it ultimately does is it brings us to an end, at least for Ruby Frankie, to this very tragic saga. She's pleading guilty to four of the aggravated child abuse charges, each one of them uh, being what's called a second-degree felony, so she could face one to 15 years in prison for each one, depending on what theory the prosecution's going forward with. And we know that she didn't get a sentence today because in Utah, like many states, uh, the state wants to have the opportunity for the victims in this case to come forward. And we know that date is down for February 20th. Uh, I'm not sure if we're going to see the children come up and speak in open court, but I would expect that uh, Ruby Frankie's husband or, or now separated husband and maybe other family members will come forward and speak on the children's behalf. Yeah, I think a lot of people would love to hear from those kids, even, you know, her maybe soon-to-be ex. Um, it's sort of a twisted tale, isn't it, within that family? You know, Frankie's lawyers um, do say that she is taking responsibility for the part that she played in all the events leading up to her incarceration, but that she's seemingly pointing the finger now at her former business partner, uh, Jody Hildebrandt, claiming that Hildebrandt actually isolated her from her family and that Frankie was, quote, subjected to a distorted sense of morality shaped by Hildebrandt's influence. We did reach out to Hildebrandt's attorneys. They've not responded to our request for comment, but the two were often seen, Brian, as you know, in these videos together. So what do you make of Hildebrandt's uh, part in, in all of this as well? I mean, I say this as an attorney and, and as a father of a one and a half year old, I know I'm still like a rookie in the parenting game. I can't mm -hmm. imagine how someone can isolate you to then abuse your own children or participate in the abuse of your own children. She had six children. Uh, I think two of them are already adults. And, and now we're talking about her younger children going through this very uh, aggressive form of parenting that many people on social media reached out to, had complaints about, police had come forward. Uh, what I make of it from a legal standpoint is I want to know, is Ruby Frank going to testify against Jody Hildebrandt if she, uh, Jody, ends up going to trial? And is that a part of the plea agreement? And, and what I'm looking for in terms of going forward is the math in all of this can be very extreme. Like I said, each charge, one to 15 years in prison, but a judge has every right to say, you know what? There are two different children that you're being charged with. I can give you 10 years for one child and then consecutively give you another 10 years. She can give, under the theories of these uh, child abuse, maybe five or 10 for each one of the different charges. The math here could be very devastating towards her, or she can get just a couple of years. It's really amazing to, to look back at those videos and how she presented herself, how she looked, and how so many people were just fooled by what she was doing behind the scenes. Um, what are you watching out for next? The victim impact statements. I want to know who's going to come forward, which one of these videos that you're showing as well are going to be potentially played in this sentencing hearing on February 20th. What, if anything, is Ruby Frankie going to say? Because, again, the defendant has the opportunity to take uh, kind of the stand, so to speak, and, and give her own two cents as to why she believes there's mitigation in this case, why she believes she should be getting on the lower end of a prison sentence rather than on the higher end. And so what is she going to say in her own defense? What is she going to agree to? To, and what ultimately is the judge going to give once they've heard all of the uh, witnesses come forward? Well, we'll follow it together. Always great to have your legal insight, Brian. Thank you. My pleasure. Coming up, a massive shift for Pope Francis and the Catholic Church. We've got all the details next. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. 
so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. So many people start their day here. From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Orange County, New York on the migrant crisis, I'm Jacqueline Lee. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Glad you're streaming with us. Some other top headlines are falling for you this hour in a major shift. Pope Francis says the Catholic Church will now allow blessings of same-sex couples. However, the church did add that the blessing must avoid any elements that remotely resemble a marriage rite. It is the first major update to the Catholic doctrine in decades and will have a major impact across the globe for a church still divided over same-sex couples. The European Union formally opening an investigation into Elton, or Elon Musk rather, and X, the social network formerly known as Twitter. The EU is looking into claims that the company failed to do enough to stop disinformation and hate speech from spreading online. This is the first investigation under a new European law attempting to hold social media companies accountable for posts on its platform. Forms. And bye-bye Berlin, hello China. The giant pandas, Pitt and Polly, were originally supposed to go to China a couple years ago, but the pandemic delayed all those plans until now. There are only about 1,800 giant pandas still living in the wild in China. Well, Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom splashes into theaters on Friday, but before stars uh, Jason Momoa and Patrick Wilson grace the big screen in the superhero sequel, they spent an afternoon of adventure with our Maggie Rooley across the city of London, and let me tell you, it was a difficult assignment and quite an adventure for Maggie. Yay! Jason Momoa and his aquatic alter ego Aquaman have a lot more in common than you think. They both know how to wield a trident. And they're both quite comfortable on the water. We're ready, go. Okay, yeah. Go. Ah! Ah! <laughs> Ripping through the River Thames, we caught up with Jason in London. Look at that, that's ridiculous. Atlantis is way cooler. <laughs> That's true. That's like, very true. <laughs> cool killer bridge. I don't know if you've seen my movie, but ours is way bigger. Or what would you want people to know about Aquaman that they might not know? I think he really, really wants to um, have a brother and connect with his brother. That's heartwarming. He's not gonna tell no one. Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you. <laughs> this is Don't tell anyone great. else. You know the deal here. No spoilers. But speaking of that brother. Good job, little brother. High five. Do not call me brother. We met up with Patrick Wilson for quite the high tea. Jason, you actually volunteered to be mother. I'll be mother. I'll be mother. Will I'll you? Be will you? Great mother. Please. For us? I will. Ladies first. I'm oh, why? Thank you so here. much. Look at the stance. Wow. Okay. My this is really. <laughs> See this? You're getting you getting this lunch? Have you seen mother oh do this? My God. And after we sip. <laughs> oh, that's a tasty treat. <laughs> Some good tea. <laughs> it's time to spill. There you go. Well, you know, I have to say something I love about the two of you is that you're brothers on the screen, but I feel like. 
there's a little roma uh, bromance going on You here. said romance. I did, I slipped. Chemistry is a funny thing. Mm. First of all, we're both very, very, very busy people in our own lives, for sure. And so I think the relationship on screen has to come from two people that want to be there and want to have a good time, and, 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 and we do. Well, I think what's fun about the new movie is that you guys don't have to hate each other the whole time. Yeah. It seems like you're, you're teaming up a bit. Yeah. You choose to. <laughs> <laughs> so what was it like to sort of be on the same side in this movie? When you come from these two different worlds, where I, where I suck at something, he's great at it, and where he yeah. sucks at something, I'm great at it. And so when we come together to do something positive. And True King builds bridges, right? <laughs> True King builds bridges. And it's what these stars have brought from their personal lives that really help these characters shine. We always talk about uh, whether you're playing somebody super serious or super mm. funny. It's like, how much do you, do you go to the character? How much does the character come to you? And I think what this film has done even more than the first film is this character has come to him. I'm a husband and a father, and I wouldn't have it any other way. You've played this character for so long. You're like, I would love to see him this way. I wanted to walk that line where you're like, being a king, dealing with all that, mm. in a world that's getting completely polluted, being a father for the first time, he's obviously the reluctant king who's now king, and then also being a husband, and just like balancing all that, and he's exhausted. And I am. Being a great father. That's that part. <laughs> Maggie Ruley, ABC News, London. All right, thanks to Maggie for that. And thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips from Breaking News to all the stories that matter to you. You can always find us anywhere you stream, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops, neither do we. We'll be right back. We have really good news. <laughs> oh I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions, their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Today on ABC News Live, wicked weather slamming the Northeast, powerful winds and heavy rain leaving thousands of you without power. We've got your forecast ahead. Southwest Airlines slapped with a record-setting fine, what it means for travelers and why the transportation secretary says he's putting all airlines on notice. And anger over the accidental killing of three Israeli hostages. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin in the Middle East for talks as officials confirm a fresh round of hostage negotiations with Hamas. 
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Our top story this hour, 11 states under flood watches right now from Maryland to Maine. Wind gusts already reaching up to 70 miles per hour in parts of New England. That same system bringing heavy rain to the southeast as well. Parts of South Carolina measuring its highest non-tropical tide on record with more than 16 inches of rain falling in parts of the state. And more than a half a million people are now without power in New England. Our senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it all for us right now. That massive storm making its way into the Northeast. In New Jersey, drivers had to be rescued after cars stalled out in floodwaters. Cars hydroplaning through deep water along New York City's FDR Drive. The Carolina coastline getting hammered. An ocean overwash pushing ashore in Buxton, North Carolina, part of the Outer Banks. Winds wreaking havoc across South Carolina. This shopping center suffering severe damage after a reported tornado touched down. Pieces of the building ending up in the parking lot. Windows smashed after winds picked up debris and launched into this van. Winds toppling trailers and knocking down trees into houses in Horry County. When we were running, that's when we heard the glass breaking and we came out and then the tree was there. Areas near Charleston getting more than 16 inches of rain. AccuWeather captured first responders rescuing drivers in historic Georgetown. The same storm slamming Florida too. Conditions so bad there, this driver couldn't see the road ahead, going right over a seawall and into the intercoastal. His van floating. First responders, though, were able to rescue him. Oh, my God. And this power line igniting during the storm in St. Petersburg. All right, Rob, thanks so much. Well, let's get some more on this forecast amid the storms and bring in our meteorologist, Kenton Jewicki. So, Kenton, where's the storm headed next, and what do you think people should expect? Yeah, Kira, it's definitely not done yet. The storm is still bringing heavy rain to the new uh, to New England, all of New England, and also upstate New York, getting through New York City right now as well. And the winds, they're still going as well. We have wind gusts just in the past couple hours. Nantucket there, around 60-mile-per-hour wind gusts still going on. That's a damaging wind gust, certainly. And and also up near Portland, getting up to 50 miles per hour there. Here are some of those alerts. Again, winter storm warning there for Erie. Otherwise, we have all these flash flood warnings. But we also have flood warnings everywhere in red that you see. That's either a flash flood warning or just a regular flood warning where there's been so much rain. A lot of these areas seeing two to four inches of rain, and there's just not a lot for that to go. So there are there's water over roadways. Streams are higher. Certainly a big impact there. And as we track this through, by about 6 p.m., that's going to be north of Boston. It's going to be near Portland for that heaviest rain. More snow, though, coming over from the west. That's going to be lake effect snow and even some wraparound snow on the back of the system. So by 7 a.m. tomorrow, we're looking at Appalachia, still seeing uh, a bit of snow there and some lake effect as well. But chilly air, this feels like a spring storm for a lot of the Northeast. It's very warm. But tomorrow, that all changes. We're going to look at a wind chills tomorrow morning uh, in the teens and 20s for a lot of the Northeast. All right, and the West Coast also expecting some storms, right? They are. Uh, two storms, actually. The first one is already starting to move in. We have a lot of alerts already coming through here with this. Wind alerts especially, and some winter storm alerts. That's going to be for those higher elevations where they could see uh, about a foot of snow there. But it's really this second storm that's the big one, Kira. We're looking at about Tuesday here. That's when this starts to come in. It's for the entire state of California, but especially Southern California, which doesn't see this type of storm that often. We're looking at any anywhere from two to three inches for a lot of this California coast here through the end of this week. But look at Los Angeles down there. They're going to see possibly three inches, maybe even more, depending on how this storm tracks. So something else that we're certainly keeping an eye on this week, Kira. All right, Kenton, thanks so much. Well, the Department of Transportation is handing down a record-setting fine for Southwest Airlines after last year's travel meltdown during the holiday season. The $140 million fine is 30 times larger than any previous fine against an airline. The government is also making uh, South Southwest rather issue a $75 flight credit to any traveler whose arrival is delayed more than three hours if it's the airline's fault. Transportation reporter Sam Sweeney joins me now. So, Sam, let's just talk about the message the Department of Transportation is sending here with this historic find. They are calling for accountability, not just from Southwest, but the entire industry. And this has really been one of Secretary Buttigieg's uh, projects. He wants to hold these airlines accountable, reduce delays, reduce cancellations. And when there are those cancellations uh, and delays that are significant, the airline should be responsible if it's their fault. I spoke with him this morning. Let's listen. 
This record penalty is holding Southwest accountable for their failures, and it is sending a message to the entire industry with a new standard, a new level of accountability. It is a multiple of anything that our department has done in the past, and our expectation is that that will lead to better decisions and better passenger service. And there you heard it from the secretary. They have worked methodically over the last year to go through all of the paperwork, all of the complaints from passengers. They've traveled to Dallas to meet with Southwest officials multiple times to see everything that happened here, why this failure took place, and what Southwest is doing to improve it so it doesn't happen again. And the big takeaway here is that $75 credit. If you fly Southwest and your flight, as you said, Kira, is delayed more than three hours and it is Southwest's fault, you are now entitled to $75. That is a first for airlines here in the U.S. And a lot of friends impacted last year uh, by Southwest and what went down. Do you think there'll be broader implications here and that I other airlines will have to comply as well? It sounds like there will be. They're working through that uh, uh, federal regulatory framework there uh, to get this into place. I asked the secretary that this morning and he said they're going to watch this. They're going to see how it looks, but they want again, hold these airlines accountable. And this is just one way of doing it. But there is another side to this story. Some uh, critics of this policy say, look, is this going to encourage airlines to cut corners to get these planes into the air when it may not be safe. Of course, the airlines themselves, uh, you know, say that they would never do that and they put safety first, but that's what some critics of these programs do say. So let's just talk about 2022 and, and why that travel meltdown even went down the way that it did, because clearly it's warranting a, a pretty big penalty here for Southwest in particular. This was the worst meltdown in aviation history. It couldn't have happened at a worse time. It was Christmas week. You had millions of people traveling, and they canceled nearly 17,000 flights. Now, other airlines also had problems earlier in the week when this ice storm moved across the country, but they were able to recover, and Southwest, Southwest was not able to. They had a different operating system. Instead of a hub system, they go from point to point. That was one of their problems, but also their computer system melted down. It was antiquated. It needed needed to be update, their crews were out of place, and they needed to stop the airline, and they did a full restart. And if you recall, it started earlier on the week, and it didn't get really recovered until Friday. All right, let's see how the week goes. Only seven days out till Christmas. Sam Sweeney, thank you. Thank you. talk about the war in the Middle East now. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin is in Israel amid growing pressure on the country to scale back its offensive in Gaza as the humanitarian crisis just deepens. Secretary Austin and Israel's Minister of Defense held a presser focusing on the future of Gaza after this war. Take a listen. Israelis and Palestinians both deserve a horizon of hope. It is in the interest of both Israelis and Palestinians to move forward toward two states living side by side in mutual security. Our Inez de is in Tel Aviv. You know, Inez, we talked about the growing pressure on Israel, but you really didn't see it in that presser with the Secretary of Defense. Yeah, so Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin there really trying to walk a fine line. On the one hand, reaffirming the U.S.'s support for Israel, but this comes as there are growing disagreements with Israel when it comes to Gaza. So uh, one issue, of course, is everything going on with the uh, mounting uh, civilian casualties there. The uh, U.S. calling on Israel to do more to minimize civilian casualties. The Israelis insisting they are doing everything they can uh, to, to, to do that. Uh, when it comes to the future of Gaza, that's another big uh, sticking point, and we know that Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin discussed that with the Israeli Defense Minister. Uh, the, the Austin afterwards did uh, publicly talk about um, how, how, you know, parts of what they had discussed. So uh, he says that there should be a two-state solution. We know that's what the U.S. is in favor of under clear principles that Secretary of State uh, Antony Blinken laid out last month. And part of those principles include things like Israel should not reoccupy Gaza or, uh, you know, re reuniting uh, Gaza or, or uni uniting Gaza with the West Bank under a revitalized Palestinian authority. But both of those things are things that the Israelis uh, are, are opposed to. So we've heard the Israelis suggest that they should maintain 
a presence in Gaza after the war ends. And we also know that the Israeli prime minister is not too hot on the idea of having the Palestinian Authority take over Gaza. So those are, are, are I think, two, the main two sticking points. That's part of the reason you're seeing Austin uh, here in Israel to kind of smooth that out. Um, and it's part of the reason you saw other U.S. officials as well, uh, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan just last week and uh, Blinken last month. So let's talk about hostages. An IDF commander says that the accidental shooting last week of those three Israeli hostages in Gaza was against the rules of engagement. How did this mistake happen? And what changes is the IDF making in the wake of those deaths? Yeah, so they're, they're very much still looking into it. There is an investigation that's ongoing. According to a preliminary investigation, we understand that those three hostages uh, were came out of a building that was in an area of very intense fighting. They were shirtless. They had a makeshift uh, white flag, but a soldier perceived them uh, to be a threat and opened fire, killing two instantly. We understand that afterwards, someone cried out help in Hebrew, and so a battalion commander uh, ordered for the troops to stop firing, but another soldier uh, opened fire again minutes later and uh, killed the third hostage. So that, so that, you know, of course, set off all sorts of protests, uh, especially here in Tel Aviv over the weekend. The, the families of the hostages taking to the streets uh, to, to, to protest that and, and call for some kind of deal here to be put on the table to release the hostages. But the IDF, you know, saying they're looking into the incidents, um, insisting that they're doing everything they can as they go about, you know, going after Hamas and going after Hamas's uh, infrastructure, destroying the tunnels, for instance. The IDF insists that they are taking steps to try and keep the hostages is safe, um, but, but they still are going to have lots of questions to answer there, Kira. Well, CIA Director Burns also uh, joining the head of Israel's intelligence service for more hostage negotiation talks. What would it take for another deal to happen, you think? Yeah, and we understand that, that those negotiations are back on, uh, so that is certainly some, some you know, good news, I think. The Israeli officials uh, uh, confirming that uh, the head of the Israeli intelligence service is in Europe meeting with the Qatari prime minister. We also understand, according to U.S. officials, that CIA Director Bill Burns uh, is joining those talks. We know the first round of talks were held in Doha, the, those talks that led to that first temporary truce. Bill Burns was part of those talks, and so now it appears another round of talks is being held in Europe. I will say a top Hamas official, though, uh, reiterating that there would be no additional hostage releases uh, until the fighting stops here. So, you know, that may throw a wrench here uh, in these talks. Um, but but we are hearing from the families of the hostages, again, the, those, you know, the, those that took to the streets over the weekend, thousands taking to the streets in Tel Aviv, some of them even camping out overnight outside of the IDF's headquarters, demanding that a deal be put on the table, saying that the current approach of going after the hostages by force, which the IDF has been taking, clearly isn't working. We're learning almost every every day of additional hostages who have been killed. And so the families of these hostages want some kind of deal to be put on the table. Uh, they were telling us that, you know, they feel it's the only way to bring back the hostages alive. All right. Inez de la Cotera there in Tel Aviv. Thanks, Inez. Former President Trump is facing backlash now for comments that he made about immigrants while on the campaign trail. Critics say his words echo those of Adolf Hitler as he also praised authoritarian leaders, even quoting Russian President Vladimir Putin. Our senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott has the latest with less than a month until the first votes are cast in the 2024 Republican primary. On the campaign trail, former President Donald Trump is drawing big crowds in a swing through early voting states, but coming under fire for these anti-immigrant comments he made in New Hampshire this weekend. They're poisoning the blood of our country. That's what they've done. That language echoes white supremacists and was used by Adolf Hitler in his autobiographical manifesto, Mein Kampf, where Hitler criticized mixing races, calling it, quote, blood poisoning. Trump has repeatedly used the phrase. He's disgusting. And what he's doing is dog whistling to Americans who feel absolutely under stress and strain from the economy and from the conflicts around the world. And he's dog whistling it to blame it on people from areas that don't look like us. If elected, Trump promised to carry out mass deportations, deputizing the National Guard to arrest undocumented immigrants. I will terminate every open borders policy of the Biden administration, stop the invasion of our southern border and begin the largest domestic deportation operation in American history. On the campaign trail, the former president also praising dictators, at one point invoking Russian President Vladimir Putin, using quotes from a top U.S. adversary to attack President Biden. Vladimir Putin. Has anybody ever heard of Vladimir Putin? 
of Russia says that Biden's, and this is a quote, politically motivated persecution of his political rival is very good for Russia because it shows the rottenness of the American political system. The Biden campaign responding with a blistering statement, writing Trump parroted Adolf Hitler, praised Kim Jong-un, and quoted Vladimir Putin while running for president on a promise to rule as a dictator and threaten American democracy. And Trump's own words turning off some Republican voters. He takes things to the extremes, and this is part of the drama we're trying to get away from. There's no reason for it. But the former president is still the far and away front runner, ahead of his Republican rivals by 50 points. He's not afraid to hurt people's feelings, and there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> people really need to toughen up a little bit. And thanks to our senior congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott, there. And we should note that Trump has pleaded not guilty to 91 criminal charges now. And on the political front, our friends over at 538 have taken a look at the historical data and found that no presidential candidate has been this far ahead in the national polls and gone on to lose the nomination. Coming up, honoree Sandra Day O'Connor with a look inside the private ceremony where Supreme Court justices are paying their final respects. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis, weeknights on ABC News Live. We have really good news. <laughs> I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions, their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. Do you remember the moment you saw that gun? How could I forget? One night, the Uber driver and the terror that still haunts a city. The 2020 event special, Friday on ABC. Glad you're streaming with us. Members of the public are paying their respects to the late Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who's lying in repose at the Supreme Court. Justice O'Connor was the first woman to ever serve on the nation's highest court and passed away earlier this month at the age of 93. Well, this morning, justices, family members, and spouses spoke at a private ceremony in the high court's Great Hall, and among them, Supreme Court, Supreme court Justice Sonia Sotomayor, who praised her role model. I will always remember the day Sandra was nominated to become the first female Supreme Court Justice. Sitting in my district attorney's office in New York, I felt the gravity of her nomination. At a time when most states had no female justices on their high courts, and large firms of 300 to 500 lawyers touted having just one female partner, I knew that Sandra would open the door for women in the law and serve as an inspiration to girls across the country. Later on, she would often say that it was good to be the first, but don't want to be the last. 
public is invited to pay their respects through 8 p.m. tonight and tomorrow her funeral will be held at Washington National Cathedral. Our Jay O'Brien is just outside the Supreme Court there. 24 years on the court and you know she not only shaped the court's decisions in that time Jay but those decisions are still being felt in this moment. That's exactly right. Uh, she fashioned herself, remember, Kira, as a moderate on the court, a swing vote. She was appointed by President Ronald Reagan. She was obviously a conservative, but the longer she spent on that court, the more that she was unpredictable. And she cast votes that would, uh, for instance, uphold precedent that protected uh, Roe v. Wade. And then she, of course, also upheld, uh, for instance, the University of Michigan's decisions or uh, admissions decisions on affirmative action. But then she was the defiant vote in Bush v. Gore, that rare instance in which the Supreme Court decided who would win the presidency, and that's how George W. Bush becomes president. Um, and so her legacy is long in the decisions that she made, but also the court is so different now than when Sandra Day O'Connor was on the bench. Roe was overturned. Affirmative action changed forever in a recent decision. And so the, the arc of her impact on American legal history is still being felt to this day. And also just the example she set in her ideological change and bend while she sat on the bench. You know, when she first arrived at the Supreme Court, I mean, there wasn't even a woman's restroom near the courtroom because there was never a need for one, you know, but she approached her role as the first female Supreme Court justice with such grace and humility and clearly paved the way for other women justices, as we heard Sotomayor, you know, mentioned in her life. Yeah, Justice Sotomayor said that when she was memorializing Justice Sandra Day O'Connor today, she was memorializing a role model. There's this story so often told about Sandra Day O'Connor where she goes to Stanford, she graduates third in her class, and then she goes to a big law firm, and instead of offering her a job as a lawyer, she had gone there to seek, they offered her a job as a secretary. So instead, she went to a district attorney's office, and that's where she began her long legal career. Both Justice Sotomayor also Justice Elena Kagan have uh, authored remembrances in which they said they remember where they were when President Reagan announced that he was plucking a judge from a state court in Arizona and elevating her to be his nominee to the Supreme Court, the first female ever to hold that job. And the phrase is so often used when it comes to Sandra Day O'Connor that she didn't just open the door for women in law and in American politics, she kicked it open. She sure did, and twice joined the majority in decisions that upheld and reaffirmed Roe versus Wade. Let's just talk about how significant it was to have a woman in the room you know, during these landmark rulings, Jay. Well, one of the things that Sandra Day O'Connor's clerks frankly remarked on today, but also been remarking on since she passed a few weeks back, is that she always looked at judicial opinions as to how they would impact people, how the law impacts average Americans. And she would have those conversations in deliberations with the various justices, on that case and on others. But also, again, as we noted earlier, Kira, the landscape of the American legal system, particularly as it relates to Roe, has completely been upended since Sandra Day O'Connor sat on the court. She was a key vote in Planned Parenthood v. Casey, which was a decision that really bolstered Roe and the right to an abortion. But that same Supreme Court now completely changed in its conservative majority and completely changed with the justices that sat on it has now struck down Roe, a sign that Sandra Day O'Connor sat on a court that is much different than the one we look at today. It sure is. But her influence, I'll tell you, that'll live on forever, that's for sure. Jay, thanks so much. Coming up, a massive shift for Pope Francis and the Catholic Church. We've got the details right after a break. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. 
With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Reporting from the FBI, I'm Pierre Thomas. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Glad you're streaming with us with our headlines that we're tracking for you this hour. In a major shift, Pope Francis says the Catholic Church will now allow blessings of same-sex couples. However, the church adding that the blessing must avoid any elements that remotely resemble a marriage rite. It's the first major update to Catholic doctrine in decades and will have a major impact across the globe for a church still divided over same-sex couples. The European Union formally opening an investigation into Elon Musk and X, the social network formerly known as Twitter. The EU is looking into claims the company failed to do enough to stop disinformation and hate speech from spreading online. This is the first investigation under a new European law attempting to hold social media companies accountable for posts on its platforms. And bye bye Berlin, hello China. The giant pandas, Pitt and Polly, originally were supposed to go to China a couple years ago, but the pandemic delayed those plans until now. They are only about 1,800 giant pandas still living in the wild in China. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips from Breaking News to all the stories that matter to you. You can always find us on various streaming services, ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com. News never stops, neither do we. We'll be right back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Give it to me. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. 
We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Bedminster, New Jersey, I'm Mary Bruce. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Hello, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. And I'm Terry Moran. We've got some breaking news. The jury in the Jonathan Majors domestic violence trial has found him guilty of one count of assault and one count of harassment, but acquitted him of another count of assaulting his former girlfriend. This comes after jurors spent four or five hours deliberating over portions of several days. And this is a case that has gotten a lot of attention. Jonathan Majors, a major rising star. Uh, and he he met you know, a crisis in this, and the jury has now returned with its verdict. And there was a lot of talk about this uh, trial impacting his future in the movie business. Rising star within the Marvel movies. Uh, our legal contributor, Brian Buckmeyer, has been following uh, this from the very beginning as well. So I guess let's first of all talk about the charges here, uh, Brian, your first reaction. Yeah, I'm actually kind of scratching my head just because I'm looking at the different charges and, and let me break it down and explain. There are two different assaults here. One is intentional assault and one is reckless assault. Uh, based on the number order that they're telling us, my guess, and, and please someone correct me if I'm wrong, is they're acquitting him of intentional assault but finding him guilty of reckless assault, meaning that he just did something he should have known um, better and it, it caused the injury of Grace Jabari. Then he's found not guilty of aggravated assault, which is to alarm, annoy, harass, or threaten someone and subject them to physical violence. Uh, but he's not guilty of that, but he is guilty of alarming and annoying uh, Grace Jabari. To me, this sounds like, a, we call it a King Solomon decision. It's, they literally just split the baby and said half and half, but some of the convictions and some of the acquittals don't really make sense when you put them all together. Well, Brian, let, let, me, let me try to make a little sense. I wonder, I don't know the exact fact pattern since I wasn't in the courtroom, but couldn't you say that in, in the fury of what is a domestic dispute, he was reckless in his handling, in his, uh, his physical handling of, uh, of uh, Jabari, and that was, uh, that was the reckless assault. And the harassment is he lost his temper rather than consciously went after went after her. Does that make sense? No, because it would make sense for the reckless and then the aggravated harassment, because the aggravated harassment is harassing someone through physical violence. So why find him guilty of assaulting recklessly, but not guilty of harassing someone through physical force? That's that's the part that I'm thinking someone just kind of said, you know what, right. we'll find him guilty for two, but not guilty for these two. But it, it, it could work. It, the, someone's got to talk to the jury, I guess. Yeah. Let's talk about the, the evidence, um, because there was clearly a clashing narrative from both sides. Uh, we had video, audio, text, photos. Do we have that uh, uh, video? Okay, this is um, some of the photos that we had here of, of the, the bruises and the cuts. This is the video that I'm talking about. I mean, this was probably one of the most powerful pieces of the evidence that they played in court, Brian. Absolutely. And, and I was in court watching some of this video being played to the jury, and I think it was difficult for both the uh, prosecution and the defense to really articulate this video in a way that really moved the jury. And I think ultimately the jury kind of took this case into their own hands. We saw that from the jury notes. 
saying we want all of the evidence, pretty much video, testimony, 911 calls, and they decided for themselves. For me, is this Jonathan Majors assaulting his then girlfriend, then running away, or is this him trying to stop her from stealing, or I guess re-stealing his cell phone and getting away from her? Uh, the the juxtaposition of how this was presented to the jury, I think, is what caused uh, the deliberation to take so long. And there's a is there, there's a state of mind, obviously, that the that the prosecution would have to prove, right? And so here they are. She has seen the the spark that triggered this fight was she saw what she thought was a message from another woman on his phone. So she was trying to grab the phone, he's trying to grab it back there, probably at the, at the peak of emotions and anger and, and mutual conflict at that point. And I, is, would the jury have factored that in? In other words, we've all been in fights with people we love, and so it's not the same as a as a as a self, as a more conscious <laughs> as Brian conscious smiles. He's like, mm. yeah. This, <laughs> that, that, so this this is the difficult part for me, and this is where I was getting in trouble at home when I tried to break this down to my wife. Um, what I didn't like about this defense is they didn't focus on what is called penal law thirty five twenty five. It's the ability to use force to stop a larceny or theft or criminal mischief, the damage of your property. And I always go back to this analogy that I've said multiple times in ABC. If, and I'll use Kira, use an example. If Kira's walking down the street and someone takes her purse, the law says you're allowed to use force to take your property back. The law doesn't say, well, your girlfriend's allowed to take your cell phone because she's allowed to check for infidelity. The law doesn't say, well, my wife's allowed, uh, to, or I'm allowed to take my wife's property because I need to check it for this or that. No, to me, this broke down to Grace Jabari stealing property and Jonathan Majors using force, now the question is, is it appropriate force to take back his property? But that seemed to be an argument that was missed completely in this trial. I'm not sure quite why. Uh, for the most part, they really focused on, can you believe that these injuries actually occurred in that vehicle when Grace Jabari then went off drinking with these new friends that she saw, that she supposedly bumped into a wall, supposedly bounced her head off of the DJ booth, was smoking with a cigarette, was her finger really broken, was her ear really scratched? That's where this case really focused. It didn't focus on is any person justified of using force to take back their property. So Majors didn't testify in his own defense, right? That's correct. He did not testify did, in this case. So, so do you think that helped or hurt him? I, I, hindsight's always twenty twenty. So you look at it now and you're like, maybe it hurt him. I, I hmm. think the difficulty in him testifying was that the evidence that came in was so strong that for lack of a better term, this was a toxic relationship. This was a man who believed he was, as his own words, a great man, and that he needed a great woman similar to like that of Michelle Obama or Coretta Scott King, and through the prosecution's eyes or their lens, was manipulating Grace Jabari to be um, someone else through verbal and emotional abuse, and that this crescendo of verbal and emotional abuse led to the physical abuse that is this case. And if Jonathan Majors took the stand, he would have had to answer for each and every one of those instances of verbal and emotional abuse. And I think that would have been very damning for him, not just in a criminal setting, but also in a, in a PR setting, because he's gotta have a life after this. So I think strategically it makes sense for him not to testify, but I think on another sense, him testifying to what happened in that vehicle saying, I was just trying to get my phone back. This was not a form of manipulation. This wasn't a form of abuse. This was someone took my property and I tried to take it back with as little force or as little harm as possible and she wasn't injured when I left. I think that could have been helpful as well. All right, let's go to Aaron Katursky, who's been covering this for us. Th thank you, Brian, our senior investigative reporter. So, uh, Aaron, this is a split verdict. Brian's just been slicing and dicing the law with us and, and some of the evidence in the case. What do you make of this verdict? What's the jury saying? And what are the consequences for Jonathan Majors? I think off the bat, with two counts of conviction, Jonathan Majors faces uh, as as much as a year in, in prison, although uh, hard-pressed to find another case of, of misdemeanor domestic violence where a first-time offender actually served time. But be that as it may, uh, it, he does face the possibility of a year in prison on each of the two uh, counts of, of conviction. Terry, I think the verdict reflects a, a signal from the jury that they did not believe Jonathan Majors intentionally assaulted Grace Jabari in the back seat of that SUV back in March, but was reckless uh, when when he tried to, to grab 
back his phone and and left her with a lacerated ear and a fractured finger. Uh, because on both counts that involved intentional conduct, the jury acquitted him. On the counts uh, where it was just reckless assault, he was convicted. And then the jury saw video uh, of the alleged harassment outside the SUV where, where Majors is seen hoisting Jabari off the ground and shoving her back into the SUV. Uh, that, that was pretty cut and dry, it seemed, to the jury. And so they convicted him on, on the single misdemeanor count of harassment. So what's the, the talk, Ben, Aaron, just about his future and his career and how that's playing into all of this? I mean, the, uh, a lot of uh, the coverage has been about how he was this rising star within Marvel yeah. and that this case um, could devastate his, his future. Well, he was a rising star within Marvel, wasn't he? And, you know, with roles in, in, in Loki and Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantum Mania, which is where he met Grace Jabari on set. She was doing a dance instruction for some of the, the cast members. And, and a lot of his projects have been put on hold pending the outcome of the case. But regardless, and, and you know, he can try to fight the two counts of conviction. Uh, but regardless, there were some things that came out during trial which were not a good look for his reputation. The jury heard, and Majors does not dispute, that you know, Majors was throwing things at Grace Jabari on several occasions, threw a candle at her head, the, the, the candle container smashed, the jury saw pictures of it. Uh, there were clearly instances of, of verbal and emotional abuse where he's imploring her not to come home drunk because uh, he's a great man, he needs a great woman to support him and, and uh, implores her to behave more like Coretta Scott King or, or Michelle Obama, implicitly comparing himself to the husbands of, of those two women. Uh, and, and there were other instances where he tells her, and the jury saw surveillance images of this, to, to button up her blouse. Uh, he thought her, her, her blouse was unbuttoned too much as they were going out on the, the night, March 25th, uh, earlier this year when the, the, the assault occurred. So there, there, there were things that weren't great for majors that, that came out. Now, whether he can overcome that, you know, Kira, Terry, you guys know Hollywood sometimes has short memories. Hmm. Well, although since really the Me Too movement, it is hard uh, for someone to come back from these mm -hmm. kinds of allegations without a great journey of reconciliation with mm -hmm. all, uh, himself first, and, perhaps. And, and Terry, I think that what you just said seems to reflect a reason that the Manhattan District Attorney decided to bring this case in the first place, um, because prosecutors seem to believe that, you know, it, it doesn't have to just be Harvey Weinstein or, or, or conduct that reaches that level. Um, and, and in fact, I think prosecutors are coming to, to a belief that women are enduring all sorts of other kinds of domestic violence that don't necessarily rise to felony conduct under the law, uh, but may deserve uh, a look from prosecutors nonetheless. Uh, it, I can't think of another misdemeanor assault case that's ever gone to trial in, in the last 20 years here, Terry. But, but the Manhattan DA's office was determined to bring the case, knowing that the, it was an imperfect set of facts. And, and I think the split verdict uh, reflects that. But knowing it was an imperfect set of facts, they moved ahead anyway because they, they wanted to send I think a bit of a message that that the conduct uh, women often endure in relationships, uh, even if it isn't as serious as something like a Harvey Weinstein, uh, nonetheless uh, deserves a day in court. It's fascinating. Yeah, point well made. Overall, uh, not a real healthy relationship when you learned a lot of the facts and the back and forth and just the ma manipulation and all mm, of that. So. Mm. Brian, Aaron, thank you both so much. And sentencing for Jonathan Majors is currently set for February 6, 2024. Coming up, a massive shift for Pope Francis and the Catholic Church. We've got all the details right after a quick break. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. 
reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Really glad you're streaming with us today. Well, it's a spiritual shift that not every Catholic is happy about, but for many same-sex couples, they are thankful for the blessing. Because today, Pope Francis said the Catholic Church will now allow blessings, pastoral blessings of same-sex couples. The church also clarified that the blessing, quote, must avoid any elements that resembly, remotely resemble a marriage rite. It's the first major update to Catholic doctrine in decades and will have a huge impact across the globe for a church still divided over LGBTQ plus people. Let's bring in our contributor and consultant to the Vatican, Father James Martin. Father, great to see you. Um, this is quite a huge step for the Catholic Church. Why do you think that the Pope um, is making this decision right now? Well, that's a good question. I mean, he's listening to people, first of all. Also, there's a new uh, person, Cardinal Fernandez, in charge of the Vatican's, uh, basically their theology office, and he signaled a much more openness to this question. But really, I think it's been a long time coming, and the Pope is really trying to be pastoral and listening to the needs of people on the ground, including same-sex couples. You know, Father, you've been, you've been really a leader in trying to uh, awaken the church to a new way of looking at uh, same-sex relationships within the context of the Gospels. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that journey and how you feel today, given that what Pope Francis has approved of is essentially, a, if I can say it, a standard blessing from a priest, as a, as a priest would bless anyone who needs a blessing, all of us do from time to time, <laughs> rather than anything incorporated into a marriage rite. What do you think about that and, and the journey here? Yeah, well, my own journey uh, really started in earnest with the Pulse nightclub massacre where 49 uh, LGBTQ people were killed. And I asked the church to, along with other people, to respond more uh, clearly to this group, this community in our church. And uh, along with many other people, I've been uh, encouraging the Vatican to be more open to LGBTQ people. Um, but your question, uh, it, I think it's, um, you know, it makes sense that they wouldn't want to confuse people to make it seem like the church was uh, approving same-sex marriages. We're not doing marriage rights. But it really is something that a lot of same-sex couples have been asking for, just some sort of pastoral accompaniment from, from priests and deacons and bishops. And it's a huge step forward, and it really is the first time that this door has been opened in any way uh, to same-sex couples. So it's a really historic day. You also wrote an open letter to the Pope talking about the church needing to be more aware of the real life effects of stigmatizing language about LGBTQ plus people. Is this move enough to do that? And also tell me about how the Pope responded to your letter. <laughs> Well, I've met with him a couple of times, and we've had very uh, warm conversations. He's very encouraging and inspiring and, you know, always supportive. 
Um, and I think there will be some people who say that uh, this doesn't go far enough, but there are also people who are going to say that this goes too far. Uh, in some parts of the Catholic Church, the, even, even the word LGBT uh, is, is kind of anathema. So I think we have to remember what the Pope is trying to do is balance the needs of some locales with with the the fears of other locales but once again it's it's a it's an early christmas gift for lgbtq catholics <laughs> amen thanks very much for that father jim great to see you thanks very much my pleasure well coming up remembering sandra day o'connor how the supreme court's first woman justice opened the door for others in the decades to come at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. We have really good news. <laughs> Congratulations, you're I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions. Their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. Reporting from the aftermath of the Maui fires, I'm Melissa Adon. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Well, members of the public are paying their respects to the late Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who is lying in repose at the Supreme Court. In the rotunda of the Capitol there, there she is. Justice O'Connor died earlier this month at the age of 93. She was the first woman ever to serve on the Supreme Court of the United States. And this morning, Justice's family members, spouses, former clerks, they all spoke at a private ceremony in the High Court's Great Hall. That's where that is. Excuse me, that's not in the Capitol. That's in the High Court, in the Supreme Court's Great Hall. And now the public is invited to pay their respects up there through 8 p.m. tonight. Tomorrow, her funeral will be held at Washington National Cathedral. So let's bring in ABC's Jay O'Brien. He's up at the Supreme Court and ABC News contributor and presidential historian Mark Updegrove for more on this. So Mark, you know, Justice O'Connor, she served on the court for 24 years, was an absolutely critical vote. And you actually had, had the opportunity to interview her at the uh, LBJ Library in 2010. Let's take a look at that first. When you were coming up in the world, who were your role models? My parents. I didn't know any children, you know, out on the ranch, frankly. And uh, I went to live with my grandmother. I guess she was to go to school in El Paso. She was a nonstop talker. And if her eyes were open, her lips were moving. <laughs> <laughs> I had to learn a lot about doing my work and never hearing a word she said. <laughs> I don't know if that's helped me or not. Maybe it did. <laughs> I love that. Mark, what struck you most about, about that interview and, and, and about Justice O'Connor? 
You know, she she was uh, she had a great sense of humor, as you can see there, uh, a wonderful sense of humor. But she was a pragmatist, and I, I think uh, she was appointed by Ronald Reagan, of course, in 1981, the first female to sit on the Supreme Court. So she was certainly somebody who broke down barriers. But when she got to the court, she did not come as a as a conservative. She was a pragmatist and and practical. And I think one of the things that really was formative for her was serving in the Arizona State Senate, where she had to deal with both Republicans and Democrats and was a consensus builder. In fact, she talked about bringing them to her home uh, for, for barbecues, back, backyard cookouts, so they could get to know each other better. I think one of the things that she lamented in today's Washington was that lawmakers didn't talk to one another. And very often, Supreme Court justices didn't necessarily get along because of their views. She sat in the middle and was the most influential member of the court during her time on the court as a consequence of sitting in the middle and being a moderate voice. And Jay, she didn't even have a women's restroom near the courtroom. I mean, that's the times that we are talking about. And now, if you look at the court all these years later, how she paved this road for so many other, you know, brilliant women to have a chance to, to sit, you know, there in the highest court. Yeah, and the phrase is so often repeated when it comes to Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. She didn't just open the door for women in American politics and American law. She kicked the door open. And that's what we heard from Justice Sonia Sotomayor today in that touching remembrance, just as Justice O'Connor's casket came into the Supreme Court right here behind me to lay in repose as it is now. Justice Sotomayor said that she was memorializing someone who had been a role model to her and to women across the country, someone that was able to, as Mark just said, bring Supreme Court justices of different ideologies together in a way that, frankly, had not been done in the court up to that time. And also someone whose legacy endured after she left the court. She wasn't just part of significant decisions on the court. She also dedicated her professional life after she was a justice, her post-justice life, to civics education and iCivics, which is a game, a computer game system that teaches young people about American civics. She said that getting involved in civics is what you can do to best honor American democracy, that it's a participatory process, not just something you stand on the sidelines and watch. Absolutely. And, and Mark, I want to go back and pick up on what you were talking about, how she brought to the Supreme Court the practical, pragmatic experience of an elected politician who, who did deals, who had to, you know, press the flesh a little bit to, to get people to vote for and to get other legislators to agree with her. And she also, of course, was the first mother on the Supreme Court of the United States, raised three sons. So she, she had a lot of experience no one else up in that court had ever had. <laughs> and it did shape her, her decisions. And you know, the, the notion you said she was in the middle, she changed her mind on, on decisions as well. She had the strength and freedom to do that. What what some examples of that? You know, Terry, that's a, that's a good point. One of the things that, that uh, few would expect when she was appointed to the Supreme Court was that she would uphold abortion rights and affirmative action in higher education. And that latter decision, uh, a landmark decision that was passed, down, uh, passed by the Supreme Court in, in 2003, was largely influenced by her experience with the first black on the Supreme Court, Thurgood Marshall. She spent a lot, about 10 years on the court with Justice Marshall and learned a lot through his eyes about the plight of African Americans and, and minorities in this country. And that informed her view on that case. So she was willing to listen to others. She was not an ideologue. She was a, 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 a pragmatist, as I mentioned earlier, but she believed that the law should evolve based, in her words, on a careful byproduct of an emerging social consensus. That's what dictated her views in, in many cases, Terry, and, and made her again so important as sitting in the middle of that court and determining whether she would go right or left on any particular decision, Terry. And, and Mark and, and Jay, her connection to the country, she said in that final letter, I feel so fortunate to be an American. She was a, a patriot through and through. And presidential historian Mark Updegrove, our Jay O'Brien, thanks very much for being with us. And thanks to all of you for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. And I'm Terry Moran. The news never stops. We'll be right back with more.
whenever news breaks. It's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. Welcome to Crufts, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day on the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner of oh, Crufts 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hello, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. And I'm Terry Moran. We've got some breaking news. The jury in the Jonathan Majors domestic violence trial has found him guilty of one count of assault and one count of harassment, but acquitted him of another count of assaulting his former girlfriend. This comes after jurors spent four or five hours deliberating over portions of several days. And this is a case that has gotten a lot of attention. Jonathan Majors, a major rising star, uh, and he, he met... You know, a crisis in this, and the jury has now returned with its verdict. And there was a lot of talk about this uh, trial impacting his future in the movie business. Rising star within the Marvel movies. Uh, our legal contributor, Brian Buckmeyer, has been following uh, this from the very beginning as well. So I guess let's first of all talk about the charges here, uh, Brian, your first reaction. Yeah, I'm actually kind of scratching my head just because I'm looking at the different charges and, and let me break it down and explain. There are two different assaults here. One is intentional assault and one is reckless assault. Uh, based on the number order that they're telling us, my guess, and, and please someone correct me if I'm wrong, is they're acquitting him of intentional assault but finding him guilty of reckless assault, meaning that he just did something he should have known um, better and it, it caused the injury of Grace Jabari. Then he's found not guilty of aggravated assault, which is to alarm, annoy, harass, or threaten someone and subject them to physical violence. Uh, but he's not guilty of that, but he is guilty of alarming and annoying uh, Grace Jabari. To me, this sounds like a, we call it a King Solomon decision. It's, they literally just split the baby and said half and half, but some of the convictions and some of the acquittals don't really make sense when you put them all together. Well, Brian, let, let me let me try to make a little sense. I wonder, I don't know the exact fact pattern since I wasn't in the courtroom, but couldn't you say that in, in the fury of what is a domestic dispute, he was reckless in his handling, in his, uh, his physical handling of, uh, of uh, Jabari, and that was, uh, that was the reckless assault. And the harassment is he lost his temper rather than consciously went after, went after her. Does that make sense? No, because it would make sense for the reckless and then the aggravated harassment, because the aggravated harassment is harassing someone through physical violence. So why find him guilty of assaulting recklessly, but not guilty of harassing someone through physical force? That's, that's the part that I'm thinking someone just kind of said, you know what, right. we'll find him guilty for two, but not guilty for these two. But it, it, it could work. It, the, someone's got to talk to the jury, I guess. Yeah. Let's talk about the, the evidence, um, because there was clearly a clashing narrative from both sides. Uh, we had video, audio, text, photos. Do we have that 
uh, uh, video. Okay, this is um, some of the photos that we had here of, of the, the bruises and the cuts. This is the video that I'm talking about. I mean, this was probably one of the most powerful pieces of the evidence that they played in court, Brian. Absolutely. And, and I was in court watching some of this video being played to the jury, and I think it was difficult for both the uh, prosecution and the defense to really articulate this video in a way that really moved the jury. And I think ultimately, the jury kind of took this case into their own hands. We saw that from the jury notes saying, we want all of the evidence, pretty much video, testimony, 911 calls, and they decided for themselves. For me, is this Jonathan Majors assaulting his then girlfriend, then running away, or is this him trying to stop her from stealing, or I guess re-stealing his cell phone and getting away from her? Uh, the the juxtaposition of how this was presented to the jury, I think, is what caused uh, the deliberation to take so long. And there's a is there, there's a state of mind, obviously, that the that the prosecution would have to prove, right? And so here they are. She has seen the the spark that triggered this fight was she saw what she thought was a message from another woman on his phone. So she was trying to grab the phone, he's trying to grab it back. They're probably at the, at the peak of emotions and anger and, and mutual conflict at that point. And I, is, would the jury have factored that in? In other words, we've all been in fights with people we love, and so it's not the same as a as a as a self as a more conscious <laughs> as Brian conscious smiles. He's like, mm. yeah. This, <laughs> so this this is the difficult part for me, and this is where I always get in trouble at home when I try to break this down to my wife. Um, what I didn't like about this defense is they didn't focus on what is called Penal Law 3525. It's the ability to use force to stop a larceny or theft or criminal mischief, the damage of your property. And I always go back to this analogy that I've said multiple times in ABC. If, and I'll use Kira, use an example. If Kira's walking down the street and someone takes her purse, the law says you're allowed to use force to take your property back. The law doesn't say, well, your girlfriend's allowed to take your cell phone because she's allowed to check for infidelity. The law doesn't say, well, my wife's allowed, uh, to, or I'm allowed to take my wife's property because I need to check it for this or that. No, to me, this broke down to Grace Jabari stealing property and Jonathan Majors using force, now the question is, is it appropriate force to take back his property? But that seemed to be an argument that was missed completely in this trial. I'm not sure quite why. Uh, for the most part, they really focused on, can you believe that these injuries actually occurred in that vehicle when Grace Jabari then went off drinking with these new friends that she saw, that she supposedly bumped into a wall, supposedly bounced her head off of the DJ booth, was smoking with a cigarette, was her finger really broken, was her ear really scratched? That's where this case really focused. It didn't focus on, is any person justified of using force to take back their property? So Majors didn't testify in his own defense, right? That's correct. He did not testify did, in this case. So, so do you think that helped or hurt him? I, I, hindsight's always twenty twenty. So you look at it now and you're like... Maybe it hurt him. I, I think the difficulty in him testifying was that the evidence that came in was so strong that, for lack of a better term, this was a toxic relationship. This was a man who believed he was, as his own words, a great man, and that he needed a great woman similar to like that of Michelle Obama or Coretta Scott King, and through the prosecution's eyes or their lens was manipulating Grace Jabari to be um, someone else through verbal and emotional abuse, and that this crescendo of verbal and emotional abuse led to the physical abuse that is this case. And if Jonathan Majors took the stand, he would have had to answer for each and every one of those instances of verbal and emotional abuse. And I think that would have been very damning for him, not just in a criminal setting, but also in a, in a PR setting, because he's got to have a life after this. So I think strategically it makes sense for him not to testify, but I think on another sense, him testifying to what happened in that vehicle saying, I was just trying to get my phone back. This was not a form of manipulation. This wasn't a form of abuse. This was someone took my property and I tried to take it back with as little force or as little harm as possible and she wasn't injured when I left. I think that could have been helpful as well. All right, let's go to Aaron Katursky, who's been covering this for us. Th thank you, Brian, our senior investigative reporter. So, uh, Aaron, this is a split verdict. Brian's just been slicing and dicing the law with us and, and some of the evidence in the case. What do you make of this verdict? What's the jury saying? And what are the consequences for Jonathan Majors? I think off the bat, with two counts of conviction, Jonathan Majors faces uh, as 
as much as a year in, in prison, although uh, uh, hard-pressed to find another case of uh, misdemeanor domestic violence where a first-time offender actually served time. But be that as it may, uh, it, he does face the possibility of a year in prison on each of the two uh, counts of, of conviction. Terry, I think the verdict reflects a, a signal from the jury that they did not believe Jonathan Majors intentionally assaulted Grace Jabari in the back seat of that SUV back in March, but was reckless uh, when when he tried to, to grab back his phone and and left her with a lacerated ear and a fractured finger, uh, because on both counts that involved intentional conduct, the jury acquitted him. On the counts uh, where it was just reckless assault, he was convicted. And then the jury saw video uh, of the alleged harassment outside the SUV where where. Majors is seen hoisting Jabari off the ground and shoving her back into the SUV. Uh, that, that was pretty cut and dry, it seemed, to the jury, and so they convicted him on, on the single misdemeanor count of harassment. So what's the, the talk, Ben, Aaron, just about his future and his career and how that's playing into all of this? I mean, the, uh, a lot of uh, the coverage has been about how he was this rising star within Marvel yeah. and that this case um, could devastate his, his future. Well, he was a rising star within Marvel, wasn't he? And, you know, with roles in, in, in Loki and Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantum Mania, which is where he met Grace Jabari on set. She was doing a dance instruction for some of the, the cast members. And, and a lot of his projects have been put on hold pending the outcome of the case. But regardless, and, and you know, he can try to fight the two counts of conviction, uh, but regardless, there were some things that came out during trial which were not a good look for his reputation. The jury heard, and Majors does not dispute, that you know, Majors was throwing things at Grace Jabari on several occasions, threw a candle at her head, the, the, the candle container smashed, the jury saw pictures of it. Uh, there were clearly instances of, of verbal and emotional abuse where he's imploring her not to come home drunk because uh, he's a great man, he needs a great woman to support him and, and uh, implores her to behave more like Coretta Scott King or, or Michelle Obama implicitly comparing himself to the husbands of, of those two women. Uh, and, and there were other instances where he tells her, and the jury saw surveillance images of this, to, to button up her blouse. Uh, he thought her, her, her blouse was unbuttoned too much as they were going out on the, the night, March 25th, uh, earlier this year when the, the, the assault occurred. So there, there, there were things that weren't great for majors that, that came out. Now, whether he can overcome that, you know, Kira, Terry, you guys know Hollywood sometimes has short memories. Hmm. Well, although since really the Me Too movement, it is hard uh, for someone to come back from these mm -hmm. kinds of allegations without a great journey of reconciliation with mm -hmm. all, uh, himself first, and, perhaps. And, and Terry, I think that what you just said seems to reflect a, a reason that the Manhattan District Attorney decided to bring this case in the first place. Um, because prosecutors seem to believe that, you know, it, it doesn't have to just be Harvey Weinstein or, or, or conduct that reaches that level. Um, and, and in fact, I think prosecutors are coming to, to a belief that women are enduring all sorts of other kinds of domestic violence that don't necessarily rise to felony conduct under the law, uh, but may deserve uh, a look from prosecutors nonetheless. Uh, it, I can't think of another misdemeanor assault case that's ever gone to trial in, in the last 20 years here, Terry. But, but the Manhattan DA's office was determined to bring the case, knowing that the, it was an imperfect set of facts. And, and I think the split verdict uh, reflects that. But knowing it was an imperfect set of facts, they moved ahead anyway because they, they wanted to send, I, I think, a bit of a message that, that the conduct uh, women often endure in relationships uh, even if it isn't as serious as something like a Harvey Weinstein, nonetheless uh, deserves a day in court. It's fascinating. Yeah, point well made. Overall, uh, not a real healthy relationship when you learned a lot of the facts and the back and forth and just the ma manipulation and all mm. of that. So, mm. Brian, Aaron, thank you both so much. And sentencing for Jonathan Majors is currently set for February 6, 2024. Coming up, a massive shift for Pope Francis and the Catholic Church. We've got all the details right after a quick break.
much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. So many people start their day here. From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Do you remember the moment you saw that gun? How could I forget? One night, the Uber driver and the terror that still haunts a city. The 2020 event special, Friday on ABC. Really glad you're streaming with us today. Well, it's a spiritual shift that not every Catholic is happy about, but for many same-sex couples, they are thankful for the blessing. Because today, Pope Francis said the Catholic Church will now allow blessings, pastoral blessings of same-sex couples. The church also clarified that the blessing, quote, must avoid any elements that resembly, remotely resemble a marriage rite. It's the first major update to Catholic doctrine in decades and will have a huge impact across the globe for a church still divided over LGBTQ plus people. Let's bring in our contributor and consultant to the Vatican, Father James Martin. Father, great to see you. Um, this is quite a huge step for the Catholic Church. Why do you think that the Pope um, is making this decision right now? Well, that's a good question. I mean, he's listening to people, first of all. Also, there's a new uh, person, Cardinal Fernandez, in charge of the Vatican's, uh, basically their theology office, and he signaled a much more openness to this question. But really, I think it's been a long time coming, and the Pope is really trying to be pastoral and listening to the needs of people on the ground, including same-sex couples. You know, Father, you've been, you've been really a leader in trying to uh, awaken the church to a new way of looking at uh, same-sex relationships within the context of the Gospels. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that journey and how you feel today, given that what Pope Francis has approved of is essentially, a, if I can say it, a standard blessing from a priest, as a, as a priest would bless anyone who needs a blessing, all of us do from time to time, <laughs> rather than anything incorporated into a marriage rite. What do you think about that and, and the journey here? Yeah, well, my own journey uh, really started in earnest with the Pulse nightclub massacre where 49 uh, LGBTQ people were killed. And I asked the church to, along with other people, to respond more uh, clearly to this group, this community in our church. And uh, along with many other people, I've been uh, encouraging the Vatican to be more open to LGBTQ people. Um, but your question, uh, it, I think it's, um, you know, it makes sense that they wouldn't want to confuse people to make it seem like the church was uh, approving same-sex marriages. We're not doing marriage rights. But it really is something that a lot of same-sex couples have been asking for, just some sort of pastoral accompaniment from, from priests and deacons and bishops. And it's a huge step forward, and it really is the first time that this door has been opened in any way uh, to same-sex couples. So it's a really historic day. You also wrote an open letter to the Pope talking about the church needing to be more aware of the real life effects of stigmatizing language about LGBTQ plus people. Is this move enough to do that? And also tell me about how the Pope responded to your letter. <laughs> Well, I've met with him a couple of times, and we've had very uh, warm conversations. He's very encouraging and inspiring and, you know, always supportive. Um, and I think there will be some people who say that uh, this doesn't go far enough, but there are also people who are going to say that this goes too far. Uh, 
in some parts of the Catholic Church, the even even the word LGBT uh, is is kind of anathema. So I think we have to remember what the Pope is trying to do is balance the needs of some locales with, with the the fears of other locales. But once again, it's it's a it's an early Christmas gift for LGBTQ Catholics. <laughs> Amen. Thanks very much for that. Father Jim, great to see you. Thanks very much. My pleasure. Well, coming up, remembering Sandra Day O'Connor, how the Supreme Court's first woman justice opened the door for others in the decades to come. We have really good news. <laughs> I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions, their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Reporting in St. Petersburg, Florida, in the aftermath of Hurricane Adelia, I'm M. Wynn. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Members of the public are paying their respects to the late Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who is lying in repose at the Supreme Court. In the rotunda of the Capitol there, there she is. Justice O'Connor died earlier this month at the age of 93. She was the first woman ever to serve on the Supreme Court of the United States. And this morning, Justice's family members, spouses, former clerks, they all spoke at a private ceremony in the High Court's Great Hall. That's where that is. Excuse me, that's not in the Capitol. It's in the High Court, in the Supreme Court's Great Hall. And now the public is invited to pay their respects up there through 8 p.m. tonight. Tomorrow, her funeral will be held at Washington National Cathedral. So let's bring in ABC's Jay O'Brien. He's up at the Supreme Court and ABC News contributor and presidential historian Mark Updegrove for more on this. So Mark, you know, Justice O'Connor, she served on the court for 24 years, was an absolutely critical vote. And you actually had, had the opportunity to interview her at the uh, LBJ Library in 2010. Let's take a look at that first. When you were coming up in the world, who were your role models? My parents. I didn't know any children, you know, out on the ranch, frankly. And uh, I went to live with my grandmother. I guess she was to go to school in El Paso. She was a nonstop talker. And if her eyes were open, her lips were moving. <laughs> <laughs> I had to learn a lot about doing my work and never hearing a word she said. <laughs> I don't know if that's helped me or not. Maybe it did. <laughs> I love that. Mark, what struck you most about, about that interview and, and, and about Justice O'Connor? You know, she, she, was, uh, she had a great sense of humor, as you can see there, uh, a wonderful sense of humor. But she was a pragmatist. And I, I think uh, she was appointed by Ronald Reagan, of course, in 1981, the first female to sit on the Supreme Court. So she was certainly somebody who broke down barriers. But when she got to the court, she did not come as a as a conservative, she was a pragmatist and, and practical. And I think one of the things that really was formative for her was serving 
in the Arizona State Senate, where she had to deal with both Republicans and Democrats and was a consensus builder. In fact, she talked about bringing them to her home uh, for, for barbecues, back, backyard cookouts, so they could get to know each other better. I think one of the things that she lamented in today's Washington was that lawmakers didn't talk to one another. And very often, Supreme Court justices didn't necessarily get along because of their views. She sat in the middle and was the most influential member of the court during her time on the court as a consequence of sitting in the middle and being a moderate voice. And Jay, she didn't even have a women's restroom near the courtroom. I mean, that's the times that we are talking about. And now, if you look at the court all these years later, how she paved this road for so many other, you know, brilliant women to have a chance to, to sit, you know, there in the highest court. Yeah, and the phrase is so often repeated when it comes to Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. She didn't just open the door for women in American politics and American law. She kicked the door open. And that's what we heard from Justice Sonia Sotomayor today in that touching remembrance, just as Justice O'Connor's casket came into the Supreme Court right here behind me to lay in repose as it is now. Justice Sotomayor said that she was memorializing someone who had been a role model to her and to women across the country, someone that was able to, as Mark just said, bring Supreme Court justices of different ideologies together in a way that, frankly, had not been done in the court up to that time. And also someone whose legacy endured after she left the court. She wasn't just part of significant decisions on the court. She also dedicated her professional life after she was a justice, her post-justice life, to civics education and iCivics, which is a game, a computer game system that teaches young people about American civics. She said that getting involved in civics is what you can do to best honor American democracy, that it's a participatory process, not just some of you stand on the sidelines and watch. Absolutely. And, and Mark, I want to go back and pick up on what you were talking about, how she brought to the Supreme Court the practical, pragmatic experience of an elected politician. Who, who did deals, who had to, you know, press the flesh a little bit to, to get people to vote for and to get other legislators to agree with her. And she also, of course, was the first mother on the Supreme Court of the United States, raised three sons. So she, she had a lot of experience. No one else up in that court had ever had. <laughs> and it did shape her, her decisions. And, you know, the, the notion you said she was in the middle, she changed her mind on, on decisions as well. She had the strength and freedom to do that. What are some examples of that? You know, Terry, that's a, that's a good point. W one of the things that, that uh, few would expect when she was appointed to the Supreme Court was that she would uphold abortion rights and affirmative action in higher education. And that latter decision, uh, a landmark decision that was passed down, uh, passed by the Supreme Court in, in 2003, was largely influenced by her experience with the first black on the Supreme Court, Thurgood Marshall. She spent a lot, about 10 years on the court, with Justice Marshall and learned a lot through his eyes about the plight of African Americans and, and minorities in this country. And that informed her view on that case. So she was willing to listen to others. She was not an ideologue. She was a, 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 a pragmatist, as I mentioned earlier, but she believed that the law should evolve based, in her words, on a careful byproduct of an emerging social consensus. That's what dictated her views in, in many cases, Terry, and, and made her, again, so important as sitting in the middle of that court and determining whether she would go right or left on any particular decision, Terry. And, and Mark and, and Jay, her connection to the country, she said in that final letter, I feel so fortunate to be an American. She was a, a patriot through and through. And Presidential story and Mark Updegrove, our Jay O'Brien, thanks very much for being with us. And thanks to all of you for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. And I'm Terry Moran. The news never stops. We'll be right back with more. So much at stake, so much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television.
It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. We have really good news. Congratulations, you're breaking. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand. These were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions. Their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the Gulf Coast of Florida, covering Hurricane Adalia. I'm Mike Ajachi. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Hello, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Some of the top headlines we're tracking for you here on ABC News Live this hour. Eight states still under flood watches on the East Coast as a storm thrashes the coast from Pennsylvania to Maine. Wind gusts already reaching up to 70 miles per hour in parts of New England, while more than 700,000 customers are without power in that region. One death already reported in Wyndham, Wyndham, Maine, rather, when a tree went down in that storm. The same system bringing heavy rain to the southeast as well. Parts of South Carolina measuring are getting more than 16 inches of rain falling in parts of the state and in North Carolina. That EF1 tornado also brought up the wind speeds to 9 miles per hour. Well, the closing bell sounding on Wall Street. Stocks kicking off the week on a high note. The Nasdaq S&P 500 all finishing higher as the S&P 500 looks to build on its weekly winning streak. Markets continue to show signs of optimism after the Federal Reserve hinted it will begin cutting interest rates next year. Some of today's biggest winners, Etsy, Netflix, Facebook, uh, parent Meta. Well, members of the public are paying their respects to the late Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who is lying in repose at the Supreme Court. Justice O'Connor died earlier this month at age 93. She was the first woman to ever serve on the Supreme Court. And this morning, justices, family members, spouses, they all spoke at a private ceremony at the High Court's Great Hall. Now the public is invited to pay their respects through 8 p.m. tonight. Her funeral will be held tomorrow at the Washington National Cathedral. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on various streaming services, the ABC News app, and, of course, on abcnews.com. News never stops. GMA3 starts right now. What you need to know right now on GMA3. Millions on the East Coast dealing with blinding rains and damaging winds. At least 11 states under a flood watch and powerful gusts from the Carolinas to Maine. We've got the latest. And U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin arriving in Israel. The latest on the hostage negotiations as pressure grows for the IDF to dial back the intensity of its military response to the Hamas terror attack. The latest from our team in Tel Aviv. And Madonna's still killing it, launching her latest tour at 65. It's a thing. Our Monday morning quarterback, Mike Muse, on the super women of music, making it look easy, and why most of us feel younger than our actual age. Plus, keeping the music alive on Maui, the celebrities, musicians, and local organizations banding together as the community slowly builds back. Also, Shark Barbara Corcoran with the important Money Monday real estate update. What your money can buy you across the country. If I had one wish, one wish to give that day, it would be to kiss my mama on Christmas Day. 
Plus, keeping you in the holiday spirit with the beautiful sounds of the season. Jazz great Gregory Porter stops by with a Christmas classic. Now from Times Square, Eva Pilgrim and DeMarco Morgan with Dr. Jen Ashton and what you need to know. It's the most It is that time of the everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to What You Need to Know. It is good to be with you guys. And you're just rocking, just loving the holiday I, music. Don't you love Christmas? I love it. I love this time of year. It's great. How about I you, love Dr. The music the most. Yes? Absolutely. It always gets you in the mood. You always feel happy and generous. You know, Dr. Jerry, as we're getting ready to come out here today, said that he is a really great karaoke singer. And I'm like dying to She's hear him sing. trying to get me to sing. Oh, let's She's do trying it. to get me to sing. You no. want to go now? During the commercial break. <laughs> During the commercial break, guys. Right. We'll make sure you guys I see it on Instagram. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Deering, let's talk medical news if we can. Flu, RSV, and COVID-19 yes. cases are ticking up across the country, especially, especially rather when you talk about hospitalizations. How can you tell which is which especially when it comes to treatment? Yeah, you know, it's always difficult to tell which, which um, uh, diagnosis you have, whether you have RSV, flu, or COVID, but there are some specific signs that I always attribute to one or the other, and here they are. They first start off with RSV. It can be associated with cough, runny nose, fever, or wheezing, and importantly about RSV is that incubation period, that time from when you're exposed to when you develop symptoms can be about five days to help mm. you with your mental tracking. And then secondly, flu. The symptoms of flu include high fever, malaise, or feeling like you just can't get out of bed, and I think one of the telltale signs of the flu that's very really commonly associated is how quickly it can come on. And then for COVID-19, you can have variable symptoms from respiratory symptoms like a cough to GI symptoms like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and then of course that textbook sign, that loss of taste or smell that we call anosmia. And the incubation period for COVID is becoming more and more complex. It can be anywhere from two to three days to up to 14 days later. But overall, what you have to know is that all of these symptoms and signs are reasons why you should put on that mask, why you should make sure that you're avoiding those who are high risk. And stay home if you're sick. Stay home mm -hmm. and get tested early because especially if you're high risk, you want to be able to get those intervention medications for COVID, for example, Paxlovid, for flu, things like Tamiflu, especially for those who are high risk. All right, Doc, you have spoken. Thank mm -hmm. you. Of course. Let's turn now to ABC's Rena Roy with the latest headlines. Good afternoon to you, Rena. Rena good to hey, see you. Hey, good to see all of you. What a great Monday, right? We got festive music. Apparently, we're going karaoke after this. <laughs> I actually awesome. know a spot down the street, so I'll meet you guys there after the show. <laughs> we do have a lot of news to get to. We begin with the massive storm drenching the I-95 corridor. Millions in the path of that rainmaker plowing up the East Coast with high winds and flooding rains. Our Ginger Z is tracking it. That was not a fun commute for millions of people. And what was happening now is that coastal low. It's really been torturing everybody from Florida up the coast. But look at South Carolina. That was more than 16 inches of rain. The low pushing all the water up. Some of those tides so incredibly high. And then potential and likely tornado damage. They'll get out and do that survey today. That's near Myrtle Beach. Finally, on my commute in, we had trees down on the up, uh, west side highway, and this is going to be the case all the way through New England for the rest of this afternoon. So we've dried out, but we're still blustery. But you see some of those gusts, 30 to 60 miles per hour up through Boston and Maine. will finally dry everybody out by midnight tonight, and then comes in the snow and colder weather. And former President Trump under increasing fire for language at campaign rallies, echoing white supremacists and used by Adolf Hitler in Mein Kampf. One opponent, former Governor Chris Christie, calling Trump disgusting, adding his anti-immigrant documents are dog whistling. The Biden campaign responding, saying Trump, quote, parroted Adolf Hitler, praised Kim Jong-un and quoted Vladimir Putin on a promise to rule as a dictator and threaten American democracy. And mourners are paying respects to retired Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, her body lying in repose at the nation's highest court. A funeral service tomorrow at the National Cathedral. O'Connor was the first woman ever to serve on the Supreme Court. And two sports notes, the incredible healing of New York Jets quarterback Aaron Rodgers. League sources telling ESPN that Rodgers is likely to be medically cleared this coming week after that torn Achilles. And the Chiefs beat the Patriots. Taylor Swift, shall we say, showing her dismay on a play against Chiefs bow Travis Kelsey. Taylor not happy and bleeped in Monday night football action. The Eagles take on the Seahawks tonight here on ABC at 8.15 Eastern. And for anyone questioning how invested Taylor Swift is, I think we just saw it right there. Oh, you know it. <laughs> I love it. Thank you very much. We appreciate it.
And just ahead here on GMA3 on this Monday, the new fallout overseas has details emerge about the three Israeli hostages believed to have been killed by the IDF. Our team is in Tel Aviv with the latest on this story. Plus, nothing but a number. Mike Muse is here to do some Monday morning quarterbacking on aging. GMA3 when we come back. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. Welcome to Crux, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day on the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner of Crux 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News? Hi. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is OK. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Welcome back to GMA3. Israel is under pressure to dial back its campaign against Hamas as the conflict enters an 11th week. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin is in Israel hoping to get a timetable for the nation's next steps to dismantle Hamas and reduce civilian casualties. And joining us now from Tel Aviv is ABC News correspondent Britt Clinton. Britt, it is good to see you. And we'll start with this question. Israeli forces accidentally killed three hostages in Gaza over the weekend. How could something so tragic like this happened. Yeah, hi, Eva and DeMarco. Exactly the question that the public here is asking. What went wrong? Those hostages, they came out with a white cloth tied to a stick. Two of them were shot um, and killed. And then the third one ran into the building, shouted help in Hebrew, and was still killed despite orders to stop shooting. This is all according to an IDF preliminary report. Israel says uh, the men were perceived as a threat. Uh, the IDF uh, spokesperson I spoke to, he said, you know, it's a chaotic battlefield. Combat in open terrain is one of the most challenging and, and really dynamic environments known to man. Uh, and that's why, he said, uh, we have also issued 
guidance to all of the troops on the ground. So really more questions than answers at this stage. But I've spoken to hostage families and guys, they're really angry. You know, they're saying we knew this would have happened and this is exactly why uh, they're pushing for a deal before more of their loved ones are killed. Now, Brit, Israeli leaders are being urged to outline these next steps in this war with Hamas. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin is there. What kind of answers is he looking for? Well, U.S. officials say Austin will ask to minimize the human toll, you know, stop this heavy bombardment that we're seeing in Gaza. Guys, the casualties are mounting every single day. We're looking at 19,400 people dead, more than 7,000 children. Utter devastation in Gaza right now. So the U.S. wants a de-escalation. It wants to scale back the offensive uh, by Israel. And it really, probably Austin will want to see plans um, as to how Israel wants, is going to do that, how and, and when. Israel, though, appears to be very much steadfast in its mission to destroy, to eradicate Hamas and Hamas uh, capabilities, including its, its huge network of tunnels. And we were talking about the hostage situation there. What more is being done to negotiate the release of those hostages? So we know that CIA director Bill Burns uh, is joining the Mossad director and Qatari PM in Warsaw right now to push for a hostage deal. And in late November, Burns traveled to Doha as part of these kind of ongoing negotiations uh, to bring the hostages home. Uh, but Prime Minister Netanyahu, he's under intense pressure because of those, uh, the deaths of those three hostages to mm. accept some kind of ceasefire. Israeli officials have also confirmed that uh, new negotiations are underway in Brussels, but really Israel Israelis, the view from here is not very optimistic that there will be any kind of deal struck and, and any kind of optimistic outcome. And Brett, across the globe, there are growing calls for a ceasefire. Any signs of a truce, another truce? Well, again, it's very much tied to those negotiations, but time is is running out. You know, you have to consider that this is bombardment uh, for many weeks now, and the situation in, in Gaza is getting increasingly grim. You know, there is one crossing that has been opened, the uh, Karem Shalom. Uh, it's doubling the amount of food and medicine reaching Gaza from Israel, but frankly, it's just not enough. It is a drop in the ocean. After 10 weeks, this is fertile ground for disease. Uh, you know, these areas are crowded, infrastructure has been flattened, uh, there's barely any, any electricity, people are starving, and the WHO, it's worried about a whole, um, you know, slew of, of infections, of diseases, chicken pox, uh, meningitis, measles, food poisoning, you name it, they're all on the rise. So the situation is growing increasingly dire, and the international community is growing more frustrated and, frankly, kind of more angry uh, at Israel for, uh, for not accepting a ceasefire and not pausing uh, this fighting we're seeing in Gaza. Yeah, let's talk a little bit more about that humanitarian crisis that you just mentioned there in Gaza. You mentioned that one pathway in and out. Are there enough supplies, both medical and food, getting in? And, and, and is that even helpful right now with everything going on? It's really not. It's trickling in at a rate that, you know, when I speak to aid officials, they say, you know, it's it's just papering over the cracks. It's really not doing enough. Um, there is a, a, a alarm sounding over what's going on in Gaza and things absolutely need to change. And I think that's why we're seeing U.S. officials high profile visits in the region, um, because they really need to um, be able to put the pressure on Israel to halt what's happening in Gaza right now. All right. We're glad you're safe when the world is watching. ABC News foreign correspondent Britt Clinton. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. And just ahead here on GMA3, they say age is nothing but a number. I agree with them. <laughs> Why most of us feel younger than we actually are. Mike Muse is up next with our Monday morning quarterback. So much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. We have really good news. <laughs> you I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women. 
life and death medical conditions, their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. So many people start their day here. From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7 straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. From the volcanic landscapes of southwestern Iceland, I'm James Longman. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to GMA3. It is Monday, and you know what that means. It is time for another round of Monday Morning Quarterback. And here to catch us up with what we need to know from the weekend is our own, one of our favorites, Mike News. Mike News. What's up, everybody? What's up, I love doing you. Mondays with you all. Uh, of course. I mean, we'll, we'll we couldn't have, have any other Mondays. Way. Best team in America. Yeah. <laughs> all right, let's talk about something exciting here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're talking about Madonna. Yo. Why are we talking about Madonna today? The queen of pop is back on tour, and she debuted her U.S. leg of a world tour this weekend at Barclays Center in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. This is her 12th tour. And not only is this her 12th tour, but this is her 12th tour at the age of 65. Which is still hard to believe that Madonna is 65. Yeah. I know. She does not look like she's 65 in the way that she moves, the way that she dances across the stage. But there's a reason why I'm emphasizing the number 65 today. Okay. And it's because I was looking at a study over the weekend uh, that says that in 2006, adults over 40 felt about 20% younger than their actual age. I I agree. Oh, I'll hold right? my hand up. Yeah. And then another, <laughs> but, but wait, there's more. Okay. There's more. Okay. Another study, Eva, says that the greatest age discrepancy in the United States, Western Europe, and Australia with people who feel younger than they actually are. So, a question I have for you, uh -huh. my favorite We're listening. team. We're listening. What age do you guys feel? I mean, I always feel perpetually post-college. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. That young you? Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, in my head, I'm about that mature. So are we 24, 25? I'm going to say 25, because, like, I'm responsible, right? So Yeah, yeah but, I mean, how many 25-year-olds 20, are responsible? But you guys can get, like, 25, you can rent a car. I mean, yeah, you can rent exactly. a car. You can rent a car. Like, wow, De DeMarco, you know. what's your age? You know, I just feel like I still got it. So whatever age that is, you know? If it's 18, if it's 21, I still got it. Yes. It's evergreen. Yeah. So is there any truth to feeling younger than your age? I think it is, but you know, you know me, I love some data points. You know what a good data point is? We're listening. Let's look at the GOAT Tom Brady. Do you know how old he was when he retired? 40. 45 years old. Oh, was he 45? Yeah. 45 years old. I thought 41. Still out there with one of America's That's... favorite games. And winning. And winning. And I have to give a nod to our favorite executive producer, Kat, who loves Aaron Rodgers, her guy. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. He is 40 years old. He is the oldest quarterback currently right now. Although he's injured, he's rehabbing. But he but rehabbed he fast. Up. He's expected to be Very back. Quickly. He is. But Eva, we have a question for America. 
America, we want to know what age do you think you are? Let us know on our Instagram at ABCGMA3. We want to hear from you. I know. I want to know what people think they are and what they think other people think they are. Ooh. <laughs> That's good. Because I wonder okay. if they're the same. Spicy. I that is spicy. <laughs> you are 25. Trying to the start moral something of the story <laughs> is you're only you, as old as you think you are. Yeah, yeah, right? I like that. That's I like that. kind of petty shady. I'm here for it. I'm here for it. Nice nasty. Yeah, yeah, yeah nice nasty. It it's a very blessed your heart. Bless your heart. That's <laughs> so South Carolina today. <laughs> Thank you, man. I am South Carolina. Bless Thank your you. heart, America. Just bless Thank your heart. Thank you, Mike, for all of that. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Give it to me. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Dr. Darian is back with us, and today we're looking at the issue of severe obesity in yeah. toddlers, mm. and specifically low-income families. It's a really concerning number. So the American Academy of Pediatrics has done a study. They looked at over 16 million children across more than 20 states, 20 states, and they found that the rates of obesity for children between the ages of 2 and 4 years old has increased since 2016 to 2020. Now, when I see numbers like that, especially with a young age demographic like this, my first response is, what are we doing as a community in order to provide affordable nutritional options for these families but then there's also a call to action and a reminder to parents about how to manage their children's behavior their activity because, because it we, starts at home and I see a lot home. of little kids who walk around and they have juice I mean they're literally like one or two years mm -hmm. old and nothing but sugar you know that's an important point that you bring up it starts at home making sure that you're minding their diet I think modeling behavior children are repeating whatever we're doing anyone mm -hmm. who's a parent knows that and so number one making sure that you're eating healthy options the recommendations is that children get between 150 to 300 minutes of activity a week. That's about 30 minutes a day. That can be playing tag, riding their bike, swimming. You want to make sure that your children are outside. You want to make sure that you value their sleep. And you also just simply want to make sure that you talk to them about how they're, you know, using their diet to grow and become stronger and not focus on their physical appearance, but focus on their strengths. But what do you do with a generation that doesn't play outside anymore because of gadgets and yeah. iPhones? And I think often it's really mm. difficult. Number one, we have to remember that 
we can put down our phones and model that behavior to participate. Involve your children in food preparation, making them active, being out there, playing tag with them. You know, these are simple activities that we can do that can get your child more active, make, the, make sure that they're being mindful of their diet and choosing healthy options and growing into the healthiest adult that they can become. But are there programs to help people afford this? I mean, food is expensive. Food is incredibly expensive. <laughs> and and I would check food. with community resources are always available. Talk to your doctor and get a plan done. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions, their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. You're watching America's number one streaming news. ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Hello, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Some of the top headlines we're watching for you this hour on ABC News Live. Marvel star Jonathan Majors found guilty of one count of third-degree assault and one count of second-degree harassment, but acquitted of two other counts of assault and aggravated harassment in a split verdict today. The 34-year-old actor was charged after an altercation with his then-girlfriend, Grace Jabari, in New York City. Sentencing for Majors is set for February 2024. It's a spiritual shift that not every Catholic is happy about, but for many same-sex couples, they are thankful for the blessing. Pope Francis says the Catholic Church will now allow blessings of same-sex couples. The church also clarified that the blessing must avoid any elements that remotely resemble a marriage rite. It's actually the first major update to Catholic doctrine in decades. It will have a huge impact across the globe for a church still divided over LGBTQ plus people. Well, it's hard to believe when looking at him, but Academy Award-winning actor and People Magazine's two-time sexiest man alive, Brad Pitt, turned 60 today. And then, how about Keith Richards? He's 80, and he's still rocking. The legendary lead guitarist and founding member of the Rolling Stones is also celebrating his birthday today. Happy birthday to two living legends. And they look really good, too. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. ABC News Live is here for you 24-7. You can always find us on various streaming services, the ABC News app, and, of course, on abcnews.com. The news never stops. Neither do we. GMA3 starts right now. Get down, let's get down to business. All right, let's get down to business. Welcome back to GMA3. What you need to know, the NCAA record-setting women's volleyball championship, the largest crowd ever, by the way, in an indoor match. Nebraska taking on of the Texas Longhorns. Texas senior Asia O'Neal serving up five aces, including the game winner. Her dad 
is former NBA star Jermaine O'Neal. A big hug soaking up uh, this emotional moment right here between dad and daughter. Bravo. Keep it in the family. Turning to a headline that's getting a lot of attention. It's been mm -hmm. nearly two months since Friends star Matthew Perry died. There's an autopsy report from the L.A. County Coroner, and it has concluded acute effects of ketamine as the main cause ruling his death an accident. And Dr. Darren is showing us now with the latest on this story. So what did we learn in the autopsy? Yeah, well, these reports are incredibly detailed, and what we understand from them is what the cause of death is, what caused the death, and then the manner of death, or how it happened. And so from this report, we understand that an extremely high level of ketamine was found within his system, which was likely associated with his deep sedation and led to his eventual death. Um, it's important to understand when you're talking about ketamine, it has an, a, a long history, been used for decades clinically, and has been shown to show some incredible benefits. I use it in, clinically in the hospital for treatment of pain. It's used in operating rooms to deeply sedate patients. And it's even a part of growing research that shows incredible advancements for treatment-resistant depression. But it does come with its risks. Ketamine can alter your vital signs in terms of your blood pressure and your heart rate. And it can even dangerously decrease your respiratory rate or your breathing and even stop breathing, which is why it has to be used under the direction of a medical provider who is trained using it. Yeah, on this show, we've covered the ketamine being used for the treatment-resistant depression. Depression. And the thing that they always tell us at those clinics is this is so safe. That's so safe that they use it as anesthesia in children. Mm -hmm. So at what point does this become lethal? You know, that's a good question. When you're using it clinically, it's often under a monitored cardiac setting. For example, if I'm using it in the hospital for a child to do something like a procedural sedation where you want to sedate them to avoid pain during the procedure, that child is hooked up to a monitor. We're monitoring their vital signs. And then also we're making sure that they're coming out of that medication and mm -hmm. metabolizing it appropriately. Now, when someone is using it outside of a prescription or if someone is using it recreationally, you just simply don't know what dose or potency you're getting, and that can open, uh, open you up to a world of risk, which you're just not aware of. So should we be concerned right now? You know, I think it, it's a reminder of the fact that ketamine is a controlled substance for a reason. It's a reminder that it has to be prescribed and done with coordination with a medical professional. But I do think that we shouldn't step away from the advancements that we've seen with ketamine. We should just pay closer attention and making sure that we're being safe with it. All right, Dr. Terry, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Still ahead here on GMA3, the special initiative giving away hundreds of instruments on Maui to help the community heal through music. And it's Money Monday here. Shark Barbara Corcoran is with us on how to stretch that real estate dollar when we come back. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. <laughs> Welcome to Crooks, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day. On the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner of Crooks 2023. <laughs> the Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. 
We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Welcome back to GMA3. Four months after deadly wildfires tore through Maui, the heart of Lahaina has reopened. ABC's Will Carr shows how the love of music is helping that community heal. Music on Maui is more than just a melody. It's culture and history and community all wrapped into what's called mele. I almost don't want to use the word therapeutic, but that's probably a good word. Uh, it's a way to minister to other people, to assist them in bringing people together, to share in joys, to share in sadness. For four months, sadness has swept across Maui after fires devastated much of Lahaina, destroying thousands of homes and killing at least 100 people. Lost in the disaster, Lahaina Music, a store filled with instruments owned by Jason and Vanya Jerome. All my personal instruments were in the store when it burned, that was all gone. But we received some generous donations from some people that enabled the uh, Koloha, for example, gave me this ukulele, which was awesome. The aloha spirit of people being willing to give and help each other out has really been inspiring. Thanks to that aloha spirit, the Jeromes are still playing, joining other Hawaiian artists, including Jack Johnson, striving to keep music on Maui alive. You hardly even know it when I try to show you. Let's take them over here and offload them. Over the weekend, free guitars for kids delivering nearly 200 instruments to the island. We really want this to be a transformational gift and not just a transactional. We're not just giving somebody something, we're actually doing it through relationships. The organization teaming up with Johnson and touring artist and longtime Hawaii resident Ron Ortiz II. Handing out guitars and ukuleles to kids at the Ritz-Carlton Kapalua, many who lost their instruments when their homes burn. I lost a guitar, two ukuleles, um, a drum, and piano. And so what does it mean to you to now have the guitar in your hands? I'm happy and I'm excited to play it, well, practice. Losing a guitar, it's like losing a baby, you know? And just having this opportunity to come up here and just, I mean, get a really nice guitar, it's just, it's amazing, yeah. We pass our instruments down in generations. So if you had an instrument, ukulele from your grandmother, a uh, guitar from your grandfather, your great-grandfather, that's not replaceable. But we wanted to come and say, hey, we want to give you something that can help with your journey and help keep music, that fire of music, in your life. Don't be afraid, the pain can't hurt you anymore. Oh, oh, oh. Artista Second showing the kids the beauty of music and the healing strength of Mele. I love music. It's my favorite thing to do. And I'm really happy to have this brand new guitar. What does Mele mean to you? It's about coming together, sharing music and history and lineage and life through song. It's all encompassing, it's all collaborative, and it's something that people can share together. And if you can't sing and you can't play an instrument, just, you know, tapping on a, uh, a table to, to keep the beat. And these people have poured knowledge into me very graciously, and now it's my joy to be able to pass it on to others. It's kind of like a river, you're just a part in it. That river still flowing amidst a scarred landscape. And our many thanks to Will for that report. And watch our Maui Strong 808 reports each month. 
All right, still ahead, we've got a shark sighting. Barbara Corcoran with what your real estate dollar is worth around the country. It's Money Monday here on GMA3 when we come back. We've had a million, million nights. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. We have really good I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions, their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. I'm Marcus Moore covering the wildfires in Greece. Wherever the story is, we will take you there. You're streaming with ABC News Live. Let's get down, let's get down to business. All right, welcome back to GMA3. You know her from Swimming with the Sharks and ABC's hit series, Shark Tank. But today, Barbara Corcoran is here to talk all things housing market. That's right, the queen of real estate mm -hmm. herself is going to walk us through exactly what your money can get you across the country. We are so grateful to have you here Always. with us. Of course, you're going to be very surprised. The <laughs> ultimate expert. So I'm curious, what are you seeing right now in the housing market? I'm seeing an improvement slightly, but it gives you a ray of hope. Interest rates have just broken 7%, which we've been waiting for. Not the same as 2 or 3, but it's coming down. And the average house price in America has held firm, and there's still a shortage of listings. So it's not an easy market, but an improving market. All right, let's take a trip across the country. You've got a few houses for us to look at. Yes. Let's start in Texas. Yes. Texas, this is a wonderful house in Texas, in Ballinger, Texas, and the people there just love their town. They can't say enough about it. Here's a big entrance for you. It's an old Victorian with the original moldings and the glass is still intact, and they've opened it up to make it a more modern a, a part, a more modern house. I'm so used to apartments in the city. There's a bedroom. It's huge. The other four bedrooms are just as big. They've got big closets, and that's a laundry room that would even have my husband do a load of wash <laughs> once in a while. It's so pretty. And this building, this uh, house here, has a great sunroom. And why is it a closed sunroom? It's sunny, and that's the backyard. You could see the rounded so out porch. People are gonna love sitting there. 
and there's nothing about that house you wouldn't like. And for four thirty-five, it's yours. That is a deal there, isn't <laughs> and it? The trees Sound are like beautiful. a broker. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, let's go to South Carolina, my home state. Tell us about this one. Ah, uh, then you should be talking about this great house. This great house comes with eleven acres of property for the people who really want a lot. Don't judge it by its cover. It's brown. It should be painted, but inside it's white and Look at bright the light and gorgeous. Too. What a gorgeous living room! A load of windows on that far wall. The kitchen, I think the wallpaper is the problem, mostly more than anything else, but it's a modern kitchen, but it does need revamping. You can see looking at it, there's a vacant bedroom. All the bedrooms are just like this, with big closets, big windows, and there's, a, of course, a bathroom that definitely needs upgrading, but they're all windowed rooms all around the house. And there is either a lake, a puddle, a pond <laughs> or a swimming pool, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> Looks beautiful, right? Big mature trees helps the value of land very much. All right, let's talk New York City. We know real estate here is extremely expensive. You got a home for us. I sure do, and don't be disappointed. That doesn't look like the best block in town, but it's a great block in Soho. It's where everybody wants to live. Here you get 250 square feet, and you only walk up one flight of stairs to get there. Now, for somebody outside New York, they might be shocked by that, but this has three walls of windows, hardly found in New York. It's got a new kitchen, new bath. It's bright as you can make it. It's just tiny, tiny, tiny for a lot of money. There's a close-up of the kitchen, and you're about to see a close-up of the singular bath. And that's where you can turn around right and left a little bit when you really try hard. <laughs> is Barely. everybody trying to explain to my family in South Carolina how big of a deal a wash machine is in yes. the city? Oh. It's a big deal in the city, my yeah. God. A luxury uh, feature. Yeah, mm -hmm. very much so. Uh, let's go to California okay. uh, and take a look at this next house. This is, I'm happy we're getting this. Look at that view. This wow. is a beautiful place in California. Um, what, it, what it really has is the most beautiful views no matter where you look. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a beautiful room. It's opened up, light and bright. Nobody would object to that. And we'll see a few more here. Okay, the dining room's a little wonky, but picture it's just the table tur turning you off, I think, okay? There's a view from the top. It shows you those double height ceilings, which people just love. It makes the room feel so big. All the bedrooms, including all four of them, are huge. And that's a storage room, believe it or not. How's, how's that for, compare that to the studio in New York, my God. And there's the view out your back. My God, is that not a beautiful, beautiful view? That is stunning. And that's a deal, considering, you know, it being California. I will sell it to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, watch this woman right here. All right, Barbara, thank you very much. We appreciate it. And if you want more tips and exclusive entrepreneurial content, check out Barbara in your park pocket, rather, a new Patreon community launching this January. Always good to have you on. Thank you very much. All right, up next, we'll get to hear from jazz great Gregory Porter. The, the Grammy world. winner is celebrating the upcoming holiday with his Every first Christmas album. We'll be right back. Say. Merry Christmas, may you... First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions. Their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it.
Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> How cute. Yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Give it to me. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Live reporting, breaking new exclusives. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Well, welcome back to GMA3. We are rounding out the hour with a very special holiday performance. It comes to you from a two-time Grammy award-winning jazz great. Oh, we're so lucky and excited about this one. He has just released his first ever holiday album, and it's called Christmas Wish. So please help us welcome the one and only Gregory Porter, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Congratulations on the new album. Thank you so it's much. It's your first holiday album. It is my first, yes. so long? Why'd you keep us waiting? Well, I wanted this to be my first record, but, um, you know, uh, I think I had some songs that, in, that, that I had of my own that, I, that wanted to come out, mm. and I think now is the perfect time. I feel like I have a voice uh, that's, that's made for healing people. And then, and, and this time at Christmas, people need a, a healing and, and a comfort. That is mm -hmm. so true. Yeah, it's a difficult time in the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're backed by your incredible band. Yeah. But I've heard that on your album, you also feature a special guest. What can you tell us about that collaboration? Yes, Samara Joy is an extraordinary singer, a sensation, uh, and I think I think it's the prettiest voice in the world. Mm. And uh, so it's such an honor to be able to sing with her. Uh, we did uh, What Are You Doing New Year's, and she's incredible on it, and uh, yeah, she'll be doing that for the next hundred years. <laughs> she's so great. So yeah. I want to hear what you're singing, because I'm told that it is the favorite song of our executive producer, Kat McKenzie. Oh. Okay, <laughs> well, yes, um, Someday at Christmas is a, a, a song St uh, a uh, Stevie Wonder uh, made famous, and so yeah, I'll be doing that. Well, here we go. Let's get right to it then. Here's Gregory Porter with Someday at Christmas. Love it. Someday at Christmas, men won't be boys. Playing with bombs like kids play with toys. One warm December, our heart will see a world where men are free. Someday at Christmas, there will be no wars When we have learned what Christmas is for When we have found what life's really worth There'll be peace on earth Someday all our dreams will come to be Someday in a world where men are free Maybe not in time for you and for me but Someday at Christmas time Someday at Christmas, we'll see a land With no hungry children, and no empty hand One happy morning, people will share A world where people care Someday at Christmas, there will be no tears When all men are equal, and no man has fears One shining moment, one prayer away from a world Someday all our dreams will come to be Someday in a world where men are free Maybe not in time for you and for me But someday at Christmas time Someday all Christmas man will not fail Hate will be gone and love will prevail Someday 
someday a new world we can start with hope in every heart. Someday all our dreams will come to be. Someday in a world where men are free. Maybe not in time for you, but for me. Someday at Christmas time. Someday. That was amazing. Thank there. you so much. Don't Thank keep you. us waiting so long the next time. Yeah. <laughs> that was awesome. All right, folks, and for his Christmas album, you can get it anywhere that albums and records are sold. And that is what you need to know for this Monday. We love having you here. I'm DeMarco Morgan. I'm Eva Pilgrim. And I'm Dr. Darian. For all of us here at GMA3 and ABC News, make it a great one. One warm December, nice. our heart will see a world where men are free. Someday at Christmas, there will be no wars when we have learned what Christmas is for. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. Welcome to Crufts, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day on the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner, oh, Crufts 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from South Korea, I'm Juhi Cho. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. I'm Kana Whitworth here in Los Angeles, and right now on ABC News Live, Texas waging a new crackdown at the southern border. The state's Republican governor, Greg Abbott, signing two bills into law today seeking to step up immigration enforcement. Why critics say one of the measures would legalize racial profiling. Also, America's top two military commanders visiting Israel to discuss the nation's strategy in Gaza. We have details on those talks. Plus, we'll take you inside what Israeli officials are calling the biggest Hamas tunnel discovered yet. Also, remembering Sandra Day O'Connor, our nation's first female Supreme Court justice lying in repose at the Supreme Court, how one of the current female justices honored her today. But we begin here with immigration. This debate right now in Texas is launching a new crackdown at the border. Republican Governor Greg Abbott is set to sign two new immigration bills into law today. It'll happen in just moments. Uh, one of them would greenlight $1.5 billion worth of additional security measures, and that includes barriers along the Texas-Mexico border. And you're looking live as we talk in Brownsville, Texas. The governor there just arriving to sign these two bills. You see they're down close to the border. You can actually see the wall there on the left side of your screen. Now, the, that's the first bill he's going to sign. The other bill would allow state and local authorities to arrest migrants suspended 
or ex excuse me, suspected of crossing the border illegally. Now, that measure in particular is drawing a lot of outrage from immigration advocates who fear that it would lead to widespread racial profiling and imprisonment of migrants. So I want to bring in ABC News' Maria Villarreal. She's live for us in Fort Worth, Texas, with more on this. And this is an issue that Maria has covered uh, extensively. Again, as you're watching there, uh, Governor Greg Abbott of Texas, he is just there to sign these two bills. You see he's flanked by leadership uh, right there in Brownsville, Texas. And we'll keep that up as we continue to talk here with Maria. And Maria, if we can, if we can focus on this second bill here that I talked about, the one that makes it uh, a crime to cross the border illegally. So so Maria, essentially, this one is expected to draw some legal challenges here because when you hear from Mexico, Mexico says it rejects any measure that would allow state or local authorities to detain and return Mexican or foreign nationals to Mexican territory. Essentially, Mexico going on to say that it has an agreement with the U.S. for that, but it's under no obligation to negotiate with Texas, the state specifically. So what more do we know about that measure itself, Maria? Well, okay, no, it's no surprise. I mean, listen, we've we've talked about this for months, the idea that Mexico's government and president, for that matter, has a very strained and unique relationship with the governor of Texas, Greg Abbott. Obviously, they are not on the same page when it comes to immigration. Already, we've seen the federal government, right, having to push Mexico along to kind of work with them on the issues they've had with immigration over the last several years. To have to do the same with Governor Greg Abbott is asking a lot of the Mexican government. And they themselves have obviously told us recently that they just don't have the funds to continue their efforts on their side of the border without help from the federal government. Greg Abbott has been very clear of what he wants. He wants to beef up security with the excess dollars that he has right now here in the state of Texas. One of the ways he's going to do that is with SB4. Now, this is a controversial bill because basically uh, the word that you mentioned earlier, suspected. How are you going to know? How are you going to basically understand whether or not someone is here legally or legal or, or legally for that matter? A lot of immigration advocates have said the only way is to racially profile someone. And of course, that is again the law. Some of the other issues that some of these immigration advocates have talked about is the idea that once you are talking to somebody, you suspect that they may not be here legally, you know, what does that do to their asylum claims? Uh, if they are here to request asylum, does that mean that we're not going to allow them to, uh, to do that? So obviously we do know that immigration uh, advocates like the ACLU, Texas Civil Rights Project, there is a good chance that they are going to be filing a lawsuit very soon in this case. And Maria, let's take one moment to go ahead and listen to Governor Greg Abbott here as he's preparing to sign these bills. Let's listen together. Size of Houston, Texas. Altogether, since Joe Biden has been president, when you count those apprehended and the known gotaways, it adds up to about 8 million people crossing the border illegally. Now, I know that cities like Chicago and New York, they have had it with regard to the influx of migrants to their locations. But I don't think they truly know the magnitude of the damage caused to the United States by Joe Biden. Because three times the number of residents of Chicago have entered illegally. And he is talking about Biden. some of the other cities that have also seen an influx of migrants as well. And of course, his state is on the border, illegally. and he has made a uh, series of decisions the along the border that many have called into question. And so, Maria, as we bring you back in here, as I mentioned, you've covered this issue extensively. Uh, you were down at the border just about a, a week and a half ago or so. And, and Maria, immigration, as you hear the governor talking, it's becoming a bigger focal point for the Republican president candidates that are running for president, many of them blasting Biden's border, border policies, as you're hearing Abbott do as well. And so, Maria, what is this current reality right now at the border? And would these new measures change anything? You know, Kena, there, there is no doubt. Immigration is a very polarizing issue. So for Republican candidates to talk about this, I mean, it only it only adds, you know, to their credibility, right, to be able to say that they've been to the border, they know there are issues, there's a disaster going on. We just heard Ron DeSantos talking about this. You know, what we are really seeing at the border right now is an issue with immigration reform. We have not seen true immigration reform since the Reagan administration. That's about 40 years ago, right? Now, we put Band-Aids on 
overcome the problem in order to help the agents, the volunteer groups along the border, uh, these communities. But really, we haven't seen true reform. And that doesn't just mean talking about what is happening at the border, right? The influx of people that we see on a regular basis. We're talking about also what that means for the court system, the asylum processing. Obviously, there's a huge backlog of cases for people trying to request asylum the right way and go through our court system. So again, I, you know, when we when we talk about these things and we talk about Republican candidates, especially explaining how the border is a big crisis. Yes, there is a lot going on at the border. And yes, more needs to be done by this administration. And when you talk about strategies like closing ports of entry, we don't really know what that will do to this because, you know, it's throwing spaghetti at the wall with this administration with not a lot of conversation about why this will work, why they think it will work. So really, uh, you know, Republicans are taking a hold of that. They're running with it. They're using it, you know, in their campaign speeches and during the debates. I do not doubt that we will continue to have these discussions over the next 12 months, uh, you know, as we get closer to you know, the election for sure. And Maria, we talked about one of the bills that he's signing today. Let's talk about this other major bill that would appropriate more than one and a half billion dollars for additional barriers, uh, among many other moves. Uh, what kind of barriers are we talking about here? Maria, of course, we're reminding people that those floating barriers recently had to be removed from the Rio Grande following a court ruling. You know, that's what the court says. Governor Greg Abbott says he's still going to fight it. And as I last checked just a few hours ago, those floating red balls are still in the Rio Grande River. And in fact, the people that have continued to go and check on them, the citizens that live in Eagle Pass, you know, they tell me that now they are collecting a lot of moss, a lot of, you know, debris and sediment down there in the river. And so it is becoming an environmental hazard as well. You know, when it comes to what this money will be used for, is specifically when it comes to a structure on the border, you know, we're not really sure. With each administration, the border wall changes. I mean, that's, you know, a perfect example is what we saw during the Trump administration. He wanted it to look so different. He wanted the wall to be a huge, you know, keystone for what he stood for, which was stopping illegal immigration. And that wall is very different than what we saw during the Obama administration and during the Bush administration as well. When it comes to Governor Greg Abbott, there is no telling what this wall will look like. Right now at Eagle Pass, though, we can tell you what the wall looks like. For them at least. It's a lot of wiring on private land. And so what that says to me is they do not have to follow the same rules as what the federal government does right now. Going through agencies like the EPA, the Army Corps of Engineers, that is extremely important in this. Basically what that means is that you are building a wall that can sustain the elements and the terrain for that matter. We saw some private land be given up to somebody who was trying to build a border wall several years ago. That border wall sank in the Rio Grande River because it was not substantially made. So again, a lot of concerns surrounding not just SB4, but really what this funding is going to when it comes to the border wall as well. All right, yet to see Maria Villarreal from Texas for us today. We appreciate it. And now to actor Jonathan Majors, who has been found guilty of two misdemeanors in his New York City domestic tr violence trial. A Manhattan jury reached a mixed verdict today, finding Majors guilty of harassment and assault of his ex-girlfriend, Grace Jabari. The jury also acquitting Majors, though, of a different assault charge and of aggravated harassment. The verdict comes after jurors spent more than four hours deliberating over the course of several days. ABC News senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky has been tracking all of this. He's live outside uh, the court there in New York. Aaron, thanks for being with us. And Aaron, what potential punishment is Majors now facing and is there any legal recourse for him? There is some legal recourse in terms of an appeal, the two counts on which he was convicted, Kena, but at the moment, he still faces the possibility of a year in prison based on the two uh, misdemeanor uh, convictions. Uh, although beyond the, the potential for, for jail time, and I, and I have to say, misdemeanor assault, first time offense, unlikely he'd be sent to prison over this. Uh, he already is suffering a career consequence. We heard from our parent company, Disney, that Marvel is no longer moving forward with Jonathan Majors. And he had been a budding star with roles in Loki and Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania, on the set of which is where he met Grace Jabari, the woman he has now been convicted of assaulting in the backseat of an SUV back in March, Kena. All right, Aaron Katursky, our thanks as always to you in New York.
We turn now to the latest on the war in Gaza. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin meeting with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu today in a push to transition what he calls a more targeted campaign against Hamas amid mounting international pressure for a ceasefire in Gaza. Israelis and Palestinians both deserve a horizon of hope. It is in the interest of both Israelis and Palestinians to move forward toward two states living side by side in mutual security. Well, Israeli officials confirming another round of high-stakes hostage negotiations with Hamas. This coming as the IDF claims it has discovered what they call the biggest Hamas tunnel in Gaza. So joining me right now is ABC News' Inez de la Katara, who's live for us in Tel Aviv, and ABC News senior Pentagon reporter Louis Martinez, who is also in the region traveling with the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So thank you both for being with us. And Louis, let's start here with you and jump right into it. You know, we continue to see these attacks from the Iran-backed Houthis in the Red Sea, and I I know you have some new reporting right now on how the U.S. military is looking to allies for a multinational approach here to dealing with this situation to try and avoid widening this war. That's right, Kena. The Pentagon has just announced a new multinational naval task force called Operation Prosperity Guardian. This is going to bring together several nations, including the United States, that are, that are going to provide naval ships and other resources to counter this threat of Houthi missiles and drones that have been fired at uh, commercial shipping in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. Uh, the United States has been saying now for weeks that they're preparing some kind of a response, but that they wanted it to be an international response because they said this is not just a U.S. problem. And this is the international response that they're building on. Uh, they're building on a, an early, well, an already existing task force called Task Force 153 that was designed to counter the piracy threat in that region. So now they're just going to use that framework and build in, uh, bring in additional countries uh, to now protect shipping in the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden, obviously a, a huge impact on shipping. Several shipping companies have already decided uh, that they are not gonna allow their ships to enter uh, the Babel Mandeb, which is the strait separating the Gulf of Aden and the Red Sea. So a major new effort being launched by the Pentagon and just announced just a short time ago. And noting from uh, some of your notes here, uh, Louis, they're saying it's an international threat, which requires an international response. So I know you'll be watching how that plays out. Uh, and as to you, U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and others uh, have repeatedly expressed concerns about the large number of civilian deaths in Gaza. What are we learning right now about Israel's operations as they move forward there in Gaza? Yeah, Kena, and we're seeing really growing disagreements there between the U.S. and Israel, both in terms of the fighting happening right now and in terms of what should come next. So when it comes to what's happening right now, we do know the U.S. has been, you know, continuously pressuring Israel to do more to try and uh, prevent the number of uh, civilian casualties, to try and minimize the number of civilian casualties. The uh, U.S. are also pressuring Israel to move to a new kind of lower intensity phase of the war, but the Israelis have given no timeline for when that could happen. And then when it comes to what happens next in Gaza, some disagreements there as well with uh, the U.S. Uh, pushing for uh, the Palestinian Authority to uh, take over uh, a Palestinian state. They, that's ultimately what they want to see is a two-state solution here that would unite both Gaza and the West Bank. And they do not want to see Israel reoccupy Gaza. Uh, but the Israelis are, are, you know, have suggested that that's not what they're planning on. And they have, in fact, suggested that they might keep a presence there in Gaza. So uh, growing disagreements there between the two countries. Uh, that's part of the reason uh, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin is in the region, is to uh, smooth out some of that. And, and it's part of the reason we saw uh, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan and uh, um, Secretary of State Antony Blinken as well last month. All right. We certainly hear uh, the IDF at least suggesting they would have to have some kind of security presence uh, in Gaza for the remaining future. And, and Louis, to you, what do you think that Israeli officials will do with some of this advice, if you will, uh, from U.S. officials to move in a more targeted manner? And how are they going to work through this next phase of the war? I mean, what would that look like if they heed this advice? Well, you know, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said that it is normal to in a military operation to go from one to transition from one phase into another. What he's talking about is going from a major a military operation like we're seeing right now into something that's more targeted, something that actually allows for stability operations to take place. Uh, when we heard from the Israeli Defense Minister Yav Galant was that he and Austin had some very frank discussions, um, and but that they took the adv uh, advice and essentially they listened to Austin. Um, but I think one of the things that the Israelis are talking about is providing stability 
um, on both the southern front there in Gaza as well as the northern front up there in, in northern Lebanon, in northern Israel, uh, where there have been attacks from Hezbollah. And there have been about 70,000 Israeli residents that have left from the north, about 100,000 that have been moved away from uh, the Gaza area. And so that's what they want. They want to provide the stability for the return of those Israeli citizens back to those areas. So they want to see another phase where they can guarantee that security. But of course, the question begins to be, be asked, how much longer is this major military operation going to continue? Certainly. And I know we hear uh, at least a number of months uh, in terms of the IDF. And, and as to you, you recently got a look inside uh, one of those Hamas tunnels. But this one in particular is one that the IDF says is the largest that they've discovered so far. Its entrance is really close to a border crossing into northern Israel. Uh, what did you see there? Yeah, Kena, so this was a tunnel that we were taken to visit with the IDF on an IDF embed. They say it's the largest Hamas tunnel they've ever uncovered in Gaza. And they say this is something that would have taken years to build and millions of dollars to build. They say when they found it, uh, it was riddled with weapons and booby traps and militants uh, inside as well. They've now uh, cleared it. Um, and they say it was a tunnel that was specifically built to, to attack Israel and specifically the Erez uh, border crossing. So the entrance, one of the entrances to the tunnel is actually actually just a, a few feet from the uh, Erez border crossing. Now, the IDF says they do plan to destroy this tunnel. I asked uh, IDF spokesper uh, spokesperson Daniel Hagari how they plan to do that. They don't get into the specifics of how they've, they're going about destroying the tunnels, uh, but they say that the only way to permanently destroy these tunnels is uh, by using ex explosives. By using explosives. All right, Inez and Louis, our thanks to you as always. And now to a preview of a GMA3 exclusive. Co-anchor DeMarco Morgan sitting down with the Mississippi police officer who shot and wounded an unarmed 11-year-old boy. In May of this year, this police sergeant, Greg Capers, answered a domestic disturbance call. And while he was in the home, he shot an 11-year-old, Adrian Murray shot him in the chest. Well, Murray was hospitalized for five days with a collapsed lung and a lacerated liver and fractured ribs. The Mississippi Attorney General's office declining to bring charges against Sergeant Capers after a grand jury found that he did not engage in criminal conduct when he shot the boy. Greg Capers sitting down exclusively with our own DeMarco Morgan. So let me ask you this, Sergeant. For those who say having a badge comes with a ton of responsibility and they believe you acted poorly that day? Well, you know, it's, people have their own opinion and unless they're in our shoes, you never know exactly what you may run into or encounter on a day's time within your 12 hour schedule. You just never know what you may run into. Spare the moment, it's a split decision that has to be made. Have you thought about that little boy since that day? All the time. All the time. DeMarco Morgan, our thanks to you. And you can watch this exclusive interview airing on GMA3 tomorrow. And coming up next here, remembering Sandra Day O'Connor, our nation's first female Supreme Court justice, lying in repose at the Supreme Court, how one of the current female justices honored her today. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yeah. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's 
the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. Welcome to Crufts, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day on the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner of oh, Crufts 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. And welcome back. A mournful day in the nation's capital. The late Sandra Day O'Connor, the first woman to serve on the U.S. Supreme Court, lying in repose today in the High Court's Great Hall. O'Connor died earlier this month at the age of 93. Family members, friends, and colleagues, including Justice Sonia Sotomayor, spoke about a private ceremony earlier today. I will always remember the day Sandra was nominated to become the first female Supreme Court justice. Sitting in my district attorney's office in New York, I felt the gravity of her nomination. At a time when most states had no female justices on their high courts, and large firms of 300 to 500 lawyers touted having just one female partner, I knew that Sandra would open the door for women in the law and serve as an inspiration to girls across the country. Later on, she would often say, that it was good to be the first, but don't want to be the last. An opportunity to pay their respects tonight until 8 p.m. Eastern time. Her funeral will be held at the National, National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. on Tuesday. And ABC News Live will be streaming Justice O'Connor's service tomorrow as well. Coming up next here, uh, he's making a list. He's certainly checking it twice. But take a look how this Santa Claus is going the extra mile to be especially inclusive this holiday season. We'll show you after the break. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Give it to me. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the massive protests on the streets of Tel Aviv, Israel, I'm James Longman. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live.
And welcome back. We have a sweet story for you from South Carolina. Santa Claus making sure that more children can feel included on this holiday season. And the big guy in red visiting a class of hearing impaired students at the Brennan Elementary School in Columbia. And you can see using sign language. Santa spent the entire day reading books, singing carols with a group of kids. And of course, uh, no visit is complete without some gifts from the North Pole. Uh, the annual event is called Singing Santa and it's been going on for 25 years and parents say that their kids feel a little bit happier knowing that Santa cares about the deaf community and comes to visit them as well. Oh, that's beautiful. We have a lot more news ahead here on ABC News Live and today's big story. America's two top military commanders visiting Israel to discuss its strategy in Gaza. This is concerns grow for civilians there. I'll be speaking with ABC's senior Pentagon reporter Louis Martinez who is currently traveling with the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Also, in our spotlight, Southwest Airlines slapped with a record $140 million fine for last year's holiday travel meltdown. And, of course, the holiday rush underway this year. I'll be speaking with our panel about whether carriers are doing enough to own up to their mistakes. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions, their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoon. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Well, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin reaffirming America's unshakable support for Israel, but urging protection for civilians that are caught in the conflict. I'm Kana Whitworth here in Los Angeles, and that is our big story today. The Defense Secretary and Joint Chiefs of Staff Chairman General C.Q. Brown uh, visiting Israel to discuss the country's war strategy. I will be speaking with ABC News senior Pentagon reporter Louis Martinez, who is traveling with General Brown about the next phase in Israel's fight 
against Hamas. Also in our spotlight, Southwest Airlines slapped with a record $140 million fine for its holiday travel meltdown last year. Our panel weighs in on what carriers can do to own up to their mistakes as this year's rush grows busier by the day. Of course, though, we begin here with our big story. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and Joint Chiefs of Staff Chairman General C.Q. Brown showing support for Israel while working to prevent its fight against Hamas from escalating in the region. Secretary Austin and General Brown are respectively America's top civilian and military commanders, both of them visiting Israel to discuss the next phase in this war strategy. Austin speaking alongside his Israeli counterpart earlier and said that the U.S. has insights to offer based on our own country's experience fighting the terrorists. We also have some great thoughts about um, how to transition from high intensity operations to a lower intensity and more surgical operations. So we had uh, great discussions on all of those uh, those issues. Well, Austin and other U.S. officials, including President Biden, have repeatedly expressed concern about the large number of civilian deaths in Gaza, even while asserting American support for Israel's campaign aimed at destroying Hamas. So joining me now is our ABC News senior Pentagon reporter, Louis Martinez, who is now in Jordan. He's traveling with the Joint Chiefs of Staff chairman. And uh, Louis, thank you so much for being here with us. And as you know, uh, this face-to-face -face meeting that you're, you're witnessing and that you're seeing play out, it's, the significance of that certainly cannot be overstated. And there's growing growing concern about this war widening and already it sounds like some decisions are made. So Louie, I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit more here about Operation Prosperity Guardian. Yes, Kena, that is the newly established multinational naval task force just announced by the Pentagon uh, to counter the threat by the Houthi militants in Yemen who have been launching ballistic missiles, have been launching drones at commercial shipping in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. It's had a huge impact on shipping companies who have told their ships not to enter those waterways until the security situation calms down. Um, but uh, this new initiative, uh, Prosperity Guardian, is going to be made up of the United States, some European countries, um, and they're looking for additional countries that can provide naval ships as well as resources uh, to essentially protect commercial shipping in those waterways. Very vital uh, transport area for the economic uh, shipping that goes towards Europe and other countries hopefully to protect and deter. Uh, also, Louis, as you know, the Defense Intelligence Agency uh, just released a map showing nearly a dozen of those Houthi attacks there in the Red Sea. And this is just since October. And when you see it like that, I think it really does highlight uh, the concern over this region. Secretary Austin was asked today about why the U.S. hasn't really hit back. And very shortly after that meeting is when we learned of this new multinational uh, naval task to combat this. So, Louis, do people feel as if the U.S. is not responding with enough strength here? I mean, I think the, what U.S. officials have been stressing is that this is not just a U.S. problem. This is an international problem. They're saying that this is international shipping that goes through those waterways, and it deserves an international response. So that's why they worked out uh, trying to establish this naval task force. Actually, what they're doing is they're building on the framework of an already existing uh, naval task force called Task Force 153. And if let's talk about the variations in threats. Earlier, it was piracy threats from Somali pirates. That's why that task force was established. Now, since it's still in place, they're now just going to add to it. And now the, the focus is going to be on protecting ships from Houthi militants there in Yemen. That graphic just shows you where all of those attacks have been concentrated. These missiles and these drones that have been being fired from Houthi-controlled areas of Yemen. We've seen American ships, naval ships, that have already shot down some of these drones and some of these missiles um, because they were heading towards ships or they're heading towards Israel in some cases. So, uh, yes, a very growing threat that required, uh, according to the United States, an international response. All right, Louis. And also, what has the U.S. expressed that they would like to see after Israel finishes its major military operation there in Gaza? And also, Louis, what is the Israeli response to that? You know, the United States has been stressing the transition to the next phase away from major combat operations inside of Gaza. Um, the, the violence and the destruction that you're seeing on your screens right now is being caused because of the airstrikes, because of troops on the ground uh, there in Gaza. And the United States wants to see that a smooth transition to the next phase where uh, there's more targeted operations, like you heard from Secretary Austin 
where there's more of a fluidity of operation so that therefore um, continuity of life can go on so that humanitarian aid can continue to go in at the same time while establishing security for the Israelis who have moved away from the areas close to Gaza because of the ongoing threat. So it's a balance of issues. What we heard from the Israeli defense minister yesterday was that these were frank discussions, but at the same time, uh, they are willing to listen to the United States, but there's no discussion of a timetable. And that's something that the United States actually wants to see. They want to know when this transition can take place uh, so that we can see the hostilities go down a bit. All right, Louie, I know you'll be watching that very closely for us. Uh, thank you so much, and please travel safe. And let's bring our big story now to our panel. So joining us today is our ABC News contributor and Sirius XM radio host, Mike Muse, ABC News contributor and former Democratic senator from North Dakota, Heidi Heitkamp, ABC News contributor and former Trump administration official, Sarah Isker, and ABC News contributor and op-ed columnist for the Los Angeles Times, LZ Granderson. So thank you all so much for being here with us. Heidi, let's start here with you. National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby called the mistake shooting of those three hostages by the IDF tragic and sad but Heidi anger among Israelis is mounting as is international pressure how do these in-person visits from top American military officials impact that situation I think it reinforces uh, the resolve of the administration to stand with Israel, but it also is a reminder that um, they have to calibrate. They cannot be full force and that it, when you when you go forward and you see kind of what does victory look like and you see the international community now more and more uh, uh, diverting from uh, a, a pro-Israeli stand or at least taking a look and saying we need to see Ceasefire. We need to make sure that everybody stays on the same page. And I think it's absolutely critical that we continue this kind of diplomacy with not just the region, but diplomacy within uh, Israel. And diplomacy, I know, feels very far away for a lot of people right now. Sarah, as we turn here to you, we're watching this pressure mount. Uh, there's a saying I know you've heard uh, from Benjamin Netanyahu. I'm paraphrasing, uh, not directly quoting here. But the sense of what he said is that if the enemy would lay down their weapons, there would be no war. But if Israel were to lay down its weapons, there would be no Israel. Uh, we know that Israel is still taking rocket fire from Hamas, but we don't see the same public pressure on Hamas, it seems. That's exactly right. I mean, we talk about the tragedy of Israel accidentally shooting these hostages. Where's the blame on Hamas? Why were those people there in the first place? Because Hamas kidnapped them and intentionally put them in harm's way for exactly this purpose. Where is the pressure on Hamas to lay down its arms to actually abide by a ceasefire? Ceasefire after ceasefire they've broken for 20 years, and yet we're still calling on Israel to have a ceasefire? How about the people who said they would do October 7th again and again and again if given the opportunity? How do you have a ceasefire with only one side agreeing to it? And LZ, I'd love for you to just let, I'd love to let you just respond directly to Sarah there. Well, I think part of the reason why is because it isn't just three parties that we're talking about. There's Hamas, there's the Palestinian people, the innocent people in Gaza, for instance, and then there's the people of Israel. So well, I certainly understand what you're talking about, but this isn't a one versus one conversation. There are actually the majority of people that are involved, almost two million displaced individuals are caught in between. So that's the reason why there's so much passion for a ceasefire is because we're thinking about the people that's caught in between who have no agency of their own. But how do we call it a ceasefire when only one side stops shooting? And it is the IDF that... Go ahead, ahead, LZ. LZ. You're asking very, very good questions. But the question I have is this. At what point does Israel go from defending itself nationally or globally to looking as if it's seeking revenge given the number of innocent people who are getting caught and killed in, during this war? I've talked about this many times as a journalist. There's a natural narrative when it comes to war. And obviously the people who want to win the war want to control the narrative so that they have the higher moral ground. Unfortunately, the more innocent Palestinian people are seen killed, the less it seems that Israel has that higher ground. That's my concern. 
And I'd like to let Mike Muse weigh in here. I know that that is an issue that you and I have talked about extensively uh, here in the misinformation campaign uh, that we're seeing coming out of this war, Mike. And I do think that uh, the killing of these three hostages has, has certainly been an inflection point uh, within the people, within Israel, for the people of Israel as they look towards their government and how their government is going to move forward. You're, you're absolutely right. I think that is why it was the, the importance of Secretary Austin's visits to underscore what President Biden initially said in the beginning is that you know, Israel has a right to respond but must do so with restraint. And it's evident by the killing, uh, the accident of killing of the three hostages uh, that came out in a makeshift white flag being shirtless, uh, that the question remains, was there restraint or is the IDF so emotionally charged? Which is what the administration is putting their pressure on with making sure that they begin to pivot to more elite forces and strategic targeted strikes um, within the populated uh, centers of South Gaza. Uh, as a result, as a continual general bombardment, you're starting to see the casualty arise, uh, to which the question between Sarah and LZ begins to, to and, and rise up in terms of what is proportionate and what is the ratio. But Heidi said it best, uh, Kira, is that we need more diplomacy. We need to engage uh, Egypt and Qatar uh, to be more moderates on the ground so that while these ceasefires are there, uh, that there is assurance uh, that Hamas will stop firing rockets into Israel uh, so that we can move forward that diplomatic two-state solution. Uh, what Secretary Austin was alluding to in his remarks. All right, Mike, Heidi, Sarah, and LZ, thank you. And make sure that you stay with us. We'll be coming back to this panel. Coming up next here, a record-breaking fine for Southwest Airlines after breaking holiday travelers, <laughs> traveler spirits last year. Uh, but will it keep the airlines from being a Grinch this season? I mean, I hope so for everyone traveling. That's in our spotlight after the break. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. <gasps> Welcome to Crooks, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day on the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner of Crooks 2023. <laughs> the Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. This record penalty is holding Southwest accountable for their failures. 
and it is sending a message to the entire industry with a new standard, a new level of accountability. It is a multiple of anything that our department has done in the past, and our expectation is that that will lead to better decisions and better passenger service. Well, it remains to be seen in our spotlight, the U.S. Department of Transportation handing down a record-breaking fine for Southwest Airlines after last year's travel meltdown during the holiday season. That $140 million fine is 30 times larger than any previous fine against an airline. And the government is also making Southwest issue $75 flight credits to any traveler whose arrival is delayed for more than three hours if it's the airline's fault. All right, I want to bring back our panel here, Mike, Heidi, Sarah, and LZ. So, LZ, first of all, uh, does this, you know, does the punishment fit the crime, so to speak? I mean, he, people just clearly thinks that this is a strong message. He thinks that this will help with accountability, and he's calling this fine historic. He, do you agree? Yes. Get him, Mayor Pete. Get him. Let him know. I think it's awesome. Because I can't tell you how many times it's been so frustrating to be stuck in the airport and know good and well that they could have done something to inform you as a passenger about upcoming delays that could have helped mm -hmm. you. Maybe you didn't go to the airport. Maybe you decided to try a different airline. And they kept that information from you. I am so glad someone is finally stepping up for consumers and saying, you know what? Enough's enough. You are not ruining my Christmas. Get him, Secretary P. Mayor, not going to ruin my <laughs> Christmas. Okay, so LZ is a big fan of this. Heidi, is the government finally looking out for the little guy here, or, or is this like a dollar short and a day late or a year late for some people? Well, my daughter and uh, son-in-law were caught in this mess, and as they were driving from Kansas City to uh, Denver, I was frantically overnight trying to find them a flight. So um, you multiply my situation times how many passengers, and let me tell you, frustration abounds. But I'm more interested in did they fix the problem? And if they're going to say $75 for every person who's delayed for three hours because of an airline, how about apply it to every airline? Because We've all sat around waiting for flight crews to show up because they haven't managed their airline correctly. And so I think it's a good start. I think that passengers on air flights now, we're paying record amounts. I think we deserve better cons uh, customer service. Uh, and again, they keep saying that if it's the airline's fault, weather is never the airline's fault. I've been stuck in many a random hotel room because of a weather-related uh, delay. Uh, Sarah, to you, I don't know, Pete Buttigieg clearly seems to be waving a flag of success here. Uh, he seems pretty proud of what they have decided to do. But is this really going to create any kind of accountability here? Look, I, I hate to be the like party pooper here, but no, this did not change your travel experience in any meaningful way moving forward. This looks a lot more like a press release to me. There's a lot less to the settlement than meets the eye. Uh, they actually, I think for DOT's purposes, in order to make this historic and legendary, they actually counted things that Southwest Airlines already did. So they're basically backdating stuff that Southwest already did for its customers because it was good business. And now they're claiming the government did it. You know, Mayor Pete has political ambitions in the future. I think that after a pretty rocky tenure as uh, transportation secretary, he's trying to find the wins where he can get them. Find the wins. And I have to say, as a traveler, $75 for a three hour delay, if it's their fault, that, you know, you still might not have made it to the wedding, Mike. <laughs> you know? that, that, that is right, Kenna. But for me, what I look at this is it, it puts the, the airline industry unnoticed. And Kenna, you and I talk often, and particularly on this panel, about technology. And I know technology is the big bad wolf in, in society right now. But when you look at our airline industry, it is very antiquated. And what we saw last year with Southwest was just how antiquated our airline system mm -hmm. is. And so the hope is, is that these airlines will begin to bring their systems to be technologically advanced so that they, A, can handle better customer support and response, but then how to be more proactive in looking at inclement weather incidents to reroute ahead of time. That is really the power of AI when you think about it in terms of how to make things more efficient, more better, uh, and more efficient, you know, expediently uh, like going forward. So for me, this is what I'm hoping will accomplish. You want the big picture fix. I like it, Mike. We yeah. appreciate you as always. Heidi, Sarah, and LZ, thank you so much. And make sure you stay with us. Coming up next here in our last call, Keith Richards turns 80 today. How Rolling Stones are celebrating their legendary guitarists when we come back.
This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Give it to me. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Paris, I'm Brick Clement. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. posting that video today on Instagram in honor of Keith Richards' 80th birthday. I get this, the band is starting up. They're gonna hit the road again next year. Keith Richards, Mick Jagger, and Ronnie Wood will embark on a tour of North America sponsored by the AARP. I love that. I wanna bring back our panel, Mike, Heidi, Sarah, and LZ. The story's making me happy. <laughs> LZ, both Keith Richards and Mick Jagger, they're 80 years old, Ronnie Wood, 76. They're gonna hit the road next year. It's going to be a major tour uh, through North America in support of their new album, by the way, uh, the name Hackney Diamonds. I love it. Absolutely. I wrote about this uh, when it was announced about the tour because I'm telling America, get used to it. Right now, one in six is over 65. We're only going to get older as a country, so there's going to be a lot more Keith Richards running around, thanks to science. Oh, so we're all going to be old and fabulous. I really like that. Heidi, <laughs> what is your thought? Well, I, I, I think Keith Richards has proved that sex, drugs, and rock and roll doesn't always lead to an early grave. Um, good for him and good for the Rolling Stones. Love to see it. Well, only the good die young, right, Sarah? <laughs> I, I am just the dissenter on this panel. Guys, I am way too young for this nonsense. The Rolling Stones, like, call me when Dave Matthews turns 80. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, or when we're all turning 160, according to LZ. Mike, how about you? Yo, I'm with Heidi for the win for the prescriptions for longevity. Come through, Heidi. Um, I am so excited uh, for Keith Richards. I cannot wait for this tour uh, to happen. I would love to see them perform Brown Sugar Live. So that's on my bucket list now. So, Sarah, you you're not going to go that. see... No, no, I'm, I'm like all about the like 90s nostalgia, some Sugar Ray, Goo Goo Dolls, like, uh, you know, no. No, no, no. <laughs> No, 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 Sarah. See, when you start listening to that, it's no longer nostalgia. You're just sad. You have to wait <laughs> extra decades before it's nostalgia. <laughs> 
album. Oh, that's so good. If you don't have the cassette tape, it is not nostalgia. Elsie, oh, yeah, I appreciate that. Heidi, Mike, Muse, and Sarah, thank you so much for being with us today. And that is our last call. Thank you, guys. And thank you for streaming with us. I'm Kana Whitworth. Follow us on ABC News Live, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and more. Coming up here at 7 p.m. Eastern, be sure to catch ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis for the day's biggest stories and the impact that they have on you. The news never stops, neither do we. Keep it right here on ABC News Live. This is 